Capital, Volume 2. This independent recording by Andrew S. Reitenberg is public domain, both in content and in audio. Part 1. The Metamorphoses of Capital and Their Circuit Chapter 1. The Circuit of Money Capital The circuit of capital comprises three stages. As we have depicted them in Volume 1, these form the following series. First stage. The capitalist appears on the commodity and labor markets as a buyer. His money is transformed into commodities. It goes through the act of circulation, M to C, money to commodity. Second stage. Productive consumption by the capitalist of the commodities purchased. He functions as a capitalist producer of commodities. His capital passes through the production process. The result? Commodities of greater value than their elements of production. Third stage. The capitalist returns to the market as a seller. His commodities are transformed into money. They pass through the act of circulation C to M. Thus the formula for the circuit of money capital is M to C to P to C prime to M prime. The dots indicate that the circulation process is interrupted, while C prime and M prime denote an increase in C and M as the result of surplus value. In Volume 1, the first and third stages were discussed only insofar as this was necessary for the understanding of the second stage, the capitalist production process. Thus, the different forms with which capital clothes itself in its different stages, alternately assuming them and casting them aside, remained uninvestigated. These will now be the immediate object of our inquiry. In order to grasp these forms in their pure state, we must first of all abstract from all aspects that have nothing to do with the change and the constitution of the forms as such. We shall therefore assume here both that commodities are sold at their values and that the circumstances in which this takes place do not change. We shall also ignore any changes of value that may occur in the course of the cyclical process. Section 1. First Stage, M to C. M to C represents the conversion of a sum of money into a sum of commodities. The buyer transforms his money into commodities, the sellers, their commodities into money. What makes this particular act of commodity circulation a part of the whole process with a well-defined function in the independent circuit of an individual capital is not primarily the form of the act, but rather its material content, the specific use character of the commodities that change place with the money. These are on the one hand means of production, on the other labor power the material and personal factors of commodity production. Their precise nature must of course depend on the type of article to be produced. If we call labor power L, means of production MP, and the sum of commodities to be purchased C, then we have C is equal to L plus MP. To abbreviate, C factors in to L and MP. The act M to C, considered in respect of its content, is thus represented by M to C factoring into L and MP. M to C breaks up into M to L and M to MP. The money M divides into two portions, one for the purchase of labor power, the other for the means of production. The two sets of purchases pertain to completely different markets, one to the commodity market proper, the other to the labor market. But apart from this qualitative division of the commodities into which M is transformed, M to C factoring into L and MP also exhibits a most characteristic quantitative relationship. We know that the value or price of labor power is paid to its proprietor, who offers it for sale as a commodity, in the form of wages, i.e. as the price of a sum of labor that contains surplus labor. Thus, if the value of a day's labor power is three shillings, the product of five hours' labor, this sum may figure in the contract between buyer and seller as the price or wage for perhaps ten hours' labor. If a contract of this kind is made with fifty workers, they have to provide the buyer with a total of five hundred hours' labor each day. Half of this, 250 hours, or 25 10-hour working days, consisting simply of surplus labor. The means of production to be purchased must be sufficient in quantity and volume to employ this amount of labor. Thus, M to C factoring into L and MP does not simply express the qualitative relationship in which a certain sum of money, for example, 422 pounds, is transformed into means of production and labor power of a corresponding sum, but also a quantitative ratio between the portions of the money spent on labor power L and on means of production MP, this ratio being conditioned from the start by the excess or surplus labor that the number of workers involved have to expend. 
If the weekly wages of 50 workers in a spinning mill come to 50 pounds, for example, then it will be necessary to spend 372 pounds on means of production. If this is the value of the means of production that a working week of 3,000 man-hours, 1,500 of these being surplus labor, transforms into yarn. The degree to which the expenditure of excess labor requires an excess value in the form of means of production is quite unimportant here. The point is simply that under all circumstances the part of the money that is spent on means of production, the means of production bought in M to MP, must be sufficient, i.e. must be reckoned up from the start and be provided in appropriate proportions. To put it another way, the means of production must be sufficient in mass to absorb the mass of labor which is to be turned into products through them. If sufficient means of production are not present, then the surplus labor which the purchaser has at his disposal cannot be made use of. His right to dispose of it will lead to nothing. If more means of production are available than disposable labor, then these remain unsaturated with labor and are not transformed into products. Once the movement M to C factoring into L and MP is completed, the purchaser does not merely have at his disposal the means of production and labor power needed to produce a useful article. He has also a greater capacity to set labor power in motion, or a greater quantity of labor than is needed to replace the value of the labor power, as well as the means of production that are required to realize or objectify this amount of labor. He thus controls the factors of production for articles of a greater value than their elements of production, for a mass of commodities containing surplus value. The value that he has advanced in the form of money thus now exists in a natural form in which it can be realized as value which breeds surplus value in the shape of commodities. In other words, it exists in the state or form of productive capital, with the ability to function as creator of value and surplus value. We call capital in this form P. The value of P, however, equals the value of L plus MP, that of the money M transformed into L plus MP. M is the same capital value as P, only in a different mode of existence, i.e. capital value in the state or form of money, money capital. M to C factoring into L and MP, or M to C in its general form, a sum of commodity purchases, this act of general commodity circulation is thus at the same time, as a stage in the independent circuit of capital, the transformation of capital value from its money form into its productive form, or more briefly, the transformation of money capital into productive capital. In the first figure of the circuit to be considered here, money appears as the original bearer of the capital value, and hence money capital appears as the form in which capital is advanced. As money capital, it exists in a state in which it can perform monetary functions, in the present case, the functions of a general means of purchase and payment. The latter, in that although labor power is bought beforehand, it is paid for only after it has done its work. Insofar as the means of production are not readily available on the market, but have to be ordered, money also functions as a means of payment in M to MP. Money capital does not possess this capacity because it is capital, but because it is money. On the other hand, the capital value in its monetary state can perform only monetary functions and no others. What makes these into functions of capital is their specific role in the movement of capital, hence also the relationship between the stage in which they appear and the other stages of the capital circuit. In the present case, for instance, money is converted into commodities which, in their combination, constitute the natural form of productive capital. This form, therefore, already bears latently within it, as its possibility, the result of the capitalist production process. A part of the money that performs the function of money capital in M to C factoring into L and MP passes over, by accomplishing this very circulation, into a function in which its capital character vanishes, though its money character remains. The circulation of money capital M breaks up into M to MP and M to L, purchase of means of production and purchase of labor power. Let us consider the latter process by itself. M to L, on the capitalist's part, is the purchase of labor power. It is the sale of labor power on the part of the worker, the owner of labor power. We can say labor here as the wage form is presupposed. What is M to C, M to L, for the purchaser is here as in every sale, L to M, or C to M, for the seller, the worker. In this case, the sale of his labor power. The latter is for the seller of labor the first stage of circulation, or the first metamorphosis of the commodity. See Volume 1, Chapter 3, Section 2, Subsection A. It is the transformation of his commodity into its money form. The worker spends the money thus received bit by bit on a sum of commodities that satisfy his needs, on articles of consumption. The overall circulation of his commodity thus presents itself as L to M to C, i.e. firstly, L to M, that is C to M, 
and secondly, M to C, i.e. in the general form of simple commodity circulation, CMC, where money figures simply as an evanescent means of circulation, as merely mediating the conversion of one commodity into another. M to L is the characteristic moment of the transformation of money capital into productive capital, for it is the essential condition without which the value advanced in the money form cannot really be transformed into capital, into value-producing surplus value. M to MP is necessary only in order to realize the mass of labor bought by way of M to L. This is why M to L was presented from this point of view in Volume 1, Part 2, The Transformation of Money into Capital. Here we have to consider the matter from a further aspect, with special reference to money capital as a form of appearance of capital. M to L is generally regarded as characteristic of the capitalist mode of production, but this is in no way for the reason just given, i.e. because the purchase of labor power is a contract of sale which determines that a greater quantity of labor is provided than is necessary to replace the price of labor power, the wage, i.e. because surplus labor is provided, which is the basic condition for the capitalization of the value advanced, or what comes to the same thing, for the production of surplus value. It is rather on account of its form, because in the form of wages, labor is bought with money, and this is taken as the characteristic feature of a money economy. Here again, it is not the irrationality of the form that is taken as characteristic. This irrationality is rather overlooked. The irrationality consists in the fact that labor, as the value-forming element, cannot itself possess any value, and so a certain quantity of labor cannot have a value that is expressed in its price, in its equivalent with a certain definite quantity of money. We know, however, that wages are simply a disguised form, a form in which the price of a day's labor power, for example, presents itself as the price of the labor set in motion in the course of a day by this labor power, so that the value produced by this labor power in six hours' labor, say, is expressed as the value of its twelve-hour functioning, or labor. M to L is taken as the characteristic feature, or hallmark, of the so-called money economy, because labor appears here as the commodity of its possessor, and hence money as its buyer, in other words, because of the money relation, sale and purchase of human activity. But money appears very early on as a buyer of so-called services, without its being transformed into money capital and without any revolution in the general character of the economy. It is quite immaterial, as far as the money is concerned, what sort of commodities it is transformed into. Money is the universal equivalent form of all commodities, which already show in their prices that they ideally represent a specific sum of money expect to be transformed into money, and only receive the form in which they can be converted into use values for their possessor by changing places with money. Thus, once labor power is found on the market as a commodity, its sale taking place in the form of a payment for labor, in the wage form, then its sale and purchase is no more striking than the sale and purchase of any other commodity. What is characteristic is not that the commodity labor power can be bought, but the fact that labor power appears as a commodity. By way of M to C, factoring into L and MP, the transformation of money capital into productive capital, the capitalist affects a connection between the objective and the personal factors of production, insofar as these factors consist of commodities. If money is to be transformed for the first time into productive capital, or to function as money capital for the first time for its possessor, then he must first buy the means of production, i.e. buildings, machines, etc., before he buys labor power. For when the labor power passes into his control, the means of production must also be present before it can be applied as labor power. This is how the matter presents itself from the capitalist side. From the worker's side, the productive application of his own labor power is possible only when this has been associated with the means of production, as the result of its sale. Before the sale, this labor power exists in a state of separation from the means of production, from the objective conditions of its application. In this state of separation, it can be directly used neither for the production of use values for its possessor nor for the production of commodities which he could live from selling. But as soon as it is associated with the means of production, by being sold it forms a component of the productive capital of its buyer just as much as the means of production do. Hence, although in the act M to L, the possessor of money and the possessor of labor power relate to each other only as buyer and seller, confront each other as possessor of money and possessor of a commodity, and are thus from this point of view simply in a money relationship with each other, the buyer appears right from the start as the possessor of the means of production, which form the objective conditions for the productive expenditure of labor power by its possessor. In other words, these means of production confront the possessor of labor power as somebody else's property. The buyer, conversely, is confronted by the seller of labor as another's labor power which must pass into his control, 
and has to be incorporated into his capital in order for this really to function as productive capital. The class relation between capitalist and wage labor is thus already present, already presupposed, the moment that the two confront each other in the act M to L, L to M from the side of the worker. This is a sale and a purchase, a money relation, but a sale and purchase in which it is presupposed that the buyer is a capitalist and the seller a wage laborer, and this relation does in fact exist, because the conditions for the realization of labor power, i.e. means of subsistence and means of production, are separated, as the property of another, from the possessor of labor power. We are not concerned here with how this separation arises. If M to L takes place, it already exists. What is important here is that, if M to L appears as a function of money capital, or money appears here as a form of existence of capital, then this is in no way simply because money is involved here as the means of payment for a human activity with a useful effect, for a service, thus in no way because of money's function as means of payment. Money can be spent in this form only because labor power is found in a state of separation from its means of production, including the means of subsistence as means of production of labor power itself. And because this separation is abolished only through the sale of labor power to the owner of the means of production, a sale which signifies that the buyer is now in control of the continuous flow of labor power, a flow which by no means has to stop when the amount of labor necessary to reproduce the price of labor power has been performed. The capital relation arises only in the production process because it exists implicitly in the act of circulation, in the basically different economic conditions in which buyer and seller confront one another, in their class relation. It is not the nature of money that gives rise to this relation, it is rather the existence of the relation that can transform a mere function of money into a function of capital. In the conception of money capital, we customarily find two interconnected errors. For the time being, we only deal with money capital in connection with the specific function in which it confronts us here. Firstly, the functions that capital value performs as money capital, and which it is able to perform because it happens to be in the money form, are erroneously ascribed to its character as capital, whereas they are simply due to the money state of the capital value, its form of appearance as money. Secondly, and inversely, the specific content of the money function that makes it simultaneously a function of capital is deduced from the nature of money. Money is here confused with capital, whereas this function presupposes social conditions, as here in the act M to L, that are in no way given simply by commodity circulation and the money circulation corresponding to it. The purchase and sale of slaves is also in its form a purchase and sale of commodities. Without the existence of slaves, however, money cannot fulfill this function. If there is slavery, then money can be spent on the acquisition of slaves, but money in the hand of the buyer is in no way a sufficient condition for the existence of slavery. If the sale of one's own labor power, in the form of the sale of one's own labor or the wage form, is not an isolated phenomenon, but the socially decisive precondition for the production of commodities, i.e., if money capital performs the function here considered, M to C factoring into L and MP throughout society, this fact implies the occurrence of historic processes through which the original connection between means of production and labor power was dissolved, processes as a result of which the mass of the people, the workers, come face to face with the non-workers, the former as non-owners and the latter as owners, of these means of production. It is quite irrelevant whether the original connection, before it was destroyed, took the form that the worker belonged together with the other means of production as a means of production himself, or whether he was their owner. Thus the situation that underlies the act M to C, factoring into L and M P, is one of distribution. Not distribution in the customary sense of distribution of the means of consumption, but rather the distribution of the elements of production themselves, with the objective factors concentrated on one side and labor power isolated from them on the other. The means of production, the objective portion of productive capital, must thus already face the worker as such, as capital, before the act M to L can become general throughout society. We have already seen how capitalist production, once it is established, not only reproduces this separation in the course of its development, but also expands on an ever greater scale until it has become the generally prevailing social condition. But this also has another side to it. For capital to be formed and to take hold of production, trade must have developed to a certain level, hence also commodity circulation and with that commodity production. For articles cannot go into circulation as commodities except insofar as they are produced for sale, i.e. as commodities. It is only on the basis of capitalist production 
the commodity production appears as the normal prevailing character of production. The Russian landowners, who in consequence of the so-called emancipation of the peasants now conduct their farming with wage laborers instead of with the forced labor of serfs, have two complaints. Firstly, they complain of the lack of money capital. They say, for example, that before the harvest is sold, the wage laborers have to be paid a considerable amount, and the basic condition for this, a supply of ready cash, is lacking. Capital in the form of money must constantly be available, precisely for the payment of wages, in order that production may be conducted on a capitalist basis. But the landlords need not worry. Everything comes to those who wait, and in time the industrial capitalist will have at his disposal not only his own money, but also the money of others. The second complaint is more typical, namely that even when they have money, the labor power to be bought is not available in sufficient quantity and at the right time. This is because the Russian agricultural worker, owing to the common ownership of the soil by the village community, is not yet fully separated from the means of production, and is thus still not a free wage laborer in the full sense of the term. But the presence of such free wage laborers throughout society is the indispensable condition without which M to C, the transformation of money into commodities, cannot take the form of the transformation of money capital into productive capital. It goes without saying, therefore, that the formula for the circuit of money capital, M to C, to P, to C prime to M prime, is the self-evident form of the circuit of capital only on the basis of already developed capitalist production, because it presupposes the availability of the class of wage laborers in sufficient numbers throughout society. As we have seen, capitalist production produces not only commodities and surplus value, it reproduces, on an ever-extended scale, the class of wage laborers and transforms the immense majority of direct producers into wage laborers. Since the first precondition of M to C, to P, to C prime to M prime, is the continuous availability of the class of wage laborers, it already implies the existence of capital in the form of productive capital, and hence the form of the circuit of productive capital. Section 2. Second Stage. The Function of Productive Capital. The circuit of capital being considered here begins with the act of circulation M to C, the transformation of money into commodities, i.e. purchase. This circulation must therefore be supplemented by the opposite metamorphosis C to M, the transformation of commodities into money, i.e. sale. But the direct result of M to C factoring into L and MP is an interruption in the circulation of the capital value advanced in the money form. By the transformation of money capital into productive capital, the capital value has received a natural form in which it cannot circulate any further, but has to go into consumption, that is, into productive consumption. The use of labor power, labor, can be realized only in the labor process. The capitalist cannot sell the worker again as a commodity, for he is not his slave, and the capitalist has bought nothing more than the utilization of his labor power for a certain time. He can make use of this labor power only insofar as it enables him to make use of the means of production to fashion commodities. The result of the first stage is thus capital's entry into the second stage, its productive stage. The movement presents itself as M to C, factoring into L and MP, to P, the dots indicating that the circulation of capital is interrupted, but its circuit continues, with its passage from the sphere of commodity circulation into that of production. The first stage, the transformation of money capital into productive capital, thus appears as no more than the prelude and introduction to the second stage, the function of productive capital. M to C factoring into L and MP presupposes that the individual who performs this act does not just have at his disposal values in some useful form or other, but that he possesses these values in money form, that he is the possessor of money. The act, however, consists precisely in letting go of money, and the possessor of money can only remain so insofar as the money will implicitly flow back to him as a result of the very act of letting go of it. This act thus presupposes that he is a commodity producer. M to L. The wage laborer lives only from the sale of his labor power. Its maintenance, his own maintenance, requires daily consumption. His payment must therefore be constantly repeated at short intervals to enable him to repeat the purchases. The act LMC, or CMC, that are needed for his self-maintenance. Hence the capitalist must constantly confront him as money capitalist, and his capital as money capital. On the other hand, however, in order that the mass of direct producers, the wage laborers, may perform the act LMC, they must constantly encounter the necessary means of subsistence in purchasable form, i.e. in the form of commodities. Thus this situation in itself demands a high degree of circulation of products as commodities i.e. commodity production on a large scale. As soon as production by way of wage labor becomes general, 
commodity production must be the general form of production. Assuming this to be the case, commodity production in turn brings about an ever-growing division of social labor, i.e. an ever-greater specialization of the products produced as commodities by particular capitalists, an ever-greater division of complementary production processes into independent ones. M to MP, therefore, develops to the same degree as M to L, i.e. the production of means of production is separated to the same extent from the production of the commodities whose means of production they are. These two confront each commodity producer as commodities which he does not himself produce, but he buys for the purpose of his particular production process. They come from branches of production that are pursued in complete separation and independence from his own, and enter his branch of production as commodities which must therefore be bought. The material conditions of commodity production confront him to an ever greater extent as the products of other commodity producers, as commodities. The capitalist must appear to the same extent as a money capitalist, i.e. his capital must function in a greater measure as money capital. On the other hand, the same circumstance that produces the basic condition for capitalist production, the existence of a class of wage laborers, encourages the transition of all commodity production to capitalist commodity production. To the extent that the latter develops, it has a destroying and dissolving effect on all earlier forms of production, which being preeminently aimed at satisfying the direct needs of the producers, only transform their excess products into commodities. It makes the sale of the product the main interest, at first without apparently attacking the mode of production itself. This was, for example, the first effect of capitalist world trade on such peoples as the Chinese, Indians, Arabs, etc. Once it has taken root, however, it destroys all forms of commodity production that are based either on the producer's own labor or simply on the sale of the excess product as a commodity. It firstly makes commodity production universal and then gradually transforms all commodity production into capitalist production. Whatever the social form of production, workers and means of production always remain its factors. But if they are in a state of mutual separation, they are only potentially factors of production. For any production to take place, they must be connected. The particular form and mode in which this connection is affected is what distinguishes the various economic epochs of the social structure. In the present case, the separation of the free worker from his means of production is the given starting point, and we have seen how and under what conditions the two come to be united in the hands of the capitalist, i.e. as his capital in its productive mode of existence. The actual process which the personal and material elements of commodity formation, brought together in this way, enter into with each other, the process of production, therefore itself becomes a function of capital, the capitalist production process, whose nature we have gone into in detail in the first volume of this work. All pursuit of commodity production becomes at the same time pursuit of the exploitation of labor power, but only capitalist commodity production is an epoch-making mode of exploitation, which in the course of its historical development revolutionizes the entire economic structure of society by its organization of the labor process and its gigantic extension of technique, and towers incomparably above all earlier epochs. By the different roles that they play during the production process in connection with the formation of value, and thus in the creation of surplus value, means of production and labor power, insofar as they are forms of existence of the capital value advanced, are distinguished as constant and variable capital. They are further distinguished, as different components of productive capital, by the fact that the means of production, once in the possession of the capitalist, remain his capital even outside the production process whereas labor power becomes the form of existence of an individual capital only within this labor process. If labor power is only a commodity in the hands of its seller, the wage labor, it only becomes capital in the hands of its buyer, the capitalist, to whom falls its temporary use. The means of production, for their part, become objective forms of productive capital, or productive capital proper, only from the moment that labor power, as the personal form of existence of productive capital, can be incorporated into them. The means of production are no more capital by nature than is human labor power. They receive this specific social character only under certain particular conditions that have historically developed, just as it is only under such conditions that precious metals are stamped with the character of money, or money with that of money capital. In the course of its functioning, productive capital consumes its own components, to convert them into a mass of products of a higher value. Since labor power operates only as an organ of capital, the excess value with which surplus labor endows the product, over and above that of its constituent elements, is also the fruit of capital. Labor power's surplus labor is labor performed gratis for capital, and hence forms surplus value for the capitalist, a value that costs him no equivalent. The product is therefore not only a commodity, but a commodity impregnated with surplus value. Its value is P plus S, the value of the productive capital P consumed in its production 
plus that of the surplus value S it engenders. Let us suppose that this commodity consists of 10,000 pounds of yarn, with means of production to the value of 372 pounds sterling, and labor power to the value of 50 pounds used up in its production. During the spinning process, the spinners transferred to the yarn the value of the means of production consumed in the process by means of their labor, 372 pounds, while they simultaneously produced a new value of, say, 128 pounds, corresponding to their expenditure of labor. The 10,000 pounds of yarn is therefore the bearer of a value of 500 pounds. Section 3. Third stage. C prime to M prime. Commodities become commodity capital as the functional form of existence of the already valorized capital value that has arisen directly from the production process itself. If commodity production were carried out on a capitalist basis throughout the whole society, then every commodity would be from the start the element of a commodity capital, whether it consisted of pig iron or Brussels lace, sulfuric acid or cigars. The problem as to which varieties out of the host of commodities are destined by their properties for the rank of capital and which others for common commodity service is one of the charming vexations that scholastic economics inflicts on itself. In commodity form, capital must perform commodity functions. The articles it consists of, which are produced from the start for the market, must be sold, transformed into money, and thus pass through the movement C to M. The capitalist's commodity consists of 10,000 pounds of cotton yarn. If means of production to a value of 372 pounds sterling were consumed in the spinning process and a new value of 128 pounds created, then the yarn has a value of 500 pounds, expressed in its corresponding price. This price is to be realized by the sale C to M. What is it that makes this simple act of all commodity circulation simultaneously a function of capital? It cannot be a change undergone in the act itself, neither with respect to its useful character, for it is as an object of use that the commodity passes to the buyer, nor with respect to its value, for this does not suffer a change of magnitude but only of form. It first existed in yarn and now exists in money. There is thus an essential distinction between the first stage M to C and the final stage C to M. Formerly, the money advanced functioned as money capital because it was converted through circulation into commodities with a specific use value. Now the commodity can function as capital only insofar as it actually brings this character with it from the production process, before its circulation begins. During the spinning process, the spinners created yarn to the value of 128 pounds, of which 50 pounds, say, was simply an equivalent to the capitalist for his outlay on labor power, and 78 pounds formed surplus value a rate of exploitation of labor power of 156%. The value of the 10,000 pounds of yarn thus contains, firstly, the value of the consumed productive capital P, its constant part being 372 pounds sterling, its variable part 50 pounds, and their sum 422 pounds, equaling 8,440 pounds of yarn. The value of productive capital P is equal to C, the value of its formative elements, which in the stage M to C confronted the capitalist as commodities in the hands of their sellers. Secondly, however, the value of the yarn contains a surplus value of 78 pounds, equal to 1,560 pounds of yarn. Thus, as the value expression of the 10,000 pounds of yarn, C is equal to C plus delta C, C plus an increment, 78 pounds, which we shall call small c, as it exists in the same commodity form as the original value now does. The value of 10,000 pounds of yarn, 500 pounds, is thus C plus small c equals C prime. What makes C, as the value expression of the 10,000 pounds of yarn into C prime, is not the absolute amount of its value, 500 pounds, for this is determined, like the value of expression of any other sum of commodities, by the amount of labor objectified in it. It is rather the relative magnitude of its value, its value compared with the value of the capital P consumed in production. The value contained in it is this value plus the surplus value provided by the productive capital. Its value is greater i.e. it exceeds the capital value P by the surplus value small c. The 10,000 pounds of yarn is the bearer of a capital value, which has been valorized, enriched with a surplus value, and this is because it is the product of the capitalist production process. C prime expresses a value ratio, the ratio of the value of the commodity product to that of the capital consumed in its production, i.e. it expresses the composition of its value out of capital value and surplus value. The 10,000 pounds of yarn are commodity capital, C prime, only as the transformed form of the productive capital P, thus in a relationship that exists at first only in the circuit of this individual capital, or for the capitalist who has produced yarn with his capital. It is, so to speak, only an internal relation, 
not an external one that makes the 10,000 pounds of yarn, as bearer of value, into commodity capital. The yarn bears its capitalist birthmark not in the absolute magnitude of its value, but in its relative magnitude, in the magnitude of its value compared with the value of the productive capital contained in it before it was transformed into commodities. If the 10,000 pounds of yarn is sold at its value of 500 pounds, this act of circulation, considered in itself, is C to M, the simple transformation of a value that remains the same from the commodity form into the money form. However, as a particular stage in the circuit of an individual capital, this same act is the realization of a capital value of 422 pounds plus a surplus value of 78 pounds, both borne by the commodity, i.e. C prime to M prime, the transformation of the capital value from its commodity form into the money form. The function of C prime is now that of every commodity product, to be transformed into money and sold, to pass through the phase of circulation C to M. As long as the now valorized capital persists in the form of commodity capital, is tied up on the market, the production process stands still. The capital operates neither to fashion products nor to form value. According to the varying speed with which the capital sheds its commodity form and assumes its money form, i.e. according to the briskness of the sale, the same capital value will serve to a very uneven degree in the formation of products and value, and the scale of the reproduction will expand or contract. It was shown in the first volume that the degree of effectiveness of a given capital is conditioned by forces in the production process that are, to a certain extent, independent of its own magnitude. Now we see that the circulation process sets in motion new forces independent of the magnitude of value, which affect the degree of effectiveness of the capital, its expansion, and its contraction. The mass of commodity C prime, as bearer of the valorized capital, must fully undergo the metamorphosis C prime to M prime. The quantity sold is here the essential determinant. The individual commodity figures only as an integral part of the total quantity. The value of 500 pounds sterling exists in 10,000 pounds of yarn. If the capitalist succeeds in selling only 7,440 pounds, at its value of 372 pounds sterling, then he has only replaced the value of his constant capital, the value of the means of production consumed. If he sells 8,440 pounds, then he still replaces only the value of the total capital advanced. He must sell more if he is to realize surplus value, and he must sell the entire 10,000 pounds of yarn if he is to realize the whole surplus value of 78 pounds sterling, equal to 1,560 pounds of yarn. He receives in the 500 pounds only an equal value for the commodity sold. His transaction within the circulation sphere is simply C to M. If he had paid his workers 64 pounds instead of 50 pounds, then his surplus value would be only 64 pounds instead of 78 pounds, and the rate of exploitation only 100% instead of 156%. But the value of his yarn would be unchanged. Only the ratio of its various component portions would be different. The Circulation Act M to C would still be the sale of 10,000 pounds of yarn for 500 pounds sterling, its value. C prime is equal to C plus small c that is 422 pounds plus 78 pounds. C is equal in value to P, or the productive capital, and this is also equal in value to the M advanced in M to C, the purchase of the elements of production. In our example, 422 pounds. If the mass of commodities is sold at its value, then C is equal to 422 pounds, and small c is equal to 78 pounds, the value of the surplus product of 1,560 pounds of yarn. If we call small c, expressed in monetary terms, small m, then we have c prime to m prime, or c plus small c to m plus small m. And the circuit m to c to p to c prime to m prime in its expanded form is thus m to c factoring into ln mp to p to c plus small c to m plus small m. In the first stage, the capitalist withdraws articles of use, both from the commodity market proper and from the labor market. In the third stage, he puts commodities back, though only into one market, the commodity market proper. But if he withdraws more value from the market by way of his commodities than he originally put into it, this is only because he puts in a greater value of commodities than he originally withdrew. He puts in the value M and withdraws the same value C. He puts in C plus small c and withdraws the same value M plus small m. In our example, M was equal in value to 8,440 pounds of yarn. The capitalist, however, puts 10,000 pounds of yarn into the market, i.e. gives back a greater value than he took from it. On the other hand, he has only to put in this increased value because he produced surplus value, as an aliquot part of the product expressed in surplus product in the production process, by the exploitation of labor power. 
It is only as the product of this process that the mass of commodities is commodity capital, the bearer of the valorized capital value. By accomplishing C' prime to M', prime, the capital value advanced is realized together with the surplus value. The two are realized together in the sale, either by stages or at one stroke, of the total mass of commodities, expressed as C' prime to M'. Prime. However, the same circulation process, C' prime to M' prime, differs for the capital value and for the surplus value insofar as it expresses, in each case, a different stage of their circulation, a different section in the series of metamorphoses that they have to pass through within the circulation sphere. The surplus value, small c, first came into the world within the production process. It is thus now entering the commodity market for the first time, and moreover in the commodity form. This is its first form of circulation, and hence the act small c to small m is its first act of circulation, or its first metamorphosis, which thus still has to be supplemented by the opposite circulation act, the converse metamorphosis, small m to small c. It is a different matter with the circulation accomplished by the capital value C in the same circulation act as C' prime to M', prime, which for it is the circulation act C to M, where C is equal to P, equal to the originally advanced M. This started its first act of circulation as M, money capital, and it now returns to the same form via the act C to M. It is thus passed through the two opposing phases of circulation, 1, M to C, and 2, C to M, and exists once again in the form in which it can begin the same cyclical process afresh. The transformation from the commodity form to the money form, which is for the surplus value its first transformation, is for the capital value its return, or transformation back into its original money form. The money capital was converted into a sum of commodities of equal value, L and MP, by way of M to C factoring in to L and MP. These commodities now no longer function as commodities, as articles for sale. Their value now exists in the hands of their buyer, the capitalist, as the value of his productive capital P. And in the function of P, productive consumption, they are transformed into a kind of commodity materially different from the means of production, into yarn, with the value not only being maintained but increased from 422 pounds to 500 pounds. Through this real metamorphosis, the commodities withdrawn from the market in the first stage M to C are replaced by materially different commodities of different value, which must now function as commodities, be transformed into money, and sold. Hence the production process appears simply as an interruption in the circulation of capital value, which up till then has only passed through the first phase M to C. It passes through the second and final phase, C to M, with C altered both materially and in value. But as far as the capital value taken by itself is concerned, all it has undergone in the production process is a change in its use form. It existed as 422 pounds of value in L and MP, and it now exists as 422 pounds, the value of 8,440 pounds of yarn. Thus, if we simply consider the two phases of the circulation process of the capital value separately from its surplus value, it passes through 1 M to C and 2 C to M, where the second C has a changed form but the same value as the first C. We thus have MCM, a form of circulation which, by way of a twofold displacement in opposite directions, the transformation of money into commodities and commodities into money, necessarily determines the return of the value advanced as money to its money form, its transformation back into money. The same act of circulation C' prime to M', prime, which is the second and concluding metamorphosis for the capital value advanced in money, its return to the money form, is for the surplus value that is simultaneously borne along by the commodity capital and realized together with it when it is converted into the money form, its first metamorphosis, the transformation from the commodity form into the money form, C to M, the first phase of circulation. Two things should be noted here. Firstly, the ultimate transformation of capital value back into its original money form is a function of commodity capital. Secondly, this function includes the first formal transformation of the surplus value from its original commodity form into the money form. The money form plays a double role here. On the one hand, it is the returning form of a value originally advanced in money, i.e. the money returns to the form of value that opened the process. On the other hand, it is the first transformed form of a value that originally enters into circulation in the commodity form. If the commodities of which the commodity capital consists are sold at their value, as we assume here, then C plus small c is transformed into M plus small m with the same value. It is in this last form, M plus small m, that is 422 pounds plus 78 pounds equaling 500 pounds, that the realized commodity capital now exists in the hands of the capitalist. Capital value and surplus value now exist as money, i.e. in the form of the universal equivalent. At the end of the process, the capital value is thus once again in the same form in which it entered it, 
and can therefore open the process afresh and pass through it as money capital. And indeed, because the initial and concluding form of the process is that of money capital, M, we call this form of the circuit the circuit of money capital. It is not the form of the value advanced, but only its magnitude that is changed at the end. M plus small m is nothing more than a sum of money of a certain magnitude, in our case 500 pounds. But as the result of the circuit of capital, as realized commodity capital, this sum of money contains the capital value and surplus value. Moreover, these are no longer inextricably entwined, as in the yarn, they are now simply juxtaposed. Their realization has given each of the two an independent money form. 211 250ths of the money is the capital value, 422 pounds, and 39 250ths is the surplus value of 78 pounds. This separation, effected by the realization of the commodity capital, does not only have the formal content we shall speak of in a moment. It is important in the reproduction process of capital, according to whether small m is added to m in its entirety, in part or not at all, thus according to whether or not it continues to function as a component of the capital value advanced. M and small m can even pass through quite different circulations. In M prime, the capital returns once more to its original form, M, its money form, but in a form in which it has been realized as capital. Firstly, there is a quantitative difference. It was M, 422 pounds. It is now M prime, 500 pounds, and this difference is expressed in M to M prime. The quantitatively different extremities of the circuit, the actual movement of which is indicated simply by the dots. M prime is greater than M. M prime minus M is equal to small s, the surplus value. But all that exists as the result of the cycle M to M prime is M prime. The process of formation has been obliterated in the product. M prime now exists independently in its own right. It is independent of the movement that produced it. The movement is past and M prime is there in its place. But as M plus small m, 422 pounds advance capital plus an increment of 78 pounds on the same, M prime, or 500 pounds, also exhibits a qualitative relation, although this qualitative relation itself exists only as a relation between the parts of a corresponding sum, i.e. as a quantitative ratio. M, the capital advanced, which is once again present in its original form, 422 pounds, exists now as realized capital. It has not only maintained itself, but it has also realized itself as capital, insofar as it has differentiated itself from small m, 78 pounds, which is related to it as its increase, its fruit, an increment that it itself has bred. It is realized as capital because it is value that is bred value. M prime exists as a capital relation. M no longer appears as mere money, but is expressly postulated as money capital, expressed as value that has valorized itself, i.e. thus also possesses the property of valorizing itself, of breeding more value than it itself has. M is posited as capital by its relation to another part of M prime, as to something posited by itself, as to the effect of which it is the cause, as to the consequences of which it is the ground. M prime thus appears as a sum of values which is internally differentiated, undergoes a functional conceptual self-differentiation, and expresses the capital relation. But this is expressed simply as a result, without the mediation of the process whose result it is. Portions of value are not qualitatively distinguished from each other as such, save insofar as they appear as the values of different articles, concrete things, thus in different useful forms, as values of different bodies of commodities, a distinction that does not arise from their existence as mere portions of value. In money, every difference between commodities is obliterated, because money is precisely the equivalent form common to all of them. A sum of money of 500 pounds consists of nothing but isomorphous elements of one pound, since the mediating effect of its history is obliterated in the simple existence of this sum of money, and every trace of the specific difference which the various component parts of capital possess in the production process has vanished, the only remaining distinction is the crude, non-conceptual distinction between a principle, as it is called in English, i.e. the capital of 422 pounds which was advanced, and an additional sum, a value of 78 pounds. Let M prime be 110 pounds of which 100 pounds is M, the principal, and 10 pounds is S, surplus value. There is absolute homogeneity, a complete absence of conceptual distinction between the two constituent parts of the sum of 110 pounds. Any 10 pounds is always 1 eleventh of the total sum of 110 pounds, whether it is a tenth of the principal advanced or the additional 10 pounds over and above this. Principal and increment, capital and surplus, can therefore both be expressed as fractions of the total sum. In our example, 10 elevenths is the principal, or capital, and 1 eleventh the surplus. 
At the conclusion of its process, the realized capital therefore appears as a sum of money, within which the distinction between principal and surplus expresses, in naive non-conceptual manner, the capital relation. This is also true, moreover, for C prime, equaling C plus small c, but with the difference that C prime, in which C and small c are simply proportional value portions of the same homogeneous mass of commodities, indicates its origin in P, whose direct product it is, whereas in M prime, a form arising directly from the circulation sphere, the direct connection with P has vanished. The superficial distinction between principle and increment that is contained in M prime, insofar as this expresses the result of the movement M to M prime, vanishes immediately, as soon as M prime functions actively once more as money capital, rather than being fixed as the money expression of the valorized industrial capital. The circuit of money capital can never begin with M prime but only with M, even though it is M prime that now functions as M i.e., never as an expression of the capital relation, but only as the form in which the capital value is advanced. As soon as the 500 pounds is advanced afresh as capital, in order to be valorized once more, it is the starting point rather than the point of return. Instead of a capital of 422 pounds, one of 500 pounds has now been advanced. More money than before, more capital value, but the relation between the two components has gone. The sum of 500 pounds now functions as capital rather than 422 pounds, just as, originally, a sum of 500 pounds might have functioned rather than a sum of 422 pounds. It is not the active function of money capital to present itself as M prime. Its own presentation as M prime is rather a function of C prime. Already in simple commodity circulation, C1 to M and M to C2, M functions actively only in the second act M to C. Its presentation as M is only the result of the first act, by virtue of which it first appears as the transformed form of C1. The capital relation contained in M', prime, the connection between one of its parts as a part of capital value and the other as the value increment to this, does receive a functional significance, however, insofar as M' prime divides into two circulations, the circulation of capital and the circulation of surplus value, when the circuit M to M' prime is constantly repeated. The two parts M and small m then fulfill functions that differ not just quantitatively but also qualitatively. Considered in itself, however, the form M to M' prime does not include the consumption of the capitalist, but expressly only capital's self-valorization and accumulation, insofar as the latter is first expressed in the periodic growth of the money capital that is constantly advanced afresh. Although it is a crude and conceptually undifferentiated form of capital, M prime equaling M plus small m is at the same time money capital in its first realized form, money that has bred money. This must be distinguished from the function of money capital in the first stage, M to C factoring into L and MP. In this first stage, M circulates as money. It functions as money capital simply because it is only in its monetary state that it performs a monetary function and can be converted into the elements of P that face it as commodities, L and MP. In this act of circulation, it functions only as money, but because this act is the first stage of the capital value in process, it is simultaneously a function of money capital, by virtue of the specific useful form of the commodities L and MP that are bought. M prime, on the other hand, composed of M, the capital value, and small m, the surplus value created by it, expresses valorized capital value, the purpose and the result, the function of the total process of the circuit of capital. If it expresses this result in money form, as realized money capital, this is not because it is the money form of capital, money capital, but rather the reverse, that it is money capital, capital in the money form, and that it was in this form that capital opened the process, was advanced in its money form. The transformation back into the money form is a function of the commodity capital C prime, as we saw, not of money capital. And as far as the difference small m between m prime and m is concerned, this is only the money form of small c the increment to C. M prime is only equal to M plus small m because C prime equals C plus small c. In C prime, therefore, this difference and the relation between the capital value and the surplus value bred by it is present and is expressed before they are both transformed into M prime, into a sum of money in which the two portions of value confront each other from a position of independence and can therefore also be applied to independent and different functions. M prime is only the result of the realization of C prime, both of these, C prime as well as M prime, are only different forms, the commodity form and the money form, of the valorized capital value. Both have it in common that they are valorized capital value. Both are realized capital, because here capital value exists as such together with surplus value as the fruit that is separate from it but produced by it, 
although this relation is expressed only in the naive form of the ratio between the two parts of a sum of money or a commodity value. As expressions of capital, however, both related to and distinct from the surplus value created by it, i.e. as expressions of valorized value, M prime and C prime are the same and express the same thing, only in different forms. They are not distinguished from each other as money capital and commodity capital, but rather as money and commodity. Insofar as they represent valorized value, capital active as capital, they simply express the result of the function of productive capital, the only function in which capital value breeds value. What they have in common is that both of them, money capital and commodity capital, are modes of existence of capital. The one is capital in its money form, the other in its commodity form. The specific functions that distinguish them can thus be nothing other than distinctions between the money function and the commodity function. The commodity capital, as the direct producer of the capitalist production process, recalls its origin and is therefore more rational in its form, less lacking in conceptual differentiation than money capital, in which every trace of this process has been effaced, just as all the particular useful forms of commodities are generally effaced in money. Hence it is only when M' prime itself functions as commodity capital, when it is the direct product of a production process and not the transformed form of this product, that its bizarre form disappears i.e. in the production of the money material itself. The formula for the production of gold, for example, would be M to C, factoring into L and MP, to P, to M prime, M plus small m, where M prime figures as the commodity product insofar as P provides more gold than was advanced for the elements of production of gold in the first M, the money capital. The expression M to M prime, M plus small m, is irrational, in that within it, part of a sum of money appears as the mother of another part of the same sum of money, but here this irrationality disappears. Section 4. The Circuit as a Whole We have seen how the circulation process, after its first phase, M to C, factoring into L and MP has elapsed, is interrupted by P, in which the commodities bought on the market, L and MP, are consumed as material and value components of the productive capital. The product of this consumption is a new commodity, M prime, altered both materially and in value. The interrupted circulation process, M to C, must be supplemented by C to M. But it is C prime that appears as the bearer of this second and concluding phase, a commodity different materially and in value from the original C. The circulation series thus presents itself as 1, M to C1, and 2, C prime 2 to M prime, in which the first commodity C has been replaced in the second phase by one of a higher value and a different useful form, C prime 2, during the interruption that is occasioned by the function of P, i.e. the production of C prime from the elements of C, the forms of existence of the productive capital P. The first form of appearance in which we met with capital, on the other hand, see volume 1, chapter 4, M to C to M prime, broken down into 1, M to C1, and 2, C1 to M prime, exhibits the same commodity twice over. It is the same commodity into which money is transformed in the first phase and which is transformed back into more money in the second phase. Despite this essential difference, both circulations have in common that in their first phase, money is transformed into commodities, and in their second phase, commodities into money, that the money that is spent in the first phase flows back again in the second. On the one hand, they have in common this stream of money back to its starting point. On the other hand, the excess of money that flows back over that advanced. In this respect, M to C, to C prime to M prime, too appears to be contained in the general formula M to C to M prime. It further results here that in both metamorphoses pertaining to the circulation sphere, M to C and C prime to M prime, equally large and simultaneously present values always confront and replace each other. The change in value belongs solely to the metamorphosis P, the production process, which thus appears as the real metamorphosis of capital, as opposed to the merely formal metamorphoses of the circulation sphere. Let us now consider the total movement, M to C to P to C prime to M prime, or its expanded form, M to C factoring into L and MP, to P, to C prime composed of C plus small c, to M prime composed of M plus small m. Here capital appears as a value that passes through a sequence of connected and mutually determined transformations, a series of metamorphoses that form so many phases or stages of a total process. Two of these phases belong to the circulation sphere, one to the sphere of production. In each of these phases the capital value is to be found in a different form, corresponding to a different and special function. Within this movement, the value advance not only maintains itself, but it grows, increases its magnitude. Finally, in the concluding stage, it returns to the same form in which it appeared at the outset of the total process. 
This total process is therefore a circuit. The two forms that the capital value assumes within its circulation stages are those of money capital and commodity capital. The form pertaining to the production stage is that of productive capital. The capital that assumes these forms in the course of its total circuit, discards them again and fulfills in each of them its appropriate function, is industrial capital. Industrial here in the sense that it encompasses every branch of production that is pursued on a capitalist basis. Money capital, commodity capital, and productive capital thus do not denote independent varieties of capital, whose functions constitute the content of branches of business that are independent and separate from one another. They are simply particular functional forms of industrial capital, which takes on all three forms in turn. The circuit of capital proceeds normally only as long as its various phases pass into each other without delay. If capital comes to a standstill in the first phase, M to C, money capital forms into a hoard. If this happens in the production phase, the means of production cease to function, and labor power remains unoccupied. If in the last phase, C prime to M prime, unsaleable stocks of commodities obstruct the flow of circulation. It lies in the nature of the case, however, that the circuit itself determines that capital is tied up for certain intervals in the particular sections of the cycle. In each of its phases, industrial capital is tied to a specific form, as money capital, productive capital, or commodity capital. Only after it has fulfilled the function corresponding to the particular form it is in does it receive the form in which it can enter a new phase of transformation. In order to make this clear, we have assumed in our example that the capital value of the mass of commodities created in the production stage is equal to the total value originally advanced as money. In other words, that the whole capital value advanced as money moves all at once, from one stage into the subsequent one. We have already seen, however, see Volume 1, Chapter 8, that a part of the constant capital, the actual instruments of labor, for example machines, serve continuously throughout a greater or smaller number of repetitions of the same production process, and for this reason, give up their value to the product only bit by bit. We will show later on how far this circumstance modifies the circuit of capital. The following will suffice for the time being. In our example, the value of the productive capital, 422 pounds, contained only the average calculated wear and tear of factory buildings, machinery, etc., thus only the portion of value that they carry over in the course of transforming 10,000 pounds of raw cotton into 10,000 pounds of yarn, the product of a weekly spinning process of 60 hours. The instruments of labor, buildings, machinery, etc., therefore figured in the means of production into which the constant capital advanced was transformed as if they were simply hired on the market in return for a weekly payment. This, however, alters absolutely nothing as far as the substance of the matter is concerned. We need only multiply the weekly output of yarn, 10,000 pounds, by the number of weeks contained in a given series of years, and the entire value of the instruments of labor bought and used up in this period will have been carried over. It is clear, then, that the money capital advanced must first be transformed into these means of production, and must therefore have made its exit from the first phase M to C before it can function as productive capital P. It is just as clear in our example that the capital value of 422 pounds, which is incorporated into the yarn during the production process, cannot enter into the circulation phase C' prime to M' prime as a component of the 10,000 pounds of yarn before the process is finished. The yarn cannot be sold until it has been spun. In the general formula, the product of P is considered as a material thing different from the elements of the productive capital, an object that has an existence of its own apart from the production process, possessing a useful form different from that of the elements of production. Insofar as the result of the production process does appear as a thing, this is always the case. Even when a part of the product enters once more as an element into the renewed production process. Thus grain serves as seed corn for its own production, but the product consists only of grain and thus has a different physical shape from the elements applied together with it, labor power, instruments of labor, fertilizer. There are, however, particular branches of industry in which the product of the production process is not a new objective product, a commodity. The only one of these that is economically important is the communication industry, both the transport industry proper, for moving commodities and people, and the transmission of mere information, letters, telegrams, etc. A. Chuprov says on this point, quote, the manufacturer can produce articles first and look for customers afterwards. His product, after it is ejected in finished form from the production process, passes into circulation as a commodity separate from this process. Production and consumption thus appear as two acts separated in time and space. In the transport industry, however, which does not create new products but only displaces people and things, these two acts coincide. The services, the change of place, are necessarily consumed the moment they are produced. 
This is why the area within which railways can seek their customers is at most 53 kilometers on either side. End quote. The result in each case, whether it is people or commodities that are transported, is a change in their spatial location. For example, that the yarn finds itself in India instead of in England, where it was produced. But what the transport industry sells is the actual change of place itself. The useful effect produced is inseparably connected with the transport process, i.e. the production process specific to the transport industry. People and commodities travel together with the means of transport, and this journeying, the spatial movement of the means of transport, is precisely the production process accomplished by the transport industry. The useful effect can only be consumed during the production process. It does not exist as a thing of use distinct from this process, a thing which functions as an article of commerce and circulates as a commodity only after its production. However, the exchange value of this useful effect is still determined, like that of any other commodity, by the value of the elements of production used up in it, labor power and means of production, plus the surplus value created by the surplus labor of the workers occupied in the transport industry. In respect of its consumption, too, this useful effect behaves just like other commodities. If it is consumed individually, then its value vanishes with its consumption. If it is consumed productively, so that it is itself a stage of production of the commodity that finds itself transported, then its value is carried over to the commodity as an addition to it. The formula for the transport industry is thus M to C, factoring into L and MP, to P to M prime, for it is the production process itself, and not a product separable from it, that is paid for and consumed. This, therefore, has almost exactly the same form as that for the production of precious metals, except that M' prime is here the transformed form of the useful effect produced in the course of the production process, and not the natural form of the gold and silver that is produced during this process and ejected from it. Industrial capital is the only mode of existence of capital in which not only the appropriation of surplus value or surplus product, but also its creation is a function of capital. It thus requires production to be capitalist in character. Its existence includes that of the class antagonism between capitalists and wage laborers. To the degree that it takes hold of production, the technique and social organization of the labor process are revolutionized, and the economic historical type of society along with this. The other varieties of capital which appeared previously, within past or declining conditions of social production, are not only subordinated to it and correspondingly altered in the mechanism of their functioning, but they now move only on its basis, thus live and die, stand and fall together with this basis. Money capital and commodity capital, insofar as they appear and function as bearers of their own peculiar branches of business alongside industrial capital, are now only modes of existence of the various functional forms that industrial capital constantly assumes and discards within the circulation sphere, forms which have been rendered independent and one-sidedly extended through the division of social labor. On the one hand, the circuit M to M prime is inextricably linked with the general circulation of commodities, issues from it and flows back into it, forming a part of it. On the other hand, it forms for the individual capitalist an independent movement peculiar to his capital value, a movement which proceeds in part within the general circulation of commodities, in part outside it, but which always retains its independent character. It does so firstly because both of the phases that it goes through in the circulation sphere, M to C and C to M, possess a functionally specific character as phases of the movement of capital. In M to C, C is determined in its material content as labor power and means of production, in C prime to M prime, the capital value is realized together with the surplus value. In the second place, P, the production process, includes productive consumption. Thirdly, the return of money to its starting point makes the movement M to M prime, a cyclical movement complete in itself. On the one hand, therefore, each individual capital, in the two halves of its circulation M to C and C prime to M prime, is an agent of the general circulation of commodities, in which it functions and of which it forms a link, either as money or as commodity. Hence it is a member of the general series of metamorphoses of the commodity world. On the other hand, it describes its own independent circuit within the general circulation, one in which the sphere of production forms a transitional stage, and in which it returns to its starting point in the same form in which it left it. Within its own circuit, which includes its real metamorphosis in the production process, the magnitude of its value also changes. It returns not only as money value, but as increased and expanded money value. If we finally consider M to C to P to C prime to M prime as a special form of the circuit of capital, alongside the other forms that will be investigated later on, it is marked by the following features. 1. It appears as this circuit of money capital, because industrial capital in its money form as money capital forms the starting point and the point of return of the whole process. 
The formula itself expresses that the money is not spent here as money, but is only advanced, and is thus simply the money form of capital, money capital. It further expresses the fact that it is the exchange value, not the use value, that is the decisive inherent purpose of the movement. It is precisely because the money form of value is its independent and palpable form of appearance that the circulation form M to M prime, which starts and finishes with actual money, expresses money-making, the driving motive of capitalist production most palpably. The production process appears simply as an unavoidable middle term, a necessary evil for the purpose of money-making. This explains why all nations characterized by the capitalist mode of production are periodically seized by fits of giddiness, in which they try to accomplish the money-making without the mediation of the production process. 2. In this circuit, the stage of production, the function of P forms an interruption in the circulation process M to C to C prime to M prime, whose two phases are in turn only a mediation of simple circulation M to C to M prime. The production process here appears formally and explicitly in the actual form of the circuit itself, for what it actually is in the capitalist mode of production, a mere means for the valorization of the value advanced, i.e. enrichment as such appears as the inherent purpose of production. 3. Because the sequence of phases is opened by M to C, C prime to M prime is the second term in the circulation. The starting point is M, the money capital to be valorized, the conclusion M prime, the valorized money capital M plus small m, in which M figures alongside its offshoot small m as realized capital. This distinguishes the circuit of money capital from the two other circuits P and C prime, and in two ways. On the one hand, through the money form of the two extremes, money is the independent and palpable form of existence of value, the value of the product and its independent value form in which all trace of the commodity's use value has been effaced. On the other hand, the form P to P does not necessarily become P to P prime, that is P plus small p, while in the form C prime to C prime, no value difference at all is visible between the two extremes. It is thus characteristic of the formula M to M prime on the one hand that the capital value forms the starting point and the valorized capital the point of return, so that the advancing of the capital value appears as the means, the valorized capital value as the goal of the whole operation. On the other hand, that this relation is expressed in the money form, the independent value form, hence money capital as money breeding money. The creation by value of surplus value is not only expressed as the alpha and omega of the process, but explicitly presented in the glittering money form. 4. Since M prime, the money capital realized as the result of C prime to M prime, the complementary and concluding phase of M to C exists in absolutely the same form as that in which it opened its first circuit, it can, as it emerges from this, reopen the same circuit as augmented, accumulated money capital. M prime equaling M plus small m. At least it is in no way expressed in the form of M to M prime that the circulation of small m separates itself from that of M when the circuit is repeated. Considered by itself in isolation, from the formal standpoint, the circuit of money capital thus expresses only the process of valorization and accumulation. Consumption, therefore, is expressed in it only as productive consumption, M to C factoring into L and MP. This is all that is accounted for in this circuit of the individual capital. M to L is L to M or C to M from the point of view of the worker, i.e. the first phase of the circulation that mediates his individual consumption, L to M to C, C being the means of subsistence. The second phase, M to C, no longer falls within the circuit of the individual capital, but it is introduced by it and presupposed by it, for the worker, in order to continue to exist on the market as exploitable material for the capitalist, must before all else keep alive, and therefore maintain himself by individual consumption. This consumption itself, however, is assumed here only as a precondition for the productive consumption of labor power by capital, thus only insofar as the worker maintains and reproduces himself as labor power by his individual consumption. The means of production, MP, however, the actual commodities that are involved in the circuit, are simply the means of nourishment for productive consumption. The act L to M mediates the individual consumption of the worker, the transformation of means of subsistence into his flesh and blood. But the capitalist must also exist, thus also live and consume, in order to function as a capitalist. In actual fact, he needs to consume only as a worker, and hence no more than this is assumed in the form of the circulation process, but even this is not expressed formally, since the formula closes with M prime, i.e. a result that can function again immediately as increased money capital. C prime to M prime directly contains the sale of C prime. 
but C prime to M prime, which is from one side a sale, is M to C, a purchase from the other side, and in the last instance commodities are bought only for the sake of their use value. We ignore intermediate transactions here. In order to enter the process of consumption, either individual or productive, according to the nature of the article bought. This consumption, however, does not enter into the circuit of the individual capital of which C prime is the product. The product C prime is precisely ejected from the circuit as a commodity to be sold. It is expressly destined for the consumption of others. We therefore find among the exponents of the mercantile system, which is based on the formula M to C to P to C prime to M prime, long sermons to the effect that the individual capitalist should consume only in his capacity as a worker, and that a capitalist nation should leave the consumption of its commodities and the consumption process in general to other, more stupid nations, while making productive consumption into its own life's work. These sermons are often reminiscent in both form and content of analogous ascetic exhortations by the fathers of the Church. The circuit of capital is thus a unified process of circulation and production. It includes both. Insofar as the two phases M to C and C prime to M prime are processes of circulation, the circulation of capital forms part of the general circulation of commodities. But by taking part in functionally determined sections or stages in the circuit of capital, which do not just pertain to the sphere of circulation, but also to that of production, capital performs its own circuit within the general circulation of commodities. This general circulation enables it, in the first stage, to assume the form in which it can function as productive capital. In the second stage, to cast off the commodity function in which it cannot renew its circuit. It equally gives it the possibility of separating its own capital circuit from the circulation of the surplus value that is adhered to it. The circuit of money capital is thus the most one-sided, hence most striking and characteristic form of appearance of the circuit of industrial capital, in which its aim and driving motive, the valorization of value, money-making, and accumulation, appears in a form that leaps to the eye, buying in order to sell dearer. The fact that the first phase is M to C displays the providence of the components of productive capital and the commodity market. It also shows that the capitalist production process is conditioned by circulation, trade. The circuit of money capital is not just commodity production. It only comes into being by way of circulation and presupposes this. This is already shown by the fact that the form M, pertaining to circulation, appears as the first and pure form of the capital value advanced, which is not the case with the two other forms of the circuit. The circuit of money capital remains the permanent general expression of industrial capital, insofar as it always includes the valorization of the value advanced. In P to P, the money expression of the capital emerges only as the price of the elements of production, thus only as the value expressed in money of account, the form in which it is found in bookkeeping. M to M prime becomes a particular form of the circuit of industrial capital insofar as newly appearing capital is first advanced as money and is withdrawn in the same form whether on its transfer from one branch to business to another, or when industrial capital is withdrawn from business altogether. This includes the capital function of the surplus value first advanced in the money form, and emerges most strikingly when this functions in a business other than that from which it originates. M to M prime can be the first circuit of a capital. It can be its last. It can be taken as the form of the total social capital. It is the form of capital that is newly invested whether as newly accumulated capital in the money form or old capital that is completely transformed into money in order to be transferred from one branch of production to another. As a form that is comprised in all circuits, money capital performs this circuit precisely for that part of the capital that creates surplus value, the variable capital. The normal form of advance for wages is payment in money. This process must be steadily repeated at short intervals, as the worker lives from hand to mouth. Hence the worker must constantly come face to face with the capitalist as money capitalist and with his capital as money capital. Here there can be no question, as in the purchase of the means of production and the sale of productive commodities, of a direct or indirect balancing of accounts, so that the greater part of money capital actually figures only in the form of commodities, money only in the form of money of account, and finally cash only for the settlement of the balances. On the other hand, a part of the surplus value arising from the variable capital is spent by the capitalist for his personal consumption. This pertains to the retail trade and, after however roundabout a journey, is ultimately spent as cash in the money form of the surplus value. Whether this part of the surplus value is great or small in no way affects the matter. The variable capital constantly appears anew as money capital inverted in wages, M to L, and small m as surplus value that is spent to defray the personal needs of the capitalist. Thus both m, as the variable capital value advanced, and small m, as its increment, are necessarily retained in the money form, to be spent as such. 
The formula m to c to p to c prime to m prime, with the result m prime equaling m plus small m, contains in its form a certain deception. It bears an illusory character that derives from the existence of the advanced and valorized value in its equivalent form, in money. What is emphasized is not the valorization of the value, but the money form of this process, the fact that more in the money form is finally withdrawn from the circulation sphere than was originally advanced to it, i.e. the increase in the mass of gold and silver belonging to the capitalist. The so-called monetary system is simply the expression of the superficial form M to C to M prime, a movement that proceeds exclusively in the circulation sphere and hence can only explain the two acts, one M to C and two C to M prime, by saying that C in the second act is sold above its value and therefore withdraws more money from the circulation sphere than was cast into it by its purchase. On the other hand, however, M to C to P to C prime to M prime, when regarded as the exclusive form, is the basis for the more developed mercantile system, in which it is not simply the circulation of commodities but also their production that appears as a necessary element. The illusory character of M to C to P to C prime to M prime, and the corresponding illusory significance it is given, is there as soon as this form is regarded as the sole form, not as the one that flows and is constantly repeated i.e. as soon as it is taken not just as one of the forms of the circuit, but rather as its exclusive form. In itself, however, it refers to other forms. Firstly, this whole circuit presupposes the capitalist character of the production process, and hence this production process itself as a basis as well as the specific social relations determined by it. M to C is equal to M to C factoring into L and MP. But M to L implies that the wage laborer, and therefore the means of production too, are a part of the productive capital, hence the labor and valorization process. The production process is already a function of capital. Secondly, if M to M prime is repeated, the return to the money form appears just as evanescent as the money form in its first stage. M to C vanishes in order to make way for P. The permanently repeated advance in money, as well as its permanent return in money, themselves appear simply as evanescent moments in the circuit. Thirdly, the circuit loops as M to C to P to C prime to M prime, followed by M to C to P to C prime to M prime, followed by M to C to P, etc. With the second repetition of the circuit, we already have the circuit P to C prime to M prime, followed by M to C to P, before the second circuit of M is even complete, and thus all further circuits can be considered in the form P to C prime to M to C to P. M to C, therefore, as the first phase of the first circuit, simply forms an evanescent prelude to the constantly repeated circuit of productive capital, as is in fact the case when industrial capital is invested for the first time in the form of money capital. Furthermore, before the second circuit is complete, the first circuit, C prime to M prime, followed by M to C to P to C prime, abbreviated C prime to C prime, has been described, the circuit of commodity capital. Thus the first form already contains the two others, and the money form vanishes insofar as it is not just an expression of value, but an expression of value in the equivalent form in money. Finally, if we take a newly appearing individual capital, which describes the circuit M to C to P to C prime to M prime for the first time, then M to C is a preparatory phase, the precursor of the first production process performed by this individual capital. This phase, M to C, is therefore not the presupposition, but is rather posited or conditioned by the production process. However, this holds only for this individual capital. The general form of the circuit of industrial capital is the circuit of money capital, insofar as the capitalist mode of production is presupposed, i.e. within a specific state of society determined by capitalist production. Hence, the capitalist production process is the basic precondition. It is prior to all else, if not within the first circuit of the money capital of a newly invested industrial capital, then outside it. The continued existence of this production process assumes the constantly repeated circuit of P to P. This assumption is already made within the first stage M to C factoring into L and MP, insofar as this stage presupposes, on the one hand, the existence of a class of wage laborers, and on the other hand, what is the first stage M to C for the purchaser of the means of production and C prime to M prime for their seller. It presupposes, therefore, that C prime is commodity capital, and therefore that the commodity itself is the result of capitalist production. With this, we must also presuppose the function of productive capital.
Chapter 2. The Circuit of Productive Capital The circuit of productive capital has the general formula P to C' prime to M' prime to C to P. It signifies the periodically repeated function of the productive capital, i.e. reproduction. In other words, it signifies that its production process is a reproduction process in respect to valorization. Not only does production occur, but also the periodic reproduction of surplus value. It signifies that the function of the industrial capital that exists in its productive form does not take place once and for all, but is periodically repeated, so that the new beginning is given by the point of departure itself. A part of C' prime, in certain cases in the investment branches of industrial capital, may directly re-enter, as means of production, the same labor process from which it emerged as a commodity. All this does is circumvent the need to transform its value into real money, or money tokens. In other words, the only independent expression it receives is as money of account. This part of the value does not enter the circulation process. The same holds for the part of C' prime that the capitalist consumes in kind, as part of the surplus product. This is, however, insignificant for capitalist production. At most, it comes into consideration in agriculture. Two things about this form immediately catch the eye. Firstly, while in the first form, M to M', prime, the production process, the function of P interrupts the circulation of money capital and appears only as a mediator between its two phases M to C and C' prime to M'. Prime. Here, the entire circulation process of industrial capital, its whole movement within the circulation phase, merely forms an interruption, and hence a mediation, between the productive capital that opens the circuit as the first extreme and closes it in the same form as the last extreme, i.e., in the form of its new beginning. Circulation proper appears only as the mediator of the reproduction that is periodically repeated and made continuous through this repetition. Secondly, the entire circulation presents itself in the opposite form from that which it possessed in the circuit of money capital. There it was M C M, that is M to C and C to M, disregarding the value determination. Here again, disregarding the value determination, it is C M C, that is C to M and M to C, i.e. the form of simple commodity circulation. Section 1. Simple Reproduction Let us consider first all of the process C' prime to M' prime to C that runs its course between the extremes P to P in the sphere of circulation. The starting point of this circulation is the commodity capital, C' prime, which is equal to C plus small c, which is equal to P plus small c. The function of the commodity capital C' prime to M', prime, the realization of the capital value P contained in it, which now exists as a commodity component C, as well as of the surplus value it contains, which exists as a component of the same commodity mass with the value small c, was treated in the first form of the circuit. There, however, it formed the second phase of the interrupted circulation, and the concluding phase of the entire circuit. Here it forms the second phase of the circuit, but only the first phase of circulation. The first circuit ends with M', prime, and since M', prime, just as much as the original M, can reopen the second circuit as money capital, it was at first unnecessary to see whether the M and small m, surplus value, contained in M', prime, continue their paths together, or whether they describe different paths. This would only have been necessary if we had pursued the first circuit further in its repetition. But in the circuit of productive capital, this point must be decided, since the very definition of the first circuit depends on it, and because C' prime to M' prime appears in it as the first phase of circulation, which is to be supplemented by M to C. It depends on this decision whether the formula depicts simple reproduction or reproduction on an expanded scale. The character of the circuit is altered according to this decision. Let us therefore start by taking the simple reproduction of the productive capital, in which connection we assume, as in the first chapter, that other circumstances remain the same and that commodities are bought and sold at their values. On this assumption, the entire surplus value goes into the personal consumption of the capitalist. As soon as the commodity capital C' prime has been transformed into money, the part of the money that represents the capital value goes on circulating in the circuit of industrial capital. The other part, which is surplus value turned into gold, goes into the general circulation of commodities. It is money circulation proceeding from the capitalist, but it takes place outside the circulation of his individual capital. In our example, we had a commodity capital C' prime of 10,000 pounds of yarn to the value of 500 pounds sterling. 422 pounds of this was the value of the productive capital, and continues the capital circulation begun with C' prime as the money form of 8,440 pounds of yarn, while the surplus value of 78 pounds, the money form of 1,560 pounds of yarn, the excess portion of the commodity product makes its exit from this circulation and describes a separate path within the general circulation of commodities. That is C prime, which is composed of C plus small c, into M prime, which is composed of M plus small m, into C factoring into L and MP, and separately into small c. 
Small M to small C is a series of purchases made with the money that the capitalist spends, whether on commodities as such or on services, for his esteemed self and family. These purchases are fragmented and take place at different times. The money thus exists temporarily in the form of a money reserve or hoard destined for current consumption, since it is in the form of a hoard that any money whose circulation is interrupted exists. In its function as a means of circulation, which also includes its temporary form of a hoard, it does not enter into the circulation of the capital in its money form M. The money is not advanced, but spent. We have assumed that the total capital advanced is constantly passing from one of its phases to another, and that here, therefore, the commodity product of P carries the total value of the productive capital P, 422 pounds, plus the surplus value created during the production process, 78 pounds. In our example, where we are concerned with a discrete commodity product, the surplus value exists in the form of 1,560 pounds of yarn, just as it exists in 2.496 ounces in each pound of yarn. If, however, the commodity product was a machine worth 500 pounds, for example, and with the same value composition, then there would certainly still be a portion of the machine's value that equaled 78 pounds surplus value, but this 78 pounds would exist only in the total machine. This could not be divided into capital value and surplus value without being broken into pieces, and thus destroying its value together with its use value. The two value components could thus be depicted only ideally as components of the physical body of the commodity, not as independent elements of the commodity C prime, in the way that each pound of yarn can be depicted as a separate, independent commodity element of the 10,000 pounds. In the one case, the total commodity, or commodity capital, the machine, must be sold in its entirety before small m can embark on its own particular circulation. But if the capitalist sells 8,440 pounds of yarn, in the other case, then the sale of the remaining 1,560 pounds exhibits a completely separate circulation of the surplus value in the form small c, 1,560 pounds of yarn, to small m, 78 pounds sterling, to small c, articles of consumption. The value elements of each individual portion of the yarn product of 10,000 pounds, moreover, can be depicted as parts of the product just as much as the total product can. Just as the 10,000 pounds of yarn can be partitioned into constant capital value, small c, 7,440 pounds of yarn with a value of 372 pounds sterling, variable capital value, small v, 1,000 pounds of yarn with a value of 50 pounds sterling, and surplus value, small s, 1,560 pounds of yarn with a value of 78 pounds sterling, so each pound of yarn can be partitioned into small c, 11.9 ounces with a value of 8.3 pence, small v, 1.6 ounces with a value of 1.2 pence, and small s, 2.5 ounces of yarn with a value of 1.9 pence. The capitalist can therefore successively consume the elements of surplus value contained in the 10,000 pounds of yarn by its successive sale in successive portions, and also successively realize the sum of small c plus small v in this way. But this operation similarly presupposes that the entire 10,000 pounds of yarn is sold, and that the value of small c and small v is therefore replaced by the sale of 8,440 pounds. See Volume 1, Chapter 9, Section 2. However this might be, by way of c prime to m prime, both the capital value and the surplus value contained in C prime acquire a separable existence, the existence of different sums of money. Both M and small m are in each case actually the transformed form of the value that originally possessed its own expression merely as the price of the commodity, i.e. a merely ideal expression. Small c to small m to small c is simple commodity circulation, the first phase of which, small c to small m, is included in the circulation of the commodity capital C prime to m prime, and therefore in the circuit of capital. Its complementary phase, small m to small c, on the other hand, falls outside the circuit, as a separate process of general commodity circulation. The circulation of c and small c, capital value and surplus value, divides after the transformation of c prime into m prime. It follows from this, firstly, that when the commodity capital is realized by way of c prime to m prime, i.e. c prime to m plus small m, the movement of capital value and surplus value, which in c prime to m prime was still common to both, and was borne by the same mass of commodities becomes divisible, as the two now possess independent forms as sums of money. Secondly, if this division takes place, with small m being spent by the capitalist as revenue, while m continues the path prescribed for it by the circuit as the functional form of capital value, the first act c prime to m prime, together with the subsequent acts m to c and small m to small c, can be depicted as two different circulations, c to m to c and small c to small m to small c. Both of these, in their general form, are series that belong to the ordinary commodity circulation. Moreover, it happens in practice that where commodities are continuous in their physical composition, and hence indivisible, the value components are isolated ideally. 
In the London building trade, for example, which is conducted for the most part on credits, the contractor receives advances in various stages as the building of the house progresses. None of these stages is a house. Each of them is rather a really existing component of a future house that is coming into being. Despite its reality, it is thus only an ideal fraction of the whole house, but it is sufficiently real all the same to serve as security for an additional advance. For more on this subject, see chapter 12 below. Thirdly, if the common movement of capital value and surplus value in C and M only divides in part, so that a part of the surplus value is not spent as revenue, or not at all, then a change in capital value takes place within the circuit of the capital value itself, before the circuit is completed. In our example, the value of the productive capital was £422. If M to C continues as £480, for example, or £500, then it traverses the final stages of the circuit as a value £58 or £78 greater than it originally was. This can also occur in combination with the change in its value composition. C prime to M prime, the second stage of circulation, and the concluding stage of circuit 1, M to M prime, is the second stage of the present circuit and the first stage of commodity circulation in it. Insofar as circulation comes into consideration, it must thus be supplemented by M prime to C prime. However, M prime to C prime does not just have the process of valorization already behind it, in the case of the function P, the first stage, but its result, the commodity product C prime, has already been realized. The valorization of capital, as well as the realization of the commodity product in which the valorized capital is represented, thus ends with C prime to M prime. We've assumed simple reproduction, i.e. that small m to small c completely separates off from m to c. Since both circulations, small c to small m to small c, and c to m to c, belong in their general form to commodity circulation, and thus do not exhibit any difference in value between their extremes, it is quite easy to conceive the capitalist production process, as the vulgar economists do, as the simple production of commodities, use values destined for consumption of some kind or other which the capitalists produce only in order to replace them with commodities of a different use value, or to exchange them with these, as the vulgar economics incorrectly puts it. C prime appears from the start as commodity capital, and the aim of the entire process, enrichment, valorization, by no means excludes a growth in the capitalist consumption in line with the increase in the magnitude of surplus value. In fact, it absolutely includes it. In the circulation of the capitalist revenue, the commodity which has been produced, C, or the corresponding ideal fraction of the commodity product, C prime, serves in point of fact only to convert this revenue into money and from money into a series of other commodities for the purpose of private consumption. But in this connection, one should not overlook the little fact that small c is a commodity value which does not cost the capitalist anything. It is the embodiment of surplus labor, which originally stepped forth onto the stage as a component of the commodity capital C prime. This small c is thus itself already linked in its existence to the circuit of the capital value in process, and if this comes to a halt, or is disturbed in some way, it is not only the consumption of small c that is restricted or completely ceases, but in addition, the market for the set of commodities that form the replacement for small c. This is similarly the case if c prime to m prime goes awry, or only a portion of c prime can be sold. We have seen that small c to small m to small c, as the circulation of the capitalist revenue, enters into the capital circulation only insofar as small c is a value portion of c prime, capital in its functional form as commodity capital. But as soon as it becomes independent through small m to small c, thus in the form as a whole, small c to small m to small c, it does not enter into the movements of the capital advanced by the capitalist, even though it proceeds from this. It is related to it insofar as the existence of capital presupposes the existence of the capitalist, and this latter is conditional on his consumption of surplus value. Within the general circulation, C prime functions, for example, as yarn, simply as a commodity, but as a moment of the circulation of capital, it functions as commodity capital, a form that the capital value alternately assumes and discards. When the yarn is sold to the merchant, it is removed from the circuit of capital whose product it is, but still continues as a commodity in the orbit of general circulation. The circulation of this mass of commodities continues, even though it has ceased to form a moment in the independent circuit of the capital of the spinner. The really definitive metamorphosis of this mass of commodities thrown into circulation by the capitalists, C to M, its final abandonment to consumption, can thus be completely separated in time and space from the metamorphosis in which this mass of commodities functions as his commodity capital. The same metamorphosis that has already been accomplished in the circulation of this capital remains still to be completed in the sphere of general circulation. Nothing is changed if the yarn now enters the circuit of another industrial capital. The general circulation includes the intertwining of the circuits of the various independent fractions of the social capital, i.e. the totality of individual capitals, as well as the circulation of those values that are not placed on the market as capital. 
in other words, those going into individual consumption. The relation between the circuit of capital, as it forms a part of general circulation, and as it provides the links in an independent circuit, is further displayed if we consider the circulation of M' prime, equaling M plus small m. M, as money capital, continues the circuit of capital. Small m, spent as revenue, in small m to small c, goes into the general circulation, but is cast out of the circuit of capital. Only that part of it enters the latter circuit that functions as additional money capital. In small c to small m to small c, money functions simply as coin. The purpose of this circulation is the individual consumption of the capitalist. Vulgar economics shows its characteristic cretinism by the way that it depicts this circulation, which does not enter into the circuit of capital, the circulation of the portion of the value product that is consumed as revenue as the characteristic circuit of capital. In the second phase, m to c, the capital value M, equaling P, the value of the productive capital that opens the circuit of industrial capital, is again present, having rid itself of the surplus value, i.e. with the same value magnitude as in the first stage of the circuit of money capital M to C. Despite the different position, the function of the money capital into which the commodity capital has now been changed remains the same, its transformation into M, P, and L, means of production and labor power. The capital value in the function of the commodity capital C prime to M prime has thus passed through the phase C to M at the same time as C to M, and it now moves into the complementary phase M to C, factoring into L and MP. Its overall circulation is thus C to M to C, factoring into L and MP. Firstly, the money capital M appeared in form 1, circuit M to M prime, as the original form in which the capital value was advanced. Now it appears from the start as a part of the sum of money into which the commodity capital has been transformed in the first phase of circulation, C prime to M prime, thus from the start as a transformation mediated by the sale of the commodity product, of P, the productive capital, into the money form. Here the money capital exists from the outset neither as the original nor as the concluding form of the capital value, since it is only through repeatedly stripping off the money form that the phase M to C that complements the phase C to M can be completed. Hence the portion of M to C that is simultaneously M to L also appears no longer as a mere advance of money for acquiring labor power, but as an advance in which the same 1,000 pounds of yarn, with the value 50 pounds sterling, is advanced for the labor power in the money form, and this forms a portion of the commodity value produced by the labor power. The money that is here advanced to the worker is only the transformed equivalent form of a portion of the commodity value that he himself produces. And for this reason alone, the act M to C, insofar as it is M to L, is in no way simply the substitution of commodities in use form for commodities in money form, but includes other elements that are independent of the general circulation of commodities as such. M prime appears as the transformed form of C prime, which is itself the product of the past function of P, the production process. The entire sum of M prime thus appears as the monetary expression of past labor. In our example, 10,000 pounds of yarn, equaling 500 pounds sterling, the product of the spinning process. 7,440 pounds of this yarn equals the constant capital advanced, small c, equaling 372 pounds. 1,000 pounds of this yarn equals the variable capital advanced, small v, equaling 50 pounds. And 1,560 pounds of yarn equals the surplus value, small s, 78 pounds. If, out of M prime, it is only the original capital of 422 pounds that is advanced afresh, other circumstances remaining the same, then the worker merely receives, as the next week's advance in M to L, a portion of the 10,000 pounds of yarn produced in this week, the money value of 1,000 pounds of yarn. As the result of C to M, the money is throughout the expression of past labor. Insofar as the complementary act M to C is immediately performed on the commodity market, and M is thus converted into existing commodities found on the market, there is again a conversion of past labor from one form, money, into another, commodity. But M to C is separate from C to M in time. It can, in exceptional cases, be simultaneous, if, for example, the capitalist who performs M to C and the capitalist for whom this act is C to M transfer their respective commodities to each other at the same time, and M simply settles the balance. The difference in time between the execution of C to M and that of M to C may be more or less considerable. Although, as the result of the act C to M, M represents past labor, M can represent for the act M to C the transformed form of commodities that are not yet present on the market at all, but will be there only in the future, since M to C does not need to take place until C has been produced afresh. In the same way, M may represent commodities that are produced simultaneously with the C whose monetary expression it is. In the conversion M to C, for example, acquisition of means of production, coal may be purchased before it is extracted from the mine. 
insofar as small m figures as accumulation of money and is not spent as revenue, it can represent cotton that will only be produced next year. The same applies to the expenditure of the capitalist revenue, small m to small c, and holds even for the wages of labor, equaling 50 pounds. This money is not only the monetary form of the workers' past labor, but also a draft on simultaneous or future labor that will only be realized, or is supposed to be realized, in the future. The worker may use it to buy a coat that will only be made one week later. This is, in particular, the case with the very large number of necessary means of subsistence that must be consumed almost immediately, the moment they are produced, if they are not to spoil. In the money with which his wage is paid, therefore, the worker receives the transformed form of his own future labor, or that of other workers. With one part of his past labor, the capitalist gives him a draft on his own future labor. It is his own simultaneous or future labor which forms the as-yet non-existent reserve stock with which his past labor is paid for. Here, the idea that a stock has to be formed is completely demolished. Secondly, in the circulation C to M to C, factoring into L and M P, the same money changes its position twice. The capitalist first receives it as a seller and then gives it out again as a buyer. The transformation of the commodity into the money form only serves to transform it from the money form into the commodity form again, and so the money form of capital, its existence as money capital, is thus only an evanescent moment in this movement. Alternatively, the money capital, insofar as the movement is fluid, appears as the means of circulation only when it serves as a means of purchase. It appears as an actual means of payment only when capitalists buy from each other. Hence, when there is simply a balance of payments to be settled. Thirdly, the function of money capital, whether it serves as mere means of circulation or as means of payment, is simply to mediate the replacement of C by L and MP, i.e. to replace the yarn, the commodity product, which is the result of the activity of the productive capital, after a deduction of the surplus value spent as revenue, with its own elements of production, i.e. to transform capital value back from its form as commodity into the elements of formation of this commodity, it thus mediates, in the last instance, only the transformation of commodity capital back into productive capital. In order for the circuit to run its normal course, C prime must be sold at its value and as a whole. Furthermore, C to M to C does not just include the replacement of one commodity by another, but its replacement in the same value relations. We have made the assumption that this is what happens here. In fact, however, the value of the means of production varies. Capitalist production is precisely marked by a continuous change in value relations, if only because of the constant change in the productivity of labor that characterizes it. We shall deal with this change in the value of the factors of production later, and for the moment we merely indicate it. The transformation of the elements of production into commodity product, P, into C prime, proceeds in the sphere of production, while the transformation of C prime back into P takes place in the circulation sphere. It is mediated by the simple metamorphosis of commodities. Its content, however, is a moment of the reproduction process considered as a whole. C to M to C, as a form of circulation of capital, includes a functionally specific interchange of material. The conversion CMC further requires that C be equal to the elements of production of the commodity quantum C prime, and that these maintain their original value relations to each other. Thus, it is not only assumed that the commodities are bought at their values, but also that they do not suffer any change of value during the circuit. If this is not the case, then the process cannot run its normal course. In M to M prime, M is the original form of the capital value, and is cast aside only in order to be reassumed later. In P to C prime to M prime to C to P, M is only a form assumed in the process, and is already cast aside again within this. Here the money form appears simply as an evanescent form of the value of capital. The capital as C prime is anxious to assume the money form, but the capital as M prime is equally anxious to get rid of it as soon as it is pupated into it, in order to convert itself once more into the form of productive capital. As long as it persists in the shape of money, it does not function as capital, and thus is not valorized. The capital remains idle. M functions here as a means of circulation, even though a means of circulation of capital. The appearance of independence that the money form of the capital value possesses in the first form of the circuit, that of money capital, vanishes in the second form, which thus constitutes a critique of form 1, and reduces this to a mere particular form. If the second metamorphosis, M to C, comes up against obstacles, for example, if the means of production are unobtainable in the market, then the circular flow of the reproduction process is interrupted, just as if the capital was tied up in the form of commodity capital. The difference, however, is that it can last out longer in the money form than in its previous commodity form. It does not cease to be money when it functions as capital, but it does cease to be a commodity, and in fact a use value in general, if it is detained too long in its function as commodity capital. Secondly, in the money form it is able to assume a form other than its original one of productive capital, while as C' prime it can move no further. 
in its form, C prime to M prime to C, includes for C prime only acts of circulation which are moments of its reproduction. But the real reproduction of the C into which C prime is converted is necessary to the performance of C prime to M prime to C. This is, however, conditional on reproduction processes outside the reproduction process of the individual capital depicted in C prime. In form 1, M to C factoring into L and MP simply prepared the first transformation of money capital into productive capital. In form 2, it prepares the transformation of commodity capital back into productive capital. Thus, insofar as industrial capital remains invested in the same business, it prepares the transformation of commodity capital back into the same elements of production from which it emerged. It therefore appears here, as in form 1, as a preparatory phase for the production process, but as a return to this process, a repetition of it, hence as a forerunner to the reproduction process, and so also to the repetition of the valorization process. We again have to note here that M to L is not simple commodity exchange, but the purchase of a commodity L that is to serve for the production of surplus value, while M to MP is only a procedure that is materially indispensable to the accomplishment of this end. With the completion of M to C factoring into L and MP, M has been transformed back into productive capital and begins the circuit afresh. The form P to C prime to M prime to C to P can therefore be expanded as follows. P to C prime, composed of C plus small c, to M plus small m, to C factoring into L and MP and into P, and separately into small c. The transformation of money capital into productive capital is the purchase of commodities for the purpose of commodity production. It is only insofar as consumption is productive consumption of this kind that it falls within the actual circuit of capital. The condition for consumption to occur is that surplus value is made by means of the commodities thus consumed. And this is something very different from production, even commodity production, whose purpose is the existence of the producers. Such a replacement of commodity by commodity conditioned by surplus value production is something quite other than an exchange of products that is simply mediated by money. But this is how the matter is presented by the economists, as proof that no overproduction is possible. Besides the productive consumption of M, transformed into L and MP, the circuit contains the first link of M to L, which for the worker is L to M, in other terms C to M. Of the worker's circulation L to M to C, which includes his consumption, only the first link falls into the circuit of capital, as the result of M to L. The second act, i.e. M to C, does not fall into the circulation of the individual capital, although it proceeds from it. The constant existence of the working class, however, is necessary for the capitalist class, and so therefore is the consumption of the worker mediated by M to C. The act C prime to M prime merely assumes that C prime is transformed into money, is sold, so that the circuit of the capital value can continue, and the surplus value can be consumed by the capitalist. The commodity is, of course, bought only because it is a use value, i.e. is suitable for some kind of consumption, productive or individual. But if C' prime circulates further, for example, in the hands of the merchant who has bought the yarn, this in no way disturbs, initially at least, the continuation of the circuit of the individual capital that has produced the yarn and sold it to the merchant. The whole process follows its course, and with it also the individual consumption of the capitalist and the worker that is conditional on it. This point is an important one in considering crises. As soon as C prime is sold, is transformed into money, it can be transformed back into the real factors of the labor process, and hence of the reproduction process. Hence, whether C prime is bought by the final consumer or by the merchant who intends to sell it again does not directly alter the matter in any way. The volume of the mass of commodities brought into being by capitalist production is determined by the scale of this production and its needs for constant expansion, and not by a predestined ambit of supply and demand, of needs to be satisfied. Besides other industrial capitalists, mass production can have only wholesale merchants as its immediate purchasers. Within certain bounds, the reproduction process may proceed on the same or on an expanded scale, even though the commodities ejected from it do not actually enter either individual or productive consumption. The consumption of commodities is not included in the circuit of the capital from which they emerge. As soon as the yarn is sold, for example, the circuit of the capital value represented in the yarn can begin anew, at first irrespective of what becomes of the yarn when sold. As long as the product is sold, everything follows its regular course, as far as the capitalist producer is concerned. The circuit of the capital value that he represents is not interrupted, and if this process is expanded, which includes an expansion of the productive consumption of the means of production, then this reproduction of capital can be accompanied by a more expanded individual consumption, and thus demand on the part of the workers, since this is introduced and mediated by productive consumption. The production of surplus value, and with it also the individual consumption of the capitalist, can thus grow, and the whole reproduction process find itself in the most flourishing condition, 
while in fact a great part of the commodities have only apparently gone into consumption and are actually lying unsold in the hands of retail traders, thus being still on the market. One stream of commodities now follows another, and it finally emerges that the earlier stream had only seemed to be swallowed up by consumption. Commodity capitals now vie with each other for space on the market. The latecomers sell below the price in order to sell it all. The earlier streams have not yet been converted into ready money, while payment for them is falling due. Their owners must declare themselves bankrupt or sell at any price in order to pay. This sale, however, has absolutely nothing to do with the real state of demand. It has only to do with the demand for payment, with the absolute necessity of transforming commodities into money. At this point, the crisis breaks out. It first becomes evident not in the direct reduction of consumer demand, the demand for individual consumption, but rather in a decline in the number of exchanges of capital for capital, in the reproduction process of capital. In order to fulfill its function as money capital, as a capital value destined to be transformed back into productive capital, M is converted into the commodities M, P, and L. If these commodities are to be purchased or paid for at different dates, M to C then takes the form of a series of successive purchases and payments, so that a part of M performs the act M to C, while another part persists in the money state, and only serves for simultaneous or successive acts M to C at a time determined by the conditions of the process itself. It is withdrawn from circulation only temporarily, to step into action and fulfill its function at a definite point in time. This storing of money is then itself a function determined by its circulation and for circulation. Its existence as a fund for purchase and payment, the suspension of its movement, its state of interrupted circulation, is then a situation in which the money fulfills one of its functions as money capital. For in this case, the money that is temporarily dormant is itself a part of the money capital M, of M prime minus small m, equaling M, of the value portion of the commodity capital equal to P, the value of the productive capital from which the money that is withdrawn originates. Furthermore, all the money that is withdrawn from circulation exists in the form of a hoard, the hoard form thus becomes here a function of the money capital. Just as in M to C, the function of money as a means of purchase or payment becomes a function of the money capital. And indeed, precisely because the capital value exists here in the form of money, the money state is here a state of industrial capital in one of its stages, prescribed by the circuit as a whole. But it also proves true once again here that, within the circuit of industrial capital, money capital performs no other functions than those of money, and these money functions have the significance of capital functions only through their connection with the other stages of the circuit. The expression of M' prime as a relation between small m and m, as a capital relation, is not a direct function of the money capital, but rather of the commodity capital C', prime, which in turn expresses as a relation between small c and c only the results of the production process, of the self-valorization of the capital value that takes place within it. If the circulation process comes up against obstacles, so that M has to suspend its function M to C as a result of external circumstances, the state of the market, etc., and on this account persists for a shorter or longer time in its money state, then this is again a form of hoarding, which can also arise in simple commodity circulation if the transition from C to M to M to C is interrupted by external circumstances. It is the involuntary formation of a hoard. In our case, the money thus has the form of latent money capital, money capital that lies idle. However, we shall not go into this any further for the moment. In both cases, the persistence of money capital in its money state appears as the result of interrupted movement, whether this is expedient or inexpedient, voluntary or involuntary, functional or dysfunctional. Section 2. Accumulation and Reproduction on an Expanded Scale since the proportions in which the production process can be expanded are not arbitrary, but are prescribed by technical factors, the surplus value realized, even if it is destined for capitalization, can often only grow to the volume at which it can actually function as additional capital, or enter the circuit of capital value in process by repeating a number of circuits. Until then, therefore, it must be stored up. The surplus value thus builds up into a hoard, and in this form it constitutes latent money capital. Latent because as long as it persists in the money form it cannot function as capital. Thus the formation of a hoard appears here as a moment that is comprised within the process of capitalist accumulation, accompanies it, but is at the same time essentially different from it. For the reproduction process is not itself expanded by the formation of latent money capital. On the contrary, latent money capital is formed here because the capitalist producer cannot directly expand the scale of his production. If he sells his surplus product to a gold or silver producer who thereby throws new gold or silver into circulation, or what comes to the same thing, if he sells it to a merchant who uses part of the national surplus product to import additional gold or silver from abroad, then his latent money capital forms an increment to the national gold or silver hoard. 
In all other cases, the 78 pounds, say, that was means of circulation in the hands of the purchaser has assumed in the hands of the capitalist only the form of a hoard. Thus all that has taken place is a new distribution of the national gold or silver hoard. If money functions as means of payment in our capitalist transactions, so that the commodity only has to be paid for by the purchaser at a later date, then the surplus product destined for capitalization is not transformed into money, but into claims for payment, titles to property equivalent to a sum that the purchaser either already has in his possession or expects to come into. It does not enter into the reproduction of the circuit any more than the money that is invested in interest-bearing securities, even though it can enter the circuits of other individual industrial capitals. The whole character of capitalist production is determined by the valorization of the capital value advanced, thus in the first instance by the production of the greatest possible amount of surplus value. Secondly, however, see Volume 1, Chapter 24, by the production of capital, i.e. the transformation of surplus value into capital. Accumulation, or production on an expanded scale, which first appears as a means towards the constantly extended production of surplus value, hence the enrichment of the capitalist as the personal end of the latter, and is a part of the general tendency of capitalist production, becomes in the course of its development, as was shown in the first volume, a necessity for each individual capitalist. The constant enlargement of this capital becomes a condition for its preservation. However, it is not necessary here to come back to what was already developed earlier. We first considered simple reproduction, in which connection it was assumed that the whole of the surplus value is spent as revenue. In actual fact, a part of the surplus value must always be spent as revenue in normal circumstances and another part capitalized, and it is quite immaterial in this connection that at certain periods the surplus value produced is completely consumed, and at others completely capitalized. If the movement takes its average course, and this is all that the general formula can express, there is a bit of both. In order not to complicate the formula, it is better to assume that the whole of the surplus value is accumulated. The formula P to C prime to M prime to C, factoring into L and MP, and finally to P prime, then expresses productive capital which is to be reproduced on a larger scale and with greater value, and begins its second circuit, or what comes to the same thing, repeats its first circuit, as augmented productive capital. As soon as the second circuit begins, we once again have P as the point of departure. It is simply that P is now a larger productive capital than the first P was. Similarly, in the formula M to M prime, the second circuit begins with M prime, and M prime functions as M, as money capital of a specific magnitude which has been advanced. It is a larger money capital than that with which the first circuit commenced, but all reference to its augmentation through the capitalization of surplus value has vanished, once it steps forth in the function of money capital advanced. This origin was obliterated in its form as money capital just beginning its circuit. It is just the same with P prime, as soon as it functions as the point of departure for a new circuit. If we compare P to P prime with M to M prime, the first circuit, we see that each has a quite different significance. M to M prime, taken by itself as an isolated circuit, simply expresses that M, the money capital, or industrial capital in its circuit as money capital, is money breeding money, value breeding value, and brings forth surplus value. In the circuit of P, on the contrary, the process of valorization is already complete as soon as the first stage, the production process, has taken place, and once it has passed through the second stage, C prime to M prime, the first of the circulation stages, capital value and surplus value already exist as realized money capital, as M prime, which in the first circuit appeared as the final extremity. The fact that surplus value was produced was depicted in the first form of P to P that was considered. See the expanded formula on page 79 by small c to small m to small c, the second stage of which falls outside the circulation of capital and represents the circulation of surplus value as revenue. In this form, in which the entire movement is represented by P to P, and there is thus no difference in value between the two endpoints, the valorization of the value advanced, the creation of surplus value, is depicted as much as it is in M to M prime. It is simply that the act of C prime to M prime appears as the final stage in M to M prime, but as the second stage in the circuit, and first of the circulation stages in P to P prime. In P to P prime, P prime does not express the fact that surplus value is produced, but rather that the produced surplus value is capitalized, i.e. that capital has been accumulated, and hence P prime, as opposed to P, consists of the original capital value plus the value of the capital accumulated through its movement. M prime, as the simple conclusion of M to M prime, as also C prime, as it appears within all these circuits, expresses, taken by themselves, not the movement, but rather its result, the valorization of the capital value realized in the commodity or money form, and hence the capital value as m plus small m or as c plus small c, as the relation of the capital value to the surplus value as its derivative. These express the result as different forms of circulation of the capital value that has been valorized, but neither in the form c prime nor in the form m prime is the valorization that has taken place a function of the money capital or the commodity capital. 
as a specific and distinct form or mode of existence that corresponds to the particular functions of industrial capital, money capital can perform only money functions, and commodity capital only commodity functions. The distinction between them is simply that between money and commodity. In the same way, industrial capital in its form as productive capital can consist only of the same elements as those of any other labor process that fashions products. On the one hand, the objective conditions of labor, means of production, and on the other hand, productively, purposively, active labor power. As industrial capital within the sphere of production can exist only in the combination corresponding to the production process in general, and thus also to the non-capitalist production process, so it can exist in the sphere of circulation only in the two forms of commodity and money that correspond to this. Just as the sum of the elements of production proclaims itself from the start to be productive capital, insofar as the labor power is the labor power of others which the capitalist has bought from its owners, just as he has bought his means of production from the owners of other commodities, hence just as the production process appears itself as a productive function of industrial capital, so money and commodities appear as forms of circulation of this industrial capital, and thus also their functions as its circulation functions, which either pave the way for the functions of productive capital or derive from them. It is only through their connection as functional forms which industrial capital has to go through in the various stages of its circuit that the money function and the commodity function are here at the same time functions of money capital and commodity capital. It is wrong, therefore, to seek to ascribe the specific properties and functions that characterize money as money and commodities as commodities to their character as capital, and it is just as wrong, conversely, to derive the properties of productive capital from its mode of existence and the means of production. When m prime or c prime are depicted as m plus small m, c plus small c, i.e. as a relation between the capital value and the surplus value as its offshoot, this relation is expressed in one case in the money form and the other case in the commodity form, but this does not alter the matter in any way. This relation thus does not arise from the properties and functions that can be ascribed either to the money or the commodity as such. In both cases, the characteristic property of capital, that it is money which breeds money, is only expressed as the result. C prime is always the product of the function of P, and M prime is always simply the form into which C prime has been transformed in the circuit of industrial capital. Hence, as soon as the realized money capital recommences its particular function as money capital, it ceases to express the capital relation contained in M prime, equaling M plus small m. When the movement M to M prime has been passed through, and M prime begins the cycle anew, it does not figure as M prime, but rather as M, even if the entire surplus value contained in M prime has been capitalized. In our case, the second circuit begins with the money capital of 500 pounds, instead of with 422 pounds as did the first circuit. The money capital that opens the circuit is 78 pounds greater than previously, and this difference exists when one circuit is compared with another, but such a comparison is not made within the individual circuit itself. The 500 pounds now advanced as money capital, of which 78 pounds existed earlier as surplus value, does not play a different role from the 500 pounds which another capitalist might use to open his first circuit. The same applies in the circuit of productive capital. The enlarged P prime appears as P when the circuit is begun again, just like P in simple reproduction for P to P. At the stage M prime to C prime, factoring into L and MP, the augmented magnitude is indicated simply by C prime, and not by L prime and MP prime. Since C is the sum of L and MP, it is already indicated by C prime that the sum of L and MP contained in it is greater than the original P. Secondly, however, the designations L' prime and MP' prime would be false, as we know that the growth of capital involves a change in its value composition, in the course of which the value of MP constantly grows, while that of L always declines relatively, and often even absolutely. Section 3. Accumulation of Money Whether small m, surplus value in its golden form, is immediately added onto the capital value in process, and can thus embark on the circuit together with a capital M, making a total magnitude of M prime, depends on circumstances that are independent to the mere presence of small m. If small m is to serve as money capital in a second independent business alongside the first, it is clear that it can be invested in this only if it possesses the minimal magnitude required for such a business. If it is invested in extending the original business, then the relationship between the material factors of P, as well as their value relationship, similarly determines a certain minimal magnitude for small m. Between all means of production operating in this business, there is not only a qualitative relation, but also a quantitative ratio, a proportionality. The above-mentioned material factors and the value relationships borne by them, between the factors which enter into the productive capital, determine the minimum size that small m must possess in order to be convertible either into additional means of production and labor power, or into the former alone, as an increase of productive capital. 
Thus, the mill owner cannot increase the number of his spindles without simultaneously purchasing a corresponding number of carding machines and roving frames to say nothing of the increased outlay on cotton and wages that this extension of his business would demand. For him to extend his business in this way, therefore, the surplus value must already amount to a fair sum. One pound per additional spindle is generally reckoned on. As long as small m has not reached this minimum size, the capital circuit must be repeated several times, until the sum of small m successively produced by it can function together with m in the form m prime to c prime factoring into l and mp. Even detailed changes in the spinning machinery, for example, that make it more productive, require greater outlay on raw material, extension of the roving machinery, etc. In the meantime, therefore, small m is stored up, and its accumulation is not its own function but the result of the repeated p to p. Its own function is its persistence in the money state until the repeated circuits of valorization, i.e. an external factor, have added to it sufficiently for it to have attained a minimum magnitude required for it to function actively, the magnitude at which it can really function for the first time as money capital, i.e. in the given case enter into the function of the money capital M as an accumulated portion of the latter. In the meantime, it is stored up and exists only in the form of a hoard in the process of formation and growth. Thus the accumulation of money, the formation of a hoard, appears here as a process that temporarily accompanies an extension of the scale on which industrial capital operates. Temporarily, because as long as the hoard persists in its state as a hoard, it does not function as capital, does not participate in the valorization process, but remains a sum of money that grows only because money available to it, without any effort on its part, is cast into the same coffer. The form of the hoard is simply the form of money not in circulation, money that is interrupted in its circulation and is therefore preserved in its money form. As far as the process of hoard formation itself is concerned, this is common to all commodity production, and it is only in the undeveloped pre-capitalist forms of the latter that it plays a role as an end in itself. In our case, however, the hoard appears as a form of money capital, and hoard formation as a process that temporarily accompanies the accumulation of capital, because and insofar as money figures here as latent money capital, because the formation of a hoard, the hoarded state of the surplus value present in the money form, is a functionally determined preparatory stage that proceeds outside the circuit of capital and paves the way for the transformation of surplus value into really functioning capital. This characteristic is what makes it latent money capital and is also why the scale that it must have attained in order to enter the process is determined by the value composition of the productive capital in each particular case. As long as it persists in the state of a hoard, it does not yet function as money capital. It is still money capital lying fallow, not interrupted in its function as in the previous case, but rather as yet incapable of performing this function. Here we take the accumulation of money in its original real form, as a real hoard of money. It can also exist merely in the form of favorable balances, of sums owed to the capitalist who has sold C prime. As far as concerns the other forms, in which this latent money capital may in the interval exist in the actual shape of money which breeds money, for example as interest-bearing deposits in a bank, bills of exchange, or securities of one kind or another, these do not belong here. In that case, the surplus value realized in money performs particular capital functions outside the circuit of the industrial capital from which it arose, functions which have nothing to do with that circuit as such, and assume the existence of functions of capital distinct from the functions of industrial capital which have not yet been developed here. Section 4. The Reserve Fund. In the form just considered, the hoard in which the surplus value exists, the money accumulation fund, is the money form which capital accumulation temporarily possesses, and in this respect it is itself a condition for this accumulation. But the accumulation fund can also perform particular ancillary services, i.e. it can enter into the circulation process of capital without the latter possessing the form of P to P prime, i.e. without capitalist reproduction on an expanded scale. If the process C prime to M prime extends beyond its normal duration, then the commodity capital is abnormally delayed in its transformation into the money form. Alternatively, if when the transformation is completed, the price of the means of production into which the money capital must be converted has risen, for example above the level that it had at the beginning of the circuit, then the hoard that functions as accumulation fund can be used to take the place of money capital, or a part of this. The money accumulation fund then serves as a reserve fund to cope with disturbances in the circuit. As a reserve fund of this kind, it is different from the fund for purchase and payment considered in the circuit P to P. The latter was a part of the functioning money capital, thus the form of existence of a part of the total capital value in process, the parts of which function successively at different points in time. It formed a constant reserve of money capital in the continuity of the production process, as one day money is received and no payments have to be made until later, while another day large quantities of commodities are sold and only at a later date do large quantities of commodities have to be bought. Within these intervals, therefore, a part of the circulating capital always exists in the money form. 
The reserve fund, on the other hand, is not a component part of the functioning capital, or more precisely, the money capital, but rather capital going through a preliminary stage of its accumulation, surplus value that has not yet been transformed into active capital. It goes without saying, of course, that when the capitalist is in need, he in no way ponders over the specific functions of the money that he has in his hands, but uses whatever he has in order to get the circulation process of his capital moving again. In our example, for instance, M is equal to 422 pounds and M prime to 500 pounds. If part of the capital of 422 pounds exists as a fund for purchase and payment, as a monetary reserve, it is reckoned that, with circumstances remaining the same, it will enter as a whole into the circuit and will also be sufficient for this purpose. The reserve fund, however, is a part of the 78 pounds of surplus value. It can enter the circuit of the capital of 422 pounds only insofar as this circuit is accomplished in altered circumstances, for it is a part of the accumulation fund, and it figures here without an expansion in the scale of reproduction. In the money accumulation fund, money already exists as latent money capital, and is thus transformed into money capital. The general formula for the circuit of productive capital, which comprises both simple reproduction and reproduction on an expanded scale, is... P to C prime to M prime, which is phase 1, to M to C, which is phase 2, factoring into L and MP, and finally to P, or P prime. If P is equal to P, then M in phase 2 is equal to M prime minus small m. If P is equal to P prime, then M in phase 2 is greater than M prime minus small m, i.e. small m has been wholly or partly transformed into money capital. The circuit of productive capital is the form in which the classical economists have considered the circuit of industrial capital. Chapter 3. The Circuit of Commodity Capital The general formula for the circuit of commodity capital is C prime to M prime to C to P to C prime. Here, C prime does not just appear as the product of the two earlier circuits, but also as their premise, since what is M to C for one capital already involves C prime to M prime for another, at least insofar as a part of the means of production are themselves the commodity product of other individual capitals in their circuits. In our case, for example, coal, machinery, etc., are the commodity capital of the mine owner, the capitalist engineer, etc. It has already been shown in Chapter 1, Section 4, moreover, that when M to M prime is being repeated for the first time, even before this second circuit of the money capital is completed, not only is the circuit P to P presupposed, but also the circuit C prime to C prime. If there is reproduction on an expanded scale, then the concluding C prime is greater than the starting C prime, and will therefore be designated here as C prime prime. The difference between the third form and the two previous ones is first apparent in that here the circuit commences with the entire circulation, in its two opposing phases, whereas in form 1 the circulation was interrupted by the production process, and in form 2 the entire circulation and its two complementary phases simply appeared as a mediation for the reproduction process, and hence formed the mediating movement between P to P. With M to M prime, the form of circulation is M to C, to C prime to M, or M C M. With P to P, it is conversely C prime to M prime, M to C, or C M C. In C prime to C prime, it similarly has this latter form. Secondly, when the circuits 1 and 2 are repeated, even if the final points M prime and P prime form the points of departure for a new circuit, the form in which they were produced vanishes. Both M prime, being equal to M plus small m, and P prime being equal to P plus small p, begin the new process once more as M and P. In form 3, however, the starting point C must be designated as C prime, even when the circuit is renewed on the same scale. The reason for this is as follows. In form 1, as soon as M prime as such opens a new circuit, it functions as money capital M, the advance in monetary form of the capital value which has to be valorized. The magnitude of the money capital advanced has increased, for it has grown by way of the accumulation accomplished in the first circuit. But whether the magnitude of the money capital advanced is 422 pounds or 500 pounds in no way alters the fact that it appears simply as capital value. M prime no longer exists as valorized capital, as capital pregnant with surplus value, as a capital relation. It is only in the course of the process that it is to be valorized. The same holds for P to P prime. P prime must always continue to function as P, as capital value which should produce surplus value and always repeat the circuit. 
The circuit of commodity capital, on the other hand, does not just open with capital value, but with expanded capital value in the commodity form, and thus it includes, from the start, not only the circuit of the capital value present in the commodity form, but also that of the surplus value. Hence, if simple reproduction takes place in this form, this involves, at the close of the circuit, a C prime of equal magnitude to the one at its starting point. If a part of the surplus value goes into the capital circuit, then what appears at the end is in fact not C prime, but C prime prime, a bigger C prime. But the following circuit still opens with C prime, which is simply a greater C prime than in the previous circuit and begins its new circuit with a greater accumulated capital value, hence also with relatively more newly produced surplus value. In all cases, C prime always opens the circuit as a commodity capital equal to capital value plus surplus value. In the circuit of an individual industrial capital, C prime as C appears not as the form of this capital but as the form of another industrial capital, insofar as the means of production are the product of this other capital. The act M to C, i.e. M to MP of the first capital is for this second capital C prime to M prime. In the act of circulation M to C factoring into L and MP, L and MP behave identically insofar as they are commodities in the hands of their sellers, in the one case the workers who sell their labor power, in the other the possessors of the means of production, who sell the latter. For the buyer, whose money functions here as money capital, both these things function merely as commodities, as long as he has not yet bought them, thus as long as they confront his capital, existing in the money form, as the commodities of others. MP and L are distinguished here only insofar as MP is C prime in the hands of its seller, and can thus be capital if MP is the commodity form of his capital, whereas L is always just a commodity for the worker, and becomes capital only in the hands of the buyer, as a component part of P. C prime can therefore never open a circuit as mere C, as merely the commodity form of the capital value. As commodity capital, it always has to be a dual aspect. From the point of view of use value, it is the product of the function of P, here yarn, whose elements L and MP, emerging from the circulation as commodities, have only function to fashion this product. Secondly, from the point of view of value, it is the capital value P plus the surplus value small m produced in the function of P. It is only in the circuit of C prime itself that C is equal to P, meaning that the capital value can and must separate itself from the portion of C prime in which surplus value exists, from the surplus product in which the surplus value is hidden, whether the two are actually separable, as in the case of the yarn, or not, as in the case of the machine. They become separable in any case, as soon as C prime has been transformed into M prime. If the total commodity product is divisible into independent and homogeneous partial products, as for example our 10,000 pounds of yarn, and if the act C prime to M prime can thus be represented as a sum of successively performed sales, then the capital value can function as C in the commodity form and separate itself off from C prime before the surplus value is realized, therefore before C prime is realized as a whole. Of the 10,000 pounds of yarn with the value of 500 pounds sterling, the value of 8,440 pounds is equal to 422 pounds sterling, meaning the capital value, separated from the surplus value. If the capitalist first sells 8,440 pounds for 422 pounds sterling, then this 8,440 pounds represents C, the capital value in commodity form, the additional surplus product contained in C prime, which consists of 1,560 pounds of yarn and equals a surplus value of 78 pounds sterling, only circulates later. The capitalist could complete C to M to C, factoring into L and MP before the circulation of the surplus product small c to small m to small c. Alternatively, if he firstly sells 7,440 pounds of yarn at its value of 372 pounds sterling, and then 1,000 pounds at its value of 50 pounds sterling, he could replace the means of production, the constant capital small c, with the first part of C, and the variable capital small v, i.e. the labor power, with the second part of C, and then proceed as before. But if there are successive sales of this kind, and the conditions of the circuit allow it, then the capitalist, instead of dividing C prime into small c plus small v plus small s, can undertake this division also for aliquot parts of C prime. For example, 7,440 pounds of yarn is equal to 372 pounds sterling, which, as a portion of C prime, 10,000 pounds of yarn equaling 500 pounds sterling, represents the constant capital, can itself be further broken down into 5,535.36 pounds of yarn, with a value of 276.768 pounds sterling, which simply replaces the constant part, the value of the means of production used up in the 7,440 pounds. 744 pounds of yarn, with a value of 37.2 pounds sterling, which replaces the variable capital, 
and 1,160.64 pounds of yarn with a value of 58.03 pounds sterling, which carries the surplus value in the form of surplus product. Having thus sold 7,440 pounds, he can replace the capital value contained in it from the sale of 6,279.36 pounds at a price of 313.968 pounds sterling and spend the value of the surplus product of 1,160.64 pounds, equaling 58.03 pounds sterling as revenue. He can, in the same way, break down 1,000 pounds of yarn, being 50 pounds sterling, being the variable capital, and accordingly sell. 744 pounds of yarn for 37.2 pounds sterling, the value of the constant capital in 1,000 pounds of yarn, 100 pounds of yarn for 5 pounds sterling, the variable capital value of the same, thus 844 pounds of yarn for 42.2 pounds sterling replace the capital value contained in the 1,000 pounds of yarn. Finally, 156 pounds of yarn at its value of 7.8 pounds sterling, which represents the surplus product contains in the 1,000 pounds and may be consumed as such. Finally, he can break down the remaining 1,560 pounds of yarn, with its value of 78 pounds sterling, when he manages to sell it, in such a way that the sale of 1,160.64 pounds for 58.032 pounds sterling replaces the value of the means of production contained in this 1,560 pounds, and 156 pounds at its value of 7.8 pounds sterling replaces the variable capital value. Together, this makes 1,316.64 pounds of yarn, equaling 65.832 pounds sterling, the replacement of the total capital value, so that finally the surplus product of 243.36 pounds, being 12.168 pounds sterling, remains to be spent as revenue. As each of the elements small c, small v, and small s existing in the yarn is divisible into the same component parts, so is each individual pound of yarn with a value of 1 shilling or 12 pence. Here follows a table of partial sales. The value of small c, equaling 0 0.744 pounds of yarn, equaling 8.92 pence. The value of small v, equaling 0 0.1 pounds of yarn, equaling 1.2 pence. The value of small s, equaling 0 0.156 pounds of yarn, equaling 1.872 pence. Small c plus small v plus small s, equaling 1 pound of yarn, valued at 12 pence. If we add together the results of the three partial sales as above, then we get the same result as if the entire 10,000 pounds of yarn was sold at one stroke. In constant capital, the first sale, 5,535.36 pounds of yarn, valued at 276.768 pounds sterling. The second sale, 744 pounds of yarn, valued at 37.2 pounds sterling. And the third sale, 1,160.64 pounds of yarn, valued at 58.032 pounds sterling. Together, 7,440 pounds of yarn at 372 pounds. In variable capital, the first sale being 744 pounds of yarn at 37.2 pounds sterling, the second sale being 100 pounds of yarn at 5 pounds sterling, the third sale being 156 pounds of yarn at 7.8 pounds sterling, together totaling 1,000 pounds of yarn at 50 pounds. In surplus value, the first sale being 1,160.64 pounds of yarn, valued at 58.032 pounds sterling, the second sale being 156 pounds of yarn, valued at 7.8 pounds sterling, the third sale being 243.36 pounds of yarn, valued at 12.168 pounds sterling, together totaling 1,560 pounds of yarn at 78 pounds. The grand total, the constant capital, contained in 7,440 pounds of yarn at 372 pounds sterling, the variable capital contained in 1,000 pounds of yarn at 50 pounds sterling, and the surplus value contained at 1,560 pounds of yarn at 78 pounds sterling, together totaling 10,000 pounds of yarn at 500 pounds sterling. Taken by itself, C prime to M prime is nothing more than a sale of 10,000 pounds of yarn. The 10,000 pounds of yarn is a commodity like all other yarn. What interests the buyer is the price of one shilling per pound, or 500 pounds per 10,000 pounds. If he goes into the value composition in the course of his bargaining, then he does so only with the crafty intention of showing that it could be sold below one shilling per pound, and the seller would still be doing good business. But the quantity that he buys will depend upon his needs. If he is the owner of a weaving mill, for example, it will depend on the composition of his own capital functioning in this weaving mill, and not on that of the capital of the spinner from whom he buys it. The ratio in which C' prime has to serve, on the one hand to replace the capital utilized in it, or its various components, on the other hand as surplus product, whether the surplus value is destined to be spent or for capital accumulation, exists only in the circuit of the capital whose commodity form is represented by the 10,000 pounds of yarn. It has nothing to do with the sale as such. 
It is assumed here, moreover, that C' prime is sold at its value, and so all that is involved is its transformation from the commodity form into the money form. It is, of course, decisive for C' prime, as a functional form in the circuit of this individual capital, whether and to what extent price and value diverge from one another in the sale, but here, where we are merely considering the distinctions of form, this is of no concern. In Form 1, M to M', prime, the production process appears in the middle, between the two complementary and mutually opposed phases of the circulation of capital. It is over with before the concluding phase C' prime to M' prime begins. Money is advanced as capital, first transformed into the elements of production, then transformed from these into the commodity product, and this commodity product then again converted into money. This is a finished and complete cycle of business, the result being money which can be used by anyone for anything. Thus the recommencement of the cycle is indicated only as a possibility. M to P to M prime may just as well be the final circuit, concluding the functioning of the individual capital, which is then withdrawn from the business, or else the first circuit of a capital that newly enters into its function. Here the general movement is M to M prime, from money to more money. In form 2, P to C prime to M prime to C, to P, which is P prime, the entire circulation process follows the first P and precedes the second, but it follows in the opposite order to that of form 1. The first P is productive capital, and its function is the production process, as precondition for the subsequent process of circulation. The concluding P, on the contrary, is not the production process, it is only the renewed existence of the industrial capital in its form of productive capital. Furthermore, this is the result of the transformation of the capital value into L and MP that is accomplished in the final circulation phase, into the objective and subjective factors that constitute, in their union, the form of existence of productive capital. Whether the capital is P or P', prime, it is present once more at the conclusion in a form in which it must function once more as productive capital, must again accomplish the production process. The general form of the movement P to P' prime is the form of reproduction, and does not indicate, as does M to M', prime, that valorization is the purpose of the process. For this reason, classical economics found it all the more easy to ignore the specifically capitalist form of the production process, and to present production as such as the purpose of the process, to produce as much and as cheaply as possible, and to exchange the product for as many other products as possible, partly for the repetition of production, M to C, partly for consumption, small m to small c. In this connection, since M and small m appear here only as evanescent means of circulation, the peculiarities of both money and money capital could be overlooked, the whole process then appearing simple and natural, i.e. possessing the naturalness of superficial rationality. In the case of commodity capital, similarly, profit was occasionally forgotten, and this capital figured insofar as there was any mention of the production circuit as a whole simply as a commodity, though as soon as the component parts of value were discussed, it figured as commodity capital. Accumulation, of course, appeared in the same light as production. In Form 3, C' prime to M' prime to C, to P, to C', prime, it is the two phases of the circulation process that open the circuit, and in fact in the same order as in Form 2, P to P. P then follows, together with its function, the production process, as in Form 1. The circuit closes with the result of this process, C'. Prime. Just as in Form 2, the circuit closes with P, the merely renewed existence of the productive capital, so here it closes with C prime, the renewed existence of the commodity capital. Just as in form 2, the capital in its concluding form P had to begin the process again as a production process, so here it must reopen the circuit with the reappearance of the industrial capital in the form of commodity capital, with the circulation phase C prime to M prime. Both forms of the circuit are incomplete, because they do not conclude with M prime, with the valorized capital value transformed back into money. Both must thus be continued further, and hence include a reproduction. The overall circuit in Form 3 is C' prime to C'. Prime. What differentiates the third form from the two earlier ones is that it is only in this circuit that the valorized capital value, and not the original capital value that has still to be valorized, appears as the starting point of its own valorization. C' prime, as capital relation, is here the point of departure, and thus has a determining effect on the whole circuit insofar as this includes, even in its first phase, both the circuit of the capital value and that of the surplus value, and surplus value must, on average, even if not in every individual circuit, be partly spent as revenue and pass through the circulation small c to small m to small c, and partly function as an element of capital accumulation. In the form c' prime to c', prime, the consumption of the entire commodity product is presupposed as the condition for the normal course of the circuit of capital itself. The individual consumption of the worker, 
and the individual consumption of the non-accumulated part of the surplus product comprise, taken together, the total individual consumption. Thus, consumption in its entirety, both individual and productive consumption, enters into the circuit of C' prime as a precondition. Productive consumption, which in the nature of the case includes the individual consumption of the worker, for labor power is the permanent product within certain limits of the worker's individual consumption, is carried on by every individual capital. Individual consumption, other than is necessary for the existence of the individual capitalist, is presupposed only as a social act, in no way as the act of the individual capitalist. In Forms 1 and 2, the overall movement presents itself as a movement of the capital value advanced. In Form 3, the valorized capital, in the shape of the total commodity product, forms the starting point and possesses the form of capital in movement, commodity capital. It is only after its transformation into money that this movement splits up into movement of capital and movement of revenue. The division of the total social product, as well as the particular division of the product of every individual commodity capital, into an individual consumption fund on the one hand and a reproduction fund on the other, is included in this form of the circuit of capital. M to M prime allows for the possible expansion of the circuit, according to the scale on which small m enters the new circuit. In P to P, P can begin the new circuit with the same value, perhaps even with a lesser value, and yet still represent reproduction on an expanded scale. If, for example, the commodity elements are cheapened as the result of an increased productivity of labor. Conversely, in the opposite case, a productive capital that has grown in value may represent reproduction on a materially more restricted scale. If, for example, the elements of production have become dearer. The same applies for C prime to C prime. In C prime to C prime, capital in the commodity form is the premise of production. It reappears as a premise within this circuit in the second C. If this C is not yet produced or reproduced, then the circuit is inhibited. This C must be reproduced, for the most part, as the C prime of another industrial capital. In this circuit, C prime exists as the point of departure, the point of transit, and the conclusion of the movement. In other words, it is always there. It is a permanent condition for the reproduction process. C prime to C prime is distinguished from forms 1 and 2 by a further characteristic. All three have in common that the form in which the capital opens its circuit is also the form in which it closes it, and it therefore finds itself back once more in the initial form, and in this form recommences the same circuit. The initial forms M, P, and C prime are always the forms in which the capital value is advanced in form 3, together with a surplus value that is adhered to it, i.e., their original forms as far as the circuit is concerned. The concluding forms, M prime, P, and C prime, are in each case the transformed form of a preceding functional form in the circuit which is not the original form. Thus in form 1, M prime is the transformed form of C prime, while the closing P in form 2 is the transformed form of M, and in forms 1 and 2 this transformation is effected by way of a simple process of commodity circulation, by a formal exchange of position between commodity and money. In Form 3, C prime is the transformed form of P, the productive capital. But in this Form 3, the transformation firstly does not just affect the functional form of the capital, but also the magnitude of its value, while secondly, the transformation is not the result of a merely formal change of position belonging to the circulation process, but rather the real transformation which the use form and the value of the commodity components of the productive capital have undergone in the production process. The form of the first extremes M, P, and C prime is given for each circuit, 1, 2, or 3. The returning form of the closing extreme is produced and hence determined by the series of metamorphoses of the circuit itself. C prime, as the closing point of the circuit of an individual industrial capital, only presupposes the form P of the same industrial capital, which does not belong to the circulation sphere, and it is the product of the form P. M prime, as the closing point in circuit 1, the transformed form of C prime, from the circuit C prime to M prime, presupposes M in the hands of the buyer, as existing outside the circuit M to M prime, brought into it by the sale of C prime and made into its own closing form. Thus, in form 2, the closing P presupposes L and MP, that is C, as existing outside it and incorporated into it as the closing form by M to C. But apart from the final extreme, the circuit of the individual money capital does not presuppose the existence of money capital as such, and the circuit of the individual productive capital does not presuppose the existence of productive capital in the circuit itself. In Form 1, M may be the only money capital, and in Form 2, P may be the only productive capital that appears on the historical scene. In Form 3, however, i.e., C prime, being C plus small c, to M prime, to the one track, M to C factoring into L and MP, to P to C prime, and the other track, small m to small c. 
C is twice presupposed outside the circuit. Firstly, in the circuit C prime to M prime to C, factoring into L and MP. This C, insofar as it consists of means of production, is a commodity in the hands of its seller. It is itself a commodity capital, insofar as it is the product of a capitalist production process, and even when this is not the case, it appears as commodity capital in the hands of the merchant. It is further presupposed in the second small c, of small c to small m to small c, which must similarly be present as a commodity in order to be bought. In either case, whether commodity capital or not, L and MP are commodities as much as C prime is, and act towards one another as commodities. The same holds for the second small c, in small c to small m to small c. Thus, insofar as C prime is equal to C, that is L and MP, commodities are its own elements of formation, and must be replaced by equivalent commodities in the course of circulation, just as the second small c must in small c to small m to small c. Moreover, on the basis of the capitalist mode of production, as the prevailing mode, all commodities must be commodity capital in the hands of their sellers. They continue to be so in the hands of the merchant, or they become so if they were not so previously. Alternatively, they can be commodities such as imported articles, which replace original commodity capital, hence simply give it another form of existence. The commodity elements L and MP, of which the productive capital P consists, do not possess the same shape, as forms of existence of P as they did on the various commodity markets from which they were brought together. They are now united, and in their combination they can function as productive capital. If it is only in this form, form number 3, within the circuit itself that C appears as a premise of C, this is because the starting point is capital in the commodity form. The circuit is opened by the conversion of C prime, insofar as it functions as capital value, whether or not increased by the addition of surplus value, into the commodities that form its elements of production. But this conversion comprises the entire circulation process C to M to C, meaning L and MP, and is its result. C thus stands here at both extremes, though the second extreme, which receives its form C from outside, from the commodity market, by way of M to C, is not the last extreme of the circuit, but only the latter of the first two stages that comprise its circulation process. Its result is P, and then P's function begins, the production process. It is only as the result of this, i.e. not as the result of the circulation process, that C prime appears as the close of the circuit, and in the same form as the original extreme C prime. In M to M prime and P to P, on the other hand, the closing extremes M prime and P are the direct results of the circulation process. This is why it is only at the close that M prime in the first case and P in the second case are assumed to be in the hands of others. Insofar as the circuit takes place between these extremes, neither M in the one case nor P in the other, the existence of M as someone else's money and of P as another production process, appears as a precondition for these circuits. C prime to C prime, on the other hand, presupposes C being L and MP, as other commodities in the hands of others, commodities which are drawn into the circuit and changed into productive capital by way of opening the process of circulation. Then, as the result of productive capital's function, C prime once again becomes the closing form of the circuit. But precisely because the circuit C prime to C prime presupposes in its description the existence of another industrial capital in the form C, being L and MP, and MP comprises other capitals of various kinds, for example, in our case, machines, coal, oil, etc., it itself demands to be considered not only as the general form of the circuit, i.e. as a social form in which every individual industrial capital can be considered, except in the case of its first investment, hence not only as a form of motion common to all individual industrial capitals, but at the same time as the form of motion of the sum of individual capitals, i.e. of the total social capital of the capitalist class, of movement in which the movement of any individual industrial capital simply appears as a partial one, intertwined with the others and conditioned by them. If we consider, for example, the total annual commodity product of a country, and analyze the movement in which one part of this replaces the productive capital of all individual businesses, and another part goes into the individual consumption of the different classes, then we are considering C prime to C prime as a form of motion of both the social capital and of the surplus value or surplus product produced by this. The fact that the social capital is equal to the sum of the individual capitals, including joint stock capital and also state capital, insofar as governments employ productive wage labor in mines, railways, etc., and function as industrial capitalists, and that the total movement of the social capital is equal to the algebraic sum of the movements of the individual capitals, in no way prevents this motion, as the motion of an isolated individual capital, from displaying phenomena different from those displayed by the same motion, when it is viewed as a part of the total motion of the social capital i.e. in its connection with the motions of the other parts of this. In this latter aspect, 
Problems can be resolved whose solution must be presupposed in considering the circuit of a single individual capital, instead of resulting from the study of this. C prime to C prime is the only circuit in which the capital value originally advanced forms only a part of the extreme that opens the movement, and in which the movement in this way proclaims itself from the start as a total movement of industrial capital, a movement both of the part of the product that replaces the productive capital and of the part that forms surplus product and is, on average, partly spent as revenue and partly has to serve as an element of accumulation. Insofar as the expenditure of surplus value as revenue is included in this circuit, individual consumption is also involved. This latter, however, is also included insofar as the starting point C, the commodity, exists as some particular kind of useful article. Every capitalistically produced article is commodity capital, irrespective of whether its use form destines it for productive or individual consumption or for both. M to M prime indicates only the value aspect, the valorization of the capital value advanced as the purpose of the whole process. P to P, being P prime, points to the production process of capital as a reproduction process with the productive capital remaining the same or growing in magnitude, accumulation. C prime to C prime, while it already proclaims itself in its initial extreme as a form of capitalist commodity production, comprises both productive and individual consumption from the start. Productive consumption and the valorization included in it appear simply as a branch of its movement. Finally, since C prime can exist in a use form, incapable of entering any further production process, it is apparent from the start that the various value components of C prime, expressed in portions of the product, must assume a different position, according to whether C prime to C prime is taken as a form of motion of the total social capital or as the independent movement of an individual industrial capital. In all these peculiarities, this circuit points beyond its own existence as the isolated circuit of a merely individual capital. In the figure C prime to C prime, one movement of the commodity capital, i.e. of the capitalistically produced total product, appears both as premise of the independent circuit of the individual capital and as conditioned by it in turn. Hence, if this figure is conceived in its particularity, it is no longer sufficient to rest content with the fact that the metamorphoses of C prime to M prime and M to C are on the one hand functionally determined sections of the metamorphosis of the capital and on the other hand links in the general circulation of commodities. It is necessary to make clear how the metamorphoses of an individual capital are intertwined with those of other individual capitals, and with the part of the total product that is destined for individual consumption. This is why our analysis of the circuit of the individual industrial capital was primarily based on the first two forms. In agriculture, for example, where they reckon from one harvest to the next, the circuit C' prime to C' prime does appear as the form of a single individual capital. Figure 2 proceeds from the sowing, and figure 3 from the harvest or, as the physiocrats put it, from avance and reprise, respectively. In figure 3, the movement of the capital value appears from the start simply as a part of the movement of the general mass of products, while in figures 1 and 2, the movement of C' prime simply forms a moment in the movement of a single capital. In figure 3, the commodities on the market form the permanent premise of the process of production and reproduction. Hence, if attention is fixed exclusively on this figure, all the elements of the production process seem to proceed from one commodity circulation and to exist only as commodities. This one-sided conception overlooks the elements of the production process that are independent of the commodity elements. Since in C' prime to C', prime, the total product, the total value, is the point of departure, it is evident here that, leaving aside foreign trade, reproduction on an expanded scale, with productivity otherwise remaining the same, can take place only if the material elements of the additional productive capital are already contained in the part of the surplus product to be capitalized. That is to say, insofar as the production of one year serves as a precondition for that of the next, or insofar as production can occur together with a simple reproduction process within a year, surplus product is immediately produced in the form that enables it to function as additional capital. Increased productivity can increase only the material substance of capital, and cannot raise its value, but it still forms additional material for valorization. C prime to C prime is the basis of Kesney's tableau économique, and it shows great discernment on his part that he selected this form in opposition to M to M prime, the form fixed on and isolated by the mercantile system, and not P to P. Chapter 4. The Three Figures of the Circuit Taking TC to stand for the total circulation process, we can depict the three figures as follows. 1. M to C to P to C' prime to M' prime. 2. P 
to TC to P. 3. TC to P being C prime. If we take all three forms together, then all the premises of the process appear as its result, as premises produced by the process itself. Each moment appears as a point of departure, of transit, and of return. The total process presents itself as the unity of the process of production and the process of circulation. The production process is the mediator of the circulation process, and vice versa. Common to all three circuits is the valorization of value as the determining purpose, as the driving motive. In Figure 1, this is actually expressed in the form. Form 2 begins with P, the valorization process itself. In Form 3, the circuit begins with the valorized value and closes with the newly valorized value even when the movement is repeated on the same scale. Insofar as C to M is M to C for the buyer and M to C is C to M for the seller, the circulation of capital simply displays the general metamorphosis of commodities and the laws developed in connection with this, see Volume 1, Chapter 3, Section 2, governing the amount of money in circulation apply here too. However, if we do not just dwell on this formal aspect of the matter, but consider the real connection between the metamorphoses of the various individual capitals, in fact, the connection between the circuits of individual capitals as partial movements of the reproduction process of the total social capital, then this process cannot be explained in terms of the simple change of form between money and commodity. In a constantly rotating orbit, every point is simultaneously a starting point and a point of return. If we interrupt the rotation, then not every starting point is a point of return. Thus, we have seen that not only does every particular circuit implicitly presuppose the others, but also that the repetition of the circuit in one form includes the motion which have to take place in the other forms of the circuit. Thus, the entire distinction presents itself as merely one of form, a merely subjective distinction that exists only for the observer. Insofar as each of these circuits is considered as a particular form of the movement in which different individual industrial capitals are involved, this difference also exists throughout simply at the individual level. In reality, however, each individual industrial capital is involved in all three at the same time. The three circuits, the forms of reproduction of the three varieties of capital, are continuously executed alongside one another. One part of the capital value, for example, which for the moment functions as commodity capital, is transformed into money capital, while at the same time another part passes out of the production process into circulation as new commodity capital. Thus the circular form of C' prime to C' prime is constantly described, and the same is the case with the two other forms. The reproduction of the capital in each of its forms, and at each of its stages, is just as continuous as is the metamorphosis of these forms, and their successive passage through these stages. Here, therefore, the entire circuit is the real unity of its three forms. We have assumed in our discussion that the capital value appears either as money capital, productive capital, or commodity capital to the full extent of its magnitude. We thus had the £422, for example, first completely as money capital, then transformed fully into productive capital, finally as commodity capital, yarn to the value of £500, including £78 surplus value. The various stages here constitute an equal number of interruptions. For example, as long as the £422 persists in its money form, i.e. until the purchase, M to C, factoring into L and M P are completed, the total capital exists and functions simply as money capital. Once it is transformed into productive capital, it functions neither as money capital nor as commodity capital. Its entire circulation process is interrupted. Just as on the other hand, its entire production process is interrupted as soon as it functions in one of the two stages of circulation, whether as M or as C prime. Thus the circuit P to P would present itself not only as a periodic renewal of the productive capital, but equally as an interruption in its function, the production process, until the circulation process had been completed. Instead of taking place continuously, production would be pursued only in spasms and be repeated only after periods of time of accidental duration according to whether the two stages of the circulation process were accomplished quicker or more slowly. This would be the case, for example, with a Chinese handicraftsman who works only for individual clients and whose production process comes to a halt between one order and the next. This is, in fact, true for each individual portion of capital in motion, and all portions of the capital go through this movement in succession. Assume that the 10,000 pounds of yarn is one week's output of a spinning mill. This 10,000 pounds of yarn moves in its entirety from the sphere of production into that of circulation. The capital value contained in it must be entirely transformed into money capital, and as long as it persists in the form of money capital, it cannot re-enter the production process, 
it must first enter circulation and be transformed back into the elements of productive capital, L and MP. The circuit of capital is a constant process of interruption. One stage is left behind, the next stage embarked upon, one form is cast aside, and the capital exists in another. Each of these stages not only conditions the other, but at the same time excludes it. But continuity is the characteristic feature of capitalist production, and is required by its technical basis, even if it is not always completely attainable. Let us see how things proceed in reality. While our 10,000 pounds of yarn steps onto the market as commodity capital and accomplishes its transformation into money, whether as a means of payment, means of purchase, or simply money of account, new cotton, coal, etc., comes into the production process in its place. All this has therefore already been transformed back from both the money form and the commodity form into the form of productive capital, and begins its function as such. Moreover, while the first 10,000 pounds of yarn is being converted into money, a previous 10,000 pounds is already describing the second stage of its circulation, and being transformed back from money into the elements of productive capital. All portions of capital go through the circuit in succession, and at any one time they find themselves in various stages of it. Thus industrial capital in the continuity of its circuit is simultaneously in all of its stages, and in the various functional forms corresponding to them. While the circuit C' prime to C' prime has only just begun for that part which is transformed from commodity capital into money for the first time, for industrial capital, considered as a self-moving totality, the same circuit C' prime to C' prime has already been traversed. Money is given out with one hand and taken in with the other. What is at one point the commencement of the circuit M to M' prime is simultaneously at another point its conclusion. The same applies for the productive capital. The real circuit of industrial capital in its continuity is therefore not only a unified process of circulation and production, but also a unity of all its three circuits. But it can only be such a unity insofar as each different part of the capital runs in succession through the successive phases of the circuit, can pass over from one phase and one functional form into the other. Hence, industrial capital, as the whole of these parts, exists simultaneously in its various phases and functions, and thus describes all three circuits at once. The succession of the various parts is here determined by their coexistence, i.e., by the way in which capital is divided. In the developed factory system, the product is continuously at the various stages of its formation, and in transition from one phase of production to another. Since each individual industrial capital has a definite size, which is dependent on the means of the capitalist and has a definite minimum for each branch of industry, definite numerical ratios must obtain in its division into parts. The size of the capital involved determines the scale of the production process, and this determines the volume of commodity capital and money capital, insofar as these function alongside the production process. The coexistence which determines the continuity of production, however, exists only through the movement in which the portions of capital successively describe the various stages. The coexistence is itself only the result of the succession. If C' prime to M' prime comes to a halt in the case of one portion, for example, if the commodity is unsaleable, then the circuit of this part is interrupted, and its replacement by its means of production is not accomplished. The successive parts that emerge from the production process as C' prime find their change of function barred by their predecessors. If this continues for some time, production is restricted and the whole process brought to a standstill. Every delay in the succession brings the coexistence into disarray. Every delay in one stage causes a greater or lesser delay in the entire circuit, not only that of the portion of the capital that is delayed, but also that of the entire individual capital. The immediate form in which the process presents itself is that of a succession of phases, so that the transition of the capital into a new phase is determined by its abandonment of the previous one. Thus, every particular circuit has one of the functional forms of the capital as its starting point and point of return. On the other hand, the total process is in fact the unity of the three circuits, which are the different forms in which the continuity of the process is expressed. The total circuit presents itself for each functional form of capital as its own specific circuit, and indeed each of these circuits conditions the continuity of the overall process. The circular course of one functional form determines that of the others. It is a necessary condition for the overall production process, in other words, for the social capital, that this is at the same time a process of reproduction and hence the circuit of each of its moments. Different fractions of the capital successively pass through the different stages and functional forms. Each functional form thus passes through its circuit simultaneously with the others, though it is always a different part of the capital that presents itself in it. A part of the capital exists as commodity capital that is being transformed into money, 
but this is an ever-changing part and is constantly being reproduced. Another part exists as money capital that is being transformed into productive capital. A third part as productive capital being transformed into commodity capital. The constant presence of all three forms is mediated by the circuit of the total capital through precisely these three phases. As a whole, then, the capital is simultaneously present and spatially coexistent in its various phases, but each part is constantly passing from one phase or functional form into another, and thus functions in all of them in turn. The forms are therefore fluid forms, and their simultaneity is mediated by their succession. Each form both follows and precedes the others, so that the return of one part of the capital to one form is determined by the return of another part to another form. Each part continuously describes its own course, but there is always another part of capital that finds itself in this form, and these particular circuits simply constitute simultaneous and successive moments of the overall process. It is only in the unity of the three circuits that the continuity of the overall process is realized, in place of the interruption we have just delineated. The total social capital always possesses this continuity, and its process always contains the unity of the three circuits. For individual capitals, the continuity of reproduction is at certain points interrupted to a greater or lesser degree. Firstly, the quantities of value are frequently distributed amongst the various stages and functional forms in unequal portions at different times. Secondly, these portions may be differently divided, according to the character of the commodity which has to be produced, thus according to the particular sphere of production in which the capital has been invested. Thirdly, the continuity may be more or less interrupted in branches of production that depend on the season, either as a result of natural conditions, agriculture, fishing for herrings, etc., or as a matter of convention, as is the case with so-called seasonal work, for example. It is in the factory and in mining that the process occurs most regularly and uniformly, but this difference between branches of production does not give rise to any difference in the general forms of the circuit. Capital, as self-valorizing value, does not just comprise class relations, a definite social character that depends on the existence of labor as wage labor. It is a movement, a circulatory process through different stages, which itself, in turn, includes three different forms of the circulatory process. Hence, it can only be grasped as a movement, and not as a static thing. Those who consider the autonomization of value as a mere abstraction forget that the movement of industrial capital is this abstraction in action. Here, value passes through different forms, different movements in which it is both preserved and increases, is valorized. Since we are firstly dealing here simply with the forms of movement, we have not considered the revolutions that the capital value may suffer in its circulatory process. It is clear, however, that despite all revolutions in value, Capitalist production can exist and continue to exist only so long as the capital value is valorized, i.e. describes its circuit as value that has become independent, and therefore so long as the revolutions in value are somehow or other mastered and balanced out. The movements of capital appear as actions of the individual industrial capitalist insofar as he functions as buyer of commodities and labor, seller of commodities, and productive capitalist, and thus mediates the circuit by his own activity. If the social capital value suffers a revolution in value, it can come about that his individual capital succumbs to this and is destroyed, because it cannot meet the conditions of this movement of value. The more acute and frequent these revolutions in value become, the more the movement of independent value, acting with the force of an elemental natural process, prevails over the foresight and calculation of the individual capitalist, the more the course of normal production is subject to abnormal speculation, and the greater becomes the danger to the existence of individual capitals. These periodic revolutions in value thus confirm what they ostensibly refute, the independence which value acquires as capital and which is maintained and intensified through its movement. The sequence of metamorphoses of capital and process implies the continuous comparison of the change in value brought about in the circuit with the original value of the capital. The independence of value in relation to the value-forming power, labor power, is introduced by the act M to L, the purchase of labor power, and is realized during the production process as exploitation of labor power. But this independence does not reappear in the circuit in which money, commodity, and elements of production are only alternating forms of the capital value in process, and in which the past magnitude of the value is compared with the present changed value of the capital. Value, says Bailey, opposing the autonomization of value which characterizes the capitalist mode of production and which he treats as the illusion of certain economists, Value is a relation between contemporary commodities, because such only admit of being exchanged with each other. 
He says this in opposition to the comparison of commodity values at different points in time, a comparison which, if the value of money at each period is taken as fixed, is simply a comparison between the expenditure of labor required in different epochs for the production of the same kind of commodities. This derives from his general misunderstanding, according to which exchange value equals value. The form of value is value itself, thus commodity values cease to be comparable once they no longer actively function as exchange values and cannot actually be exchanged for one another. He does not in the least suspect, therefore, that value functions as capital value or capital only insofar as it remains identical with itself and is compared with itself in the different phases of its circuit, which are in no way contemporary but rather occur in succession. In order to consider the formula of the circuit in its pure state, it is not sufficient to assume that commodities are sold at their values. This must also take place in circumstances that, in other respects, too, remain the same. If we take the form P to P, for example, we must disregard all technical revolutions in the production process which may devalue the productive capital of a particular capitalist. We must also disregard any repercussions that a change in the value elements of the productive capital might have on the value of the existing commodity capital, which may rise or fall if there is a stock of this on hand. Let C prime, the 10,000 pounds of yarn, be sold at its value of 500 pounds sterling. 8,440 pounds, equaling 422 pounds sterling, replaces the capital value contained in it. But if the value of cotton, coal, etc. rises, here we disregard mere price fluctuations, then this 422 pounds may not be sufficient to replace completely the elements of the productive capital. Additional money capital is then necessary, i.e. money capital is tied up. Conversely, if these prices fall, money capital is set free. The process takes place quite normally only if value relations remain constant. In practice, it runs its course as long as the disturbances in the repetition of the circuit balance each other out. The greater the disturbances, the greater the money capital that the industrial capitalist must possess in order to ride out the period of readjustment. And since the scale of each individual production process grows with the progress of capitalist production, and with it the minimum size of the capital to be advanced, this circumstance is added to the other circumstances, which increasingly turn the function of industrial capitalist into a monopoly of large-scale money capitalists, either individual or associated. We may remark here, in passing, that when there is a change in the value of the elements of production, a distinction arises between the form M to M prime on the one hand, and the forms P to P and C prime to C prime on the other. In M to M prime, as the formula for newly invested capital, which first appears as money capital, a fall in the value of the means of production, for example raw materials, ancillaries, etc., means that only a smaller outlay of money capital than previously is required in order to open a business of a particular size, since, given that the level of the productive forces remains the same, the scale of the production process depends only on the volume and scale of the means of production that a given quantity of labor power can cope with, and not on the value of those means of production or on that of the labor power. The latter simply has an effect on the magnitude of the valorization. Conversely, if there is an increase in the value of the elements of production of the commodities which form the elements of productive capital, then more money capital is necessary in order to found a business of a given size. In both cases, it is only the amount of the money capital to be newly invested that is affected. In the first case, some money capital becomes superfluous. In the second case, more money capital is tied up provided that the rate of increase of a new individual industrial capital proceeds as is usual in a given branch of production. The circuits P to P and C prime to C prime behave in the same way as M to M prime only insofar as the movements of P and C prime is at the same time accumulation, i.e. insofar as excess small m, money, is transformed into money capital. Otherwise, they are affected differently from M to M prime by a change in the value of the elements of productive capital. Here, we once again disregard the impact a change in value of this kind has on the components which are already involved in the production process. Here it is not the original outlay that is directly affected, but rather an industrial capital involved not in its first circuit, but in its process of reproduction, i.e. C prime to C factoring into L and MP, the conversion of commodity capital back into its elements of production, insofar as these consist of commodities. With a fall in value, or price, Three cases are possible. First, the reproduction process may be continued on the same scale, in which case a part of the former money capital is set free, and money capital is stored up, though neither real accumulation, production on an expanded scale, 
nor the preliminary and accompanying transformation of small m, surplus value, into an accumulation fund has taken place. Second, the reproduction process may be expanded to a larger scale than would have otherwise been the case if the technical proportions permit this. Or third, a larger reserve of raw materials, etc., may be built up. The opposite happens with a rise in the value of the replacement element of commodity capital. Reproduction then no longer takes place on its normal scale. For example, working hours may be cut. Or, additional money capital has to be injected in order to continue the former scale of reproduction. Money capital is tied up. Or, finally, the monetary accumulation fund, where there is one, has to serve in whole or in part for pursuing the reproduction process on its old scale, instead of expanding it. This also involves the tying up of money capital, although here the additional money capital does not come from an external source, from the money market, but rather from the resources of the industrial capitalist himself. But there can be modifying circumstances to P to P and C prime to C prime. If our cotton spinner has a large reserve of raw cotton, for example, i.e. a large part of his productive capital is in the form of a cotton stock, then a part of his productive capital will be devalued by a fall in the cotton prices. If these rise, then this part of his productive capital conversely rises in value. On the other hand, if he has large quantities tied up in the form of commodity capital, for example in cotton yarn, then a fall in cotton prices will devalue a part of his commodity capital and thus a part of his overall capital in the circuit, conversely with a rise in cotton prices. In the process C' prime to M to C factoring into L and MP finally, if C' prime to M, the realization of commodity capital, has taken place before the change in value of the elements of C, then the capital is affected only in the way considered in the first case, i.e. in the second act of circulation M to C factoring into L and MP. But if the change in value occurs before the completion of C' prime to M, then, with other circumstances remaining the same, the fall in the price of cotton leads to a corresponding fall in the price of yarn, and a rise in the price of cotton to a rise in the price of yarn. The effect on the various individual capitals invested in the same branch of production can be very different according to the different circumstances in which they are found. Money capital may also be set free or tied up as the result of differences in the duration of the circulation process, i.e. in the speed of circulation. This, however, belongs to the discussion of turnover. What interests us here is simply the real distinction which emerges between M to M' prime and the two other forms of the circuit with respect to the changes in value of the elements of productive capital. In the section of circulation M to C factoring into L and MP, in the epoch when the capitalist mode of production is already developed, and hence dominant, a large part of the commodities which the means of production, MP, consist, are themselves the functioning commodity capital of others. From the standpoint of the seller, therefore, what takes place is C prime to M prime, the transformation of commodity capital into money capital. But this does not hold good absolutely. On the contrary, Within its circulation process, in which industrial capital functions either as money or as commodity, the circuit of industrial capital, whether in the form of money capital or commodity capital, cuts across the commodity circulation of the most varied modes of social production, insofar as this commodity circulation simultaneously reflects commodity production. Whether the commodities are the product of production based on slavery, the product of peasants, of a community, of state production, or of half-savage hunting peoples, etc., as commodities and money, they confront the money and commodities in which the industrial capital presents itself, and enter both into the latter's own circuit and into that of the surplus value borne by the commodity capital, insofar as the latter is spent as revenue, i.e. in both branches of the circulation of commodity capital. The character of the production process from which they derive is immaterial. They function on the market as commodities, and as commodities, they enter both the circuit of industrial capital and the circulation of the surplus value borne by it. Thus the circulation process of industrial capital is characterized by the many-sided character of its origins, and the existence of the market as a world market. What holds for foreign commodities holds also for foreign money, as commodity capital functions in relation to money simply as commodity, so this money functions towards commodity capital simply as money. The money functions here as world money. Now, however, there are two further points to be made. Firstly, as soon as the act M to MP is completed, the commodities, MP, cease to be commodities and become one of the modes of existence of industrial capital in its functional form P, productive capital. Their provenance is therefore obliterated. They now exist simply as forms of existence of industrial capital and are incorporated into it. Yet it remains the case that their replacement requires their reproduction, 
and to this extent the capitalist mode of production is conditioned by modes of production lying outside its own stage of development. Its tendency, however, is to transform all possible production into commodity production. The main means by which it does this is precisely by drawing this production into its circulation process, and developed commodity production is itself capitalist commodity production. The intervention of industrial capital everywhere promotes this transformation, and with it too the transformation of all immediate producers into wage laborers. Secondly, whatever the origin of the commodities that go into the circulation process of industrial capital, and these include the necessary means of subsistence into which variable capital is transformed after being paid to the workers so that they can reproduce their labor power, whatever therefore may be the social form or the production process from which these commodities derive, they confront industrial capital straight away in its form of commodity capital, they themselves having the form of commodity dealing or merchant's capital, and this, by its very nature, embraces commodities from all modes of production. As the capitalist mode of production presupposes production on a large scale, so it also necessarily presupposes large-scale sale, sale to the merchant, not to the individual consumer. Insofar as this consumer is himself a productive consumer, i.e. an industrial capitalist, i.e. insofar as an industrial capital in one branch of production supplies means of production to another branch, there is also direct sale by one industrial capitalist to several others, in the form of orders, etc., each industrial capitalist is a direct seller insofar as he is himself his own merchant, which he is moreover also when he sells to a merchant. Commodity trade is presupposed, as a function of merchant's capital, and this develops ever further with the development of capitalist production. Thus we occasionally take its existence for granted in illustrating particular aspects of the capitalist circulation process. But in this general analysis, we assume direct sale without the intervention of the merchant, since this intervention conceals various moments of the movement. We may quote Sismondi, who presents the matter rather naively. Quote, Commerce employs a considerable capital, and this appears at first glance not to form part of that whose course we have charted. The value of the cloth accumulated in the stores of the draper seems at first to be completely different from the part of the year's production that the rich man gives to the poor man as a wage to have him work for him. But this capital has simply replaced that of which we have been speaking. In order to grasp clearly the progress of wealth, we started with its creation, and we have followed it through to its consumption. The capital employed in the manufacture of cloth, for example, we regarded as remaining constant. Exchanged against the revenue of the consumer, it divided into only two parts. One of these served as revenue for the manufacturer, in the form of profit. The other served as revenue for the workers in the form of wages, while they were manufacturing more cloth but it was soon found to be to everyone's advantage for the various parts of this capital to replace one another, so that if 100,000 crowns was sufficient for the whole circulation between the manufacturer and the consumer, this 100,000 crowns would be shared equally between the manufacturer, the wholesale merchant, and the retailer. The first of these, who receives only a third of the total, does the same work as he did when he received the whole lot, because the moment its manufacture is completed, he finds the merchant to buy it much sooner than he would have found the consumer. The wholesaler's capital, for its part, is replaced by that of the retailer much sooner. The difference between the sums advanced in wages and the purchase price for the final consumer forms the profit on the capitals. It is divided between the manufacturer, the wholesaler, and the retailer, after they have divided their functions between them, and the task accomplished is the same, even though it has employed three persons and three fractions of capital in place of one. All these, the merchants, indirectly participated in production, for as the aim of production is consumption, it cannot be considered accomplished until it has placed the object produced at the disposal of the consumer. End quote. In considering the general forms of the circuit, and throughout the second volume in general, we take money to be metal money, excluding symbolic money, mere tokens of value which are specific to particular countries, as well as credit money, which we have not yet developed. Firstly, this is the course taken by history. Credit money played no role, or at least not a significant one, in the early period of capitalist production. Secondly, the necessity of this course can be proved theoretically, insofar as everything critical that has so far been said about the circulation of credit money by Tuke and others compelled them time and again to look back at how the matter would present itself on the basis of mere metallic circulation. It should not be forgotten, however, that metallic money cannot only function as means of purchase, but also as means of payment. For the sake of simplification, we generally take it, in this second volume, only in the first functional form. 
The circulation process of industrial capital, which forms only one part of its individual circuit, is determined, insofar as it represents only a series of acts within the general commodity circulation, by the general laws that have already been developed. See Volume 1, Chapter 3. The same quantity of money, for example 500 pounds, puts correspondingly more industrial capitals into circulation, i.e. individual capitals in their form as commodity capitals. The greater the velocity of circulation of the money, thus the faster each individual capital passes through its series of metamorphoses into commodities and money. Capital of the same value accordingly requires less money for its circulation. The more the money functions as a means of payment, for example, the more that it is only balances that have to be settled when a commodity capital is replaced by its means of production, and the shorter the periods of payment, for example, in the payment of wages. On the other hand, assuming that the velocity of circulation and all other circumstances remain the same, the amount of money needed to circulate as money capital is determined by the sum of the prices of the commodities, price multiplied by the quantity of commodities, or alternatively, given the quantity and values of the commodities by the value of the money itself. But the laws of general commodity circulation apply only insofar as the circulation process of capital is a series of simple acts of circulation, and not insofar as the latter form functionally specific sections of the circuits of individual industrial capitals. In order to make this clear, it is best to consider the circulation process in its uninterrupted interconnection, as it appears in the two forms, form 2, P to C prime, to track 1 being C to M to C factoring into L and M P, to P being P prime, and track 2 being to M prime, and track 3 being to small c to small m to small c, and form 3, C prime, to track 1 being C to M to C factoring into L and M P, to P and C prime, to track 2 being M prime, and track 3 being small c to small m to small c. As a series of acts of circulation in general, the circulation process, whether as C to M to C or as M to C to M, simply presents two opposing series of commodity metamorphoses, each individual metamorphosis including the opposite metamorphosis on the part of the other person's commodity or money that confronts it. C to M on the part of the commodity possessor is M to C on the part of the purchaser. The first metamorphosis of the commodity in C to M is the second metamorphosis of the commodity which steps forth as M. Conversely with M to C. What was previously demonstrated concerning the intertwining of the metamorphoses of a commodity at one stage with those of another commodity at another stage therefore holds good for the circulation of capital, insofar as the capitalist is buyer and seller of commodities, and his capital accordingly functions as money towards others' commodities, or as a commodity towards others' money. This intertwining, however, is not by this token alone an entwining of the metamorphoses of capitals. Firstly, M to C, being MP, as we have seen, can depict an entwining of the metamorphoses of various individual capitals. The commodity capital of the cotton spinner, yarn, for example, is in part replaced by coal. A part of his capital exists in the money form and is converted from this into the commodity form, while the capital of the mine owner exists in the commodity form and is therefore converted into the money form. The same act of circulation here represents opposite metamorphoses on the part of two industrial capitals, which belong to different branches of production, i.e. an entwining of the series of metamorphoses of these capitals. As we have seen, however, the MP into which M is converted need not be commodity capital in the categorical sense, i.e. need not be a functional form of industrial capital produced by a capitalist. It is always M to C on the one hand and C to M on the other, but not always an entwining of metamorphoses of capital. Furthermore, M to L, the acquisition of labor power, is never an entwining of capital metamorphoses, for while labor power is certainly a commodity for the worker, it becomes capital only when it is sold to the capitalist. In the process C' prime to M' prime, on the other hand, M' prime does not need to be converted commodity capital. It can be the expression in money of the commodity labor power, i.e. wages, or of a product produced by an independent worker a slave, a serf, or a community. Secondly, it is by no means always the case that the functionally determined role played by every metamorphosis that takes place within the circulation process of an individual capital represents the corresponding opposite metamorphosis in the circuit of the other capital, particularly if we assume that the whole of production for the world market is pursued on a capitalist basis. In the circuit P to P, for example, the M' prime that turns C' prime into cash may be, on the side of the buyer, simply the monetary expression of his surplus value, if the commodity is an article of consumption. 
Alternatively, in M prime to C prime, factoring into L and M P, i.e., where accumulated capital is involved, it may be for the buyer of M P simply a replacement for his capital advance, or it may not re enter his capital circulation at all, particularly if this branches off into expenditure of revenue. The way in which the various components of the total social capital, of which the individual capitals are only independently functioning components, alternately replace one another in the circulation process, both with respect to capital and to surplus value, is thus not the result of the simple intertwining of the metamorphoses that occurs in commodity circulation, and which the acts of capital circulation have in common with all other processes of commodity circulation, but rather requires a different mode of investigation. Up till now, mere phrases have been taken as sufficient in this respect, although when these are analyzed more closely they contain nothing more than indefinite notions, simply borrowed from the intertwining of metamorphoses that is common to all commodity circulation. One of the most obvious peculiarities of the circuit of industrial capital, and thus of capitalist production, is the situation that on the one hand, the elements from which productive capital is formed stem from the commodity market, and must be continually renewed from it, bought as commodities, and on the other hand, the product of the labor process emerges from it as a commodity, and must constantly be sold anew as a commodity. A modern farmer in the lowlands of Scotland might, for example, be contrasted with an old-fashioned small peasant on the continent. The former sells his entire product and thus has to replace all its elements, even the seed corn, on the market, while the latter consumes the greater part of his product directly, buys and sells as little as possible, and as far as possible produces his tools, clothing, etc. himself. Natural economy, money economy, and credit economy have for this reason been counterposed as the three characteristic economic forms of motion of social production. Firstly, these three forms do not represent phases of development of the same status. The so-called credit economy is itself only a form of the money economy, insofar as both terms express functions or modes of commerce between the producers themselves. In developed capitalist production, the money economy simply appears as the basis of the credit economy. Thus, money economy and credit economy merely correspond to different stages of development of capitalist production. They are in no way different independent forms of commerce as opposed to natural economy. It would be just as valid to counterpose the very varied forms of natural economy as equal in status to the other two. Secondly, what is emphasized in the categories money economy and credit economy and stressed as the distinctive feature, is actually not the economy proper, i.e. the production process itself, but rather the mode of commerce between the various agents of production, or producers, that corresponds to the economy. And so this should also be done in the case of the first category. Instead of natural economy, we would then have barter economy. A completely enclosed natural economy, such as the Inca state of Peru, would fall into none of these categories. Thirdly, money economy is common to all commodity production and the product appears as a commodity in the most diverse organisms of social production. Thus, it would simply be the scale on which the product was produced as an article of trade, as a commodity, and thus also the extent to which its own formative elements must again enter the commodity from which it derives as articles of trade, as commodities, which would characterize capitalist production. In point of fact, capitalist production is commodity production as the general form of production, but it is only so and becomes ever more so in its development because labor itself here appears as a commodity, because the worker sells his labor, i.e. the function of his labor power, and moreover, as we have assumed, at a value determined by the cost of its reproduction. The producer becomes an industrial capitalist to the same extent that labor becomes wage labor. Hence, capitalist production, and thus also commodity production, appears in its full extent only when the direct agricultural producer is also a wage laborer. In the relation between capitalist and wage labor, the money relation, the relation of buyer and seller, becomes a relation inherent in the production itself. But this relation rests fundamentally on the social character of production, not on the mode of commerce. The latter rather derives from the former. It is typical of the bourgeois horizon, moreover, where business deals fill the whole of people's minds to see the foundation of the mode of production in the mode of commerce corresponding to it, rather than the other way around. The capitalist casts less value into circulation in the form of money than he draws out of it, because he casts in more value in the form of commodities than he has extracted in the form of commodities. Insofar as he functions merely as the personification of capital, as industrial capitalist, his supply of commodity value is always greater than his demand for it. 
If his supply and demand matched one another in this respect, this would be equivalent to the non-valorization of his capital. It would not have functioned as productive capital. Productive capital would have been transformed into commodity capital that had not been impregnated with surplus value. It would not have extracted from labor power during the production process any surplus value in the commodity form, and thus not functioned as capital at all. The capitalist must indeed sell dearer than he has bought. But he manages to do this only because the capitalist production process enables him to transform the cheaper, because less valuable, commodities that he has bought into more valuable, and hence dearer, ones. He sells dearer not because he sells above the value of his commodities, but because he sells commodities of a value greater than the sum of values of the ingredients required to produce them. The greater the difference between the capitalist's supply and his demand, i.e. the greater the additional commodity value that he supplies over the commodity value that he demands, the greater the rate at which he valorizes his capital. His goal is not simply to cover his demand with his supply, but to have the greatest possible excess of supply over demand. What is true for the individual capitalist is true for the capitalist class. Insofar as the capitalist simply personifies industrial capital, his own demand consists simply in the demand for means of production and labor power. His demand for MP is smaller in value terms than the capital he has advanced. He buys means of production to a smaller value than the value of his capital, and hence to a still smaller value than that of the commodity capital he supplies. As far as his demand for labor power is concerned, it is determined in its value by the ratio between his variable capital and his total capital, i.e. V to C. In capitalist production, therefore, this demand grows at a smaller rate than his demand for means of production. The capitalist buys more of MP than of L, and to a steadily increasing extent. Insofar as the worker converts his wages almost wholly into means of subsistence, and by far the greater part into necessities, the capitalist's demand for labor power is indirectly also a demand for the means of consumption that enter into the consumption of the working class. But this demand equals V, and not an atom more. If the worker saves something out of his wages, we necessarily leave the matter of credit out of consideration here, this means that he transforms a part of his wage into a hoard, and to this extent does not appear as a customer. The maximum limit of the capitalist demand is C, equaling small c plus v. But his supply is small c plus v plus s. Thus, if the composition of his commodity capital is 80 parts small c, 20 parts v, and 20 parts s, then his demand is 80 parts small c plus 20 parts v, a value one-fifth smaller than his supply. The greater the percentage of s produced, the rate of profit, the smaller his demand in relation to his supply. Although, as production advances, the capitalist demand for labor power, and hence indirectly for necessary means of subsistence, becomes progressively smaller than his demand for means of production. It should not be forgotten that his demand for MP is always smaller than his capital, considering this day by day. His demand for means of production must thus always be smaller in value than the commodity product of the capitalist who works with the same capital and under otherwise similar conditions, and supplies him with these means of production. That many capitalists are involved here, and not just one, in no way affects the matter. Assume that his capital is 1,000 pounds, the constant part of this being 800 pounds, then his demand on all of these capitalists is 800 pounds. Together they supply for each 1,000 pounds, no matter how much of this falls to each one of them and what portion this may constitute in his total capital. Assuming the same rate of profit, the means of production to a value of 1,200 pounds. Thus, his demand only covers two-thirds of their supply, while his own total demand is only four-fifths of his own supply, considered in value terms. We still have to investigate the question of turnover, for the time being only in passing. Assuming that his total social capital is £5,000, of which £4,000 is fixed and £1,000 circulating, this 1,000 is equal to 800 parts small c and 200 parts v, according to the above assumption. His circulating capital must turn over five times in the year in order for his total capital to turn over once. His commodity product is then £6,000, i.e. £1,000 greater than the capital he advanced, which once again gives the same ratio of surplus value as above. 5,000 parts C to 1,000 parts S, equaling 100 parts small c plus v to 20 parts S. Thus this turnover in no way alters the ratio of his total demand to his total supply the former remaining one-fifth smaller than the latter. Let us assume that his fixed capital has to be renewed in ten years. 
Each year, then, he amortizes one-tenth, equaling 400 pounds. After the first year, he has a value of 3,600 pounds in fixed capital and 400 pounds in money. Insofar as repairs are necessary, and these do not exceed the average amount, they are simply capital that is invested at a later date. We can consider the matter as if he had allowed for all the repair costs when he assessed the value of his invested capital, insofar as this enters into the annual commodity product, so that these are included in the one-tenth amortization. If his repair needs are lower than average, this is simply a bonus for him, just as it is to his disadvantage if they are higher. In any case, although, on the assumption that his total capital turns over once in the year, his annual demand remains £5,000, the same as the original capital value he advanced, it increases with respect to the circulating part of the capital, while it steadily declines with respect to the fixed part. We now come to reproduction. Assume that the capitalist consumes the entire surplus value small m, and reconverts only the original capital sum c into productive capital. The capitalist's demand is now equal in value to his supply, but this is not so in respect to the movement of his capital. As capitalist, he exerts a demand only on the basis of four-fifths of his supply, in value terms. The remaining fifth he consumes as non-capitalist, not in his function as a capitalist, but for his private requirements or pleasures. His account, reckoned in percentages, is then his demand as a capitalist being 100, supply 120, his demand as a man of the world being 20, the total demand equaling 120 out of a supply of 120. This assumption is equivalent to assuming the non-existence of capitalist production, and therefore the non-existence of the industrial capitalist himself. For capitalism is already essentially abolished once we assume that it is enjoyment that is the driving motive and not enrichment itself. It is moreover also technically impossible. The capitalist must not only form a reserve capital to guard against price fluctuations, and in order to be able to await the most favorable conjunctures for buying and selling, he must accumulate capital in order to extend production and incorporate technical advances into his productive organism. In order to accumulate capital, he must first withdraw from circulation a part of the surplus value that he obtained from it, and let it grow in the form of a hoard until it has assumed the requisite dimensions for an extension of his old business or the opening of a new line. As long as the hoarding continues, the capitalist's demand is not increased, the money is immobilized and does not withdraw from the commodity market an equivalent in commodities for the money equivalent that it is withdrawn for commodities supplied. We have ignored credit here, and it pertains to credit if the capitalist deposits the money that he accumulates in a bank, for example, on current account bearing interest. Chapter 5. Circulation Time As we have seen, the movements of capital through the production sphere and the two phases of the circulation sphere are accomplished successively in time. The duration of its stay in the production sphere forms its production time, that in the circulation sphere its circulation time. The total amount of time it takes to describe its circuit is therefore equal to the sum of its production time and its circulation time. The production time includes, of course, the period of the labor process, but this is not all. We should first recall that a part of the constant capital exists in means of labor such as machines, buildings, etc., which serve for constant repetitions of the same labor process until they are worn out. The periodic interruption of the labor process, at night, for example, may interrupt the function of these means of labor, but it does not affect their stay in the place of production. They belong to this not only when they function, but also when they do not function. What is more, the capitalist must hold in reserve a certain stock of raw and ancillary materials, so that the production process can keep going for shorter or longer intervals on the previously determined scale, without depending on the accidents of daily supply on the market. This reserve of raw materials, etc., is only gradually consumed productively. There is therefore a difference between the capital's production time and its functioning time. The production time of the means of production generally comprises 1 the time during which they function as means of production and thus serve in the production process, two, the pauses during which the production process and thus also the functioning of the means of production incorporated in it is interrupted, and three, the time during which they are held in reserve as conditions of the process and thus already represent productive capital but are not yet engaged in the production process. The difference so far considered is in each case a difference between the time that the productive capital remains in the production sphere and its time in the actual production process. But the production process may itself involve interruptions of the labor process and hence of working time, 
intervals in which the object of labor is exposed to the action of physical processes without further addition of human labor. The production process, and hence the function of the means of production, continues in this case, even though the labor process, and hence the function of the means of production as means of labor, is interrupted. This is the case, for example, with corn that is sown, wine that ferments in the cellar, or material of labor that is exposed to chemical processes, as in many industries such as tanning. Here, the production time is greater than the working time. The difference between the two consists in an excess of the production time over the working time. This excess is always based on the fact that the productive capital exists in a latent state in the production sphere, without functioning in the production process itself, or that it functions in the production process without being involved in the labor process. The part of the latent productive capital that is simply held in readiness as a condition for the production process, such as cotton, coal, etc., in the spinning mill, acts neither to form products nor values. It is idle capital, although its idleness forms a condition for the uninterrupted flow of the production process. The buildings, apparatus, etc., that are necessary for storing the productive reserve, the latent capital, are conditions of the production process and hence form components of the productive capital advanced. They fulfill their function by maintaining the productive components in the preliminary stage. They make the raw material, etc., dearer. But since a part of this labor, in the same way as a part of all other wage labor, is not paid for, it is productive labor and creates surplus value. The normal interruptions of the overall production process, i.e. the intervals in which the productive capital does not function, produce neither value nor surplus value. Hence the drive towards night work. See Volume 1, Chapter 10, Section 4. The intervals in the working time that the object of labor has itself to undergo during the production process create neither value nor surplus value, but they further the product, form a part of its life, a process that it must pass through. The value of the apparatus, etc., is carried over to the product in proportion to the entire period during which it functions. The product is placed in this stage by labor itself, and the use of this apparatus is just as much a condition of production as the reduction to dust of a part of the cotton that does not go into the product, but still carries its value over to it. The other part of the latent capital, such as the buildings, machines, etc., i.e. the means of labor whose function is interrupted only by the regular pauses in the production process, irregular interruptions as a result of a restriction of production, crises, etc., adds value without entering into the formation of the product. The total value that the means of labor add to the product is determined by the average length of their life. They lose value because they lose use value, not only in the time during which they are functioning, but also in the time during which they are not. Finally, the value of that part of the constant capital that continues in the production process, even when the labor process is interrupted, appears once again in the result of the production process. The means of production are here placed by labor itself in conditions in which they undergo by themselves certain specific natural processes, the result of which is a specific useful effect or changed form of their use value. Labor always carries over the value of the means of production to the product, to the extent that it actually consumes these deliberately as means of production. Nothing is altered here by whether the labor must, through the means of labor, act continuously on the object of labor in order to produce this effect, or whether it need only give the first impulse by placing the means of production in conditions in which they themselves undergo the intended alteration, without labor's further collaboration, as a result of natural processes. Whatever may be the reason for the excess of production time over working time, whether it is because the means of production form only latent productive capital, i.e. still exist in a stage preliminary to the production process proper, or because their specific function is interrupted within the production process by the pauses in it, or because finally the production process itself requires interruptions in the labor process, in none of these cases do the means of production function to absorb labor. If they absorb no labor, then they absorb no surplus labor. Hence there is no valorization of the productive capital, as long as this finds itself in that part of its production time that is in excess of the working time, no matter how inseparable these pauses may be from the accomplishment of the valorization process. It is clear that the nearer production time and working time approach to equality, the greater the productivity and valorization of a given productive capital in a given space of time. The tendency of capitalist production is therefore to shorten, as much as possible, the excess of production time over working time. But although the production time of capital may diverge from its working time, it always includes the latter, 
and the excess itself is a condition of the production process. Thus, the production time is always the time that the capital takes to produce use values and valorize itself, hence to function as productive capital, although it includes time in which it is either latent or produces without being valorized. Within the circulation sphere, capital exists as commodity capital and money capital. Its two circulation processes consist in transforming itself from the commodity form into the money form and from the money form into the commodity form. The circumstance that the transformation of the commodity into money is here at the same time the realization of the surplus value embodied in the commodity and that the transformation of money into commodity is at the same time the transformation of capital value into or back into the form of its elements of production in no way changes the fact that these processes as processes of circulation are processes of simple commodity metamorphosis. Circulation time and production time are mutually exclusive. During its circulation time, capital does not function as productive capital, and therefore produces neither commodities nor surplus value. If we consider the circuit in its simplest form, so that the entire capital value always moves at one stroke from one phase to another, then it is obvious that the production process is interrupted, and with it therefore the self-valorization of capital. So long as its circulation time lasts, and that according to the duration of the latter, the production process will be repeated sooner or later. If the various parts of the capital pass through the circuit in succession, so that the circuit of the total capital value is successively accomplished in the circuit of its various portions, then it is clear that the longer its aliquot parts remain in the circulation sphere, the smaller must be the part that functions at any time in the production sphere. The expansion and contraction of the circulation time hence acts as a negative limit on the contraction or expansion of the production time, or of the scale on which a capital of a given magnitude can function. The more that the circulation metamorphoses of capital are only ideal, i.e. the closer the circulation time comes to zero, the more the capital functions, and the greater is its productivity and self-valorization. If a capitalist works to order, receives payment on the delivery of his product, and is paid in his own means of production, then his time of circulation approaches zero. Capital's circulation time generally restricts its production time, and hence its valorization process. Moreover, it restricts this in proportion to its duration. This can increase or decrease very considerably, and hence restrict the production time of capital to a very different degree. But what political economy sees is only the appearance, i.e. the effect of the circulation time on the valorization process of capital in general. It conceives this negative effect as positive, because its results are positive. It sticks all the more firmly to this illusion, as it seems to provide it with the proof that capital possesses a mystical source of self-valorization that is independent of its production process and hence of the exploitation of labor, and derives rather from the sphere of circulation. We shall see later how even scientific economics let itself be taken in by this illusion, an illusion which, as we shall show, is confirmed by various phenomena. 1. The capitalist way of calculating profit in which the negative reason appears as positive, in that with capitals in different spheres of investment, in which only the circulation times differ, longer circulation time is the basis for a higher price, in short, is one of the bases in the equalization of profits. 2. The circulation time forms only one movement of the turnover time, but the latter includes the production time or reproduction time. And 3. The conversion of commodities into variable capital, wages, is conditioned by their previous transformation into money. In the case of capital accumulation, therefore, the conversion into additional variable capital takes place in the circulation sphere, or during the circulation time. Hence, the accumulation arising therefrom appears to be due to the circulation time. Within the sphere of circulation, capital passes through the two opposing phases C to M and M to C, in whichever order. Thus, its circulation time breaks down into two parts, the time needed for its transformation from commodity into money, and the time that it needs for its transformation from money into commodities. We already know from the analysis of simple commodity circulation, see Volume 1, Chapter 3, that C to M, the sale, is the most difficult part of its metamorphosis, and thus forms the greater part of the circulation time in normal circumstances. As money, value exists in its ever-convertible form. As commodity, it must first receive this form of direct exchangeability and hence constant readiness for action by being transformed into money. What is involved in the circulation process of capital in its phase M to C is its transformation into those commodities which form the specific elements of productive capital in a given sphere of investment. 
the means of production may not be present on the market, needing first to be produced, or they may have to be drawn from distant markets, or there may be dislocations in their normal supply, changes of price, etc. In short, a mass of circumstances that are not recognizable in the simple change of form M to C, but require for this part of the circulation phase either less time or more. Just as C to M and M to C are separated in time, so they may be also separated in space, the selling and the buying markets being in different places. In factories, for example, buyers and sellers are frequently even different persons. Circulation is just as necessary for commodity production as is production itself, and thus agents of circulation are just as necessary as agents of production. The reproduction process includes both functions of capital, and thus also the need for these functions to be represented, either by the capitalist himself or by salaried workers, his agents. But this is just as little a reason for confusing the circulation agents with the production agents as it is a reason for confusing the functions of commodity capital and money capital with those of productive capital. The circulation agents must be paid by way of the production agents. But if capitalists who buy and sell among themselves create by this act neither products nor value, this situation is not altered when the scale of their business enables them to pass this function on to others, and indeed makes it necessary to do so. In many businesses, sellers and buyers are paid in the form of a percentage of profit. The phrase that they are paid by the consumers is no help at all. The consumers can pay only insofar as they themselves produce, as agents of production, an equivalent in commodities, or alternatively appropriate this form of the production agents, whether by a legal title, as their partners, etc., or through personal services. There is a distinction between C to M and M to C that has nothing to do with the difference in form between commodities and money, but derives from the capitalist character of production. In and for themselves, both C to M and M to C are mere translations of the given value from one form into the other. But C prime to M prime is at the same time the realization of the surplus value contained in C prime. Not so M to C. Hence the sale is more important than the purchase. M to C is in normal conditions a necessary act for the valorization of the value expressed in M, but it is not a realization of surplus value. It is a prelude to its production, not an appendix to it. Their very form of existence of commodities, their existence as use values, sets certain limits to the circulation of the commodity capital C prime to M prime. If they do not enter into productive or individual consumption within a certain interval of time, according to their particular characteristics, in other words, if they are not sold within a definite time, then they get spoiled and lose, together with their use value, the property of being bearers of exchange value. Both the capital value contained in them and the surplus value added to it are lost. Use values remain the bearers of perennial and self-valorizing capital value only insofar as they are constantly renewed, are replaced by new use values of the same or another kind. Their sale in their finished commodity form, i.e. their entry mediated through sale into productive or individual consumption, is, however, the constantly repeated condition for their reproduction. They must change their old use form within a certain time and continue their existence in a new one. It is only through this constant renewal of its body that the exchange value maintains itself. The use values of different commodities may decay at different speeds. Thus a greater or lesser interval may elapse between their production and their consumption, and they may thus persist for a shorter or longer time in the circulation phase C to M as commodity capital, endure a shorter or longer circulation time as commodities. The limitation of the circulation time of commodity capital, imposed by the spoiling of the commodity body itself, is the absolute limit of this part of the circulation time, or of the time for which the commodity capital can circulate as commodity capital. The more perishable a commodity, the more directly after its production it must be consumed, and therefore sold, the smaller the distance it can move from its place of production, the narrower, therefore, is its sphere of spatial circulation, and the more local the character of its market. Hence, the more perishable a commodity, the greater are the absolute barriers to its circulation time that its physical properties impose, and the less appropriate it is as an object of capitalist production. Capitalism can only deal in commodities of this kind in populous places, or to the extent that distances are reduced by the development of means of transport. The concentration of the production of an article in a few hands, however, and in a populous place, can create a relatively large market, even for an article of this kind as is the case with the big breweries, dairies, etc. Chapter 6. The Costs of Circulation Section 1. 
Pure Circulation Costs Subsection A. Buying and Selling Time Capital's changes of form from commodity into money and from money into commodity are at the same time business transactions for the capitalist, acts of buying and selling. The time which these changes of form take for their completion exists subjectively, from the standpoint of the capitalist, as selling time and buying time, the time during which he functions as seller and buyer on the market. Just as the circulation time of capital forms a necessary part of its reproduction time, so the time during which the capitalist buys and sells, prowls around the market, forms a necessary part of the time in which he functions as a capitalist, i.e. as personified capital. It forms a part of his business hours. Since it was assumed that commodities are bought and sold at their value, all that is involved in these acts is the conversion of the same value from one form into another, from the commodity form into the money form, and from the money form into the commodity form, a change of state. If the commodities are sold at their values, then the amounts of value in the hands of both buyer and seller remain unchanged. It is only the form of existence that is altered. If the commodities are not sold at their values, then the sum of converted values remains unaffected. What is a plus for one side is a minus for the other. But the metamorphoses C to M and M to C are business transactions between buyer and seller. They need time to come to terms, the more so insofar as a struggle is involved here, in which each side seeks to get the better of the other. It is businessmen who face each other here, and when Greek meets Greek, then comes the tug of war. The change of state costs time and labor power, not to create value, but rather to bring about the conversion of the value from one form into the other, and so the reciprocal attempt to use this opportunity to appropriate an excess quantity of value does not change anything. This labor, increased by evil intent on either side, no more creates value than the labor that takes place in legal proceedings increases the value of the object in dispute. This labor, which is a necessary moment of the capitalist production process in its totality, and also includes circulation or is included by it, behaves somewhat like the work of combustion involved in setting light to a material that is used to produce heat. This work does not itself produce any heat, although it is a necessary moment of the combustion process. For example, in order to use coal as a fuel, I must combine it with oxygen, and for this purpose transform it from the solid into the gaseous state i.e. affect a change in its physical form of existence, or physical state. The separation of the carbon molecules that were combined into a solid whole, and the breaking down of the carbon molecule itself into its individual atoms, must precede the new combination, and this costs a certain expenditure of energy which is not transformed into heat, but rather detracts from the heat. When the commodity owners are not capitalists, but rather independent direct producers, the time they spend on buying and selling is a deduction from their labor time, and they therefore always seek, in antiquity, as also in the Middle Ages, to defer such operations to feast days. The dimensions assumed by the conversion of commodities in the hands of capitalists can naturally not transform this labor, which does not create value, but only mediates a change in the form of value, into value-creating labor. Just as little can such a miracle of transubstantiation proceed by a transposition, i.e. if the industrial capitalists, instead of themselves performing the work of combustion, make this into the exclusive business of third parties paid by them. These third parties will certainly not put their labor power at the disposal of the capitalists for the sake of their blue eyes. It is similarly immaterial for the rent collector of a landlord or the porter at a bank that their labor does not add one iota to the magnitude of the value of the rent, nor to the gold pieces carried to another bank by the sackful. For the capitalist who has others to work for him, buying and selling is a major function. Since he appropriates the product of many people on a larger social scale, so he has also to sell on such a scale, and later to transform money back again into the elements of production. Now, as before, the time taken up with buying and selling creates no value. An illusion is introduced here by the function of merchant's capital, but without going into further detail, this much is clear from the start. If we have a function which, although in and for itself unproductive, is nevertheless a necessary moment of reproduction, then when this is transformed through the division of labor from the secondary activity of many into the exclusive activity of a few into their special business, this does not change the character of the function itself. One merchant, considered here merely as the agent of the formal transformation of commodities as mere buyer and seller, may, by way of his operations, shorten the buying and selling time for many producers. He should then be considered as a machine that reduces the expenditure of useless energy or helps to set free production time. In order to simplify the matter, since we shall only be considering the merchant as capitalist and merchant's capital later on, let us assume that this buying and selling agent is a man who sells his labor. 
He expends his labor power and his labor time in the operations C to M and M to C, and hence he lives off this in the same way as someone else might live from spinning or making pills. He performs a necessary function because the reproduction process itself includes unproductive functions. He works as well as the next man, but the content of his labor creates neither value nor products. He is himself part of the faux frais of production. His usefulness does not lie in his transforming an unproductive function into a productive one, or unproductive labor into productive. It would be a miracle if a transformation of this kind could be brought about by such a transference of functions. He is useful rather because a smaller part of society's labor power and labor time is now tied up in these unproductive functions. Still more, let us assume that he is simply a wage laborer, even if one of the better paid. Whatever his payment, as a wage laborer he works part of the day for nothing. He may receive every day the value product of eight hours labor and function for ten. The two hours surplus labor that he performs no more produce value than do his eight hours of necessary labor, although it is by means of the latter that a part of the social product is transferred to him. In the first place, both before and after, from the social point of view, a person's labor power is used up for ten hours in this mere circulation function. It is not available for anything else, including productive labor. Secondly, however, society does not count these two hours of surplus labor, although they are spent by the individual who performs them. Society does not appropriate by these means any additional product or value, but the costs of circulation that he represents are reduced by a fifth, from ten hours to eight. Society pays no equivalent for a fifth of this active circulation time whose agent he is. If it is the capitalist who employs these agents, then the circulation costs of his capital, which form a deduction from his receipts, are reduced by the non-payment of the two hours. For him, this is a positive profit, because the negative restriction on the valorization of his capital is reduced. As long as small, independent commodity producers spend a part of their own time in buying and selling, this simply presents itself as time spent in the intervals between their productive function, or as a loss in their production time. In all circumstances, the time taken here is a cost of circulation, which does not add anything to the values converted. It is a necessary cost for transferring these from the commodity form into the money form. Insofar as the capitalist commodity producer appears as the agent of circulation, he is distinguished from the direct commodity producer only in that he sells and buys on a larger scale, and hence functions as circulation agent to a higher degree. But if the scale of his business forces or enables him to buy, or hire, his own circulation agents as wage laborers, this does not affect the substance of the phenomenon. Labor power and labor time must be spent to a certain degree in the circulation process, insofar as this is a mere change of form. But this now appears as an additional outlay of capital. A part of the variable capital must be deployed in acquiring these labor powers that function only in circulation. This capital advance creates neither products nor value. It proportionally reduces the scale on which the capital advance functions productively. It is the same as if a part of the product was transformed into a machine that bought and sold the remaining part of the product. This machine means a deduction from the product. It is not involved in the production process, although it can reduce the labor power, etc., spent on circulation. It simply forms a part of these circulation costs. Subsection B. Bookkeeping. Besides the actual buying and selling, labor time is spent on bookkeeping, which requires pens, ink, paper, desks, and other office equipment as well as objectified labor. Thus it is spent in this function both as labor power and as means of labor. In this connection, the same state of affairs obtains as with buying and selling time. As a unity within its circuits, as value in process, whether within the production sphere or the two phases of the circulation sphere, it is only ideally that capital exists in the shape of money of account at first in the head of the commodity producer, capitalist or otherwise. By way of bookkeeping, which also includes the determination or reckoning of commodity prices, price calculation, the movement of capital is registered and controlled. The movement of production, and particularly of valorization, in which commodities figure only as bearers of value, as the names of things whose ideal value existence is set down in money of account, thus receives a symbolic reflection in the imagination. As long as the individual commodity producer either keeps his accounts merely in his head, as the peasant does, for example, only capitalist agriculture produces the bookkeeping farmer, or only keeps account of his expenses, receipts, dates of payment, etc., incidentally, outside his production time, it is obvious that this function of his, and the instruments of labor which he may use to perform it, such as paper, etc., represent an additional expenditure of labor time and instruments of labor, which, although necessary, constitutes a deduction both from the time that he can spend productively and from the instruments of labor that function in the actual production process and enter into the formation of products and value. The nature of the function itself, 
is in no way changed by the scale that it assumes by being concentrated in the hands of the capitalist commodity producer, and by appearing, not as the function of many small commodity producers, but as that of one capitalist, as one function within a large-scale production process, nor is it changed by being torn loose from the productive functions to which it is an adjunct and becoming the independent function of special agents who are exclusively entrusted with it. The division of labor, with one function becoming independent in this way, does not make this into a product or value-forming function if it is not so in itself, and thus was already so before it became independent. If a capitalist invests his capital for the first time, then he must invest one part in acquiring a bookkeeper, etc., and a means of bookkeeping. If his capital is already functioning, in its continuous reproduction process, then he must constantly transform a part of the commodity product by way of money into a bookkeeper, clerks, and so on. This part of the capital is withdrawn from the production process and belongs to the costs of circulation, as a deduction from the total yield, including the actual labor power which is exclusively devoted to this function. There is nevertheless a certain distinction between the costs arising from bookkeeping or unproductive expenditure of labor time on the one hand, and those of mere buying and selling time on the other. The latter simply arise from the particular social form of the production process, from the fact that it is a process of production of commodities. Bookkeeping, however, as the supervision and ideal recapitulation of the process, becomes ever more necessary the more the process takes place on a social scale and loses its purely individual character. It is thus more necessary in capitalist production than in the fragmented production of handicraftsmen and peasants, more necessary in communal production than in capitalist. The costs of bookkeeping are however reduced with the concentration of production and in proportion to its increasing transformation into social bookkeeping. We are concerned here simply with the general character of those circulation costs that arise from the merely formal metamorphosis. It would be superfluous to go into all their detailed forms. But how forms pertaining to the merely formal transformation of value, thus arising from the specific social form of the production process, forms which in the case of the individual commodity producer are only evanescent and scarcely noticeable moments that run alongside his production or are dovetailed in with it, how these may strike the eye as massive circulation costs is seen in the simple case of the receipt and dispensing of money, once this has become independent as an exclusive function of banks, etc., or of cashiers in individual businesses, and is concentrated on a large scale. What must be emphasized is that these circulation costs do not change their character with their altered form. Subsection C. Money. Whether a product is produced as a commodity or not, it is always a material form of wealth, a use value, destined for individual or productive consumption. As a commodity, its value exists only ideally in the price, which does not affect its actual use form. But the fact that certain commodities, such as gold and silver, function as money and as such dwell exclusively in the circulation process, for they also remain in the circulation sphere as a hoard, reserve, etc., even if only latently, is purely a product of the particular social form of the production process, as a process of commodity production. Since, on the basis of capitalist production, the commodity is the general form of the product, the great mass of products are produced as commodities and must hence assume the money form. And since the mass of commodities, the part of the social wealth functioning as commodities, is constantly growing, so the quantity of gold and silver that functions as means of circulation, means of payment, reserve, etc. also increases. The commodities that function as money go neither into individual nor into productive consumption. They represent social labor fixed in a form in which it serves merely as a machine for circulation. Apart from the fact that a part of the social wealth is confined to this unproductive form, the wear and tear of money requires its steady replacement, or the transformation of more social labor, in the product form, into more gold and silver. These replacement costs are significant in nations where there is a developed capitalism, because the part of the wealth that is confined to the form of money is considerable. Gold and silver, as the money commodities, constitute for society costs of circulation that arise simply from the social form of production. They are faux flay of commodity production in general, which grow with the development of this production and with capitalist production in particular. This is a part of the social wealth which has to be sacrificed to the circulation process. Section 2. Costs of Storage Those circulation costs that proceed from the mere change in form of value, from circulation in its ideal sense, do not enter into the value of commodities. The portions of capital spent on them constitute mere deductions from the capital productively spent, as far as the capitalist is concerned. The circulation costs that we shall deal with now are different in nature. They can arise from production processes that are simply continued in the circulation sphere, and whose productive character is thus merely hidden by the circulation form. 
There may also be nothing but costs from the social point of view, unproductive expenditure of labor, either living or objectified, but precisely because of this, they still have a value-forming effect for the individual capitalist, and form an addition to the selling price of his commodities. This follows from the simple fact that these costs differ between different individual capitals within the same production sphere. The act of adding them to the price of the commodity means that they become distributed in proportion to the degree to which they occur for the individual capitalist. But all labor that adds value can also add surplus value, and will always add surplus value on the basis of capitalism, since the value that it forms is dependent on its own extent, and the surplus value that it forms is dependent on the extent to which the capitalist pays for it. Thus, while the costs that make commodities dearer, without increasing their use value, are faux frais of production from the social point of view, for the individual capitalist they can constitute sources of enrichment. On the other hand, insofar as what they add to the price of the commodity merely distributes these circulation costs equally, they do not thereby cease to be unproductive in character. Insurance companies, for example, divide the losses of individual capitalists among the capitalist class, but this does not prevent the losses thus adjusted from being losses as before, from the standpoint of the total social capital. Subsection A. Stock Formation in General During its existence as commodity capital, or its stay on the market, I, as long as it finds itself in the interval between the production process from which it emerges and the consumption process which it enters into, the product forms a commodity stock. As a commodity on the market, and hence in the form of a stock, commodity capital figures twice in each circuit, once as the commodity product of the actual capital and process whose circuit is under consideration, the other time as the commodity product of another capital that must be present on the market in order to be sold and transformed into productive capital. It is possible, of course, that this latter commodity capital is produced only to order. There is then an interruption until it has been produced. The flow of the production and reproduction process, however, requires that a mass of commodities, means of production, is constantly present on the market, i.e. forms a stock. Productive capital similarly includes the purchase of labor power and the money form is here only the value form of the means of subsistence that the worker must find for the greater part of the market. In the course of this subsection, we shall go into this in more detail. The point, however, is already established. Let us take up the standpoint of the capital value in process, which has been transformed into commodity product and must now be sold or transformed back into money, and which therefore functions for the time being as commodity capital on the market. The state in which it forms a stock is therefore an inexpedient and involuntary stay on the market. The more quickly it is sold, the more fluid the reproduction process. The delay in the formal transformation hinders the material change that must occur in the circuit of capital, and thus its further functioning as productive capital. On the other hand, the constant presence of commodities on the market, the commodity stock, appears for M to C as the condition for the flow of the reproduction process and for the investment of new or additional capital. The persistence of commodity capital as a commodity stock requires buildings, stores, containers, warehouses, i.e., an outlay of constant capital. It equally requires that payment be made for the labor power employed in placing the commodities in their containers. Furthermore, commodities decay and are subject to the damaging influence of the elements. Additional capital must thus be expended to protect them from this, partly in objective form as means of labor and partly in labor power. The existence of capital in its form as commodity capital, and hence as a commodity stock, gives rise to costs that, since they do not pertain to the production sphere, count as costs of circulation. These circulation costs are distinguished from those mentioned under Heading 1, inasmuch as they do enter into the value of commodities to a certain extent and thus make the commodities dearer. Under all circumstances, capital and labor power which serve to maintain and store the commodity stock are withdrawn from the direct production process. On the other hand, the capital employed here, including labor power as a component of the capital, must be replaced out of the social product. Hence this outlay has the same effect as a reduction in the productivity of labor, so that a greater quantity of capital and labor is required to obtain a specific useful effect. These are simply expenses. Insofar as the costs of circulation made necessary by the formation of the commodity stock arise solely from the time taken to transform existing values from the commodity form into the money form, i.e., only from the specific social form of the production process, only from the fact that the product is produced as a commodity and must therefore also pass through a transformation into money, they share exactly the same character as the circulation costs enumerated under Heading 1. On the other hand, however, the value of the commodities is conserved, or increased, only because the use value, the product itself, is transferred under certain objective conditions that cost an outlay of capital. 
and subjected to operations in which additional labor works on the use values. The calculation of the commodity values, the bookkeeping for this process, and the buying and selling, on the contrary, do not operate on the use values in which the commodity value exists. They are only concerned with its form. Thus, although in the case assumed here, these expenses of stock formation, which is here involuntary, arise purely from a delay in the change of form, and from the necessity for this change, they are nevertheless distinguished from the expenses under heading 1, and that their actual object is not the formal transformation of value, but the conservation of the value which exists in the commodity as a product, a use value, and hence can be conserved only by conserving the product, the use value itself. The use value is not increased or raised. On the contrary, it declines. But its decline is restricted, and it itself is conserved. The value that is advanced and exists in the commodity is also not increased here. But new labor, both objectified and living, is added to it. We must now investigate how far these expenses proceed from the particular character of commodity production in general, and how far from commodity production in its universal absolute form, i.e. capitalist commodity production, how far too they are common to all social production and simply assume a particular shape, a specific form of appearance, within capitalist production. Adam Smith put forward the incredible opinion that the formation of a stock is a phenomenon peculiar to capitalist production. Later economists, for example Laylor, stressed on the contrary that with the development of capitalist production stock formation declines. Sismondi even regarded this as one of the negative features of capitalist production. In point of fact, stock exists in three forms, in the form of productive capital, in the form of the individual consumption fund, and in the form of the commodity stock or commodity capital. Stock declines relatively in the one form when it increases in the other, although its absolute size may grow simultaneously in all three forms. It is clear from the start that where production is oriented directly towards the satisfaction of the producer's own requirements, and only a small portion of goods are produced for exchange or sale, i.e., where the social product does not assume the commodity form, or does so only to a small extent, the stock in the form of commodity, the commodity stock, forms only a small and evanescent part of wealth. Here, however, the consumption fund, i.e. the fund of means of subsistence, is relatively large. One has only to consider the peasant economy of antiquity. Here, an overwhelming part of the product was transformed directly, without forming a commodity stock, into a stock of means of production or means of subsistence, precisely because it remained in the hands of its possessor. Because it did not assume the form of a commodity stock, Adam Smith held that no stock existed in societies based on this mode of production. Adam Smith thus confused the form of stock with the stock itself, and believed that society previously lived from hand to mouth, abandoning itself to the hazards of the next day. This is a childish misunderstanding. Stock in the form of productive capital exists as means of production that are already engaged in the production process, or at least in the hands of the producer, i.e., latently, already in the production process. We have seen above that as the productivity of labor develops, and thus with the development of the capitalist mode of production, which develops the social productivity of labor more than all previous modes of production, the mass of means of production that are incorporated once and for all in the process in the form of means of labor, and function repeatedly in it over a longer or shorter period, buildings, machines, etc., constantly grows, and that its growth is both premise and effect of the development of the social productive power of labor. The growth of wealth in this form, which is not only absolute but also relative, see Volume 1, Chapter 25, Section 2, is particularly characteristic of the capitalist mode of production. The material forms of existence of the constant capital, however, the means of production, do not consist only of such means of labor, but also of material for labor at the most varied stages of elaboration, as well as ancillary materials. As the scale of production grows, and the productive power of labor grows through cooperation, division of labor, machinery, etc., so does the mass of raw material, ancillaries, etc., that go into the daily reproduction process. These elements must be ready to hand at the place of production. The extent of this stock in the form of productive capital thus grows absolutely. In order for the process to keep flowing, quite apart from whether this stock can be renewed daily or only at definite intervals, there must always be a greater store of raw material, etc., at the place of production than is used up daily or weekly, for example. The continuity of the process requires that the existence of its preconditions should depend neither on the possible interruption of daily purchases nor on whether the commodity product is sold daily or weekly, and can therefore only irregularly be transformed back into its elements of production. But it is clear that the degree to which productive capital is latent, or forms a stock, can differ very greatly. It makes a great difference, for example, whether the mill owner has to have sufficient cotton or coal on hand for three months or only for one. 
we can see that this stock can decrease relatively even though it increases in absolute terms. This depends on various conditions which essentially all derive from the greater speed, regularity, and certainty with which the necessary mass of raw material can be constantly supplied in such a way that no interruption arises. The less these conditions are fulfilled, and the less therefore the certainty, regularity, and speed of the supply, the greater must be the latent part of the productive capital, i.e. the stock of raw materials, etc., in the hands of the producer and still waiting to be worked up. These conditions stand in inverse proportion to the level of development of capitalist production, and thus of the productive power of social labor, and so too, therefore, does the stock in this form. But what appears here as a decline in the stock, for example, with Laylor, is in part only a decline of stock in the form of commodity capital or of commodity stock proper, i.e. a mere change of form of the same stock. For example, if a great mass of coal is produced every day in the country in question, i.e. if the scale and intensity of coal production is large, then the mill owner does not need a great store of coal in order to secure the continuity of his production. The constant and certain renewal of the coal supply makes this superfluous. Secondly, the speed with which the product of one process can be transferred to another process as means of production depends on the development of the means of transport and communication. The cheapness of transport plays a great role in this connection. The constantly repeated transportation of coal, for example, from the mine to the spinning mill will be dearer than the storage of a larger amount of coal for a longer period, if transport is relatively cheap. The two circumstances considered here proceed from the production process itself. The less dependent the mill owner is for the renewal of his stocks of cotton, coal, etc., on the direct sale of his yarn, and the more developed the credit system, the smaller this direct dependence, the smaller the relative size of these stocks need to be in order to secure a continuous production of yarn independent of the accidents of its sale. Fourthly, however, many raw materials, semi-finished goods, etc., require lengthy periods of time for their production and this holds in particular for all raw materials provided by agriculture. If there is to be no interruption of the production process, then a definite stock of these must be present for the whole period of time in which new products cannot replace old. If this stock in the hands of the industrial capitalist declines, this only means that it increases in the form of a commodity stock in the hands of the merchant. The development of the means of transport, for example, permits cotton lying in the import docks to be quickly delivered from Liverpool to Manchester, so that the manufacturer can renew his stocks of cotton in relatively small portions according to his needs. But then the same cotton exists in even greater amounts as commodity stock in the hands of the Liverpool merchants. There is thus simply a change in form of the stock, which Laylor and others have overlooked. If we consider the social capital, there is the same quantity of products as before in the form of stock. For an individual country, the scale on which the quantity needed for the year, for example, must be held ready, declines with the development of the means of transport. If there are many steamships and sailing ships plying between America and Britain, then the opportunities for Britain to renew its cotton stock are increased, and thus the average volume of the cotton stock that Britain must keep in store declines. The development of the world market and the consequent multiplication of sources of supply for the same article has the same effect. The article is supplied bit by bit from different countries and at different points in time. Subsection B. The Commodity Stock Proper. We have already seen how, on the basis of capitalist production, the commodity becomes the general form of the product, and the more so, the more this production develops in scale and depth. Thus, a far greater part of the product exists as a commodity, even at the same scale of production in comparison either with earlier modes of production or with the capitalist mode of production itself at a less developed stage. But every commodity, and thus also every commodity capital, which is simply a commodity, even if a commodity as the form of existence of capital value, insofar as it does not directly pass from the sphere of production into productive or individual consumption and finds itself on the market during the interval, forms an element of the commodity stock. In and for itself, assuming the scale of production is constant, the commodity stock therefore grows with capitalist production. We have already seen that this is only a change of form for the stock, i.e. that the stock increases in commodity form because it decreases in the form of direct production or consumption stock. There is simply a changed social form with the stock. If at the time, there is an increase not only in the relative size of the commodity stock in relation to the total social product, but also in its absolute size, this is because the volume of the total product increases with capitalist production. As capitalist production develops, the scale of production is determined to an ever lesser degree by the immediate demand for the product, and to an ever greater degree by the scale of the capital which the individual capitalist has at his disposal by his capital's drive for valorization and the need of his production process for continuity and extension. 
the mass of products from every particular branch of production that are on the market as commodities, or seek an outlet, necessarily grows together with this. The mass of capital tied up for a shorter or longer time in the form of commodity capital grows, and hence the commodity stock grows as well. Ultimately, most members of the society are transformed into wage laborers, people who live from hand to mouth, who receive their wages by the week and spend them by the day, and must thus find their means of subsistence available as a stock. However rapidly the particular elements of this stock may flow, a part of them must always stand still in order for the stock to remain in motion. All these moments arise out of the form of production, and the changes of form which are included in it, and which the product must pass through in the circulation process. Whatever the social form of the stock of products, its storage involves costs, buildings, containers, etc., which form receptacles for the product, similarly means of production and labor, more or less according to the nature of the product, which must be spent to ward off damaging influences. The more these stocks are socially concentrated, the smaller, relatively speaking, are the costs. These outlays always form part of social labor, whether in objectified or living form. Thus, in the capitalist form, they are outlays of capital, which do not go towards the formation of the product itself, and are thus deductions from it. They are necessary expenditures of social wealth, for they are the costs of conserving the social product, whether its existence as an element of the commodity stock arises merely from the social form of production, i.e. from the commodity form and its necessary transformations, or whether we consider the commodity stock simply as a special form of the stock of products common to all societies, even if not in the form of a commodity stock, this particular form of stock pertaining to the circulation process. The question now arises as to what extent these expenses enter into the value of commodities. If the capitalist has transformed the capital he advanced in means of production and labor power into products, into a certain mass of commodities ready for sale, and these remain in the store unsold, then it is not only the valorization process of his capital that is held up during this time. The expenditures that the conservation of this stock requires in buildings, additional labor, etc., form a positive loss. The eventual purchaser would laugh at the capitalist if he said, I could not sell my commodity for six months, and it not only cost me so and so much in idle capital to maintain it for these six months, but also caused expense X. So much the worse for you, the buyer would say, for next to you there is another seller whose commodity was finished only yesterday. Your commodity is evidently a white elephant, and probably more or less damaged by the ravages of time. You must therefore sell cheaper than your rival. Whether the commodity producer is the real producer of his commodity, or its capitalist producer, and therefore merely the representative of the real producer, in no way affects the conditions of life of the commodity. He has to transform his article into money. The expenses it cost him to maintain it in its commodity form pertain to his own individual experience and do not interest the buyer of the commodity. The latter does not pay him for the circulation time of his commodity. Even if the capitalist deliberately keeps his commodity off the market, in times of a real or anticipated revolution in values, it depends on whether this revolution actually comes about, on the correctness or incorrectness of his speculation, whether he realizes his additional expenses. The revolution in values is not the result of his expenses. Thus, insofar as the formation of a stock is a hold-up in circulation, the expenses occasioned by it add no value to the commodity. On the other hand, there can be no stock without a delay in the circulation sphere, without the capital persisting for a longer or shorter period in its commodity form. Thus there can be no stock without a hold-up in circulation, just as no money can circulate without the formation of a money reserve. That is to say, without the commodity stock, no commodity circulation. If the capitalist does not encounter this necessity in C' prime to M', prime, then he encounters it in M to C, not for his own commodity capital but for the commodity capital of other capitalists, who produce means of production for him and means of subsistence for his workers. Whether the formation of a stock is voluntary or involuntary, i.e. whether the commodity producer deliberately builds a stock, or whether his commodities form a stock as a result of the resistance that the circumstances of the circulation process itself oppose to their sale, makes no essential difference to the matter. Yet it is useful to know, as a contribution towards solving this question, what it is that distinguishes voluntary from involuntary stock formation. The involuntary formation of a stock arises from, or is identical with, a hold-up in circulation that is independent of the knowledge of the commodity producer and goes against his intentions. What characterizes voluntary stock formation? Here, the seller still attempts to get rid of his commodities as fast as possible. He still offers his product for sale as a commodity. If he were to withdraw it from sale, it would form only a potential element of the commodity stock, and not an actual one. The commodity as such is still for him simply the bearer of its exchange value, 
and as such, it can only have its effect by and through shedding its commodity form and assuming the money form. The commodity stock must have a certain volume in order to satisfy the scale of demand over a given period. The continual extension of the circle of buyers is taken into account in this connection. In order to last for one day, for example, one part of the commodities on the market must persist in the commodity form, while the other part flows and is transformed into money. Of course, the part that stands still in this way steadily declines, as the scale of the stock itself declines until it is finally all sold. This stagnation of commodities is thus taken into account here as a necessary condition for their sale. Moreover, it must be greater in scale than the average sale or the average demand, otherwise excesses above this average could not be satisfied. On the other hand, the stock must constantly be renewed, because it is constantly disappearing. In the last instance, this renewal can derive only from production, from a supply of the commodity. It is immaterial whether this comes from abroad or not. The renewal depends on the periods that the commodities need for their reproduction. The stock of commodities must be adequate for this length of time. The fact that this stock does not remain in the hands of the original producers, but runs through various reservoirs from the large-scale merchant to the retail trader, changes only the appearance, and not the thing itself. From the social point of view, a part of the capital still exists in the form of commodity stock, as long as the commodity has not entered into productive or individual consumption. The producer himself attempts to have an inventory adequate for his average demand, in order not to be directly dependent on production and to secure himself a constant circle of customers. The production periods give rise to dates of purchase, and the commodity forms a stock for a longer or shorter period of time before it can be replaced by new items of the same kind. It is only by way of this stock formation that the permanence and continuity of the circulation process is ensured, and hence that of the reproduction process which includes the circulation process. We must remember that C' prime to M' prime can be completed for the producer of C even though C is still on the market. If the producer himself intended to keep his own commodity in store until it was sold to the final consumer, he would have to set in motion a double capital, once as producer of the commodity, the other time as merchant. As far as the commodity itself is concerned, whether it is considered as an individual commodity or as a component part of the social capital, it makes no difference to the situation whether the expenses of stock formation fall onto its producers or onto a series of merchants from A to Z. Inasmuch as the commodity stock is nothing more than the commodity form of the stock that would still exist on the given scale of social production either as productive stock, latent production fund, or as a consumption fund, reserve of means of consumption, if it did not exist as a commodity stock, the expenses required to maintain the stock, that is, the expenses of stock formation, i.e. the objectified or living labor spent on this, are merely the transposed expenses of maintaining the social production fund and the social consumption fund. The increase in the value of the commodity to which they give rise simply distributes these expenses proportionately between the various commodities, as they are different for different sorts of commodity. The expenses of stock formation continue to be deductions from the social wealth, even though they are a condition of its existence. It is only insofar as the commodity stock is a condition of commodity circulation, and itself a form that has necessarily arisen in commodity circulation, insofar therefore as this apparent stagnation is a form of the flow itself that it is normal. But once the commodities lingering in their circulation stores fail to make room for the incoming wave of production and the stores are overfilled, the commodity stock expands as a result of the stagnation of circulation, just as hordes grow if the money circulation stagnates. It is quite immaterial here whether this stagnation takes place in the storerooms of the industrial capitalist or the warehouse of the merchant. The commodity stock is then not a condition of uninterrupted sale, but a consequence of the unsaleability of the commodities. The expenses remain the same. But as they arise purely from the form, i.e. from the necessity of transforming the commodities into money and the difficulty of this metamorphosis, they do not enter into the value of the commodities but form deductions, a loss of value and the realization of value. Since the normal and the abnormal forms of the stock are not distinguished in their form, and both are stagnations of circulation, the phenomena can be confused and may deceive the agents of production themselves all the more and that it is possible for the producer to feel that the circulation process of his capital is occurring, that it is in flux, even though the circulation of his commodities, which have passed into the hands of the merchants, is stagnating. If the extent of production increases then, other circumstances remaining the same, so does the volume of the commodity stock. It is then renewed and absorbed just as quickly, but on a greater scale. The rise in the volume of the commodity stock, as a result of the stagnation in circulation, can thus be mistaken for a symptom of an expansion in the reproduction process, particularly if the real movement is mystified by the development of the credit system. The expenses of stock formation consist of 1. 
a quantitative reduction in the mass of the product, for example, with stocks of flour, two, a deterioration in quality, three, the objectified and living labor required to conserve the stock. Section 3. Transport Costs It is not necessary to go into all the details of the costs of circulation here, such as packing, sorting, etc. The general law is that all circulation costs that arise simply from a change in form of the commodity cannot add any value to it. They are simply costs involved in realizing the value or transferring it from one form into another. The capital expended in these costs, including the labor it commands, belongs to the faux fray of capitalist production. The replacement of these costs must come from the surplus product, and from the standpoint of the capitalist class as a whole, it forms a deduction of surplus value or surplus product, in just the same way as the time that a worker needs to buy his means of subsistence is lost time for him. Transport costs, however, play too important a role not to be briefly considered here. Within the circuit of capital, and the commodity metamorphoses that form a section of it, the metabolism of social labor takes place. This metabolism may require a motion of the products in space, their real movement from one location to another. But circulation of commodities can also take place without their physical movement, as can the transport of products without commodity circulation, even without direct exchange of products. A house that is sold by A to B circulates as a commodity, but it does not get up and walk. Movable commodity values, such as cotton or pig iron, can remain in the same warehouse while they undergo dozens of circulation processes and are bought and resold by speculators. What actually moves here is the property title to the thing and not the thing itself. In the realm of the Incas, on the other hand, the transport industry played a major role, although the social product neither circulated as a commodity nor was distributed by means of exchange. If the transport industry therefore appears as a cause of circulation costs on the basis of capitalist production, this particular form of appearance in no way alters the substance of the matter. The quantity of products is not increased by their transport. The change in their natural properties that may be affected by transport is also, certain exceptions apart, not an intended useful effect, but rather an unavoidable evil. But the use value of things is realized only in their consumption, and their consumption may make a change of location necessary and thus also the additional production process of the transport industry. The productive capital invested in this industry thus adds value to the products transported, partly through the value carried over from the means of transport, partly through the value added by the work of transport. This latter addition of value can be divided, as with all capitalist production, into replacement of wages and surplus value. Within every production process, the change of location of the object of labor and the means of labor and labor power needed for this plays a major role. For instance, cotton that is moved from the carding shop into the spinning shed, coal lifted from the pit to the surface. The transfer of the finished product as a finished commodity from one separate place of production to another a certain distance away shows the same phenomenon only on a larger scale. The transport of products from one place of production to another is followed by that of the finished products from the sphere of production to the sphere of consumption. The product is ready for consumption only when it has completed this movement. As we have already seen, it is a general law of commodity production that the productivity of labor and the value it creates stand in inverse proportion. This holds for the transport industry as much as any other. The smaller the quantity of labor, dead and living, that is required to transport a commodity for a given distance, the greater the productive power of the labor, and vice versa. The absolute magnitude of value added by the transport of commodities stands in inverse proportion to the productive power of the transport industry, and in direct proportion to the distance to be covered, other circumstances remaining the same. The relative part of value that transport costs add to the price of the commodity, under otherwise equal circumstances, stands in direct proportion to their size and weight. The modifying circumstances are numerous. Transport requires, for example, greater or lesser measures of precaution, hence more or less expenditure of labor and means of labor, according to the relative fragility, perishability, and explosiveness of the article. The railway magnates have shown greater genius in inventing fantastic species than have botanists or zoologists. The classification of goods on the British railways, for example, fills volumes and rests for its general principle on the tendency to transform the variegated natural properties of goods into an equal number of transportation ailments and pretexts for obligatory impositions. Quote, Glass, which was formerly worth 11 pounds per crate, is now worth only 2 pounds since the improvements which have taken place in manufactures and since the abolition of the duty. But the rate for carriage is the same as it was formerly, and higher than it was previously when carried by canal. 
Formerly, manufacturers informed me that they had glass and glasswares for the plumber's trade carried at about 10 shillings per ton, within 50 miles of Birmingham. At the present time, the rate to cover risk of breakage, which we can very rarely get allowed, is three times that amount. But the companies always resist any claim that is made for breakages. End quote from the Royal Commission on Railways. Moreover, the fact that the relative share that transport costs add to the value of an article stands in inverse proportion to its value is made by the railway magnates into a special reason for taxing an article in direct proportion to its value. The complaints of the industrialists and merchants on this score are repeated on every page of the evidence in the above quoted report. The capitalist mode of production reduces the transport costs for the individual commodity by developing the means of transport and communication, as well as by concentrating transport, i.e., by increasing its scale. It increases the part of social labor, both living and objectified, that is spent on commodity transport, firstly, by transforming the great majority of all products into commodities, and then by replacing local by distant markets. The circulating of commodities, i.e. their actual course in space, can be resolved into the transport of commodities. The transport industry forms on the one hand an independent branch of production, and hence a particular sphere for the investment of productive capital. On the other hand, it is distinguished by its appearance as the continuation of a production process within the circulation process and for the circulation process. End of Part 1 Part 2 the turnover of capital. Chapter 7. Turnover time and number of turnovers. As we have seen, the overall time of circulation of a given capital is the sum of its circulation time proper and its production time. It is the period of time that elapses from the moment that the capital value is advanced in a particular form until the return of the capital value in process in the same form. The specific purpose of capitalist production is always the valorization of the value advanced, whether this value is advanced in its independent form, i.e. the money form, or in commodities, in which case its value form only possesses an ideal independence in the price of the commodities advanced. In both cases, this capital value passes through different forms of existence in the course of its circuit. Its identity with itself is established in the capitalist ledger, or in the form of money of account. Whether we take the form M to M prime, or the form P to P, both these forms include the following facts. 1. The value advanced functions as capital value and is valorized. 2. After describing its process, it returns to the form in which this process began. In M to M prime, both the valorization of M, the value advanced, and the return of the capital to this form, the money form, are readily apparent. But the same thing also takes place in the second form. For the starting point of P is the presence of the elements of production commodities of a given value. This form includes the valorization of this value, C prime and M prime, and its return to its original form, since in the second P, the value advanced once again possesses the form of the elements of production in which it was originally advanced. As we saw in the previous volume, if production has a capitalist form, so too will reproduction. Just as in the capitalist mode of production the labor process appears only as a means towards the process of valorization, so in the case of reproduction, it appears only as a means of reproducing the value advanced as capital, i.e. as self-valorizing value. See Volume 1, Chapter 23, page 711. The three forms, M to M prime, P to P, and C prime to C prime, are distinguished in the following ways. In Form 2, that is P to P, the repetition of the process, the process of reproduction, is expressed as a reality, whereas in Form 1 it is only a possibility. Both of these, however, are distinguished from Form 3, insofar as the capital value advanced, whether as money or in the shape of material elements of production, forms the starting point and hence also the point of return. In M to M prime, the return is M prime, equaling M plus small m. If the process is repeated on the same scale, then M again forms the starting point. Small m does not enter into it, but simply shows us that although M has been valorized as capital and thus created a surplus value, it has cast this surplus value off. In the form P to P, the capital value P, advanced in the form of elements of production, forms the point of departure. The form includes its valorization. In the case of simple reproduction, it is the same capital value that begins its process again in the same form. In the case of accumulation, P prime, 
possessing a value of m prime or c prime, now starts the process as an increased capital value. But the process still begins with capital value advanced in the original form, even if with a greater value than previously. In form 3, however, the capital value does not begin the process as capital value advanced, but as capital value already valorized, as the total wealth existing in the form of commodities, of which the capital value advanced forms only a part. This latter form is important for part 3 of the present volume, where the movement of individual capitals will be dealt with in its relationship with the movement of the total social capital. But it cannot be used for the turnover of capital, which always begins with the advance of capital value, in the form either of money or of commodities, and always requires the return of the circling capital value in the form in which it was advanced. Out of circuits 1 and 2, the former will be adhered to insofar as the influence of the turnover on the formation of surplus value is the main thing under consideration, the latter insofar as its influence on the formation of the product is concerned. Just as the economists have rarely distinguished between the different forms of the circuit, so too they have rarely considered these separately, in connection with the turnover of capital. They've generally concentrated on the form M to M prime, because it is this that dominates the individual capitalist and is used by him in his calculations, even if money forms the starting point only in the shape of money of account. Certain others proceed from outlays in the form of elements of production, finishing with the receipt of returns without even mentioning the form of these returns, whether they are in commodities or money. For example, quote, The economic cycle is the whole course of production, from the time that outlays are made till returns are received. In agriculture, seed time is its commencement, and harvesting is its ending. End quote from S.P. Newman, Elements of Political Economy, Andover in New York, page 81. Others begin with C prime, that is, form 3. Quote, the world of trade may be conceived to revolve in what we shall call an economic cycle, which accomplishes one revolution by business, coming round again, through its successive transactions to the point from which it set out. Its commencement may be dated from this point at which the capitalist has obtained those returns by which his capital is replaced to him, whence he proceeds anew to engage his workmen, to distribute among them in wages their maintenance, or rather, the power of lifting it, to obtain from them, in finished work, the articles in which he specially deals, to bring these articles to market, and there terminate the orbit of one set of movements by effecting a sale and receiving, in its proceeds, a return for the whole outlays of the period. End quote from T. Chalmers, On Political Economy, 2nd edition, published in Glasgow, 1832, page 85. When the entire capital value that the individual capitalist invests in one branch of production or other has described its cyclical movement, it exists once again in its original form and can then repeat the same process. It has to repeat it if the value is to be perpetuated and valorized as capital value. In the life of the capital, the individual circuit forms only a section that is constantly repeated, i.e., a period. At the close of the period M to M prime, the capital exists once again in the form of money capital and passes once more through the series of changes of form that constitute its process of reproduction and valorization. At the close of the period P to P, the capital exists again in the form of the elements of production, which constitute the premise of its repeated circuit. The circuit of capital, when this is taken not as an isolated act but as a periodic process, is called its turnover. The duration of this turnover is given by the sum of its production time and its circulation time. This period of time forms the capital's turnover time. It thus measures the interval between one cyclical period of the total capital value and the next, the periodicity in the capital's life process, or, if you like, the time required for the renewal and repetition of the valorization and production process of the same capital value. If we disregard the individual occurrences that may accelerate or shorten the turnover time of an individual capital, the turnover times of capitals differ according to their different spheres of investment. As the working day forms the natural measuring unit for the function of labor power, so the year forms the natural measuring unit for the turnovers of capital and process. The natural basis for this measurement is that the most important food crops in the temperate zone, the native ground of capitalist production, are annual products. If we call the year, as measurement unit of the turnover time, U, the turnover time of a particular capital, small u, and the number of its turnovers, small n, then small n is equal to u over small u. If the turnover time small u is 3 months, for example, then small n is equal to 12 over 3, equaling 4. The capital completes 4 turnovers in a year, or turns over 4 times. If small u is equal to 18 months, then small n is equal to 12 over 18, equaling 2 thirds. The capital only gets through 2 thirds of its turnover time in one year. If the turnover time amounts to several years, then it is reckoned in terms of multiples of a year. 
For the capitalist, the turnover time of his capital is the time for which he has to advance his capital in order for this to be valorized and for him to receive it back in its original shape. Before we investigate more closely the influence of turnover on the production and valorization process, we have to consider two new forms which capital obtains as a result of the circulation process and which affect the form of its turnover. Chapter 8. Fixed Capital and Circulating Capital Section 1. The Formal Distinctions We saw in Volume 1, Chapter 8, that one part of the constant capital maintains the specific use form in which it enters the production process, over and against the products that it helps to fashion. It continues to perform the same function over a shorter or longer period, in a series of repeated labor processes. Examples of this are factory buildings, machines, etc. In short, everything that we collect together under the description of means of labor. This part of the constant capital gives up value to the product in proportion to the exchange value that it loses together with its use value. The extent to which the value of such a means of production is given up or transferred to the product that it helps to fashion is determined by an average calculation. It is measured by the average duration of its function, from the time that it enters the production process as means of production to the time that it is completely used up, is dead, and has to be replaced or reproduced by a new item of the same kind. The peculiarity of this part of the constant capital, the means of labor, in the strict sense, is this. A part of the capital has been advanced in a form of constant capital, i.e. means of production, which then functions as factors of the labor process so long as they maintain the independent use shape with which they entered it. The finished product, and thus also the elements of its formation, insofar as they are transformed into the product, is ejected from the production process and passes as a commodity from the sphere of production into that of circulation. The means of labor, on the other hand, never leave the production sphere once they have stepped into it. Their function confines them firmly within it. A part of the capital value advanced is fixed in this form, which is determined by the function of the means of labor in the process. As a means of labor functions and is used up, one part of its value passes over to the product, while another part remains fixed in the means of labor and hence in the production process. The value fixed in this way steadily declines until the means of labor is worn out and has therefore distributed its value in a longer or shorter period over the volume of products that have emerged from a series of continually repeated labor processes. As long as a means of labor still remains effective and does not yet have to be replaced by a new item of the same kind, some constant capital value remains fixed in it, while another part of the value originally fixed in it passes over to the product and thus circulates as a component of the commodity stock. The longer the means of labor lasts, and the more slowly it wears out, the longer the constant capital value remains fixed in this use form. But whatever its degree of durability, the proportion in which it gives up value is always an inverse ratio to the overall duration of its function. If two machines are of equal value, but one of them wears out in five years and the other in ten, then the first gives up twice as much value in the same space of time as the second does. The part of the capital value that is fixed in the means of labor circulates, just like any other part. As we have seen, the whole of the capital value is in constant circulation, and in this sense, therefore, all capital is circulating capital. But the circulation of the part of the capital considered here is a peculiar one. In the first place, it does not circulate in its use form. It is rather its value that circulates, and this does so gradually, bit by bit, in the degree to which it is transferred to the product that circulates as a commodity. A part of its value always remains fixed in it as long as it continues to function and remains distinct from the commodities that it helps to produce. This peculiarity is what gives this part of the constant capital the form of fixed capital. All other material components of the capital advanced in the production process, on the other hand, form, by contrast to it, circulating or fluid capital. There's a further part of the means of production those ancillaries that are consumed by the means of labor proper as they function, such as coal by the steam engine, or which only support the action, such as gas for lighting, etc., which also do not enter the product in their material form. It is only their value that constitutes part of the value of the product. The product circulates their value in its own circulation, and they have this in common with fixed capital. But they are completely consumed in every labor process that they enter into, and therefore, with each new labor process, they must be completely replaced by new items of the same kind. They do not preserve their independent use shape as they function, and so no part of the capital value either remains fixed in their old use shape, their natural form. 
the fact that this part of the ancillaries does not materially enter into the product, but enters the value of the product only according to its own value, and the related fact that the function of these materials is confined within the sphere of production, has misled economists such as Ramsey, who at the same time confuses fixed and constant capital, into applying them the category of fixed capital. The part of the means of production that enters the product materially, i.e. raw materials, etc., thereby receives, to some extent, a form in which it can later enter individual consumption as a means of enjoyment. Means of labor, for their part, the material bearers of fixed capital, are consumed only productively and cannot enter individual consumption, since they do not enter the product or use value which they help to fashion, but rather maintain their independent shape vis-à-vis -vis it until they are completely worn out. An exception to this is provided by the means of transport. The use effect that these produce in their productive function, i.e. during their stay in the sphere of production, the change of location, simultaneously enters individual consumption, for example, that of the traveler. The latter then pays for their use just as he pays for the use of other means of consumption. As we have seen, the distinction between raw material and ancillaries can become blurred, as in the manufacture of chemicals, for example. The same is true with the distinction between means of labor on the one hand and ancillaries and raw materials on the other. In agriculture, for instance, the materials added to improve the soil partly enter the plant product as formative elements. Their effect, however, is spread over a fairly long period, for example, four to five years. One part of these, therefore, enters the product materially and thus immediately transfers its value to it, while another part remains fixed in its old use form so that its value does too. It continues to exist as means of production, and hence receives the form of fixed capital. An ox, as a draft animal, is fixed capital. If it is eaten, however, it no longer functions either as means of labor or as fixed capital. The quality that gives a part of the capital value spent on means of production, the character of fixed capital, lies exclusively in the specific manner in which this value circulates. This particular manner of circulation arises from the particular way in which the means of labor gives up value to the product, or acts to form value during the production process. This in turn arises from the special way in which the means of labor function in the labor process. We know that the same use value that emerges from one labor process in the shape of a product can enter another labor process as means of production. It is only the function of a product as a means of labor in the production process that makes it fixed capital. It is in no way fixed capital in itself, just as it emerges from a process. A machine that is the product and thus the commodity of a machine builder is part of his commodity capital. It only becomes fixed capital in the hands of its buyer, the capitalist who employs it productively. Assuming that all other circumstances remain the same, the degree of fixedness grows with the durability of the means of labor. On this durability depends the size of the difference between the capital value fixed in means of labor and the part of this value that is given up to the product in repeated labor processes. The more slowly this value is given up, and the means of labor gives up value with each repetition of the same labor process, the greater is the capital still fixed, and the greater the difference between the capital employed in the production process and the capital consumed in it. Once this difference has disappeared, the means of labor has lived out its time and lost its value together with its use value. It has ceased to be a bearer of value, since the means of labor, like every other material bearer of constant capital, gives up value to the product only to the extent that it loses its value together with its use value, then the longer it lasts out in the production process, the longer is the period for which constant capital remains fixed in it. If a means of production which is not a means of labor in the strict sense, for example, ancillaries, raw material, semi-finished goods, etc., behaves with respect to the way it gives up value, and hence to the mode of circulation of its value in the same way as a means of labor, then it is also a material bearer, a form of existence, of fixed capital. This is the case with the already mentioned improvements to the soil, which put into it chemical components whose effect extends over several periods of production or several years. Here, one part of the value continues to exist alongside the product in its independent shape, or in the shape of fixed capital, while another portion of value is given up to the product and hence circulates with it. In a case like this, it is not only a part of the value of the fixed capital that enters the product, but also the use value, the substance, in which this portion of value exists. Besides their basic error, their confusion of the categories of fixed and circulating capital with the categories of constant and variable capital, the confusion and the demarcation of concepts made by previous economists, rests primarily on the following points. Firstly, 
certain properties that characterize the means of labor materially are made into direct properties of fixed capital, for example, physical immobility, such as that of a house. But it is always easy to show that other means of labor, which are also as such fixed capital, ships, for example, have the opposite property, i.e. physical mobility. Alternatively, the formal economic characteristic that arises from the circulation of value is confused with a concrete property, as if things, which are never capital at all in themselves, could already in themselves and by nature be capital in a definite form, fixed or circulating. We saw in Chapter 7 of Volume 1 that the means of production in any labor process, irrespective of the social conditions under which it is pursued, are divisible into means of labor and object of labor. It is only within the capitalist mode of production, however, that the two become capital, in fact, productive capital as defined in Part 1. Here, the distinction between means of labor and object of labor, which is based in the nature of the labor process itself, is reflected in the new form of the distinction between fixed capital and circulating capital. It is only in this way that a thing that functions as means of labor becomes fixed capital. If its material properties also allow it to serve for other functions than that of means of labor, then whether it is a fixed capital or not depends on these various functions. Cattle, as draft animals, are fixed capital. When being fattened for slaughter, they are raw material that eventually passes into circulation as a product, and so not fixed, but circulating capital. The mere length of time for which a means of production is fixed, in repeated labor processes which are related and continuous and hence form a production period, i.e. the total production time that is needed in order to complete the product, already involves a longer or shorter advance for the capitalist, just as is the case with fixed capital, but this alone does not make his capital fixed capital. Seed, for example, is not fixed capital, but simply raw material that is fixed in the production process for approximately a year. All capital that functions as productive capital is fixed in the production process, and thus so are all the elements of that productive capital, whatever may be their material shape, their function, or the mode of circulation of their value. Whether they are fixed in this way for a longer or shorter time, according to the kind of production process or the intended useful effect, is not what makes the distinction between fixed and circulating capital. Some of the means of labor, including the general conditions of labor, are held fast in their place once they enter the production process as means of labor and are made ready for their productive function, machines for example. Other means of labor, however, are produced from the start in this static form, tied to the spot, such as improvements to the soil, factory buildings, blast furnaces, canals, railways, etc. The continued attachment of the means of labor to the production process in which it is to function is here simultaneously conditioned by its sensuous mode of existence. On the other hand, a means of labor may constantly change its physical place, i.e. move, and yet be engaged throughout in the production process, as with a locomotive, a ship, draft cattle, etc. Immobility does not give it the character of fixed capital in the one case, nor does mobility remove this character in the other. But the circumstance that some means of labor are fixed in location, with their roots in the soil, gives this part of the fixed capital a particular role in a nation's economy. They cannot be sent abroad or circulate as commodities on the world market. It is quite possible for the property titles to this fixed capital to change, they can be bought and sold and in this respect circulate ideally. These property titles can even circulate on foreign markets, in the form of shares for example. But a change in the persons who are the owners of this kind of fixed capital does not change the relationship between the static and materially fixed part of the wealth of a country and the movable part of it. The peculiar circulation of fixed capital gives rise to a peculiar turnover. The portion of value that it loses in its natural form by wear and tear circulates as a value portion of the product. Through its circulation, the product is transformed from a commodity into money, and so is the portion of the value of the means of labor that is circulated by the product. Its value trickles from the circulation process as money in the same proportion that this means of labor ceases to be a bearer of value in the production process. Its value thus acquires a dual existence. A part of it remains tied to its use form, or natural form, which pertains to the production process, while another part separates off from this as money. In the course of its function, the part of the value of the means of labor that exists in the natural form steadily declines, while the part of its value converted into the money form steadily increases, until the means of labor eventually expires and its entire value has been separated off from its dead body and has been transformed into money. Here we can see the peculiarity that this element of the productive capital displays in its turnover. The transformation of its value into money accompanies step by step the transformation into money of the commodity that bears its value. 
but its transformation back from the money form into the use form is separate from the transformation of the commodity back into its former elements of production, and is rather determined by its own reproduction period, i.e. by the time for which the means of labor serves until it has to be replaced by another item of the same kind. If a machine with a value of £10,000, say, lasts for ten years, then the turnover time of the value originally advanced in it is ten years. Until this time has elapsed, it does not need to be renewed, but continues to function in its natural form. In the meantime, its value circulates bit by bit as a portion of the value of the commodities that it steadily serves to produce, and is thus gradually converted into money, until finally, at the end of ten years, it has been completely transformed into money, and from money back into a machine, i.e. has completed its turnover. Until this reproduction time arrives, its value is accumulated gradually, in the first instance, in the form of a money reserve fund. The remaining elements of productive capital consist in part of the elements of the constant capital existing in the ancillaries and raw materials, and in part of variable capital, laid out in labor power. In analyzing the processes of labor in valorization, see Volume 1, Chapter 7, we showed how these different components behave quite differently in the formation of products and value. The value of the part of constant capital that consists of ancillaries and raw materials, just like the value of the part that consists of means of labor, reappears in the value of the product simply as transferred value, while labor power, through the labor process, adds to the product an equivalent of its value or actually reproduces its value. Furthermore, one part of the ancillary material, coal for heating, gas for lighting, etc., is consumed in the labor process without physically entering the product while another part does enter the product bodily and forms the material of its substance. All these differences are irrelevant, however, as far as the circulation and hence the mode of turnover are concerned. Insofar as ancillary and raw materials are completely consumed in the formation of the product, they transfer their entire value to the product. This value is thus completely circulated via the product, transformed into money, and from money back into the elements of production of the commodity. Its turnover is not interrupted, like that of the fixed capital, but passes continuously through the entire circuit of its forms, so that these elements of the productive capital are constantly renewed in kind. Insofar as the variable capital is concerned, i.e. the component part of the productive capital that is spent on labor power, this labor power is bought for a definite period of time. Once the capitalist has bought it and incorporated it into the production process, it forms a component of his capital, and in fact precisely its variable component. It functions daily for a certain space of time in which it adds to the product not only its entire daily value, but also an additional surplus value, which we shall in the first instance ignore. When the labor power has been bought for one week, for example, and functioned for this time, the purchase must continually be repeated at the customary intervals. The equivalent of its value, which labor power adds to the product during its function and which is transformed into money as the product circulates, must constantly be transformed back from money into labor power or constantly describe the complete circuit of its forms, i.e. turnover, if the cycle of continuous production is not to be interrupted. The part of the value of the productive capital that is advanced for labor power thus completely passes over to the product, we are still ignoring the surplus value, describes together with it the two metamorphoses pertaining to the circulation sphere and remains permanently incorporated in the production process by way of this constant renewal. No matter how differently labor power acts with respect to value formation from the components of constant capital that do not form fixed capital, this manner of turnover of its value is something that it has in common with the latter, in contrast to the fixed capital. Because of this common characteristic in their turnover, these components of productive capital, the portions of value spent on labor power and on means of production that do not form fixed capital, confront fixed capital as circulating or fluid capital. We saw previously how the money that the capitalist pays to the worker for the use of his labor power is in fact only the general equivalent form of the worker's necessary means of subsistence. In this respect, the variable capital consists materially of means of subsistence. Here, however, in considering the turnover, we are dealing with the form. What the capitalist buys is not the worker's means of subsistence, but his actual labor power. It is not the worker's means of subsistence that form the variable part of the capitalist's capital, but his active labor power. It is the worker himself who converts the money he receives for his labor power into means of subsistence, so as to transform these back into labor power and keep alive, just as the capitalist, for example, converts a part of the surplus value of the commodities that he sells for money into means of subsistence for himself, although no one would be led to say that the buyer of his commodities therefore pays him in means of subsistence. 
Even if the worker is paid a part of his wages and means of subsistence, in kind, this nowadays forms a second transaction. He sells his labor power for a definite price, and it is then agreed that he should receive a part of this price and means of subsistence. This only alters the form of the payment. It does not alter the fact that what he actually sells is labor power. This second transaction is no longer between worker and capitalist as such, but between the worker as buyer of commodities and the capitalist as their seller, whereas in the first transaction it was the worker who was the seller of a commodity, his own labor power, and the capitalist its buyer. It is just as if the capitalist had had his commodity replaced by another commodity, for example, as if he replaced the machine that he sells to an iron works by iron. Thus it is not the worker's means of subsistence that acquire the characteristic of fluid capital in contrast to fixed capital, and it is also not his labor power, but rather the portion of the value of the productive capital that is spent on it that has this characteristic in the turnover in common with some components of the constant part of the capital, and in contrast with other parts. The value of the fluid capital, both in labor power and means of production, is advanced only for the time that it takes to produce the product, according to the scale of production which is given by the volume of the fixed capital. This value enters in its entirety into the product, and thus returns again completely from circulation with the sale of the product and can be advanced afresh. The labor power and means of production in which the fluid components of the capital exists are withdrawn from the circulation sphere in the quantity needed for the formation and the sale of the finished product, but they must constantly be replaced and renewed by new purchases, by the transformation from the money form back into the elements of production. They are withdrawn from the market at any one time in smaller quantities than are the elements of fixed capital, but they must be withdrawn again all the more frequently, and the advance of the capital spent on them is repeated at shorter intervals. This regular repetition is mediated by the regular conversion of the product, which circulates their entire value. It is not only their value that continuously describes the whole circuit of metamorphoses, but also their material form. They are constantly transformed back from commodities into the elements of production of those commodities. Together with its own value, labor power constantly adds to the product's surplus value, i.e. the embodiment of unpaid labor. This surplus value is then just as constantly circulated by the finished product and transformed into money as are its other value elements. Here, however, where what we are concerned with in the first instance is the turnover of the capital value and not that of the surplus value that is turned over together with it, we shall disregard the latter for the time being. Our argument so far leads to the following conclusions. 1. The formal characteristics of fixed and fluid capital arise only from the different turnovers of the capital value or productive capital that functions in the production process. This difference in turnover arises for its part from the different ways in which the various components of the productive capital transfer their value to the product, though not from their different share in the production of the product's value or from their characteristic behavior in the valorization process. The different ways in which value is given up to the product, and hence also the different ways in which this value is circulated by the product and replaced in its original natural form as a result of its metamorphoses, ultimately arise from the different material shapes in which productive capital exists, one part of it being consumed entirely in the course of forming the particular product, while another is used up only gradually. Thus it is only productive capital that can be divided up into fixed and fluid capital. This antithesis does not exist for the two other modes of existence of industrial capital, neither for commodity capital nor for money capital, nor yet as an antithesis between these two and productive capital. It exists only for productive capital and only within it. No matter how much money capital and commodity capital function as capital, and how fluidly they circulate, they can become fluid capital in contrast to fixed only when they have been transformed into the fluid components of productive capital. But because these two forms of capital inhabit the circulation sphere, economists have been misled ever since Adam Smith, as we shall see, into classing them together with the fluid part of productive capital under the heading of circulating capital. They are certainly capital of circulation, in contrast to productive capital, but they are not circulating capital in contrast to fixed capital. 2. The turnover of the fixed components of capital, and thus also the turnover time needed by it, encompasses several turnovers of the fluid components of capital. In the same time that it takes for the fixed capital to turn over once, the fluid capital turns over several times. The one component of the value of productive capital receives the formal characteristic of fixed capital only insofar as the means of production in which it exists are not used up in the space of time that it takes to produce the product and eject it from the production process as a commodity. A part of its value must remain tied up in the old and persisting use form, while another part is circulated by the finished product. In its circulation, however, the product circulates at the same time the total value of the fluid components of capital.
3. That part of the value of productive capital that is laid out on fixed capital is advanced all at once in its entirety for the whole period of functioning of that part of the means of production of which the fixed capital consists. The capitalist thus casts this value into the circulation sphere all at once, but it is withdrawn from circulation again only gradually and bit by bit, by the realization of the value portions that the fixed capital adds bit by bit to the commodities. The actual means of production themselves, however, in which a part of the productive capital is fixed, are withdrawn from circulation all at once, to be incorporated into the production process for the whole of the period during which they function, though they do not need throughout this time to be replaced by new items of the same kind, i.e. to be reproduced. They continue to contribute for a longer or shorter time to the formation of the commodities thrown into circulation, without withdrawing from circulation the elements of their own renewal. During this time, therefore, they do not require for their part any new advance on the part of the capitalist. Finally, while the effective life of the means of production in which it exists continues, the capital value laid out as fixed capital does not pass through the circuit of its forms materially, but only in its value, and this only partially and gradually. That is to say, a part of its value is continually circulated and transformed into money as a part of the value of the commodity, without being transformed back from money into its original natural form. This transformation of money back into the natural form of the instrument of production takes place only at the end of the latter's period of functioning, when the instrument of production has been completely used up. 4. The elements of fluid capital are just as permanently fixed in the production process, if this is to be continuous, as are the elements of fixed capital. But while the elements of the former that are fixed in this way are steadily renewed in kind, the means of production by new items of the same kind, labor power by ever-repeated purchases, the elements of fixed capital are neither themselves renewed as long as they last, nor does their purchase have to be repeated. Raw and ancillary materials are constantly present in the production process, but there are always new items of the same kind, the old ones having been consumed in the formation of the finished product. Just as constantly there is labor power in the production process, but only in association with the constant repetition of its purchase and often with the change of persons. However, the very same buildings, machines, etc., carry on functioning in the same repeated production processes while the fluid capital turns over repeatedly. Section 2. Components, Replacement, Repairs and Accumulation of the Fixed Capital The various elements of fixed capital in a particular investment have differing lifespans, and hence also different turnover times. In a railway, for example, the rails, sleepers, earthworks, station buildings, bridges, tunnels, locomotives, and carriages all function for different periods and have different reproduction times, and so the capital advanced in them has different turnover times. The buildings, platforms, water tanks, viaducts, tunnels, cutting, and embankments, in short, all those things which on the English railways are called works of art, do not need to be renewed for a whole series of years. The things that wear out most quickly are the permanent way and the rolling stock. When modern railways were first constructed, the general opinion, backed by the most eminent practical engineers, was that a railway would last for centuries, and that the wear and tear of the tracks would be so negligible that it could be ignored for all financial and practical purposes. One hundred to a hundred and fifty years was considered the lifetime of good rails. It soon transpired, however, that the life of a rail, which of course depends on the speed of the locomotives, the weight and number of trains, the thickness of the rails themselves, and a number of secondary circumstances, is no more than twenty years on average. At certain particular stations and centers of heavy traffic, the rails actually wear out each year. Around 1867, steel rails began to be introduced, which, although they cost around twice as much as iron rails, last for more than twice as long. The lifespan of wooden sleepers was between 12 and 15 years. It also became evident, as far as the rolling stock was concerned, that goods wagons wore out significantly quicker than passenger carriages. In 1867, the life of a locomotive was estimated at between 10 and 12 years. Wear and tear is occasioned in the first place by actual use. As a general rule, the rails wear out in proportion to the number of trains. The wear and tear also increases by more than the square of the speed i.e. if the speed of the trains doubles, then the wear and tear increases more than fourfold. A further item of wear and tear is that caused by natural forces. Sleepers, for example, do not just deteriorate as a result of actual use, but also suffer from rot. Quote, the cost of maintaining the road does not depend so much upon the wear and tear of the traffic passing over it as upon the quality of the wood, iron, bricks, and mortar exposed to the atmosphere. A month of severe winter would do more damage to the road of a railway than a year's traffic. 
End quote from R.P. Williams on the maintenance and renewal of the permanent way, paper read at the Institute of Civil Engineers in autumn of 1866. Finally, as is the case throughout large-scale industry, moral deterioration also plays its part. After ten years have elapsed, it is generally possible to buy the same quantity of carriages and locomotives for £30,000 as previously cost £40,000. A depreciation of 25% on the market price must thus be reckoned with this on material, even if there is no depreciation in the use value. Quote, Tube bridges will not be replaced in their present form, because there are now better forms for such bridges. Ordinary repairs, taking away gradually and replacing, are not practicable. End quote from W. B. Adams, Roads and Rails, published in London, 1862. The means of labor are for the most part constantly revolutionized by the progress of industry. Hence they are not replaced in their original form but in the revolutionized form. On the other hand, the volume of fixed capital that is invested in a particular natural form and has to last out for a definite average lifespan within this is a reason why new machines, etc., are introduced only gradually and hence forms an obstacle to the rapid general introduction of improved means of labor. On the other hand, competition forces the replacement of old means of labor by new ones before their natural demise, particularly when decisive revolutions have taken place. Catastrophes, crises, etc. are the principal causes that compel such premature renewals of equipment on a broad social scale. Depreciation, apart from moral depreciation, is the portion of value that the fixed capital gradually gives up to the product as it is used, according to the average degree of its loss of use value. This depreciation in part takes the form that the fixed capital has a certain average lifespan. It is completely advanced for this period of time, and after it has elapsed, must be completely replaced. In the case of living means of labor, such as horses, for example, the reproduction time is prescribed by nature itself. Their average life as means of labor is determined by natural laws. Once this period has elapsed, the worn-out items must be replaced by new ones. A horse cannot be replaced bit by bit, but only by another horse. Other elements of the fixed capital permit periodic or partial renewal. This partial or periodic replacement should be distinguished from the gradual extension of a business. Fixed capital consists in part of components which are similar but do not last equally long, and are rather renewed bit by bit at different intervals and times. The rails at a station, for example, have to be replaced more often than the rails at other parts of the line. The same is the case with sleepers. Lardner states that in the 1850s on the Belgian railways, these had to be replaced at the rate of 8% per year, the whole of sleepers thus being replaced in the course of 12 and a half years. Here the situation is as follows. A sum is advanced, for example, for ten years on a particular kind of fixed capital. This outlay is made all at once, but a certain part of this fixed capital, the value of which has gone into the value of the product and has been converted along with this into money, is replaced each year in kind, while the remainder continues to exist in its original natural form. What distinguishes this fixed capital from fluid capital is precisely this outlay all at once and reproduction only bit by bit in the natural form. Other items of fixed capital consist of different types of components, which wear out and thus have to be replaced at different intervals of time. This is particularly the case with machines. The same applies here, in connection with the life of those different components of one and the same machine forming an item of fixed capital, as we previously noted with respect to the varying life of different components of a total fixed capital. The following should be noted in connection with the gradual extension of a business in the course of partial renewal. Even though, as we have seen, the fixed capital continues to function in its natural form in the production process, if a part of its value has circulated with the product, according to the average wear and tear, and been transformed into money, then this forms an element of the money reserve fund for the replacement of the capital when its reproduction in kind falls due. This part of the fixed capital value transformed into money can therefore serve to expand the business or to effect improvements in the machines which increase their effectiveness. Reproduction then occurs, in shorter or longer periods, and from the social point of view this is reproduction on an expanded scale, extensively, if the field of production is extended, intensively, if the means of production are made more effective. This reproduction on an expanded scale does not arise from accumulation, the transformation of surplus value into capital, but from a re-transformation of the value, which branches into two parts, and in its money form, has separated itself off from the body of the fixed capital into new fixed capital of the same kind, either additional or more effective. Of course it depends in part on the specific nature of the business, how far and in what dimensions it is susceptible to a gradual addition of this kind, and thus also in what dimensions a reserve fund has to be built up in order to be reinvested in this way, 
and in what periods of time this can take place. How far improvements of detail to existing machinery can be brought about, on the other hand, naturally depends on the nature of the improvements and on the construction of the machine itself. Adams shows that this point is borne in mind very strongly, and from the start, in railway investments. Quote, the whole structure should be set out on the principle which governs the beehive, capacity for indefinite extension. Any fixed and decided symmetrical structure is to be deprecated, as needing subsequent pulling down in case of enlargement. End quote. This, in turn, depends to a large extent on the space available. In some buildings, extra floors can be added, while others require horizontal extension and thus more land. While capitalist production is marked by the waste of much material, there is also much inappropriate horizontal extension of this kind, partly involving a loss of labor power, in the course of the gradual extension of a business, since nothing is done according to a social plan, but rather depends on the infinitely varied circumstances, means, etc., with which the individual capitalist acts. This gives rise to a major wastage of productive forces. The progressive reinvestment of the money reserve fund, i.e. of the part of the fixed capital that is transformed back into money, is most easily affected in agriculture. Here, a spatially given field of production is capable of the greatest gradual absorption of capital. The same is true when natural reproduction takes place, as in the case of cattle breeding. Fixed capital gives rise to special costs of maintenance. A part of the maintenance is affected by the labor process itself. Fixed capital spoils if it does not function in the labor process. See Volume 1, Chapter 8, page 315, and Chapter 15, page 528. Deterioration of machinery that arises from its non-use. The English law, therefore, expressly considers it as a waste if land that is farmed out is not cultivated according to custom. This maintenance that results from use in the labor process is a gift of nature provided gratis by living labor. In fact, the preserving power of labor is of a dual type. On the one hand, it preserves the value of the materials of labor by transferring it to the product, while on the other hand it preserves the value of the means of labor without transferring this value to the product by preserving their use value through their action in the production process. But fixed capital also requires positive outlays of labor if it is to be kept in good condition. The machinery must be cleaned from time to time. This involves additional labor, without which it becomes unfit for use. This is merely a defense against the damaging influence of the elements that is inseparable from the production process, and is thus keeping it in working order in the most literal sense. The normal lifespan of fixed capital is naturally reckoned on the assumption that the conditions under which it can function normally during this time are fulfilled, just as it is assumed, if the average life of a man is taken as thirty years, that he washes himself. What is involved here is not the replacement of the labor contained in the machine, but additional labor that is constantly necessary for it to be used. This is not a matter of labor performed by the machine, but of labor performed on the machine. Hence it is not an agent of production, but rather raw material. The capital spent on this labor is part of the fluid capital, even though it does not properly enter the actual labor process to which the product owes its origin. The labor must be constantly performed in the course of production, and so its value must also be constantly replaced by the value of the product. The capital spent on it belongs to that part of fluid capital that has to cover the general overheads, and is distributed over the value of the product according to an average annual calculation. As we have seen, in industry proper, this work of cleaning is performed by the workers for nothing during breaks, and for this reason it is often actually done during the production process itself, where it is a major source of accidents. This labor does not count in the price of the product. In this respect, the consumer receives it gratis. The capitalist, moreover, does not have to pay anything for the maintenance of his machine. The worker pays in his own person, and this forms one of the mysteries of capital's self-preservation, constituting in point of fact a legal chain of the worker on the machinery, and making him a co-owner of this even from the standpoint of bourgeois right. But in various branches of production, where the machinery has to be removed from the production process for cleaning, and the cleaning cannot therefore take place on the quiet, as with locomotives, for example, this maintenance work counts as running costs, i.e. as an element of fluid capital. Quote, a goods engine should not run more than three days without being kept one day in the shed. If you attempt to wash out the boiler before it is cooled down, that is very injurious. End quote. Repairs proper, the work of patching up, require an outlay of capital and labor which is not contained in the capital originally advanced, and thus cannot always be replaced and covered by the gradual replacement of the fixed capital. If the value of the fixed capital is £10,000, and its overall life is ten years, then this £10,000, when after ten years it is completely transformed into money, replaces only the value of the original capital investment, 
it has not replaced the capital or labor newly added in between times for repairs. This is an additional component of value, which is not advanced all at once, but rather according to need, and its various times of advance are by the nature of the case accidental. All fixed capital requires these later doses of additional capital outlay on means of labor and labor power. The damage to which particular parts of the machinery, etc., are exposed are by nature accidental, and hence so are also the repairs necessitated by such damage. However, two kinds of repair works can be singled out here, both having a more or less firm character and falling in different periods of the fixed capital's lifetime, childhood infirmities, and the far more numerous ailments of the years beyond middle age. No matter how perfectly constructed a machine may be when it enters the production process, faults become evident with actual use, and they have to be corrected by subsequent work. Moreover, the more it passes beyond its middle years, and thus the more that normal wear and tear mounts up, and the material it is made of becomes worn out and weak with age, the more frequent and serious becomes the repair work needed to keep the machine going until the end of its average life, just as an old man has more medical expenses than a man in the prime of life, if he is not to die before his time. Despite its accidental character, therefore, the work of repair is distributed unevenly over the various periods of the fixed capital's life. It follows from this, as well as from the otherwise accidental character of the repair work on a machine, firstly, that the actual expenditure on labor power and means of labor for repair work is accidental, as are the circumstances themselves that make these repairs necessary. The extent of the repairs needed is differentially distributed over the various periods of the fixed capital's life. It is, however, assumed in assessing the average life of the fixed capital that it is constantly maintained in working condition, partly by cleaning, which includes keeping clean its site, partly by repairs, as often as these are required. The transfer of value through the wear and tear of the fixed capital is calculated over its average period of life, but this average period is itself calculated on the assumption that the additional capital required to keep it in working order is continuously advanced. Secondly, it is equally clear that the value added by this additional expenditure of capital and labor cannot go into the price of commodities in step with the actual expenditure itself. A cotton spinner, for instance, cannot sell his yarn dearer this week than last week because he got a wheel broken or a belt snapped. The general costs of spinning are in no way affected by this accident in an individual factory. Experience shows the average extent of such accidents and the work of maintenance and repair needed during the average life of a fixed capital invested in a certain line of business. This average expenditure is distributed over its average life and added in corresponding adequate parts to the price of the product, and this is how it is replaced by the product sale. The extra capital that is replaced in this way is part of the fluid capital, even though the expenditure is of an irregular kind. Since it is of the utmost importance to treat every ailment of the machinery immediately, every large factory has, in addition to the factory workers proper, a staff of engineer, carpenter, mechanic, fitter, etc. Their wages form a part of the variable capital, and the value of their labor is distributed over the product. The expenditure that the means of production require is determined according to this average calculation and always forms a corresponding portion of the value of the product, even though it is in fact advanced at irregular intervals and so also enters the product, i.e. the fixed capital, irregularly. This capital spent on repairs, in the strict sense, forms in many respects a capital of a peculiar kind. It cannot be properly classed either as fluid or as fixed capital, but, since it is a part of the running expenses, it tends more towards the first of the two forms. The way the books are kept does not, of course, affect the actual relationships of the things entered in the accounts. But it is important to note that in many lines of business, it is customary to calculate the repair costs in conjunction with the actual wear and tear of the fixed capital, in the following way. If the fixed capital advanced is £10,000, its life 15 years, then the annual depreciation is £666.2. If the depreciation is now calculated over 10 years only, then instead of 666 and two-thirds pounds, 1,000 pounds is added annually to the price of the goods produced to compensate for the wearing out of the fixed capital, i.e., 333 and one-third pounds is reserved for repairs, etc. The figures 10 and 15 are taken only for the sake of example. This, then, is the amount spent on repairs, on an average, so that the fixed capital may last for 15 years. This calculation does not, of course, prevent the fixed capital and the additional capital spent on repairs from forming different categories. On the basis of this way of calculating, it has been assumed, for example, that the lowest cost estimate for the maintenance and replacement of steamships would be 15% per year, i.e. a reproduction time of six and two-thirds years. 
In the 1860s, the British government compensated the Peninsular and Oriental Company at an annual rate of 16%, which assumes a reproduction time of six and a quarter years. In the case of railways, the average life of a locomotive is 10 years, but if repairs are included, the depreciation is taken as 12.5%, which reduces the lifespan to eight years. For passenger coaches and goods wagons, 9% is reckoned, i.e. a life of 11 and one ninth years. In connection with contracts of rental for houses and other things that are fixed capital for their proprietors and are rented out as such, legislation has always recognized the distinction between normal deterioration produced by time, the influence of the elements, and normal wear and tear, and the occasional repairs that are necessary from time to time for the maintenance in the course of the normal life of a house and its normal use. As a rule, the first fall on the landlord, the second on the tenant. Repairs are further divided into ordinary and substantial. The latter represent in part a renewal of fixed capital in its natural form, and also fall on the landlord, unless the contract expressly states the opposite. Thus, in English law, for example, quote, A tenant, from year to year, on the other hand, is not bound to do more than keep the premises wind and water tight, when that can be done without substantial repairs, and generally to do repairs coming fairly under the head of ordinary. Even with respect to those parts of the premises which are subject of ordinary repairs, regard must be had to their age and general state, and condition when he took possession, for he is not bound to replace old and worn-out materials with new ones, nor to make good the inevitable depreciation resulting from time and ordinary wear and tear. End quote from Holdsworth, Law of Landlord and Tenant, pages 90 and 91. Something that is quite different, both from the replacement of wear and tear and from the work of repair and maintenance, is insurance, which relates to the destruction by way of extraordinary natural events, fire, flood, etc. This must be made good out of surplus value, and forms a deduction from it. Considered from the standpoint of the whole society, there must be a constant overproduction, i.e. production on a greater scale than is needed for the simple replacement and reproduction of the existing wealth, quite apart from any increase in population, for the society to have at its disposal the means of production needed to make good unusual destruction caused by accidents and natural forces. In actual fact, only a very small part of the capital needed for replacement exists in the money reserve fund. The most significant part exists in the extension of the scale of production itself, which is partly an actual expansion and partly falls within the normal capacity of the branches of production that produced fixed capital. An engineering works, for example, is organized to take account of both an annual expansion of the factories of all its customers and the need of part of them for reproduction, as a whole or in part. When wear and tear and repair costs are determined on a social average, great unevenness necessarily arises, even for equally large capital investments in the same branch of production which are under otherwise similar conditions. In practice, a machine, etc., will last one capitalist longer than the average period, and another capitalist not so long. The repair costs of the one are above the average, those of the other below it, etc. But the addition to the price determined by wear and tear, and by repair costs, is the same in both cases, and is determined on the average. Thus the increase in price brings the one more than he actually added, and the other less. This circumstance, like all others that lead the profit of different capitalists in the same line of business to differ, given the same exploitation of labor power, helps to make insight into the true nature of surplus value more difficult. The boundary between what is repair and what is replacement, between costs of maintenance and costs of renewal, is a more or less shifting one. This gives rise to a perpetual struggle, in the railways, for example, as to whether certain expenses are repairs or replacement, whether they are to be met from current expenditure or from the original capital. The transfer of repair costs to the capital account instead of the current account is a well-known device through which railway directors artificially rack up their dividends. Here, too, experience has already provided the most fundamental reference points. The subsequent works undertaken during the early life of a railway, for example, quote, ought not to be denominated repairs, but should be considered as an essential part of the construction of the railway, and in the financial accounts should be debited to capital and not to revenue, not being expenses due to wear and tear or to the legitimate operation of the traffic, but to the original and inevitable incompleteness of the construction of the line, end quote from Lardner. Quote, the only sound way is to charge each year's revenue with the depreciation necessarily suffered to earn the revenue whether the amount is actually spent or not. End quote from Captain Fitzmaurice, Committee of Inquiry on the Caledonian Railway, published in Money Market Review on the 25th of January, 1868. 
In agriculture, it becomes in practice impossible and meaningless to separate the replacement of the fixed capital from its maintenance, at least in so far as steam power is not yet used. Quote, when there is a full, though not excessive, stock of implements, of agricultural and other elements and appliances of all kinds, the general rule is to estimate the annual wear and tear together with the maintenance of the implements, according to the different conditions obtaining, at 15 to 25 percent of the original capital. End quote from Kirchhoff. In the case of railway rolling stock, it is quite impossible to separate repairs from replacement. Quote, we maintain our stock by number. Whatever numbers of engines we have, we maintain that. If one is destroyed by age, and it is better to build a new one, we build it at the expense of revenue, of course, taking credit for the materials of the old ones as far as they go. There is a great deal left. There are the wheels, the axles, the boilers, and in fact a great deal of the old engine is left. End quote from T. Gooch, chairman of the Great Western Railway Company, R.C. on the Railways, page 858. Quote, Repairing means renewing. I do not believe in the word replacement. Once a railway company has bought a vehicle or an engine, it ought to be repaired, and in that way admit of going on forever. The engines are maintained forever out of this eight and a half pence. We've rebuilt our engines. If you purchase an engine entirely, it would be spending more money than is necessary. Yet there is always a pair of wheels or an axle or some portion of the engine which comes in, and hence it cheapens the cost of producing a practically new engine. I am at this moment turning out a new engine every week, or practically a new engine, for it has a new boiler, cylinder, or framing. End quote from Archibald Sturrock, locomotive superintendent of the Great Northern Railway, in R.C., 1867. The same with carriages. Quote, in the course of time, the stock of engines and vehicles is continually repaired. New wheels are put on at one time, and a new body at another. The different moving parts most subject to wear are gradually renewed and the engines and vehicles may be conceived even to be subject to such succession of repairs, that in many of them not a vestige of the original material remains. Even in this case, however, the old materials of coaches or engines are more or less worked up into other vehicles or engines, and never totally disappear from the road. The movable capital, therefore, may be considered to be in a state of continual reproduction, and that which, in the case of the permanent way, must take place altogether at a future epoch, when the entire road will have to be relayed, takes place in the rolling stock gradually from year to year. Its existence is perennial, and it is in a constant state of rejuvenescence. End quote from Lardner. The process depicted here by Lardner, in the case of the railways, does not apply to an individual factory, but it does provide a picture of the constant partial reproduction of the fixed capital, shot through with repairs, that takes place within an entire branch of industry or generally within production as a whole considered on the social scale. Here is some evidence of the broad limits within which clever directors can manipulate the concept of repairs and replacement in the interests of their dividends. According to the above-quoted paper by R.P. Williams, various English railway companies annually wrote off the following average sums over a number of years for repairs and maintenance of the permanent way and buildings for each mile of track. London and Northwestern, £370. Midland, 225 pounds, London and Southwestern, 257 pounds, Great Northern, 310 pounds, Lancashire and Yorkshire, 377 pounds, Southeastern, 263 pounds, Brighton, 266 pounds, Manchester and Sheffield, 200 pounds. These differences arise only to a very slight degree from variations in actual expenditure. They are almost exclusively due to differing modes of calculation, according to whether items are debited to the capital account or the current account. William says, in so many words, that a lesser charge is put down when this is necessary for a good dividend, and a higher figure when there is a greater revenue able to bear it. In certain cases, the wear and tear, and thus replacement for it, is in practice of an infinitesimal magnitude, so that it is only repair costs that come into the balance. What Lardner says about works of art, in the case of the railways, holds good generally for all similarly durable works such as canals, docks, iron and stone bridges, etc., he refers to, quote, that wear and tear which, being due to the slow operation of time acting upon the more solid structures, produces an effect altogether insensible when observed through short periods, but which, after a long interval of time, such, for example, as centuries, must necessitate the reconstruction of some or all even of the most solid structures. These changes may not be unaptly assimilated to the periodical and secular inequalities which take place in the movements of the great bodies of the universe. The operation of time upon the more massive works of art upon the railway, 
such as the bridges, tunnels, viaducts, etc., afford examples of what may be called the secular wear and tear. The more rapid and visible deterioration, which is made good by repairs or reconstruction effected at shorter intervals, is analogous to the periodic inequalities. In the annual repairs is included the casual damage which the exterior of the more solid and durable works may from time to time sustain. But independently of these repairs, age produces its effects even on these structures, and an epoch must arrive, however remote it be, at which they would be reduced to a state which will necessitate their reconstruction. For financial and economic purposes, such an epoch is perhaps too remote to render it necessary to bring it into practical calculation, and therefore it need here only be noticed in passing. End quote from Lardner. This applies to all similar works with a long span of life, so that the capital advanced in them does not have to be gradually replaced in accordance with its wear and tear, but it is only the annual average costs of maintenance and repair that are transferred to the price of the product. Even though, as we have seen, a large part of the money that flows back to replace the wear and tear of the fixed capital is transformed back into its natural form annually, or even more frequently, each individual capitalist still needs an amortization fund on the part of the fixed capital that reaches its term of reproduction only after a period of years, and then has to be replaced entirely. A significant component of the fixed capital excludes piecemeal reproduction by its very nature. Apart from the case where reproduction takes place bit by bit in such a way that new stock is added to the depreciated old stock at short intervals, a prior accumulation of money is necessary, of a greater or lesser amount according to the specific character of the branch of production in question, before this replacement can occur. This cannot be just any sum of money whatever, an amount of a certain size is required. If we consider this exclusively on the assumption of simple money circulation, without any regard to the credit system, this will be brought in later, then the mechanism of the movement is as follows. In the first volume, see chapter 3, section 3, subsection A, it was shown that although a part of the money present in a society always lies fallow in the form of a hoard, while another part functions as means of circulation, or as an immediate reserve fund of directly circulating money, the proportion in which the total quantity of money is divided between hoards and means of circulation constantly alters. In our present case, money that has to be accumulated on a large scale as a hoard in the hands of a big capitalist is thrown into circulation all at once on the purchase of fixed capital. It is then divided up again in the society between means of circulation and hoard. By way of the amortization fund, in which the value of the fixed capital flows back to its starting point in proportion to the wear and tear, a part of the money in circulation again forms a hoard, for a longer or shorter period of time, in the hands of the same capitalist whose hoard was transformed into means of circulation and separated from him with his acquisition of fixed capital. There is a constantly changing distribution of the hoard existing in a society, which alternately functions as means of circulation and is then again divided off from the mass of circulating money as a hoard. With the development of the credit system, which necessarily runs parallel with the development of large-scale industry and capitalist production, this money no longer functions as a hoard but as capital, though not in the hands of its proprietor, but rather of other capitalists at whose disposal it is put. Chapter 9. The Overall Turnover of the Capital Advanced. Turnover Cycles. We have seen already that the fixed and the fluid components of productive capital turn over differently and in different periods, just as the various components of fixed capital in the same business also have different turnover periods according to their different lifespan and reproduction times. On the actual or apparent variations in the turnover of different components of fluid capital in the same business, see Heading 6 at the end of this chapter. 1. The overall turnover of the capital advanced is the average turnover of its different component parts. The mode of calculation is given below. Insofar as only different periods of time are involved, it is of course perfectly simple to take their average. However, 2. There are not only quantitative distinctions involved, but also qualitative ones. The fluid capital entering the production process transfers its whole value to the product, and must therefore be constantly replaced in kind by the sale of the product, if the production process is to continue without interruption. The fixed capital entering the production process transfers only part of its value, the wear and tear, to the product, and continues to function in the production process despite this wear and tear. Hence, it only needs to be replaced in kind at shorter or longer intervals, in any case, not as often as the fluid capital. This necessity of replacement, the reproduction period, does not just differ quantitatively for the different components of the fixed capital. 
as we have already seen, one part of the fixed capital, of longer durability and fixed for several years, can be replaced annually or at shorter intervals, and the old fixed capital added to in kind, while with fixed capital of a different sort, the replacement can only be effected all at once at the end of its life. It is necessary, therefore, to reduce the separate turnovers of the various parts of the fixed capital to a similar form of turnover, so that these differ only quantitatively in the duration of their turnover. A qualitative homogeneity of this kind does not exist if we take as the starting point P to P, the form of the continuous production process. For some elements of P have to be constantly replaced in kind while others do not. Let us take a machine with a value of 10,000 pounds, for example, which lasts for 10 years, so that one-tenth of it, 1,000 pounds, is transformed back into money every year. In the course of one year, this 1,000 pounds has been transformed from money capital into productive capital and commodity capital, and from this back into money capital. It has returned to its original money form, just like the fluid capital, if we consider the latter in this form, and it is immaterial here whether the money capital of 1,000 pounds is transformed back again into the natural form of a machine at the end of the year or not. In calculating the overall turnover of the productive capital advanced, we therefore take all its elements in the money form, so that the return to the money form concludes the turnover. We always consider the value as advanced in money, even in the case of a continuous production process where the money form of the value is only that of money of account. We can then take the average. 3. It follows that even if by far the greater part of the productive capital advanced consists of fixed capital whose reproduction time, and therefore turnover time, makes up a cycle of many years, the capital value turned over during the year by way of repeated turnovers of the fluid capital may be greater than the total value of the capital advanced. Let the fixed capital be 80,000 pounds, and its reproduction time 10 years, so that 8,000 pounds of this annually returns to its money form, or completes one-tenth of its turnover. Let the fluid capital be 20,000 pounds, turning over five times in the year. The total capital is then 100,000 pounds. The fixed capital turned over is 8,000 pounds, and the fluid capital turned over is five times 20,000 pounds, equaling 100,000 pounds. The capital turned over in the year is then 108,000 pounds, 8,000 pounds greater than the capital advanced. 1 and 2 25ths of the capital has turned over. 4. The value turnover of the capital advanced is thus separate from its actual reproduction time, or the real turnover time of its components. Say that a capital of 4,000 pounds turns over 5 times in the year. The capital turned over is then 5 times 4,000 pounds, equaling 20,000 pounds. But what returns at the end of each turnover, to be advanced once again, is the originally advanced capital of 4,000 pounds. Its size is not affected by the number of turnover periods in which it functions anew as capital. We again disregard surplus value. In the example under heading 3, we have assumed that at the end of the year, there returns to the capitalist a. a value sum of 20,000 pounds, which he lays out once again on the fluid components of capital, and b. a sum of 8,000 pounds which is separated off from the fixed capital advanced as a result of wear and tear. The same fixed capital still continues to exist in the production process, but with a reduced value of 72,000 pounds instead of 80,000. The production process must thus continue for nine years before the fixed capital advanced has come to the end of its life, no longer functions to form products or value, and has to be replaced. The capital value advanced has thus to describe a cycle of turnovers, in the given case, for example, a cycle of 10 annual turnovers, and this cycle is in fact determined by the lifespan and hence the reproduction time or turnover time of the fixed capital applied. To the same extent as the value and durability of the fixed capital applied develops with the developments of the capitalist mode of production, so also does the life of industry and industrial capital in each particular investment develop, extending to several years, say an average of 10 years. If the development of fixed capital extends this life, on the one hand, it is cut short on the other by the constant revolutionizing of the means of production, which also increases steadily with the development of the capitalist mode of production. This also leads to changes in the means of production. They constantly have to be replaced because of their moral depreciation, long before they are physically exhausted. We can assume that, for the most important branches of large-scale industry, this life cycle is now on average a 10-year one. The precise figure is not important here. The result is that the cycle of related turnovers, extending over a number of years within which the capital is confined by its fixed component, is one of the material foundations for the periodic cycle in which business passes through successive periods of stagnation, moderate activity, overexcitement, and crisis. The periods for which capital is invested certainly differ greatly and do not coincide in time. But a crisis is always the starting point of a large volume of new investment. It is also, therefore, if we consider the society as a whole, more or less a new material basis for the next turnover cycle. 5. 
On the mode of calculation of the turnover, we will let an American economist have his say. Quote, in some trades, the whole capital embarked is turned or circulated several times within the year. In others, a part is turned over oftener than once a year, another part less often. It is the average period which his entire capital takes in passing through his hands, or making one revolution from which a capitalist must calculate his profits. Suppose, for example, that a person engaged in a particular business has one half of his capital invested in buildings and machinery, so as to be turned only once in ten years, that one fourth more, the cost of his tools, etc., is turned once in two years, and the remaining fourth, employed in paying wages and purchasing material, is turned twice in one year. Say that his entire capital is $50,000, then his annual expenditure will be $25,000 divided by 10 for $2,500, $12,500 divided by 2 for $6,250, $12,500 times 2 for $25,000, totaling $33,750. The mean term in which his capital is turned being about 18 months. Take another case. Say that one-fourth of the entire capital circulates in 10 years, one-fourth in one year, and one-half twice in the year. Then the annual expenditure will be $12,500 divided by 10 for $1,250, $12,500, and $25,000 times 2 for $50,000. Turned over in one year, $63,750. End quote from Scrope, Political Economy, published in New York in 1841. 6. Actual and apparent variations in the turnover of the various parts of capital. This Scrope says in the same passage, on page 141, quote, the capital laid out by a manufacturer, farmer, or tradesman in the payment of his laborer's wages circulates most rapidly, being turned perhaps once a week if his men are paid weekly by the weekly receipts on his bills or sales. That invested in his materials and stock in hand circulates less quickly, being turned perhaps twice, perhaps four times in the year, according to the time consumed between his purchases of one and the sales of the other, supposing him to buy and sell on equal credits. The capital invested in his implements and machinery circulates still more slowly, being turned, that is, consumed and renewed, on the average perhaps but once in five or ten years, though there are many tools that are worn out in one set of operations. The capital which is embarked in buildings, as mills, shops, warehouses, barns, in roads, irrigation, etc., may appear scarcely to circulate at all. But in truth, these things are, to the full, as much as those we have enumerated, consumed in contributing to production, and must be reproduced in order to enable the producer to continue his operations, with this only difference, that they are consumed and reproduced by slower degrees than the rest, and the capital invested in them may be turned perhaps every twenty or fifty years." End quote. Here, Scrope confuses the difference in the flow of particular parts of the fluid capital, brought about by payment periods and credit conditions, with turnovers arising from the nature of the capital. He says that wages must be paid weekly out of the weekly receipts from payments for sales or bills. The first thing to note here is that differences arise with respect to wages themselves, according to the length of the period of payment, i.e. the length of time for which the worker has to give the capitalist credit, thus according to whether the payment of the wages is weekly, monthly, three-monthly, half-yearly, etc. Here the law put forward earlier applies, that, quote, the quantity of means of payment required, and thus the quantity of money capital that has to be advanced at one go, is in direct proportion to the length of the payment periods. End quote from Volume 1, Chapter 3, Section 3, Subsection B. In the second place, it is not only the entire new value added in its production by the week's labor that enters into the weekly product, but also the value of the raw material and ancillaries consumed in it. The value contained in the product circulates together with the product itself. It receives the money form by the sale of the product and has to be converted once again into the same elements of production. This holds good just as much for labor power as for raw and ancillary materials. But as we have already seen, See Chapter 6, Section 2, Subsection A. The continuity of production requires a stock of means of production, which differs for various lines of business and in the same line of business differs once again for different components of this element of the fluid capital, for example, for coal and cotton. Hence, although these materials must constantly be replaced in kind, they do not always need to be bought afresh. How often the purchase is repeated depends on the size of the stock invested in, how long it will last until it is exhausted. In the case of labor power, there is no such storage process. For the portion of the capital that is laid out on labor, the transformation back into money goes hand in hand with that laid out on ancillary and raw materials. But the transformation of the money back into labor power on the one hand and raw materials on the other proceeds separately on account of the particular purchase and payment periods of these two components, one of them being bought at longer intervals as a productive stock, the other labor power at shorter intervals, for example weekly. 
Besides his production stock, the capitalist must also keep a stock of finished commodities. One way of disregarding the difficulties of sale, etc., is to assume that a certain quantity of goods must be produced to order. Even so, while the latter part of these are being produced, those items already finished lie in store until the time when others can be completed. Other distinctions, in the turnover of the fluid capital, arise if particular elements of this have to persist longer than others at a preliminary stage of the production process, such as drying of wood, etc. The credit system, which Scrope refers to here, modifies the turnover of the individual capitalist, and so does commercial capital. At the level of society, however, it modifies this only insofar as it speeds up both consumption and production. Chapter 10. Theories of Fixed and Circulating Capital. The Physiocrats and Adam Smith. In Kesney's work, the distinction between fixed and circulating capital appears as one between original advances and yearly advances. He is correct in presenting this distinction as one within productive capital, capital incorporated into the immediate production process. Since he considers capital applied in agriculture, i.e. the capital of the farmer, as the only really productive capital, these distinctions in fact only arise for the farmer's capital. What also results from this is the annual turnover time of one part of the capital, and the more than annual, decennial, turnover times of the other. In the course of development, the physiocrats incidentally transferred these distinctions to other kinds of capital as well, to industrial capital in general. For society as a whole, the distinction between advances for one year and advances for several years remains so important that many economists, even after Adam Smith, have returned to this definition. The distinction between the two kinds of advance arises only when money advanced has been transformed into the elements of productive capital. It is simply and solely a distinction within productive capital. Thus, it did not occur to Kesney to count money as part of the original advances or the annual advances. As advances for production, i.e. as productive capital, the two contrast both with money and with commodities in the market. Moreover, Kesney correctly reduced the distinction between these two elements of productive capital to the different ways in which they enter the value of the finished product, hence the different ways in which their value is circulated together with the value of the product, and the different ways in which they are replaced or reproduced, the value of one being completely replaced each year, that of the other bit by bit over a longer period. The only step forward taken by Adam Smith was to generalize these categories. In his work, they no longer relate just to one special form of capital, farmer's capital, but to every form of productive capital. It follows automatically that in place of the distinction, taken from agriculture, between annual and more than annual turnovers, we have a general distinction between turnovers of varying times, so that a turnover of fixed capital always comprises more than one turnover of circulating capital, whatever the length of turnover of this circulating capital may be, a year, greater than a year, or less than a year. In Smith, therefore, annual advances are transformed into circulating capital, original advances into fixed capital. But the progress he made was confined to this generalization of categories. In the development of his presentation, he falls far behind Kesney. The crudely empirical way in which Smith opens his investigation immediately introduces an ambiguity. Quote, there are two different ways in which a capital may be employed so as to yield a revenue or profit to its employer. End quote from Wealth of Nations, Book 2, Chapter 1. The ways in which value may be employed to function as capital, to yield a surplus value to its owner, are as varied and manifold as the spheres of investment of capital. This is a question of the various branches of production in which capital can be invested. The question, formulated in this way, goes still further. It includes the problem of how value, even if it is not invested as productive capital, can function as capital for its owner, for example, as interest-bearing capital, merchant's capital, etc. Here, we are already a world away from the real object of the analysis i.e. the question of how the division of productive capital into its various elements affects the turnover, irrespective of its different spheres of investment. Adam Smith immediately goes on to say, quote, First, it may be employed in raising, manufacturing, or purchasing goods, and selling them again with a profit, end quote. Here, Smith tells us no more than that capital can be applied in agriculture, manufacture, or trade. Thus he speaks only of the different spheres of investment of capital, as well as of some in which, as in trade, capital is not incorporated into the immediate production process and thus does not function as productive capital. He thus already abandons the basis on which the physiocrats depict the distinctions within productive capital and their influence on the turnover. In fact, he immediately takes merchant's capital as an example in a question where what is at issue is exclusively the differences within productive capital in the process of forming products and value, differences which in turn produce differences in its turnover and reproduction. He continues, quote, The capital employed in this manner yields no revenue or profit to its employer, 
whether it remains in his possession or continues in the same shape. End quote. The capital employed in this manner. But Smith speaks of capital that is invested in agriculture and industry, and later tells us that the capital thus invested can be divided into fixed and circulating capital. The employment of capital in this manner can thus make the capital neither fixed nor circulating. Perhaps what Smith has in mind is the capital employed to produce commodities and to sell these commodities at a profit must, after its transformation into commodities, be sold. By way of sale, it firstly passes from the possession of the seller into that of the buyer, and secondly is converted from its natural form as a commodity into its money form, hence is useless to the possessor, quote, while it either remains in his possession or continues in the same shape, end quote, for him. But what emerges then is this. The same capital value that functioned previously in the form of productive capital, in a form pertaining to the production process, now functions as commodity capital and money capital, in the forms pertaining to the circulation process and thus is no longer either fixed or fluid capital. And this holds just as much for the elements of value that are added by way of raw and ancillary materials, thus by fluid capital as for those added by the use of the means of labor, i.e. by fixed capital. Thus we do not get a step nearer to the distinction between fixed and fluid capital. Further, quote, the goods of the merchant yield him no revenue or profit till he sells them for money, and the money yields him as little till it is again exchanged for goods. His capital is continually going from him in one shape and returning to him in another, and it is only by means of such circulation or successive exchanges that it can yield him any profit. Such capitals, therefore, may very properly be called circulating capitals. End quote. What Adam Smith here calls circulating capital is what I intend to call capital of circulation capital in the form pertaining to the circulation process, pertaining to the change of form mediated by exchange, material change and change of hands, i.e. commodity capital and money capital, in contrast to the form pertaining to the production process, that of productive capital. These are not particular ways in which the industrial capitalist divides his capital, but rather different forms that the same capital value, once advanced, successively assumes and discards throughout its curriculum vitae. Adam Smith lumps these together with the distinctions of form that arise within the circulation of the capital value, and its circuit through its successive forms, while the capital value exists in the form of productive capital, and this is a great step backward in relation to the physiocrats. These distinctions arise, in fact, from the various ways in which the different elements of productive capital participate in the process of value formation and transfer their value to the product. We shall see more below of the consequences of this basic confusion between productive capital and capital in the circulation sphere, commodity capital and money capital, on the one hand, and fixed capital and fluid capital on the other. The capital value advanced in fixed capital is circulated via the product just as much as that advanced in fluid capital, and that is transformed into money capital through the circulation of the commodity capital every bit as much as the other. The distinction simply arises from the fact that its value circulates bit by bit, and must thus also be replaced bit by bit, in shorter or longer periods, and so be reproduced in this way in its natural form. The particularly unfortunate example, selected by Adam Smith, demonstrates that by circulating capital, he understands here nothing other than capital of circulation, i.e. capital value in its forms pertaining to the circulation process, commodity capital and money capital. He takes as his example a kind of capital that does not belong to the production process at all, but exclusively inhabits the circulation sphere and consists solely of capital of circulation, merchant's capital. The absurdity of beginning with an example in which capital does not figure as productive capital at all is immediately indicated by Adam Smith himself. Quote, the capital of a merchant is altogether a circulating capital. End quote. The distinction between circulating and fixed capital, however, is supposedly, as we are later told, one arising from the basic distinctions within productive capital itself. Adam Smith has in mind, on the one hand, the physiocratic distinction, on the other hand, the distinctions of form which the capital value undergoes in its circuit. The two are completely jumbled up. There is no way of seeing how a profit is supposed to arise through the change of form between money and commodity, through a mere transformation of value from one of these forms to the other. Explanation of this is even made absolutely impossible insofar as Smith begins with merchant's capital, which moves solely within the circulation sphere. We shall return to this point. Let us first see what he says about fixed capital. Quote, Secondly, Capital may be employed in the improvement of land, in the purchase of useful machines and instruments of trade, or in such like things as yield a revenue or profit without changing masters or circulating any further. Such capitals, therefore, may very properly be called fixed capitals. Different occupations require very different proportions between the fixed and circulating capitals employed in them. Some part of the capital of every master, artificer, or manufacturer must be fixed in the instruments of his trade. This part, however, is very small in some and very great in others. 
The far greater part of the capital of all such master artificers, such as tailors, shoemakers, and weavers, however, is circulated, either in the wages of their workmen or in the price of their materials, and repaid with a profit by the price of the work. End quote. Quite apart from the childish definition of the source of profit, the weakness and confusion are immediately apparent. For a machine builder, for example, the machine is the product that circulates as his commodity capital, i.e., in Smith's words, is parted with, changes masters, and circulates further. The machine would thus not be fixed, but circulating capital, even according to his own definition. This confusion also arises from the way that Smith mixes up the distinction between fixed and fluid capital, which arises from the different kinds of circulation of the different elements of productive capital, with the distinctions of form that the same capital undergoes insofar as it functions as productive capital within the production process, but as capital of circulation, i.e. as commodity capital or money capital, in the circulation sphere. According to the position they assume in the life process of capital, therefore, the same things can function for Adam Smith as fixed capital, as means of labor, elements of productive capital, and as circulating capital, commodity capital, as the product that is ejected from the sphere of production into that of circulation. But then he suddenly changes the whole basis of his distinction and contradicts what he started the whole investigation with a few lines earlier. Previously, he said, quote, there are two different ways in which a capital may be employed so as to yield a revenue or profit to its employer, end quote, i.e. as circulating or as fixed capital. These were different modes of employment of distinct and independent capitals, so that capital might be employed either in industry or in agriculture, for example. Now, however, he says, quote, different occupations require very different proportions between the fixed and circulating capitals employed in them, end quote. Fixed and circulating capital are now no longer distinct and independent capital investments, but rather different portions of the same productive capital, which form different shares of the total value in different spheres of investment. They are thus distinctions that arise from the division of productive capital itself, as it lies in the facts, and they therefore apply only in relation to this. This is again contradicted, however, when commercial capital is counterposed to fixed capital as simply circulating capital. For Smith himself says, quote, the capital of a merchant is altogether a circulating capital, end quote. What it is, in fact, is a capital functioning within the circulation sphere. As such, it contrasts with productive capital in general, capital incorporated into the production process, and for this very reason it can never be counterposed to the fixed components of productive capital as a fluid, circulating component of productive capital. In the examples he provides, Smith defines fixed capital as instruments of trade and circulating capital as the share of capital laid out on wages and raw materials, including ancillaries, which is repaid with a profit by the price of the work. At first, therefore, the starting point is simply the various components of the labor process, labor power, labor, and raw materials on the one hand, instruments of labor on the other. But these are components of capital, because a sum of value that is to function as capital is laid out on them. In this respect, they are the material elements, modes of existence, of productive capital, i.e. capital functioning in the production process. Why then is one part called fixed? Because, quote, some part of the capital must be fixed in the instruments of trade, end quote. The other part, however, is also fixed in wages and raw materials. However, machines and, quote, instruments of trade, such like things as yield a revenue or profit without changing masters or circulating any further, such capitals, therefore, may very properly be called fixed capitals. End quote. Let us take, for example, mining. Here, there is no raw material involved, since the object of labor, for example, copper, is a natural product that has first to be appropriated by labor. The as yet unappropriated copper, the product of the process that will later circulate as a commodity, as commodity capital, does not form an element of the productive capital. No part of the value is laid out on it. Neither do the other elements of the production process, labor power and ancillaries such as coal, water, etc., for their part, enter materially into the product. The coal is entirely consumed, and only its value enters the product, just as the part of the value of the machine, etc., enters the product. The worker, finally, still exists just as independently vis-à-vis -vis the product as does the machine. It is only the value that he produces through his labor that is now a component to the value of the copper. In this example, therefore, not a single component of the productive capital changes hands, masters. None of these components is circulated further, because none of them materially enters the product. Where, then, is the circulating capital in this case? According to Smith's own definition, the whole of the capital employed in a copper mine consists solely of fixed capital. Let us take, on the other hand, a different industry, which uses raw materials that form the substance of the product, as well as ancillaries that enter the product bodily, and not just in respect of their value, as does coal for heating, for example. Here, when the product, yarn for instance, changes hands, so does the raw material, the cotton, of which it consists, 
passing from the production process into that of circulation. But as long as cotton functions as an element of productive capital, its owner does not sell it but works on it, makes yarn out of it. He does not let it go. Or to use Smith's crudely false and trivial expression, he does not make a profit, quote, by parting with it, by its changing masters, or by circulating it, end quote. He no more has his material circulate than his machines. They are fixed in the production process, just as much as are the spinning machines and factory buildings. Indeed, a part of the productive capital must as constantly be fixed in the form of coal, cotton, etc., as in that of means of labor. The distinction is simply that the cotton, coal, etc. needed for a week's production of yarn, for example, is completely consumed, and must therefore be replaced by new cotton, coal, etc. Thus, these elements of productive capital, although they remain identical in kind, always consist of new items, whereas the same individual spinning machine and the same individual factory building continue to serve for a whole series of weeks of production, without being replaced by new items. As elements of productive capital, all its components are constantly fixed in the production process, since this cannot proceed without them. And all elements of productive capital, fixed as well as fluid, are, as productive capital, equally distinct from circulation capital, i.e. from commodity capital and money capital. It is just the same with labor power. A part of the productive capital must constantly be fixed in it, and it is generally the very same labor powers, like the same machines, that are used by the same capitalist for a long period. The distinction between labor power and machine here does not consist in the fact that the machine is bought once and for all, which is in fact not the case when it is paid for by installments, for example, while the worker is not, but rather in that the labor that the worker expends enters entirely into the value of the product, while the value of the machine enters only bit by bit. Smith confuses different characteristics when he says of circulating capital in contrast to fixed, quote, The capital employed in this manner yields no revenue or profit to its employer, while that either remains in his possession or continues in the same shape. End quote. He places the merely formal commodity metamorphosis which the product, the commodity capital, undergoes in the circulation sphere and which mediates the commodity's change of hands on the same level with the bodily metamorphosis which the various elements of the productive capital undergo during the production process. Without further ado, he lumps together the transformation of commodity into money and money into commodity with the transformation of the elements of production into the product. His example of circulating capital is merchant's capital, which is transformed from commodity into money and from money into commodity, the change of form CMC that pertains to commodity circulation. The significance that this formal change within the circulation sphere has for functioning industrial capital is that the commodities which money is transformed back into are elements of production, means of labor and labor power, and so the change of form therefore mediates the continuity of the capital's function, mediates the production process as a continuous one as a process of reproduction. This entire change of form proceeds in the circulation sphere. It is this that mediates the actual transition of commodities from one hand to another. The metamorphoses that productive capital undergoes within its productive process, on the other hand, are metamorphoses pertaining to the labor process, which are necessary in order to transform the elements of production into the intended product. Adam Smith confines himself to saying that one part of the means of production, the means of labor proper, serve in the labor process, which he wrongly expresses as yield a profit to their master, not by changing their natural form, but simply by being gradually worn out, whereas in other part, the materials are changed and fulfill their function as means of production precisely through their alteration. This differing behavior of the elements of productive capital in the labor process, however, forms only the starting point of the distinction between fixed and non-fixed capital, and not the distinction itself, as is already shown by the fact that it obtains equally for all modes of production, non-capitalist as well as capitalist. Corresponding to this different material role is the way in which value is surrendered to the product, to which further corresponds the way in which value is replaced by the sale of the product, and it is only this that constitutes the distinction in question. Thus, capital is not fixed capital simply because it is fixed in the means of labor, but rather because a part of the value laid out on means of labor remains fixed in these, while another part circulates as a value component of the product. If it, the stock, is employed in procuring further profit, it must procure this profit either by staying with him, the employer, or by going from him. In the one case, it is a fixed, in the other, it is a circulating capital. End quote. The first thing that strikes one here is the crudely empirical conception of profit, taken from the manner in which it appears to the ordinary capitalist, something that stands in complete contradiction to Smith's own better and esoteric insight. In the price of the product, the price of both materials and labor power is replaced, but so too is the portion of value transferred from the instruments of labor to the product by wear and tear. Profit can in no case flow from this replacement. Whether a value advance for the reproduction of the product is replaced completely, or bit by bit, can alter only the manner and time of this replacement. In no case, however, can it transform what is common to both, 
the replacement of value into a creation of surplus value. What lies at the bottom of this is the everyday idea that, because surplus value is only realized by the sale of the product, by its circulation, it therefore arises simply from sale, from circulation. In point of fact, saying that profit arises in different ways is here only an incorrect way of saying that the various elements of productive capital serve or function differently in the labor process as productive elements. Finally, the distinction is not derived from the labor and valorization process itself, from the function of productive capital, but it is rather one that simply obtains subjectively for the individual capitalist, to whom one part of capital is useful in this way, another in that. Kesney, on the other hand, derived the distinctions from the actual reproduction process and its exigencies. In order for this process to be continuous, the value of the annual advances has to be completely replaced each year out of the value of the annual product, whereas the value of the original investment capital need only be replaced bit by bit, so that it is only completely replaced over a series of, for example, ten years, and only in this way is it entirely reproduced, replaced by new items of the same kind. Thus Adam Smith falls a long way behind Kesney. Nothing more remains for Adam Smith to use in defining fixed capital than the fact that it consists of means of labor that do not change their shape in the production process and continue to serve in production until they are worn out, as opposed to the products which they help to form. He forgets that all elements of productive capital are always distinct from the product, and the product circulating as a commodity in their natural form, as means of labor, materials, and labor power, and that the distinction between the part consisting of materials and labor power and the part consisting of means of labor simply lies, in the case of labor power, that it is always bought anew, not bought for its duration as with means of labor, and in the case of the materials, and that it is not the very same ones but ever new items of the same kind that function in the labor process. At the same time, the illusion is generated that the value of the fixed capital does not also circulate, although Adam Smith has of course earlier explained that the wear and tear of the fixed capital forms a part of the price of the products. When Smith distinguishes circulating capital from fixed capital, what he emphasizes is not that this circulating capital is simply that component of the productive capital that must be completely replaced out of the value of the product and must therefore go through all its metamorphoses together with the latter, whereas this is not the case with fixed capital. Circulating capital is rather lumped together with the shapes that the capital assumes on its transition from the sphere of production to that of circulation, as commodity capital and money capital. These two forms, however, commodity capital and money capital, are bearers of both the fixed and the fluid components of the value of productive capital. Both are capital of circulation, in contrast to productive capital, but not circulating fluid capital in contrast to fixed. Finally, the wholly erroneous explanation that fixed capital makes a profit by remaining in the production process while circulating capital makes a profit by leaving this and circulating permits the similarity of form that variable capital and the fluid components of the constant capital have in the turnover to conceal the basic difference that they have in the valorization process and the formation of surplus value, and in this way, the whole secret of capitalist production is still further obscured. The inclusive characterization of both forms as circulating capital abolishes this fundamental distinction, and this was carried still further by later economists, who took the contrast between fixed and circulating capital as the basic and sole distinction, instead of distinguishing between variable and constant capital. After Adam Smith has firstly described fixed and circulating capital as two specific ways of investing capital, each of which independently yields a profit, he goes on to say, quote, no fixed capital can yield any revenue but by means of a circulating capital. The most useful machines and instruments of trade will produce nothing without the circulating capital which affords the materials they are employed upon and the maintenance of the workmen who employ them. End quote. Here we see what the earlier expressions yield a revenue, make a profit, etc. really mean, i.e. that both parts of capital serve in the formation of products. But Smith offers the following as an example. Quote, that part of the capital of the farmer which is employed in the implements of agriculture is a fixed, that which is employed in the wages and maintenance of his laboring servants is a circulating capital. End quote. Here, the distinction between fixed and circulating capital is correctly related simply to the difference in circulation, to the turnover of different components of the productive capital. Quote, he makes a profit of the one by keeping it in his own possession, and of the other by parting with it. The price or value of his laboring cattle is a fixed capital. Here we have the further correct assertion that it is value to which the distinction refers and not the material element, in the same manner as that of the instruments of husbandry. Their maintenance, that of the laboring cattle, is a circulating capital, in the same manner as that of the laboring servants. The farmer makes his profit by keeping the laboring cattle and by parting with their maintenance. End quote. The farmer keeps the cattle's fodder. He doesn't sell it. He needs it as cattle fodder while he uses the cattle themselves as instruments of labor. 
The distinction is simply that the cattle fodder that enters into the maintenance of the draft cattle is completely consumed and must be constantly replaced by new cattle fodder from the agricultural product or its sale, while the cattle themselves are replaced only to the extent that each animal in succession becomes incapable of further work. Quote, Both the price and the maintenance of the cattle, which are brought in and fattened, not for labor but for sale, are a circulating capital. The farmer makes his profit by parting with them. End quote. Every commodity producer, and thus the capitalist producer as well, sells his product, the result of his production process, but this does not make the product either a fixed or a fluid component of his productive capital. It now exists rather in a form in which it has been ejected from the production process and must function as commodity capital. Fattening cattle function in the production process as raw material, not as an instrument like draft cattle. They therefore enter the product as substance, and their entire value enters the product, just as that of the ancillary materials, their fodder. This is why they are a fluid part of the productive capital, and not because the product sold, the fattened cattle, has here the same natural form as the raw material, the not yet fattened cattle. That is a mere accident. At the same time, Smith should have been able to see from this example that it is not the material shape of the element of production that makes the value contained in it fixed or fluid, but rather its function within the production process. Quote, the whole value of the seed, too, is properly a fixed capital. Though it goes backwards and forwards between the ground and the granary, it never changes masters, and therefore does not properly circulate. The farmer makes his profit not by its sale, but by its increase. End quote. Here, the utter shallowness of Smith's distinction comes into the open. In his conception, the seed is fixed capital because there is no change of masters, i.e. the seed is directly replaced out of the annual product, subtracted from it. It would be circulating capital, however, if the entire product were sold and new seed corn were bought with one part of the product's value. In the one case, there is a change of masters, in the other case, not. Here, Smith confuses fluid capital with commodity capital. The product is the material bearer of the commodity capital, but of course only of that part of it that actually enters circulation, and does not directly re-enter the production process from which it emerged as a product. Whether the seed is directly subtracted from the product, or whether the whole product is sold and a part of its value is replaced by the acquisition of new seed, what occurs in both cases is no more than a replacement, and no profit is made by this replacement. In the one case, the seed passes into circulation as a commodity along with the rest of the product, while in the other case, it figures only in the bookkeeping as a component of the value of the capital advanced. In both cases, however, it remains a fluid component of the productive capital. It is completely consumed in preparing the product, and it must be completely replaced out of this if reproduction is to be made possible. Quote, Hence, raw material and auxiliary substances lose the independent form with which they entered into the labor process. It is otherwise with the actual instruments of labor. Tools, machinery, factory buildings, and containers are only of use in the labor process as long as they keep their original shape, and are ready each morning to enter into it in the same form. And just as during their lifetime, that is to say, during the labor process, they retain their shape independently of the product, so too after their death. The mortal remains of machines, tools, workshops, etc. always continue to lead an existence distinct from that of the product they helped turn out. End quote from Capital, Volume 1, Chapter 8, page 311. These different ways in which the means of production are used in the formation of the product, some of them maintaining their independent shape vis-à-vis -vis the product, others changing it, or even losing it entirely, this distinction, which pertains to the labor process as such, and therefore applies just as much to labor processes oriented simply to the needs of the producers themselves, for example, the patriarchal family, and devoid of any exchange or commodity production, is falsified by Adam Smith, in that one, introduces here what is the quite inapposite characteristic that some means of production bring their owner profit by maintaining their shape, others by losing it, two, lumps the alterations suffered by one part of the elements of production in the labor process, together with the change of form pertaining to the exchange of products to commodity circulation, buying and selling, which at the same time includes the change of ownership of the commodities in circulation. Turnover implies that reproduction is mediated by circulation i.e. by the sale of the product, by its transformation into money, and transformation back from money into its own elements of production. But insofar as a part of his product again directly serves the same capitalist producer as means of production, the producer appears as selling this to himself. This is how the matter figures in his bookkeeping. This part of reproduction is then not mediated by circulation, but directly. The part of the product that serves again in this way as means of production replaces fluid capital, not fixed, insofar as 1. its value goes completely into the product, and 2. it is itself replaced completely in kind by a new item from the new product. Adam Smith then tells us what circulating and fixed capital consist of. He lists the things, the material elements that constitute fixed capital, and those that constitute circulating capital, as if this characteristic belonged to these things materially, by nature, and did not rather derive from their specific function within the capitalist production process. 
And yet he notes in the same chapter, Book 2, Chapter 1, that although a certain thing, a house, for example, which is reserved for direct consumption, quote, may yield a revenue to its proprietor, and thereby serve in the function of capital to him, it cannot yield any to the public, nor serve in the function of a capital to it, and the revenue of the whole body of the people can never be in the smallest degree increased by it, end quote. Here, Adam Smith clearly asserts that the property of being capital cannot be attributed to things as such and under all circumstances, but is rather a function with which they are or are not endowed according to the given conditions. But what is true of capital in general is also true of its subdivisions. The same things may form components of fluid or of fixed capital, according to the different functions they perform in the labor process. Cattle used as draft cattle, means of labor, for example, form a material mode of existence of fixed capital while as fattening cattle, raw material, they are a component part of the farmer's circulating capital. The same thing, moreover, can function at one time as a component of productive capital, and at another time form part of the direct consumption fund. A house, for example, when it functions as a place of work, is a fixed component of productive capital. When it functions as a dwelling, it is in no way a form of capital in this capacity. The same means of labor can in many cases function at one time as means of production, at another time as means of consumption. One of the errors that followed from Smith's conception was that of taking fixed and circulating capital as characteristics attributable to things. Our analysis of the labor process, see Volume 1, Chapter 7, has already shown how the determinations of means of labor, material of labor, and product change according to the various roles that one and the same thing assumes in the process. The characteristics of fixed and non-fixed capital are, in their turn, however, built on the particular roles that these elements play in the labor process and hence in the process of value formation. Secondly, however, in enumerating the things which fixed and circulating capital consist of, it becomes evident that Smith lumps together the distinction between fixed and fluid components, which is only valid and only has any meaning in relation to productive capital, capital in its productive form, with the distinction between productive capital and the forms pertaining to capital in its circulation process, commodity capital and money capital. He says in the same passage, on page 378, quote, the circulating capital consists of the provisions, materials, and finished work of all kinds that are in the hands of their respective dealers, and of the money that is necessary for circulating and distributing them. End quote. When we look more closely, in fact, we find that, in contrast to his earlier assertions, circulating capital is here again equated with commodity capital and money capital, i.e., with two forms of capital that do not belong to the production process at all, which are not circulating fluid capital in opposition to fixed, but rather circulation capital in opposition to productive capital. It is only alongside these that the components of productive capital advanced in materials, raw material or semi-manufactured goods, and actually incorporated into the production process again figure. He says, quote, The third and last of the three portions into which the general stock of the society naturally divides itself is the circulating capital, of which the characteristic is that it affords a revenue only by circulating or changing masters. It is composed likewise of four parts. First, of the money but money is never a form of productive capital, capital functioning in the production process, it is never more than one of the forms which capital assumes within its process of circulation. Secondly, of the stock and provisions which are in possession of the butcher, the grazier, the farmer, and from the sale of which they expect to derive a profit. Fourthly, and lastly, of the work which is made up and completed, but which is still in the hands of the merchant or manufacturer. And thirdly, of the materials, whether alongside or rude, or more or less manufactured, of clothes, furniture, and building, which are not yet made up into any of those three shapes, but which remain in the hands of the growers, the manufacturers, the mercers and drapers, the timber merchants, the carpenters and joiners, the brick makers, etc. End quote. The second and fourth parts simply contain products that have been ejected from the production process as such and have to be sold. In short, products that now function as commodities and hence as commodity capital i.e. possess a form and assume a position in the process in which they do not constitute an element of productive capital, whatever may be their eventual destination, i.e. whether their purpose, use value, finally fits them for individual or for productive consumption. The products in the second part are foodstuffs, those in the fourth part all other finished products, which thus themselves consist only of the finished means of labor or articles of consumption, other than the foodstuff comprised in the second part. Smith also demonstrates his confusion on this point by the way that he speaks of the merchant. If the producer has sold his product to the merchant, this no longer constitutes capital of his in any form. From the social point of view, however, it is still just as much commodity capital, even if in other hands than those of its producers. But precisely because it is commodity capital, it is neither fixed nor fluid capital. In every production not directed towards satisfying the producer's own immediate needs, the product must circulate as a commodity, i.e. be sold, not so that a profit may be made on it, but simply so that the producer may live. 
In the case of capitalist production, the sale of commodity also realizes the surplus value contained in it. The product passes out of the production process as a commodity and is therefore no longer either a fixed or fluid element of this process. Here, by the way, Smith actually refutes his own argument. The finished product, whatever may be their material shape or use value, their useful effect are all commodity capital, i.e. capital in a form pertaining to the circulation process. Because they exist in this form, they cannot constitute a component of their owner's productive capital, but this in no way prevents them, once they are sold, from becoming components of productive capital, whether fluid or fixed, in the hands of their buyer. It is evident here that the same things that enter the market at one time as commodity capital, in opposition to productive capital, may function as either fluid or fixed components of productive capital, or as neither, once they are withdrawn from the market. The product of the cotton spinner, yarn, is the commodity form of his capital, commodity capital for him. It cannot function again as component of his productive capital, either as material of labor or as means of labor. The weaver who buys it, however, incorporates it into his productive capital, as a fluid part of this. For the spinner, on the other hand, the yarn is the bearer of the value of a part of both his fluid and his fixed capital. We ignore surplus value. Similarly, a machine, as the product of the machine builder, is a commodity capital for him, and as long as it persists in this form, it is neither fluid nor fixed capital. When sold to a manufacturer who puts it to use, it becomes a fixed component of a productive capital. Even when the use form of the product enables it in part to re-enter as means of production, the process from which it emerged, as when coal re-enters the production of coal, the part of the coal product destined for sale still represents neither fluid nor fixed capital, but rather commodity capital. The use form of the product may, however, render it completely incapable of forming any element of productive capital, either material or means of labor any kind of means of subsistence, for example. It is nonetheless commodity capital for its producer, the bearer of value of both the fixed and the fluid capital, and in the proportion that the capital bestowed on its production must be completely or partially replaced. Its value has been transferred wholly or partly to it. In Smith's third case, the raw materials, including the semi-finished goods and ancillaries, figure in the first place not as a component already incorporated into productive capital, but in fact only as a special kind of those use values, the mass of commodities, which the social product consists of in general, alongside the other material components, means of subsistence, etc., listed in the second and fourth cases. Secondly, however, they are also presented as incorporated into productive capital, and hence elements of the latter in the hands of the producer. The confusion shows itself in the way that they are conceived as functioning both in the hands of the producer, in the hands of the growers, the manufacturers, etc., and in the hands of the merchants, mercers, drapers, timber merchants, where they are mere commodity capital, not components of productive capital. In listing the elements of circulating capital, in fact, Adam Smith completely forgets the distinction between fixed and fluid capital, which is applicable only to productive capital. Instead, he counterposes commodity capital and money capital, i.e. the two forms of capital pertaining to the circulation process, to productive capital, although even this he does unconsciously. A final striking thing is that Adam Smith forgets labor power in his list of the components of circulating capital. There are two reasons for this. We have already seen that, leaving aside money capital, circulating capital is, for Smith, only another name for commodity capital. But insofar as labor power circulates on the market, it is not capital, and so not a form of commodity capital. It is not capital at all. The worker is not a capitalist even though he brings a commodity to market, i.e. his own skin. It is only when labor power has been sold and incorporated into the production process, i.e. after it has ceased to circulate as a commodity, that it becomes a component of productive capital. Variable capital is the source of surplus value, a fluid component of the productive capital in relation to the turnover of the capital value laid out on this. Because Smith confuses fluid capital with commodity capital, he cannot bring labor power under his heading of circulating capital. Variable capital thus appears here in the form of the commodities that the worker buys with his wages, the means of subsistence. It is in this form that the capital value laid out on wages is supposed to form part of the circulating capital. But what is incorporated into the production process is labor power, the actual worker, and not the means of subsistence with which the worker maintains himself. We have certainly seen, see Volume 1, Chapter 23, that, considered from the society standpoint, the reproduction of the worker himself by his individual consumption forms part of the reproduction process of the social capital. But this does not hold for the individual production process taken by itself, which is what we are considering here. The acquired and useful abilities, which Smith introduces under this heading of fixed capital, form, on the contrary, components of fluid capital once they are abilities of the wage laborer, who has sold his abilities together with his labor. It is a great error on Smith's part that he divides up the whole social wealth into one, immediate consumption fund, two, fixed capital, and three, circulating capital. 
According to this, wealth would be divided into a consumption fund that does not form a part of the functioning social capital, although parts of it may always function as capital. One part of the wealth accordingly functions as capital, the other part is non-capital or consumption fund, and it appears here as an indispensable necessity for all capital to be either fixed or fluid, just as a mammal is by natural necessity either male or female. We have seen, however, that the opposition of fixed and fluid is only applicable to the elements of productive capital, and that alongside this, there is still a very significant amount of capital, commodity capital and money capital, which exists in a form in which it cannot be either fixed or fluid. Since, with the exception of the part of the product that is directly used in its natural form as means of production by the individual capitalist producer himself without sale or purchase, the entire mass of social production, on the capitalist basis, circulates on the market as commodity capital, it is clear that both fixed and fluid elements of productive capital, and, in addition, all elements of the consumption fund, are drawn from the commodity capital. This is saying no more than that both means of production and means of consumption first appear, on the basis of capitalist production, as commodity capital, even if they are also destined later to serve as means of consumption or production, just as labor power itself is found on the market as a commodity, even if it is not as commodity capital. This leads Adam Smith to a further misunderstanding. He says that, quote, Of these four parts, of the circulating capital, i.e. of capital in its forms of commodity capital and money capital, which pertain to the circulation process, two parts, which are transformed into four by Smith when he makes a further distinction on a material basis within the components of commodity capital, three, provisions, materials, and finished work are either annually or in a longer or shorter period regularly withdrawn from it and placed either in the fixed capital or in the stock reserved for immediate consumption. Every fixed capital is both originally derived from and requires to be continually supported by a circulating capital. All useful machines and instruments of trade are originally derived from a circulating capital, which furnishes the materials of which they are made and the maintenance of the workmen who make them. They require, too, a capital of the same kind to keep them in constant repair. End quote. Always accepting that part of the product directly used again by its producers as means of production, we can make the general statement about capitalist production that all products come onto the market as commodities, and hence circulate for the capitalist as the commodity form of his capital, as commodity capital, whether the natural or use form of these products means that they can or must function as means of production, and hence as fixed or fluid elements of productive capital, or whether they can serve only as means of individual rather than productive consumption. All products are thrown onto the market as commodities. All means of production and consumption, all elements of productive and individual consumption, must therefore be withdrawn again from the market as commodities, by purchase. This truism is manifestly correct. It therefore holds good equally for the fixed and for the fluid elements of productive capital, for means of labor as well as material of labor in all forms. It is still overlooked here that there are elements of productive capital which are given by nature, and are not products. The machine is bought on the market as much as the cotton is. But it in no way follows from this, it follows only from Smith's confusion of circulation capital with circulating or fluid, i.e. non-fixed capital, that every fixed capital originally derives from a fluid one. Moreover, Smith actually refutes his own argument. According to him, machines as commodities belong to the fourth part of the circulating capital. That they derive from the circulating capital thus only means that they functioned as commodity capital before they functioned as machines, although materially they derive from themselves, just as cotton, as a fluid element of the spinner's capital, derives from cotton on the market. But if in his further elaboration, Smith derives fixed capital from fluid capital, on the ground that labor and raw material are necessary in order to make machines, it is still the case, firstly, that means of labor, i.e. fixed capital, are necessary to make machines, and secondly, too, that fixed capital, machinery, etc., is necessary in order to make raw materials, since productive capital always includes means of labor, but not always material of labor. He himself goes on to say on this point, quote, Lands, mines, and fisheries require all both a fixed and a circulating capital to cultivate them. He thus concedes that fixed capital is needed to produce raw material as well as circulating capital, and, here a new muddle, their produce replaces with a profit not only those capitals but all the others in society. End quote. This is totally confused. Their product supplies the raw material, ancillaries, etc., for all other branches of industry, but their value does not replace the value of all other social capitals. It replaces only its own capital value plus surplus value. Here again, Smith is looking back to the physiocrats. From the society standpoint, it is true that the part of commodity capital that consists of products that can only serve as means of labor also functions sooner or later as means of labor. Otherwise, the products will have been produced to no avail, will be unsaleable. On the basis of capitalist production, in other words, once they have ceased to be commodities, they must form actual elements of the fixed part of the social productive capital, which they already were prospectively. There is a distinction here which arises from the natural form of the product. 
A spinning machine, for instance, has no use value if it is not used for spinning, i.e. does not function as an element of production, and thus, from the capitalist standpoint, as a fixed component of a productive capital. But the spinning machine is immobile. It can be exported from the country where it is produced and be sold, directly or indirectly, to a foreign country, whether in exchange for raw materials, etc., or for champagne. In the country where it was produced, it then functions only as commodity capital, but never, not even after its sale, as fixed capital. However, products that have been localized by being incorporated into the earth, and hence can only be used locally, for example, factory buildings, railways, bridges, tunnels, docks, etc., soil improvements, and so on, cannot be exported body and soul. They are immobile. They are not to be useless, but they must function after their sale as fixed capital in the country in which they were produced. For the capitalist producer, who builds factories speculatively, or improves estates in order to sell them, these things are the form of his commodity capital, and so, according to Smith, the form of his circulating capital. But from the society's standpoint, they must ultimately function as fixed capital, if they are not to be useless, in the country in question, in a production process fixed by their own location. It in no way follows from this that immobile objects as such are automatically fixed capital. They may be dwelling houses, etc., that belong to the consumption fund and thus do not form part of the social capital at all, even though they form an element of the social wealth, of which capital is only one part. The producer of these things, to express ourselves in Smith's terms, makes a profit by their sale. So they are circulating capital. The person who puts them to use, their ultimate buyer, can use them only by employing them in the production process. So they are fixed capital. Property titles to a railway, for instance, can change hands daily, and their owners can even make a profit by selling them abroad. The property titles are thus exportable, but the railway itself is not. It is no less the case, however, that these things must either function as the fixed components of a productive capital in the actual country where they are located or else lie idle. Similarly, manufacturer A can make a profit by selling his factory to manufacturer B, but this does not prevent the factory from functioning now as before as fixed capital. The locally fixed means of labor, those inseparable from the soil even though they may function for their producer as commodity capital and do not form any element of his fixed capital, which consists for him of the means of labor that he needs to build buildings, railways, etc., must necessarily function prospectively as fixed capital in the country in question. But it in no way follows, conversely, that fixed capital necessarily consists of immovable objects. A ship and a locomotive operate only by moving, yet they function as fixed capital for their users even if not for their producers. Things, on the other hand, that are most fully fixed in the production process, live and die in it, and never leave it after they have once entered it, can be fluid components of productive capital. For example, the coal that drives the machine in the production process, the gas consumed in lighting a factory building, etc. These are fluid, not because they physically leave the production process along with the product and circulate as commodities, but rather because their value enters completely into the value of the commodity that they help to produce, and must thus be entirely replaced from the sale of the commodity. In the passage last quoted, one phrase of Smith's should still be noted, quote, a circulating capital which furnishes the maintenance of the workmen who make them, end quote, machines, etc. With the physiocrats, the portion of capital advanced in wages figured correctly under the heading annual advances, as contrasted with original advances. On the other hand, what appears with them as a component to the productive capital applied by the farmer is not labor power itself, but rather the means of subsistence given to the agricultural workers the maintenance of the workmen, as Smith puts it. This is directly related to their specific doctrine. The portion of value which labor adds to the product, like the portion of value added by raw materials, instruments of labor, etc., in short, by the material components of the constant capital, is equal only to the value of the means of subsistence paid to the workers and necessarily consumed by them to maintain their function as labor powers. The very doctrine of the physiocrats prohibited them from discovering the distinction between constant capital and variable capital. If it is labor that produces surplus value, as well as reproducing its own price, then it produces this in industry, just as much as in agriculture. But since, in the physiocratic system, labor produces surplus value only in one branch of production, agriculture, surplus value was not seen as arising from labor, but rather from the special activity, collaboration, of nature in this branch. It was for this reason that they saw agricultural labor as productive labor, in distinction from other kinds of labor. Adam Smith defines the worker's means of subsistence as circulating capital in opposition to fixed. One, because he confuses fluid capital, as opposed to fixed, with the forms of capital pertaining to the circulation sphere, with the circulation capital, a confusion which has been uncritically taken over by his successors. He therefore confuses commodity capital with the fluid component of productive capital, and it is then self-evident that, where the social product takes the form of a commodity, the worker's means of subsistence, just like those of the non-workers, not to mention the materials and means of labor themselves, have to be supplied out of commodity capital. 2. 
But the physiocratic conception also creeps in with Smith, although it contradicts the esoteric, genuinely scientific, part of his own theoretical presentation. All capital advanced is converted into productive capital, i.e. it assumes the shape of the elements of production which are themselves the product of earlier labor, including labor power. Only in this form can it function in the production process. If now we substitute the worker's means of subsistence for the actual labor power into which the variable part of capital has been transformed, then it is clear that these means of subsistence as such are not different from the other elements of productive capital as far as the formation of value is concerned, not different, for example, from raw materials and from the means of subsistence of draft cattle. Which is why Smith, following the example of the physiocrats, puts these all on the same level in one of the passages quoted above. The means of subsistence cannot themselves valorize their value or add it to a surplus value. Their value, like that of the other elements of productive capital, can reappear only in the value of the product. They cannot add more value to it than they themselves possess. They are only distinguished from the fixed capital, which consists of means of labor, in the same way as our raw materials, semi-finished goods, etc., namely in that they are completely consumed in the product that they help to form, at least as far as the capitalist who pays for them is concerned, and their value must thus be completely replaced, whereas replacement occurs only gradually, bit by bit, in the case of fixed capital. The part of productive capital advanced in labor power, or the means of subsistence for the worker, is thus distinguished here only materially, and not with regard to the labor and valorization process from the remaining material elements of the productive capital. It is only distinguished in that it falls into the category of circulating capital, along with one part of the objective elements of product formation. Materials is Smith's general term for them, in opposition to another part of the objective elements that falls into the category of fixed capital. Although the part of capital spent on wages belongs to the fluid part of productive capital and has this fluidity in common with a portion of the objective elements of product formation, the raw materials, etc., as opposed to the fixed component of productive capital, this has absolutely nothing to do with the role that this variable part of capital plays in the valorization process as opposed to the constant part. It is simply related to how this part of the capital value advanced has to be replaced, renewed, and thus reproduced out of the value of the product by way of the circulation process. But it is only within the production process the value laid out on labor power is transformed, not for the worker but for the capitalist, from a definite, constant quantity into a variable one, and the value advanced in capital value, in capital, is thereby transformed for the first time into self-valorizing value. But because it is not the value laid out on labor power that Smith defines as fluid components of the productive capital, but rather the value laid out on the worker's means of subsistence, it is impossible for him to understand the distinction between variable and constant capital, and thus the capitalist production process in general. The characteristic of this part of capital as variable capital, in opposition to the constant capital laid out on the objective elements of product formation, is buried underneath the characteristic that the part of the capital laid out on labor power belongs to the fluid part of the productive capital with respect to the turnover. This burial is made complete insofar as in place of labor power, it is the worker's means of subsistence that are counted as an element of productive capital. Whether the value of the labor power is advanced in money or in means of subsistence is immaterial, even though the latter can of course only be the exception on the basis of capitalist production. Because Adam Smith fixed in this way, upon the characteristic of circulating capital as a decisive one for capital value laid out on labor power, the physiocratic definition, without the premises of the physiocrats, he managed to make it impossible for his successors to perceive that the part of the capital laid out on labor power was variable capital. The profound and correct explanation that he himself offered elsewhere did not prevail, whereas this blunder did. Indeed, later writers went even further, and not only made it the decisive characteristic of the part of capital laid out on labor power to be circulating capital in opposition to fixed, but also made it the fundamental characteristic of circulating capital to be laid out on means of subsistence for the worker. This naturally linked up with the doctrine of the labor fund of necessary means of subsistence as a given magnitude, which on the one hand physically restricts the share of the workers in the social product, but on the other hand has to be spent to its full extent on the acquisition of labor power. Chapter 11. Theories of Fixed and Circulating Capital. Ricardo. Ricardo introduces the distinction between fixed and circulating capital only in order to present the exceptions to the law of value i.e. those cases in which the rate of wages affects prices. We shall only come to speak of these in Volume 3. The basic confusion is however evident from the start in the following juxtaposition. Quote, this difference in the degree of durability of fixed capital, and this variety in the proportions in which these two sorts of capital may be combined. End quote. If we now ask what the two sorts of capital are, we are told, quote, the proportions, too, in which capital that is to support labor and the capital that is invested in tools, machinery, and buildings may be variously combined, end quote. Fixed capital thus equals means of labor, and circulation capital equals capital laid out on labor. 
capital that is to support labor, is itself an absurd expression taken over from Adam Smith. Here, circulation capital is on the one hand lumped together with variable capital, i.e. with the part of the productive capital laid out on labor. On the other hand, however, because the opposition is not derived from the valorization process, constant and variable capital, but rather from the circulation process, the old Smithian confusion, two misconceptions arise. Firstly, the differences in the degree of durability of the fixed capital and the variations in the composition of capital in terms of constant and variable are taken as equivalent. The latter distinction, however, determines the variation in the production of surplus value. The former, on the other hand, insofar as the valorization process is concerned, is simply related to the manner in which a given value of means of production is transferred to the product. As far as the circulation process is concerned, it affects only the period of renewal of the capital laid out, in other words, the time for which this is advanced. If, instead of penetrating through to the inner mechanism of the capitalist production process, you adopt the standpoint of the phenomena in their finished form, these distinctions do in fact coincide. When the social surplus value is distributed between the capitals invested in different branches of industry, differences in the various times for which the capital is advanced, for example, varying lifespans in the case of the fixed capital, and different organic compositions of capital, thus also the different circulations of constant and variable capital, have similar effects in the equalization of the general rate of profit and the transformation of values into prices of production. Secondly, from the standpoint of the circulation process, we have on the one hand the means of labor, fixed capital, on the other hand material of labor and wages, fluid capital. From the standpoint of the labor and valorization process, however, we have on the one hand means of production, means and material of labor, constant capital, on the other hand labor power, variable capital. As far as the organic composition of capital is concerned, see Volume 1, Chapter 25, Section 2, it is quite immaterial whether the same value of constant capital consists of more means of labor and less material of labor, or of more material of labor and less means of labor, whereas everything depends on the relation between capital laid out on means of production and that laid out on labor power. Conversely, from the standpoint of the circulation process, the distinction between fixed and circulating capital, it is just as immaterial in what proportion a given value of circulating capital is divided between material of labor and wages. From the one standpoint, the material of labor is ranked in the same category as the means of labor, as opposed to the capital value laid out on labor power. From the other standpoint, the part of capital laid out on labor power is ranked together with that laid out on material of labor, as opposed to the part of capital laid out on means of labor. In Ricardo, therefore, the part of capital value laid out on material of labor, raw materials and ancillaries, is not found on either side. It completely vanishes. It does not fit on the side of fixed capital, because it completely coincides in its mode of circulation with the part of the capital laid out on labor power. And it cannot be put on the side of circulating capital, because this would be a self-refutation of the equation taken over from Adam Smith and still silently running through Ricardo's writings between the antithesis, fixed and circulating capital, and the antithesis, constant and variable capital. Ricardo has far too great an instinct for logic not to be sensitive to this, and he therefore just lets this part of the capital disappear. It should be noted here that the capitalist advances the capital laid out on wages, to use the mode of speech peculiar to political economy, for different periods, according to whether he pays wages by the week, by the month, or every three months. In point of fact, the opposite happens. The worker advances the capitalist his labor for a week, a month, or three months, according to the intervals at which he is paid. If the capitalist did actually buy labor, instead of simply paying for it later, i.e. if he paid the worker his wages for the day, week, month, or three months in advance, then we could speak of an advance for these periods. But since he pays only after the labor has lasted for days, weeks, or months, instead of buying it and paying for it the time that it is to last, the whole thing is a capitalist quid pro quo, and the advance that the worker makes to the capitalist in the form of labor is transformed into an advance that the capitalist makes to the worker in money. This in no way alters the fact that the capitalist gets the product back from circulation, or realizes its value together with the surplus value incorporated into it, only after a shorter or longer period of time, according to the varying time that its production requires, or alternatively according to the varying time needed for its circulation. What the buyer of a commodity might want to do with it is completely immaterial to the seller. The capitalist does not get a machine any cheaper because he has to advance at its entire value all at once while the same value flows back to him from the circulation sphere only gradually and bit by bit, nor does he pay more for cotton because its value enters completely into the value of the product made from it, and is thus completely replaced at one stroke when this is sold in the market. Let us then return to Ricardo. 1. The characteristic feature of variable capital is that a definite, given, i.e. in this sense constant, part of capital, a given sum of value, assumed to be equal to the value of the labor power, although it is immaterial here whether the wage is the same as, or more or less than, the value of the labor power, is exchanged for a force that valorizes itself and creates value, 
labor power, which not only reproduces the value paid to it by the capitalist, but also produces a surplus value, a value that did not previously exist and is not bought for an equivalent. This characteristic property of the portion of value laid out on wages, which distinguishes it fundamentally from constant capital as variable capital, disappears as soon as this portion of capital laid out on wages is considered simply from the standpoint of the circulation process, and thus appears as circulation capital as against the fixed capital laid out on means of labor. This happens as soon as it is placed together under a single heading, that of circulating capital, with a component of the constant capital that laid out on material of labor, and counterposed to another component of the constant capital laid out on means of labor. Here, surplus value, i.e. the very circumstance which transforms the sum of value laid out into capital, is completely ignored. It is similarly ignored that the portion of value that the capital laid out on wages adds to the product is freshly produced, and thus actually reproduced, while the portion of value that the raw material adds to the product is not freshly produced and not really reproduced, but is simply maintained and conserved in the value of the product, and hence merely reappears as a component of the product's value. As the distinction is presented from the standpoint of the antithesis between fluid and fixed capital, it simply consists in the fact that the value of the means of labor applied in the production of a commodity goes only partly into the value of the commodity, and hence is only partly replaced by the sale of the commodity, i.e. only bit by bit and gradually. On the other hand, the value of the labor power and objects of labor, raw materials, etc., applied in the production of a commodity goes into the commodity completely, and is therefore completely replaced by its sale. In this respect, one part of the capital presents itself as fixed in regard to the circulation process, and the other as fluid or circulating. What is involved in both cases is the transfer of given, previously advanced values to the product, and their replacement when the product is sold. The sole distinction here is whether the transfer of value, and therefore the replacement of value, proceeds bit by bit and gradually, or all at once. The all-important distinction between variable and constant capital is thereby obliterated and with it the whole secret of surplus value formation and of capitalist production, namely the circumstances that transform certain values and the things in which they are represented into capital. The components of capital are distinguished from one another simply by the mode of circulation, and the circulation of commodities has of course only to do with already existing given values. The capital laid out on wages has a particular mode of circulation in common with the portion of capital laid out on raw materials, semi-finished goods and ancillaries, in contrast to that laid out on means of labor. We can thus understand why bourgeois political economy held instinctively to Adam Smith's confusion of the categories fixed and circulating capital with the categories constant and variable capital, and uncritically echoed it from one generation down to the next for a whole century. It no longer distinguished at all between the portion of capital laid out on wages and the portion of capital laid out on raw material, and only formally distinguished the former from constant capital in terms of whether it was circulated bit by bit or all at once through the product. The basis for understanding the real movement of capitalist production, and thus of capitalist exploitation, was thus submerged at one blow. All that was involved on this view was the reappearance of values advanced. Ricardo's uncritical reception of Smith's confusion is more surprising not only than that of the later apologists, among whom the confusion of concepts is rather something unsurprising, but also than that of Adam Smith himself, since Ricardo, in contrast to Smith, presented value and surplus value consistently and clearly, and in point of fact, upheld the esoteric Adam Smith against the exoteric. Among the physiocrats, there is none of this confusion. The distinction between annual advances and original advances is related solely to the different reproduction periods of the different components of capital, agricultural capital in particular, while their views on the production of surplus value constitute a part of their theory which is independent of these distinctions, a part in fact that they held up as its culminating point. The formation of surplus value is not explained in terms of capital as such, but ascribed simply to one specific sphere of capitalist production, agriculture. 2. The essential feature of the definition of variable capital, and hence of the transformation of any sum of values at all into capital, is that the capitalist exchanges a definite, given, and in this sense constant, value for value-creating power, a magnitude of value for the production of value, for self-valorization. Whether the capitalist pays the worker in money or in means of subsistence does not affect this fundamental characteristic. It affects only the mode of existence of the value advanced by him, which exists in one case in the form of money with which the worker himself buys his means of subsistence on the market, and the other case in the form of means of subsistence that he consumes directly. Developed capitalist production in fact assumes that the worker is paid in money, just as it assumes in general that the production process is mediated by the circulation process, i.e. a money economy. But the creation of surplus value, and hence the capitalization of the sum of value advanced, arises neither from the money form nor from the natural form of wages, i.e. of the capital laid out on the acquisition of labor power. 
It arises from the exchange of value for value-creating power, from the conversion of a constant quantity into a variable one. The more or less fixed character of the means of labor is a function of their degree of durability, i.e. of a physical property. According to their durability, they are worn out more quickly or more slowly, conditions remaining otherwise the same, and thus function for a longer or shorter time than fixed capital. But it is in no way simply this physical property of durability which leads them to function as fixed capital. In metalworks, the raw material is just as durable as the machines with which it is processed, and more durable, in fact, than many components of these machines, leather, wood, etc. But the metal serving as raw material does not form any the less a part of the circulating capital, while the functioning means of labor that may be constructed of the same metal form part of the fixed capital. Thus it is not its material, physical nature, its greater or lesser propensity to perish, which makes the same metal in one case fixed capital and in the other case circulating capital. This distinction rather arises from the role that it plays in the production process, in one case as object of labor, in the other case as means of labor. The function of a means of labor in the production process generally requires it to serve over and over again in repeated labor processes for a longer or shorter period of time. Its function thus prescribes a greater or lesser degree of durability for its material. But the durability of the material from which it is made does not make it in and for itself fixed capital. The same material becomes circulating capital if it is used as raw material, and for those economists who confuse the distinction between commodity capital and productive capital with the distinction between circulating and fixed capital, the same material, or the same machine, is circulating capital as a product, and fixed capital as a means of labor. Even though it is not the durable material of which the means of labor is made that makes it fixed capital, its role as means of labor does require it to consist of a more or less durable material. The durability of its material is thus a condition for its function as means of labor, hence also a material basis of the mode of circulation that makes it fixed capital. Other things being equal, the greater or lesser perishability of its material imprints it to a lower or higher degree with the stamp of fixedness, and is thus very fundamentally bound up with its quality as fixed capital. If the portion of capital laid out on labor power is considered exclusively from the standpoint of circulating capital, i.e. in contrast to fixed capital, and if the distinction between constant and variable capital is therefore lumped together with the distinction between fixed and circulating capital, it is then natural, as the material reality of the means of labor is an essential basis for its character as fixed capital, also to derive the opposite character of the capital laid out on labor power as circulating capital from the material reality of this capital, and then to define circulating capital in terms of the material reality of variable capital. The real material of the capital laid out on wages is labor itself, self-acting, value-creating labor power, living labor, which the capitalist has exchanged for dead, objectified labor and incorporated into his capital, this being the way that the value existing in his hands is first transformed into a self-valorizing value. But the capitalist does not sell this power of self-valorization. It forms throughout simply a component of his productive capital, just like his means of labor, and is never a component of his commodity capital, like the finished product that he sells, for instance. Within the production process, the means of labor, as components of productive capital, are not distinguished from labor power as fixed capital any more than the material of labor and ancillaries coincide with it as circulating capital. From the standpoint of the labor process, both of these confront labor power as the personal factor, they themselves being the objective factors. From the standpoint of the valorization process, both are distinct from labor power, variable capital, as constant capital. Alternatively, if we are to speak of a material difference that affects the circulation process, this is simply that it follows from the nature of value, which is nothing other than objectified labor, and from the nature of self-acting labor power, which is nothing other than self-objectifying labor, that labor power constantly creates value and surplus value as long as it continues to function, that what presents itself on its side as movement, as the creation of value, presents itself on the side of its product in a motionless form as created value. If the labor power has performed its function, then the capital no longer consists of labor power on the one hand and means of production on the other. The capital value that was laid out on labor power is now value which has been added to the product, together with surplus value. In order to repeat the process, the product must be sold, and with the money released by this, labor power has constantly to be bought afresh and incorporated into the productive capital. This, then, is what gives the portion of capital laid out on labor power the character of circulating capital in contrast to the capital that remains fixed in the means of labor. But if the secondary characteristic of circulating capital, which labor power has in common with a part of the constant capital, raw materials and ancillaries, is made into the fundamental one, i.e. the fact that the value laid out on it is transferred in its entirety to the product in whose production it is consumed, and not gradually and bit by bit, as in the case of fixed capital, 
that it must therefore also be replaced in its entirety by the sale of the product, then the portion of capital laid out on wages must also consist materially not of self-acting labor power, but of the material elements that the worker buys with his wages, i.e. of the part of the social commodity capital that enters the worker's consumption, the means of subsistence, in other words. The fixed capital then consists of the means of labor, which perish more slowly and need only be replaced more slowly, while the capital laid out on labor power consists of the means of subsistence, which have to be replaced more rapidly. The boundary between quicker and slower perishability, however, tends to get blurred. Quote, the food and clothing consumed by the laborer, the buildings in which he works, the implements with which his labor is assisted, are all of a perishable nature. There is, however, a vast difference in the time for which these different capitals will endure. A steam engine will last longer than a ship, a ship than the clothing of the laborer, and the clothing of the laborer longer than the food which he consumes. End quote. Ricardo forgets here the house in which the worker lives, his furniture, his tools of consumption, such as knives, forks, dishes, etc., all of which possess the same character of durability as do the means of labor. The same things and the same classes of things thus appear now as means of consumption, now as means of labor. The distinction, as expressed by Ricardo, is this, quote, According as capital is rapidly perishable and requires to be frequently reproduced or is of slow consumption, it is classed under the heads of circulating or of fixed capital. End quote. He notes below this, quote, A division is not essential and in which the line of demarcation cannot be accurately drawn. End quote. Thus we have happily ended up once again back with the physiocrats, where the distinction between annual advances and original advances was a distinction in times of consumption, and hence also in the varying reproduction times of the capital applied. It is simply that what in their case expressed a phenomenon of importance for social production and is depicted in Quesnay's Tableau Economique in connection with the circulation process here becomes a subjective distinction, and one that Ricardo himself says is superfluous. As soon as the part of capital laid out on labor is distinguished from that laid out on means of labor, only by its reproduction period and thus its term of circulation, as soon as the one part consists of means of subsistence, the other of means of labor, so that the former is distinguished from the latter only by its more transient character, then every pertinent difference between the capital laid out on labor power and that laid out on means of production is obviously destroyed. This completely contradicts Ricardo's doctrine of value, as well as his theory of profit, which is in point of fact a theory of surplus value. He only ever considers the distinction between fixed and circulating capital insofar as different proportions of the two, in the case of capitals of equal size in different branches of industry, influence the laws of value, and particularly the degree to which a rise or fall in wages affects prices as a result of these circumstances. Yet even within this restricted investigation, he commits very great errors as a result of confusing fixed and circulating with constant and variable capital, and in fact he starts his investigation on a completely false basis. Thus, one, insofar as the portion of capital value laid out on labor power is subsumed under the heading of circulating capital, the characteristics of circulating capital are themselves falsely represented, and so in particular are the circumstances which subsume the portion of capital laid out on labor under this heading. Two, there is a confusion between the quality that makes the part of capital laid out on labor variable and the quality that makes it circulating in contrast to fixed. It is clear from the start that the definition of capital laid out on labor power as circulating or fluid is a secondary one, which glosses over its specific difference in the production process. Firstly, in this definition, the capitals laid out on labor and on raw materials, etc., are equivalent, and a classification that identifies one part of the constant capital with the variable capital does not come to grips with the specific difference of variable capital as opposed to constant. Secondly, although the portions of capital laid out on labor and on means of labor are counterposed to one another, this is in no way with respect to the fact that they are involved in the production of value in completely different ways, but simply with respect to the different periods of time during which the given value of both is transferred to the product. What is at issue in all these cases is how a given value which is invested in the production process of a commodity, whether as wages, the price of raw materials, or the price of means of labor, is transferred to the product, hence circulated by the product and brought back to its starting point and replaced by its sale. The only distinction here consists in the how in the particular way in which this value is transferred and thus circulates. Whether the price of labor power, which in any case is previously determined by contract, is paid in money or in means of subsistence, in no way changes its character of being a definite and given price. However, in the case of wages paid in money, it is obvious that it is not the money itself that enters the production process, in the same way that it is not just the value but also the material of the means of production that enters this process. But if the means of subsistence that the worker buys with his wage are directly placed under one heading together with the raw materials, etc., as the material shape of circulating capital, then the means of labor counterposed to them, then this gives the matter a different appearance. 
If the value of one lot of things, the means of production, is transferred to the product in the labor process, then the value of the other lot of things, the means of subsistence, reappears in the labor power that consumes them and is similarly transferred to the product by the labor power's activity. What is involved in all these cases is similarly the mere reappearance in the product of the values advanced during production. The physiocrats took this seriously and denied that industrial labor created surplus value. Thus, in the passage from Wayland already quoted, quote, It matters not in what form capital reappears. The various kinds of food, clothing, and shelter necessary for the existence and comfort of the human being are also changed. They are consumed from time to time and their value reappears. End quote from Elements of Political Economy. The capital values advanced to production, in the shape of means of production and means of subsistence, here both equally reappear in the value of the product. The capitalist production process is thus successfully transformed into a complete mystery, and the origin of the surplus value present in the product completely withdrawn from view. What is also brought to fulfillment here is the fetishism peculiar to bourgeois economics, which transforms the social, economic character that things are stamped with in the process of social production into a natural character arising from the material nature of these things. Means of labor, for instance, are fixed capital, a scholastic definition which leads to contradictions and confusion. Just as we have shown how, in the labor process, see Volume 1, Chapter 7, it depends entirely on the role which the objective components play at the time in a particular labor process on their function, whether they function as means of labor, material of labor, or product, so, in precisely the same way, means of labor are fixed capital only where the production process is in fact a capitalist production process and the means of production are thus actually capital i.e. possess the economic determination, the social character, of capital. Secondly, they are fixed capital only if they transfer their value to the product in a particular way. If this is not the case, then they remain means of labor without being fixed capital. In the same way, ancillaries such as fertilizer, if they give up their value in the same particular way as do the greater part of the means of labor, are fixed capital, although they are not means of labor. What is at issue here is not a set of definitions under which things are to be subsumed. It is rather definite functions that are expressed in specific categories. If it is the destiny of the means of subsistence in themselves, a property devolving on them in all circumstances, to be capital laid out on wages, then it also becomes the character of this circulating capital to support labor. If the means of subsistence were not capital, then they would not support labor power, although it is in fact precisely their character as capital that gives them the property of supporting capital by the labor of others. If means of subsistence are inherently circulating capital, after this has been transformed into wages, then it further results that the size of the wage depends on the ratio between the number of workers and the given mass of circulating capital, a favorite proposition of the economists, whereas in point of fact, the quantity of means of subsistence that the worker withdraws from the market and the quantity which the capitalist has at his disposal for his own consumption depend rather on the ratio between surplus value and the price of labor. Ricardo, like Barton, constantly confuses the ratio between variable and constant capital with the ratio between circulating and fixed capital. We shall see later on how this vitiates his investigation of the rate of profit. Ricardo further equates the distinctions that arise in the turnover, for reasons other than the distinction between fixed and circulating capital, with the latter distinction itself. Quote, it is also to be observed that the circulating capital may circulate, or be returned to its employer, in very unequal times. The wheat bought by a farmer to sow is comparatively a fixed capital to the wheat purchased by a baker to make into loaves. One leaves it into the ground and can obtain no return for a year. The other can get a ground into flour, sell it as bread to his customers, and have his capital free to renew the same, or commence any other employment in a week. End quote. It is characteristic here that wheat, although as seed corn it serves not as means of subsistence but as raw material, is firstly circulating capital, because it is inherently means of subsistence, and secondly fixed capital, because its return stretches over a year. But it is not just the slower or more rapid return that makes a means of production into fixed capital, but rather the specific manner in which it gives up values of the product. The confusion created by Adam Smith has led to the following results. 1. The distinction between fixed and fluid capital is confused with the distinction between productive capital and commodity capital. Thus, the same machine is circulating capital, for example, when it exists on the market as a commodity, and fixed capital when it is incorporated into the production process. It is impossible to see here why one particular kind of capital should be more fixed or more circulating than another. 2. All circulating capital is identified with capital laid out or to be laid out on wages. This is the case with John Stuart Mill, among others. 3. 
The distinction between variable and constant capital, which Barton, Ricardo, and others already confused with that between circulating and fixed capital, is eventually reduced completely to the latter distinction, as with Ramsey, for example, who takes not only means of labor, but all means of production, raw materials, etc., as fixed capital, and only the capital laid out on wages as circulating capital. But because the reduction is accomplished in this way, the real distinction between constant and variable capital is not grasped. 4. The most recent English economists, and even more so the Scottish ones, who view everything from the unutterably narrow standpoint of a bank clerk, such as MacLeod, Patterson, and others, transform the distinction between fixed and circulating capital into that between money at call and money not at call, that is to say, between deposit money that can be withdrawn without prior notification and money whose withdrawal requires such notification. Chapter 12. The Working Period Let us take two lines of business, each with the same working day, say a labor process of ten hours, for example cotton spinning and the manufacture of locomotives. In one case, a definite quantity of the finished product, cotton yarn, is turned out every day and every week. In the other, the labor process must be repeated for perhaps three months in order to produce a finished product, one locomotive. In the one case, the product is discrete in nature, and the same work begins afresh each day or each week. In the other case, the labor process is continuous and stretches over a large number of daily labor processes, which supply a finished product only after a protracted interval, through the connectedness and continuity of their operations. Even though the duration of the daily labor process is the same in both cases, there is a very significant difference in the duration of the act of production, i.e., in the duration of the repeated labor processes that are required in order to turn out the product in its finished form, to send it onto the market as a commodity, and thus to transform it from productive capital into commodity capital. The distinction between fixed and circulating capital has nothing to do with this. The distinction made here would obtain even if exactly the same proportion of fixed and circulating capital were applied in the two lines of business. These differences in the duration of the act of production do not just occur between different branches of production but also within the same branch according to the size of the product to be supplied. An ordinary dwelling house is built in a shorter time than a large factory, and hence requires a smaller number of continuous labor processes. If the building of a locomotive takes three months, that of a battleship takes a year, if not several. The production of grain demands almost a year, that of horned cattle several years, while it can take anything from twelve to a hundred years to raise timber. A road can be built in a few months, while a railway requires years, an ordinary carpet perhaps one week, while a gobelin takes years, etc. The differences in length of the act of production are thus of infinite variety, the differing duration of the act of production must obviously produce a difference in the speed of turnover where capital outlays of equal size are involved, i.e. in the period of time for which a given capital is advanced. Let us assume that the spinning mill and the locomotive works apply equal capitals, with the same division between constant and variable, and between the fixed and fluid components of capital, finally that the working day is equally long, and there is the same division between necessary and surplus labor so as to set aside too all circumstances arising from the circulation process and external to the present case, we shall assume that both yarn and locomotive are produced to order and paid for on delivery of the finished product. At the end of the week, when the finished yarn is delivered, the spinner receives back his outlay of circulating capital, as well as the wear and tear of the fixed capital contained in the value of the yarn. We ignore the surplus value. He can now repeat the same circuit again with the same capital. He has completed his turnover. The locomotive manufacturer, on the other hand, must lay out fresh capital on wages and raw material week after week for three months, and only after three months, when the locomotive is delivered, does the circulating capital laid out bit by bit during this time for one and the same act of production to produce one and the same commodity exist again in the form in which it can begin its circuit once more. The wear and tear of the machinery during these three months is also replaced only now. One business has an outlay for one week, the other the same weekly outlay multiplied by twelve. All other circumstances being assumed equal, the one must have twelve times as much circulating capital at its disposal as the other. The fact that the capitals advanced each week are equal, however, is a matter of indifference here. Whatever may be the size of the capital advanced, in the one case it is advanced only for one week, in the other for twelve, before it can be used for a new operation, before the same operation can be repeated with it or one of a different kind begun. The difference in the speed of turnover, or the length of time for which the individual capital must be advanced before the same capital value can serve again for a new labor or valorization process, arises here from the following circumstances. 
Let us assume that the building of the locomotive, or any other machine, takes 100 working days. As far as the workers occupied in machine building are concerned, just as in spinning, the 100 working days form a discontinuous discrete quantity. According to our assumption, they consist of 100 successive and separate 10-hour labor processes. But in relation to the product, the machine, the 100 working days form a continuous quantity, a working day of a thousand working hours, a single related act of production. A working day of this kind, which is formed by the succession of more or less numerous interrelated working days, I call a working period. If we speak of the working day, then we mean the length of time for which the worker must daily expend his labor power, must work. If we speak of the working period, on the other hand, this means the number of interrelated working days that are required, in a particular line of business, to complete a finished product. The product of each working day is here only a partial product, which is taken a step further day by day and receives its finished shape, is a finished use value only at the close of a longer or shorter period of working time. Interruptions and disturbances of the social production process, as a result of crises, for example, thus have a very different effect on those products of labor that are discrete in nature and those whose production requires a longer connected period. In the former case, one day's production of a particular quantity of yarn, coal, etc., is simply not followed the next day by a fresh production of yarn or coal. It is otherwise with ships, buildings, railways, etc. Here, it is not only work that is interrupted, but an interconnected act of production. If the job is not carried any further, then the means of production and the labor already consumed in its production have been spent to no avail. Even if it is taken up again, deterioration will always have taken place in the meantime. The portion of value that the fixed capital surrenders every day to the product, until the latter is ready, builds up in layers throughout the whole duration of the working period. Here, we can also see the practical importance of the distinction between fixed and circulating capital. The fixed capital is advanced to the production process for a longer period of time. It does not need to be renewed until an interval of perhaps several years has elapsed. The fact that a steam engine gives up some value bit by bit each day to the yarn, the product of a discrete labor process, while it gives up value over three months to a locomotive, the product of a continuous act of production, in no way alters the outlay of capital needed to acquire the steam engine. In the one case, its value flows back in small doses, for example weekly, in the other case in large amounts, for example every three months. But in both cases, the steam engine is renewed only after some 20 years, say. As long as the individual period in which its value flows back bit by bit with the sale of the product is always shorter than its own period of existence, the same steam engine continues to function in the production process for several working periods. It is otherwise with the circulating components of the capital advanced. The labor power bought for this week is used up during the week and has objectified itself in the product. It must be paid for at the end of the week. And this capital outlay on labor power is repeated weekly over the three months, although the expenditure of this portion of capital in the one week does not enable the capitalist to cover the acquisition of labor in the next week. New, additional capital must be spent each week in payment for labor power, and if we set aside all credit relations, the capitalist must be able to lay out wages for the whole period of three months, even though he pays them only in weekly doses. It is the same with the other part of circulating capital, the raw materials and ancillaries. One layer of labor after the other is deposited on the product. It is not only the value spent on labor power that is steadily transferred to the product during the labor process, but also surplus value. However, all this is transferred to an unfinished product that does not yet have the shape of a finished commodity and is thus not capable of circulation. The same applies to the capital value transferred to the product layer upon layer in raw materials and ancillaries. According to the longer or shorter duration of the working period that the specific nature of the product or the useful effect to be attained demands for its production, a steadily additional expenditure of circulating capital is required, wages, raw materials, and ancillaries, no part of which exists in a form capable of circulation, such that it could serve to repeat the same operation. Each part is rather successively tied up within the production sphere as a component of the developing product, tied up in the form of productive capital. The turnover time of capital, however, is the sum of its production time and its circulation time. A lengthening of the production time thus reduces the speed of turnover as much as the lengthening of the circulation time. In the present case, however, there are two points to be noted. Firstly, the length and stay in the production sphere. The capital advanced in the first week, on labor, raw materials, etc., for instance, as well as the portions of value given up by the fixed capital to the product, remains confined to the production sphere for the entire term of three months. And as it is incorporated only into a product in formation, as yet unfinished, it cannot pass into circulation as a commodity. Secondly, 
Since the working period necessary for the act of production lasts three months, and in actual fact simply forms a single interrelated labor process, every week a new dose of circulating capital must be added to the preceding one. The quantity of additional capital successively advanced thus grows with the length of the working period. We have assumed that equal capitals are invested in the spinning and machine-building businesses, that these capitals are divided equally into constant and variable capital, ditto into fixed and circulating capital, and that the working day is of the same length in each. In short, that all conditions are the same except for the duration of the working period. In the first week, the outlay is the same for both, but the product of the spinner can then be sold and new labor power, raw materials, etc. bought with the proceeds. In short, production can be continued on the same scale. The machine builder, on the other hand, can transform the circulating capital spent in the first week back into money and use it for a fresh operation only after three months, when his product has been completed. There is thus, firstly, a difference in the reflux of the same quantity of capital laid out. Secondly, however, the same amount of productive capital is applied both in the spinning mill and the machine factory over a three-month period, but the amount of capital laid out is completely different for the spinner and the machine builder, since in the one case the same capital is quickly renewed and the same operation can thus be repeated afresh, while in the other case the capital is renewed only relatively slowly and new amounts of capital must therefore be steadily added to the old until its renewal period arrives. Thus the length of time in which specific portions of the capital are renewed, or the length of time during which capital is advanced, differs according to the length of the labor process, and so too does the amount of capital that has to be advanced, even though the capital applied daily or weekly is the same. This circumstance needs to be noted, for the time of advance can grow, as in the cases to be considered in the following chapter, without the amount of capital advanced growing in proportion to this length of time. The capital has to be advanced for longer, and a larger amount of capital is tied up in the form of productive capital. At the less developed stages of capitalist production, enterprises that require a long working period, and thus a large capital outlay for a longer time, particularly if they can be conducted only on a large scale, are often not pursued capitalistically at all. Roads, canals, etc., for example, were built at the cost of the municipality or the state, in earlier periods mostly by forced labor, insofar as labor power is concerned. Alternatively, products which require a long working period for their fabrication are manufactured only to a very minor extent with the financial means of the capitalist himself. In the construction of houses, for instance, the private individual for whom the house is being built pays advances to the builder in successive portions. He thus pays for the house bit by bit, in proportion to the progress of its production process. In the era of developed capitalism, however, where on the one hand massive capitals are concentrated in the hand of individuals, and on the other hand the associated capitalist, joint stock companies, steps onto the scene alongside the individual capitalist, where credit, too, is developed, it is only in exceptional cases that a capitalist builder still builds houses to order for individual clients. He makes a business out of building rows of houses and whole districts of towns for the market, just as individual capitalists make a business out of building railways as contractors. How capitalist production has revolutionized house building, in London, can be seen from this evidence given by a builder to the Bank Acts Committee of 1857. In his youth, he said, houses were generally built to order, and the price was paid to the contractor in installments as stages of the construction were completed. There was little speculative building. Contractors would resort to this principally just to keep their workers regularly occupied and hold their labor force together. In the last forty years, all that has changed. There is now little building to order. If someone wants a new house, he looks for one that has already been built on speculation, or is already in the process of being built. Today, the contractor no longer works directly for a client, but rather for the market, just like any other industrialist. He has to have finished goods for sale. Whereas previously, a contractor might have built three or four houses at a time on speculation, he now has to buy an extensive piece of land, in the continental sense he leases it, usually for 99 years, erect on it up to 100 or 200 houses, and thus involve himself in an undertaking that exceeds his own means some 20 to 50 times over. Funds are procured by taking out a mortgage, and this money is put at the contractor's disposal bit by bit as the building of the house progresses. If a crisis breaks out, bringing the payment of these installments to a halt, then the whole undertaking generally collapses. In the best cases, the houses remain uncompleted until better times, while in the worst, they are auctioned off at half price. It is impossible nowadays for any contractor to get along without speculative building, and on a large scale at that. The profit on the actual construction is extremely slight. The main source of profit comes from raising the ground rent, and from the clever selection and exploitation of the building land. 
Almost the whole of Belgravia, Tyburnia, and the countless thousands of villas around London have been built in this way, by speculative anticipation of the demand for houses. Abbreviated from the report of the Select Committee on Bank Acts, Part 1, 1857. Large-scale jobs, needing particularly long working periods, are fully suitable for capitalist production only when the concentration of capital is already well advanced, and when the development of the credit system offers the capitalist the convenient expedient of advancing and thus risking other people's capital instead of his own. It is self-evident, however, that whether capital advanced for production belongs to the person who uses it or not has no effect on the speed and time of the turnover. Circumstances that increase the product of the individual working day, such as cooperation, division of labor, application of machinery, also shorten the working period for interconnected acts of production. Thus, machinery shortens the building time of houses, bridges, etc. Reaping and threshing machines, etc., shorten the working period required to transform ripened corn into a finished commodity. Improved shipbuilding techniques, resulting in greater speed, shorten the turnover time with the capital invested in shipping. These improvements, which shorten the working period, and hence the time for which circulating capital has to be advanced, are generally bound up with an increased outlay of fixed capital. The working period, however, can be shortened in some branches simply by an extension of cooperation. The completion of a railway is hastened by setting afoot great armies of workers and tackling the job from many different points in space. Here, the turnover time is shortened by the growth of the capital advanced. More means of production and more labor power have to be united under the capitalist command. If the shortening of the working period is thus generally bound up with an increase in the capital advanced for this shorter time, so that the amount of capital advanced increases to the degree that the time of advance is shortened, we should remember that, apart from the total volume of social capital available, it comes down to a question of the extent to which the means of production and subsistence, i.e. disposal over them, are fragmented, or united, in the hands of individual capitalists, i.e. the extent reached by the concentration of capital. Insofar as credit mediates, accelerates, and intensifies the concentration of capital in a single hand, it contributes to shortening the working period, and with this also the turnover time. In branches of production where the working period, whether it is continuous or interrupted, is prescribed by specific natural conditions, no shortening can take place by the means described above. Quote, In regard to quicker returns, this term cannot be made to apply to corn crops, as one return only can be made per annum. In respect to stock, we will simply ask, how is the return of two- and three-year-old sheep and four- and five-year-old oxen to be quickened? End quote from W. Walter Good, Political, Agricultural, and Commercial Fallacies, published in London in 1866. The need to have ready cash as soon as possible, for example to pay fixed obligations such as taxes, ground rent, etc., solves this question insofar as cattle, for instance, are sold and slaughtered before they have reached the normal economic age, to the great detriment of agriculture. This also leads, moreover, to a rise in meat prices. Quote, Men who have mainly reared cattle for supplying the pastures of the Midland counties in summer and the yards of the eastern counties in winter have become so crippled through the uncertainty and lowness in the prices of corn that they are glad to take advantage of the high prices of butter and cheese. The former they take to market weekly to help pay current expenses and draw on the other from some factor who takes the cheese when fit to move and, of course, nearly at his own price. For this reason, remembering that farming is governed by the principles of political economy, the calves which used to come south from the dairying counties for rearing are now largely sacrificed, at times at a week and ten days old in the shambles of Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, and other large neighboring towns. If, however, malt had been free from duty, not only would farmers have made more profit and therefore been able to keep their stock till it got older and heavier, but it would have been substituted for milk and rearing by men who did not keep the cows and thus the present alarming scarcity of young cattle which has befallen the nation would have been largely averted. What these little men now say, in reply to recommendations to rear, is, We know very well it would pay to rear on milk, but it would first require us to put our hands in our purse, which we cannot do, and then we should have to wait a long time for a return, instead of getting it at once by dairying. End quote. If the lengthening of turnover can have consequences like this, even among the smaller English farmers, it is easy to understand what disturbances it must provoke among the small peasants of the continent. According to the duration of the working period, and thus also the period till a commodity ready for circulation is completed, the portion of value that the fixed capital surrenders layer by layer to the product mounts up, and the reflux of this portion of value is delayed. This delay, however, does not necessitate a renewed outlay of fixed capital. The machine continues to operate in the production process whether replacement for its wear and tear flows back quicker or more slowly in the money form. It is different with circulating capital. 
Here, not only must capital be tied up for a longer time, in proportion to the duration of the labor process, but new capital must continually be advanced for wages, raw and ancillary materials. The delayed reflux thus has a different effect in the two cases. Whether the reflux is slower or quicker, the fixed capital continues to operate. The circulating capital, on the contrary, becomes unable to function when reflux is delayed, if it is tied up in the form of unsold or unfinished and not yet saleable products, and there is no additional capital to renew it in kind. Quote, While the peasant farmer starves, his cattle thrive. Repeated showers had fallen in the country, and the forage was abundant. The Hindu peasant will perish by hunger beside a fat bullock. The prescriptions of superstition, which appear cruel to the individual, are conservative for the community, and the preservation of the laboring cattle secures the power of cultivation and the sources of future life and wealth. It may sound harsh and sad to say so, but in India it is more easy to replace a man than an ox. End quote from Return, East India, Madras and Orissa Famine. We can compare this with a passage from the Manava Dharma Sastra. Quote, Desertion of life, without reward, for the sake of preserving a priest or a cow, may cause the beatitude of those base-born tribes. It is impossible, of course, to deliver a five-year-old animal before the end of five years. But what is possible within certain limits is to prepare animals for their fate more quickly by new modes of treatment. This was precisely what Bakewell managed to do. Previously, British sheep, just like French sheep as late as 1855, were not ready for slaughter before the fourth or fifth year. In Bakewell's system, one-year-old sheep can already be fattened, and in any case they are fully grown before the second year has elapsed. By careful selective breeding, Bakewell, farmer of Dishley Grange, reduced the bone structure of his sheep to the minimum necessary for their existence. These sheep are called the New Lesters. Quote, the breeder can now send three to market in the same space of time that it formerly took him to prepare one, and if they are not taller, they are broader, rounder, and have a greater development in those parts which give the most flesh. Of bone, they have absolutely no greater amount than is necessary to support them, and almost all their weight is pure meat. End quote from Laverne, The Rural Economy of England, etc., 1855. The methods that shorten the working period differ greatly in the extent to which they can be applied in different branches of industry, and they do not cancel out the differences in length of the different working periods. To stick to our example, the application of new machine tools may, in absolute terms, shorten the working period necessary for the production of a locomotive. But if improved processes in spinning increase the finished product turned out daily or weekly here to an even greater extent, then the length of the working period in machine building will still have increased relatively compared with that in spinning. Chapter 13. Production Time Working time is always production time, i.e. time during which capital is confined to the production sphere. But it is not true, conversely, that the entire time for which capital exists in the production process is necessarily, therefore, working time. What is at issue here are not interruptions in the labor process conditioned by the natural limits of labor power itself, even though we have seen the extent to which the mere fact that fixed capital, factory buildings, machinery, etc., lies idle during the pauses in the labor process became one of the motives for the unnatural extension of the labor process and for the working day and night. What is involved is rather an interruption independent of the length of the labor process, an interruption conditioned by the nature of the product and its production, during which the object of labor is subjected to natural processes of shorter or longer duration and has to undergo physical, chemical, or physiological changes while the labor process is either completely or partially suspended. After grapes have been pressed, for instance, the wine must go through a period of fermentation and then also rest for a while before it reaches a certain degree of readiness. In many branches of industry, the product must undergo a process of drying, as in pottery, or else be exposed to certain conditions in order to change its chemical properties, as with bleaching. Winter corn seeds nine months or so to ripen. Between seed time and harvest, the labor process is almost completely interrupted. In the raising of timber, once planting and the preliminary work connected with this is completed, the seed may need a hundred years to be transformed into a finished product. During this whole time, only a relatively very insignificant intervention of labor is needed. In all these cases, additional labor is added only occasionally for a large part of the production time. The situation described in the previous chapter, where additional capital and labor has to be added to capital already tied up in the production process, occurs here only with interruptions of a greater or lesser extent. In all these cases, therefore, the production time of the capital advanced consists of two periods, a period in which the capital exists in the labor process and a second period in which its form of existence, that of an unfinished product, is handed over to the sway of natural processes without being involved in the labor process. 
This situation is not altered if the two periods of time occasionally cut across one another or are interspersed. Here, the working period and the production period do not coincide. The production period is longer than the working period, but it is only after the production period has been left behind that the product is finished and mature, and can thus be transformed from the form of productive capital into that of commodity capital. The turnover period is then extended according to the length of that part of the production time that does not consist of working time. Insofar as this time of production, over and above the labor time, is not determined by natural laws given once and for all, as with the ripening of corn, the growth of an oak, etc., the turnover period can often be shortened to a greater or lesser extent by the artificial shortening of the production time. Examples of this are the introduction of chemical in place of open-air bleaching, and the more effective drying apparatus in the drying processes. In tanning, the penetration of tannic acid into the skins, which used to take between 6 and 18 months with the old method, only takes one and a half to two months with a new method involving the use of the air pump. The most far-reaching example of artificial shortening of a production time made up exclusively of natural processes is given by the history of iron production over the last 100 years, from the invention of puddling in 1780 to the modern Bessemer process and the latest procedures introduced since then. The production time has been enormously curtailed, but the application of fixed capital has also increased to the same extent. A peculiar example of the divergence between production time and working time is provided by the American manufacturer of shoe lasts. Here, a significant part of the expense arises from the wood having to dry out in store for up to 18 months, so that the finished lasts do not warp. During this time, the wood does not undergo any other labor process. The turnover period of the capital applied is therefore not only determined by the time required to produce the last themselves, but also by the time for which the capital has to lie idle in the shape of wood which is being dried out. The capital exists in the production process for 18 months before it can enter the labor process proper. This example also shows how the turnover times of various parts of the total circulating capital may differ as a result of circumstances that arise from the production sphere and not from the circulation sphere. The distinction between production time and working time is particularly important in agriculture. In our temperate climates, the land brings forth grain once a year. The shortening or lengthening of the production period, an average of nine months for winter sowing, is itself dependent on the alternation of good and bad years, and hence cannot be precisely determined in advance and controlled, as in industry proper. Only subsidiary products, such as milk, cheese, etc., can be produced and sold continuously in short periods but the working time is in the following quite different situation. Quote, the number of working days for the three main working periods is assumed to be as follows in different districts of Germany, with respect to the climatic and other conditions involved. The spring period from mid-March, or the beginning of April, up to the middle of May, 50 to 60 days. The summer period from early June to late August, 65 to 80 days. The autumn period from early September to the end of October or middle or late November, 55 to 75 days. As far as winter goes, there is simply the work suited to that period, such as the haulage of fertilizer, wood, goods for the market, building materials, etc. End quote from Kirchhoff. Thus, the more unfavorable the climate, the more the agricultural working period, and hence the outlay of capital and labor, is compressed into a short interval, as for example in Russia. Quote, in some of the northern districts, field labor is only possible during from 130 to 150 days in the course of the year, and it may be imagined what a loss Russia would sustain if out of 65 million of her European population, 50 million remained unoccupied during six or eight months of winter, when all agricultural labor is at a standstill. End quote. Besides the 200,000 peasants who work in Russia's 10,500 factories, particular cottage industries have grown up everywhere in the villages. Quote, there are villages, for instance in Russia, in which all the peasants have been for generations either weavers, tanners, shoemakers, locksmiths, cutlers, etc., End quote. This is particularly the case in the gubernias of Moscow, Vladimir, Kaluga, Kostroma, and St. Petersburg. These cottage industries, incidentally, are already being pressed more and more into the service of capitalist production. For example, merchants supply the weavers with warps and weft, either directly or by intermediate agents. Abbreviated by reports from HM Secretaries of Embassy and Legation on the Manufacturers, Commerce, etc., we see here how the distinction between production period and working period, with the latter forming only a part of the former, constitutes the natural basis for the unification of agriculture with rural subsidiary industries, just as these, in turn, are points of vantage for the capitalist, who first intrudes in his capacity as merchant. Insofar as capitalist production later manages to complete the separation between manufacture and agriculture, the rural worker becomes ever more dependent on the merely accidental subsidiary employments and his condition thereby worsens. 
As far as capital is concerned, as we shall see later on, all these differences in the turnover balance out. Not so for the worker. In most branches of industry proper, as well as in mining, transport, etc., production proceeds evenly, and the same working time is worked year in and year out, apart from fluctuations of price, disturbances of business, etc., and abnormal interruptions, the outlay of capital going into the daily circulation process is evenly distributed. While market conditions remain the same, therefore, the reflux or renewal of circulating capital is distributed over the whole year in equal portions. However, in those investments of capital where working time forms only one part of the production time, there is a great unevenness in the outlay of circulating capital in the course of the different periods of the year, inasmuch as the reflux only follows, at one stroke, at a time prescribed by natural conditions. On a given scale of business, therefore, i.e. with the same volume of circulating capital advanced, this must be advanced in larger amounts at once, and for a longer time, than in those businesses with continuous working periods. The life of fixed capital is significantly different here from the time in which it actually functions productively. With this difference between working time and production time, the time during which the fixed capital is utilized is of course constantly interrupted for a longer or shorter interval. In agriculture, for instance, with the use of draft cattle, implements, and machines. Insofar as this fixed capital consists of draft animals, it continues to require the same, or almost the same, outlay on fodder, etc., as during the time in which it operates. In the case of dead means of labor, non-use also gives rise to certain depreciation. The product thus always becomes dearer, since the transfer of value to the product is not calculated according to the time for which the fixed capital functions, but rather according to the time in which it loses value. In these branches of production, it is a condition of normal use that fixed capital should lie idle, whether or not this still involves running costs, just as in spinning a condition of normal use is the loss of a certain quantity of cotton, and in the same way, in every labor process, the labor power expended unproductively, but unavoidably so under normal technical conditions, counts just as much as the productive. Every improvement that reduces the unproductive expenditure of means of labor, raw materials and labor power, also reduces the value of the product. In agriculture, the two things are combined, the long duration of the working period and a great difference between working time and production time. Hodgskin correctly notes on this point, quote, The difference of time, although he does not differentiate here between working time and production time, required to complete the products of agriculture and of other species of labor is the main cause of the great dependence of the agriculturalists. They cannot bring their commodities to market in less time than a year. For that whole period, they are obliged to borrow of the shoemaker, the tailor, the smith, the wheelwright, and the various other laborers, whose products they cannot dispense with, but which are completed in a few days or weeks. Owing to this natural circumstance, and owing to the more rapid increase of the wealth produced by other labor than that of agriculture, the monopolizers of all the land, though they have also monopolized legislation, have not been able to save themselves and their servants, the farmers, from becoming the most dependent class of men in the community." End quote from Hodgskin, Popular Political Economy, published in London in 1827. All methods in agriculture, which on the one hand distribute expenditure on wages and means of labor more evenly over the whole year, and on the other hand shorten the turnover by diversifying the products and thus making different crops possible during the year, require an increase in the circulating capital laid out on production, on wages, fertilizer, seed, etc., this is the case with the transition from the three-field system, with fallow, to the system of crop rotation without fallow. Also with the undersowing system in Flanders. Quote, the root crops are planted by undersowing. The same field first bears corn, flax, or rapeseed for human requirements, and then after the harvest, root crops are sown for the maintenance of the cattle. This system, which enables the horned cattle to remain permanently in the stall, produces a considerable amount of manure, and is thus the cornerstone of crop rotation. More than a third of the cultivated area in the sandy districts is undersown in this way. It is just as if the cultivated land has been extended by a third. End quote. Besides root crops, clover and other fodder is also used here. Quote, Agriculture, being thus carried to the point at which it is transformed into horticulture, understandably requires a relatively considerable capital investment. In England, the sum reckoned with is 250 francs of investment capital to the hectare. In Flanders, our farmers will probably find an investment capital of 500 francs per hectare far too low. End quote from Essays on the Belgian Ruled Economies, published in Brussels in 1863. Let us finally consider timber raising. Quote, the production of timber is fundamentally different from most others in that here natural forces work independently, and the power of men or capital is not required for natural growth. Even where forests are artificially cultivated, the amount of human and capital power expended in comparison with the section of natural forces is only slight. 
Furthermore, forests will thrive in types of soil and places where grain cannot grow, or where it no longer pays to produce it. Forest culture, however, requires a greater surface area than the cultivation of grain if it is to be conducted on a regular commercial basis. Since small plots do not allow proper forestry methods, the secondary uses are abandoned, and forest protection is made more difficult, etc. The production process is also tied to such a long period of time that it extends beyond the plans of a private undertaking, and sometimes even beyond a single human life. Capital invested in the acquisition of forest land, in communal production this capital disappears and the question is simply how much land the community can withdraw from arable and grazing land for timber production, only bears fruit after a comparatively long period of time, and turns over only partially, taking up to 150 years in the case of many types of wood. Moreover, effective timber production actually requires a reserve stock of growing timber amounting to between 10 and 40 times the annual yield. Thus, someone who does not have other income or possess substantial areas of forest cannot pursue regular forestry. End quote from Kirchhoff. The long production time, which includes a relatively slight amount of working time and the consequent length of the turnover period, makes forest culture a line of business unsuited to private and hence to capitalist production the latter being fundamentally a private operation, even when the associated capitalist takes the place of the individual. The development of civilization, and industry in general, has always shown itself so active in the destruction of forests that everything that has been done for their conservation and production is completely insignificant in comparison. Particularly worthy of note in the quotation from Kirchhoff is the following passage. Moreover, effective timber production actually requires a reserve stock of timber amounting to between 10 and 40 times the annual yield. Thus the turnover takes from ten years up to forty and more. It is the same with cattle raising. Part of the herd, cattle stock, remains in the production process, while another part is sold as the annual product. Here, only one part of the capital turns over each year, just as in the case of the fixed capital, machinery, draft cattle, etc. Even though this capital is fixed for a longer time of the production process, and thus lengthens the turnover of the total capital, it does not constitute fixed capital in the categorical sense. What is referred to here as a stock, a definite quantity of growing wood or cattle, exists partially in the production process, both as means of labor and material of labor, depending on the natural conditions of its reproduction. A significant part must always exist in this form in the case of regular cultivation. A further kind of stock has a similar effect on the turnover, a stock that forms only potential productive capital, but has to be accumulated in larger or smaller amounts as a result of the nature of agriculture, and must be advanced to production for a relatively long time even though it enters the active production process only bit by bit. This includes manure, for example, before it is carted to the field, as well as corn, hay, etc., and any stocks of feed that go into the production of cattle. Quote, a considerable part of the working capital is contained in the stocks of the business, these can lose their value to a greater or lesser extent if the appropriate measures of protection required for their maintenance and good order are not taken. A part of the production stock can even be completely lost to the business by lack of attention. What is principally required in this connection is painstaking attention to the barns, fodder, and grain lofts and cellars, the storage places that must always be kept well closed and also kept clean, ventilated, etc. The grain and other crops kept in store must be thoroughly turned over from time to time, and potatoes and beets protected against frost, water, and rot. End quote from Kirchhoff. Quote, in calculating one's own requirements, particularly for cattle, in which connection a division must be made according to the measure of the product and the intended use, attention must be paid not only to covering requirements, but also to having sufficient stock left over for unforeseen contingencies. As soon as it appears that the need cannot be fully met by one's own production, it is necessary to take into consideration whether this lack cannot be covered by other products, substitutes, or whether these cannot be procured more cheaply in place of the missing products. If there should be a lack of hay, for example, this can be made up by root crops with added straw. In general, the material value and market price of the different products must be constantly borne in mind, and the consumption regulated accordingly. If oats are dearer, for instance, while peas and rye are relatively cheap, then it will be advantageous to replace some of the oats for the horses with peas and rye, and sell the superfluous oats. End quote. In considering the formation of stock, we have already noted that a greater or lesser quantity of potential productive capital is required, i.e. a quantity of means of production destined for production, which has to be held and reserved in a greater or lesser amount in order to go into the production process bit by bit. We noted in this connection that with the capital investment of a given scale, the size of this production stock depends on the greater or lesser difficulty of its replacement, its relative proximity to the supplying markets, the development of means of transport and communication, etc. 
All these circumstances affect the minimum capital that must exist in the form of productive stock, and thus the period of time for which advances of capital have to be made, and the volume of capital that has to be advanced at once. This volume, which also has an effect on the turnover, is determined by the longer or shorter time for which circulating capital is tied up in the form of productive stock, as only potentially productive capital. On the other hand, insofar as the extent of this stagnation depends on the greater or lesser possibility of rapid replacement, on market conditions, etc., it itself arises from the circulation time, from circumstances that pertain to the circulation sphere. Quote, Moreover, a stock of all these implements or accessories, working tools, sieves, baskets, ropes, axle grease, nails, etc., is all the more necessary for replacement at any moment, the less opportunity there is of procuring them quickly in the vicinity. Finally, the entire inventory should be carefully inspected each winter, and the necessary additions and repairs immediately put in hand. Whether a larger or smaller stock of implements is generally needed is principally determined by local conditions. Where there are no craftsmen or shops in the vicinity, a greater stock must be kept than where these are to be found in the locality or very close by. If the requisite stocks are procured in greater quantities at once, under otherwise similar conditions, the advantage in cheap purpose is generally obtained, provided that a suitable point of time has been chosen, but of course a greater sum is then withdrawn at once from the current capital, which cannot always be dispensed with in the business. End quote from Kirchhoff. The difference between production time and working time, as we have seen, permits a wide range of possibilities. The circulating capital can be in its production time before it enters the actual labor process, as in the manufacture of lasts. It may be still in production time after it has undergone the actual labor process, as in with wine and seed corn. The production time may be occasionally interrupted by labor time, as in field crops and timber, or a large part of the product in a condition ready for circulation may remain incorporated in the active production process, while a much smaller part enters into the annual circulation, as in timber and cattle growing. The greater or lesser length of time, thus the greater or lesser measure in which the circulating capital has to be laid out all at once in the form of potential productive capital, partly arises from the kind of production process, as in agriculture, and partly depends on the proximity of markets, etc. In short, on circumstances that belong to the circulation sphere. We shall see later on, in Volume 3, what nonsensical theories McCulloch, James Mill, etc. were led to in their attempts to identify this production time diverging from working time with working time attempts which in their turn arose from an incorrect application of the theory of value. The turnover cycle that we considered previously is a function of the durability of the fixed capital advance to the production process. Since this encompasses a greater or smaller number of years, it also encompasses a series of turnovers of the fixed capital, repeated either yearly or within a year. In agriculture, a turnover cycle of this kind arises from the system of crop rotation. Quote, the duration of the lease must in any case not be shorter than the time taken to complete the system of crop rotation that is introduced, and hence with a three-field system it is always reckoned in terms of three, six, nine, etc. If we assume the three-field system with complete fallow, the field is cultivated only four times in six years, and in the years cultivated, with both winter and summer grain, the properties of the soil also require or permit this to be alternated between wheat and rye, barley and oats. Each kind of grain grows in the same soil better or worse than the others. Each has a different value and is also sold at a different price. The yield of the land thus varies with the years of cultivation. It is different in the first half of the cycle, in the first three years, and in the second. Even the average yield over the whole cycle is not the same in the one case as in the other, since fertility does not just depend on the quality of the soil, but also on the year's weather, the price also depending on many different conditions. If the yield is calculated on the basis of the average years of the entire cycle of six years and of the average prices in these years, then the total yield for one year can be arrived at for either period of the rotation. But this is not the case if the yield is only calculated for half of the rotation, i.e. for three years, since then the total yield would not be the same. It is evident from this that the duration of the lease in the three-field system must be fixed at at least six years. It is always far more desirable for both landlord and tenant that the lease should run for a multiple of the lease, and thus instead of six years in the case of the three-field system, it should be twelve or eighteen years or more. And in the case of the seven-field system, not seven, but fourteen or twenty-eight. End quote from Kirchhoff. Chapter 14. Circulation Time. All the circumstances so far considered as differentiating the circulation periods of different capitals invested in different branches of industry, and hence also the times for which capital has to be advanced, such as the distinction between fixed and fluid capital, the difference in working periods, etc., arise within the production process itself. 
but the turnover time of capital is the sum of its production time and its circulation or rotation time. It is self-evident, therefore, that circulation times of varying length make for different times of turnover, and thus different turnover periods. This becomes most readily apparent either when we compare two different capital investments in which all other circumstances modifying the turnover are equal and only the times of circulation are different, or when a given capital is taken with a given composition in terms of fixed and fluid capital, a given working period, etc., and only the circulation time is hypothetically varied. One section of circulation time, and relatively the most decisive one, consists of selling time, the period in which the capital exists in the state of commodity capital. According to the relative extent of this interval, the circulation time in general, and hence also the turnover period, is lengthened or shortened. An additional outlay of capital may also be necessary for costs of storage, etc. It is clear from the start that the time required for the sale of the finished product may be very different for individual capitalists in one and the same line of business, i.e. not only for the quantities of capital that are invested in different branches of production, but also for the various independent capitals invested in a particular sphere of production which in actual fact simply constitute bits of the total capital which have attained an independent position. With other circumstances remaining the same, the selling period required by the same individual capital changes with the general fluctuations in market conditions, or with fluctuations in the particular line of business in question. We shall not deal any further here with this point. We need only establish the simple fact that all circumstances that generally produce a variation in the turnover periods of capital invested in different lines of business may operate individually. For example, if one capitalist has the occasion to sell more quickly than his competitor, if one applies more methods that shorten the working period than the other does, etc., and effect a similar variation in the turnover of the various capitals inhabiting the same line of business. A permanently effective cause of differentiation in the selling time, and hence in the turnover time in general, is the distance of the market where the commodities are sold from their place of production. For the whole period of its journey to the market, capital is confined to the state of commodity capital. If it is produced to order, then there is added to the time of the journey to the market the time in which the commodity is up for sale on the market. Improvements in the means of communication and transport shortens absolutely the period in which the commodities migrate in this way, but it does not abolish the relative difference in the circulation time of different commodity capitals arising from the migration, or even that of different bits of the same commodity capital that migrate to different markets. Improved sailing ships and steamships, for instance, which shorten the journey, shorten it just as much for nearby ports as for distant ones. The relative difference remains, even though it is often reduced. The relative differences may, however, be displaced by the development of means of communication and transport in a way that does not correspond to the natural distances. For instance, a railway leading from the place of production to a major inland center of population may lengthen the distance to a nearer inland point which is not served by a railway, absolutely or relatively, in comparison to the one naturally more distant. Similarly, the relative distances of places of production from the major market outlets may be altered as a result of the same circumstances, which explains the demise of old centers of production and the emergence of new ones with changes in the means of transport and communication. In addition to this, there is the relatively cheaper cost of transport for longer distances as compared to shorter. With the development of the means of transport, the speed of movement in space is accelerated, and the spatial distance is thus shortened in time. In addition to this, the mass of means of communication develops, so that, for instance, many ships depart for the same port at the same time, several trains run between the same two points along different railways, and above all, freight ships leave Liverpool for New York, for example, on different successive days of the week, and goods trains run at different hours of the day from Manchester to London. Admittedly, the last-mentioned development does not alter the absolute speed, and so neither this part of the circulation time if the effectiveness of the means of transport remains at a given level. But successive quantities of goods can now start their journey at more closely spaced intervals and thus arrive on the market one after the other without accumulating in great masses as potential commodity capital until they are actually dispatched. Hence the reflux is distributed over shorter successive periods of time so that one part is steadily being transformed into money capital while another part circulates as commodity capital. By this distribution of the reflux over several successive periods, the total circulation time is shortened and hence also the turnover. At first, the greater or lesser frequency with which the means of transport function, for example the number of trains on a railway, develops with a degree to which a place of production produces more and becomes a major center of production, and this is a development in the direction of the already existing market, i.e., towards the major centers of production and population, towards export ports, etc. 
On the other hand, however, and conversely, this particular ease of commerce and the consequent acceleration in the turnover of capital, inasmuch as this is determined by the circulation time, gives rise to an accelerated concentration of both the center of production and its market. With this accelerated concentration of people and capital at given points, the concentration of these means of capital in a few hands makes rapid progress. There is simultaneously a further shift and displacement as a result of the change in the relative situation of production and marketplaces, which itself results from the changes in the means of communication. A place of production which possessed a particularly advantageous position through being situated on a main road or canal now finds itself on a single railway branch line that operates only at relatively long intervals, while another point, which previously lay completely off major traffic routes, now lies at the intersection of several lines. The second place rises, the first declines. The changes in the means of transport therefore bring about local variations in the circulation time of commodities, and the opportunities to buy and sell, etc., or else they alter the distribution of already existing local variations. The importance of this factor in the turnover of capital is evinced by the disputes between the mercantile and industrial representatives of different places and the directors of railways. See, for example, the above-quoted Blue Book of the Railway Committee. All branches of production which, owing to the nature of their product, are oriented principally to local outlets, such as breweries, thus develop to their largest dimensions in the major centers of population. Here, the rapid turnover of capital partly balances out the increase in the cost of many conditions of production, building land, etc. If the progress of capitalist production and the consequent development of the means of transport and communication shortens the circulation time for a given quantity of commodities, the same progress and the opportunity provided by the development of the means of transport and communication conversely introduces the necessity of working for ever more distant markets, in a word, for the world market. The mass of commodities in transit grows enormously, and hence so does the part of the social capital that stays for long periods in the stage of commodity capital, in circulation time, both absolutely and relatively. A simultaneous and associated growth occurs in the portion of social wealth that instead of serving as direct means of production, is laid out on means of transport and communication, and on the fixed and circulating capital required to keep these in operation. Merely the relative length of the journey of commodities, from their place of production to their outlet, gives rise to a difference not only in the first place of the circulation time, the selling time, but also in the second part, the transformation of money back into the elements of productive capital, the purchasing time. Say that the commodity is sent to India. This takes maybe four months. Let us take the selling time as zero, i.e. assume that the commodity is shipped to order and paid for on delivery to the producer's agent. A further four months is required to send back the money. The form in which it is remitted is immaterial here. It is thus altogether eight months before the same capital can function once again as productive capital and can be used to renew the same operation. The variations in turnover brought about in this way form one of the material bases for differing periods of credit just as overseas trade in general, in Venice and Genoa, for instance, formed one of the original sources of the credit system in its true sense. Quote, the crisis of 1847 enabled the banking and mercantile community of that time to reduce the India and China usions, time allowed for the currency of bills of exchange between there and Europe, from ten months' date to six months' sight, and the lapse of twenty years, with all the accelerations of speed and establishment of telegraphs, renders necessary a further reduction from six months' sight to four months' date, as a first step to four months' sight. The voyage of a sailing vessel via the Cape from Calcutta to London is on the average under 90 days. A usions of four months' sight would be equal to a currency of, say, 150 days. The present usions of six months' sight is equal to a currency of, say, 210 days. End quote from The Economist, published on the 16th of June, 1866. On the other hand, quote, The Brazilian usions remains at two and three months' sight, Bills from Antwerp are drawn on London at three months' date, and even Manchester and Bradford draw upon London at three months and longer dates. By tacit consent, a fair opportunity is afforded to the merchant of realizing the proceeds of his merchandise, not indeed before, but within reasonable time of when the bills drawn against it fall due. In this view, the present usions for Indian bills cannot be considered excessive. Indian produce, for the most part being sold in London with three months prompt and allowing for loss of time in effecting sales, cannot be realized much within five months, while another period of five months will have previously elapsed, on average, between the time of purchase in India and of delivery in the English warehouse. We have here a period of ten months, whereas the bill drawn against the goods does not live beyond seven months. End quote. On the 2nd of July, 1866, five big London banks dealing mainly with India and China and the Paris discount counter gave notice that, quote, from the 1st of January, 1867, 
their branches and agencies in the East will only buy and sell bills of exchange at a term not exceeding four months' sight. End quote. However, this reduction miscarried and had to be abandoned. Since then, the Suez Canal has revolutionized all this. It is clear that with the longer circulation time of commodities, the risk of a change of price on the selling market rises, owing to the lengthening of the period in which this price change can occur. A difference in circulation time, both individually between different capitals in the same branch of industry, and between different branches of industry, according to the different usances, when payment is not immediately made in cash, arises from the different terms of payment in purchase and sale. We shall not dwell any longer on this point here, although it is important for the credit system. The size of delivery contracts, which grows with the volume and scale of capitalist production, also gives rise to differences in the turnover time. The contract of delivery, as a transaction between buyer and seller, is an operation pertaining to the market, to the sphere of circulation. The differences in turnover time arising from it thus arise from the circulation sphere, but they react directly back on the production sphere, quite apart from all terms of payment and credit conditions, i.e. even with cash payment. Coal, cotton, yarn, etc. are discrete products. Each day provides its quantity of finished product. But if the spinner or mine owner agrees to deliver quantities of products which require, say, a four-week or six-week period of successive working days, it is just the same with respect to the length of time for which capital has to be advanced as if a continuous working period of four to six weeks was introduced into his labor process. It is of course assumed here that the entire quantity of products ordered is to be delivered at once, or at least is paid for only after it has all been delivered. Each day, then, considered in isolation, has provided its particular quantity of finished products, but this finished quantity is still only a part of the quantity contracted for. If the already finished part of the commodities ordered is no longer in the production process, it is still merely lying in the warehouse as potential capital. We come now to the second stage of the circulation time, the time of purchase, or the period in which the capital is transformed back from the money form into the elements of productive capital. In the course of this period, it must persist for a longer or shorter time in its state of money capital, and thus a certain part of the total capital advanced always exists in the state of money capital, although this part consists of constantly changing elements. In a particular business, for instance, N times 100 pounds of the total capital advanced has to be present in the form of money capital. This is continuously being transformed into productive capital, but just as constantly being added to again by the influx from circulation, from the realized commodity capital. Thus, a definite portion of the capital value advanced always exists in the state of money capital, i.e. in a form pertaining not to its sphere of production, but rather to its sphere of circulation. We have already seen how, when the time in which capital is confined to the form of commodity capital is prolonged by the greater distance of the market, this directly gives rise to a delayed reflux of money, and thus also delays the transformation of capital from money capital into productive capital. We also saw, in Chapter 6, with respect to the purchase of commodities, how the time of purchase and the greater or lesser distance from the major sources of raw material makes it necessary to buy raw materials for longer periods and keep them available in the form of productive stock, latent or potential productive capital, how this increases the mass of capital that must be advanced at one stroke and the time for which it must be advanced, the scale of production being otherwise the same. In different branches of industry, the shorter or longer periods for which large quantities of raw materials are thrown onto the market have a similar effect. In London, for instance, major auctions of wool take place every three months, and these dominate the wool market, whereas the cotton market is on the whole supplied continuously from harvest to harvest, even if not always evenly. Periods of this kind determine the major terms of purchase for these raw materials, and particularly affect speculative purchases, making necessary longer or shorter advances in these elements of production, just as the nature of the commodities produced affects the speculative and deliberate withholding of products from the market for longer or shorter periods in the form of potential commodity capital. Quote, the agriculturalist must therefore also be a speculator to a certain extent, and hold back the sale of his products according to the conditions of the time. Marketing the products, however, mostly depends on the person, the product itself, and the locality. Someone who, besides being skillful and fortunate, is endowed with sufficient operating capital, is not to be blamed if he sometimes lets the crops he have obtained lie for a year when prices are unusually low. Someone who has insufficient operating capital, on the other hand, or who completely lacks the spirit of speculation, will seek to obtain the current average price, and will thus have to sell as soon and as often as he has the opportunity. To let wool lie for longer than a year will almost always involve a loss, while corn and oil seed can be kept for a few years without any detriment to their quality and properties. Products that are generally subject to a substantial rise and fall in price over short periods of time, such as for example oil seed, hops, teasels, and the like, are rightly left to lie in the years when their prices stand far below the prices of production. 
one should at least delay the sale of such objects as gives rise to the daily costs of maintenance, such as fattened cattle, or liable to spoil, such as fruit, potatoes, etc. In many districts, a product generally has at certain times of the year its lowest price, and at other times its highest. Grain, for instance, is in many places generally lower in price at Martinmas than between Christmas and Easter. There are also many products in several districts that are only good for sale at certain times, as is the case with wool in the wool markets of those districts where at other times the wool trade is generally dull, etc. End quote from Kirchhoff. In considering the second half of the circulation time, during which money is transformed back into elements of productive capital, it is not only this conversion alone that is involved, nor only the time in which the money flows back, according to the distance of the market where the product is sold. What is also, and especially involved, is the extent to which a part of the capital advanced must always exist in the money form, in the state of money capital. If we leave out of consideration all speculative activities, the scale and purchases of those commodities that must constantly be present, as a productive stock, depends on the latter's periods of renewal, i.e., on circumstances that in turn depend on market conditions, and hence vary for different raw materials, etc. Here, therefore, money must from time to time be advanced in large amounts at once. But whether it flows back quicker or more slowly, according to the turnover of the capital, it always flows back bit by bit. One part of it is just as regularly spent again at short intervals, i.e. the part transformed back into wages. Another part, however, the transformed back into raw materials, etc., has to be accumulated for a longer period of time as a reserve fund, either for purchase or for payment. It therefore exists in the form of money capital, although the extent to which it exists in this form changes. We shall see in the next chapter how other circumstances, arising both from the production and the circulation processes, require this presence of a definite portion of the capital advanced in the money form. It should generally be noted, however, that the economists are much inclined to forget not only that a part of the capital needed in a business is constantly passing alternately through the three forms of money capital, productive capital, and commodity capital, but that it is always different portions of this that possess these forms alongside each other, even if the relative magnitudes of these portions are in constant flux. It is particularly the part always present as money capital that the economists forget, although precisely this circumstance is very necessary for the understanding of the bourgeois economy, and makes itself felt as such in practice as well. Chapter 15. Effect of Circulation Time on the Magnitude of the Capital Advanced In this chapter, and the one following, we deal with the influence of circulation time on the valorization of capital. First example. Let us consider a commodity capital that is the product of a working period of nine weeks, for example. We abstract for the time being both from the portion of the product's value that is added to it by the average wear and tear of the fixed capital and from the surplus value added to it during the production process, so that the value of this product can be taken as equal to the value of the fluid capital advanced for its production, i.e. the value of the wages and of the raw and ancillary materials consumed in its production. Let this value be 900 pounds, so that the weekly outlay amounts to 100 pounds. The periodic production time, which coincides here with the working period, is nine weeks. It is immaterial in this connection whether we assume a working period for a continuous product or a continuous working period for a discrete product, as long as the quantum of the discrete product that is put on the market at one stroke simply takes nine weeks' labor. Let the circulation time be three weeks. The total turnover period is then 12 weeks. After nine weeks have elapsed, the productive capital advanced is transformed into commodity capital, but it now has to spend three weeks in the circulation period. Thus the new cycle of production can begin again only at the start of the thirteenth week, and production is at a standstill for three weeks, or a quarter, of the total circulation period. It is also immaterial whether we suppose that this is the average time that it takes to sell the commodity, or whether the time is determined by the distance of the market, or, alternatively again, by the date of payment for the commodity sold. In every three months, production is at a halt for three weeks, i.e. for four times three equals twelve weeks equals three months of the year, or a quarter of the annual turnover period. Hence, if production is to be continuous, pursued on the same scale week in, week out, there are only two possibilities. One possibility is that the scale of production is cut back, so that the sum of 900 pounds is now sufficient to keep work going during the circulation time of the first turnover, as well as during the working period. A second working period is then begun in the tenth week and thus a new turnover period as well, before the first turnover period is at an end, since the turnover period is a 12-week one while the working period is 9 weeks. 900 pounds divided by 12 weeks gives 75 pounds per week. It is clear straight away that a cut of this kind in the scale of business presupposes different dimensions for the fixed capital, and thus a reduced investment in general. 
It is questionable, however, whether this reduction can always be made, since the development of production in the various branches of industry sets a normal minimum of capital investment below which the business in question will cease to be competitive. This normal minimum itself grows steadily with the development of capitalist production, and so it is in no way fixed. Between the normal minimum at any time and the normal maximum, which is itself continuously on the increase, there are several intermediate levels, a middle range that permits varying degrees of capital investment. Within the bounds of this middle range, therefore, there can be reduction in scale, the limits to this being fixed by the normal minimum at the time. In the case of a holdup of production, oversupply of markets, increase in prices of raw materials, etc., the limitation on the normal outlay of circulation capital in relation to a given basis of fixed capital takes the form of a limitation of working hours, for example, only half the day being worked, just as in periods of prosperity there is an abnormal extension of the circulating capital on the given basis of fixed capital, partly by the prolongation of working hours, partly by their intensification. With businesses that have always to reckon with fluctuations of this kind, these are coped with partly by the above means and partly also by the employment of a larger number of workers, combined with a reserve of fixed capital, for example, reserve locomotives on the railways, etc. Here we leave such abnormal fluctuations out of account, as we are assuming normal conditions. For production to be continuous, the same circulating capital must be distributed in this case over a longer period of time, over 12 weeks instead of 9. In any given interval of time, therefore, the productive capital function is reduced, the fluid part of the productive capital is reduced from 100 to 75, i.e. by a quarter. The total sum by which the productive capital functioning during the nine-week working period is reduced is 9 times 25, equaling 225 pounds, or a quarter of the 900 pounds. But the ratio of the circulation time to the turnover period is also 3 over 12, equaling one quarter. It follows, therefore, that if production is not to be interrupted during the circulation time of the productive capital that had been transformed into commodity capital, if it is rather to be continued simultaneously and continuously week by week, and there is no special circulating capital available for this purpose, the goal can only be attained by reducing the scale of the productive operations, by diminishing the fluid component of the functioning productive capital. The portion of fluid capital thus set free for production during the circulation time is related to the total fluid capital advanced as the circulation time is to the turnover period. As already noted, this applies only to branches of production in which the labor process is continued week in, week out on the same scale, and where the amounts of capital that have to be laid out do not vary between the different working periods, as in agriculture. If, however, we assume the reverse of this, namely that the nature of the investment excludes a reduction in the scale of production, and hence also in the fluid capital to be advanced each week, then the continuity of production can be maintained only by an additional fluid capital, in the above case, one of 300 pounds. During the turnover period of 12 weeks, 1,200 pounds is successively advanced, of which 300 pounds makes a quarter, as does three weeks out of 12. After the working period of nine weeks, the capital value of 900 pounds is transformed from the form of productive capital into that of commodity capital. Its working period is concluded, and this cannot immediately be repeated with the same capital. During the three weeks for which the capital exists in the circulation sphere, functioning as commodity capital, it is the same for the production process as if it did not exist at all. We are abstracting here from all credit relations and assume, therefore, that the capitalist operates only within his own capital. But while the capital advance for the first working period spends three weeks in the circulation process after completing its production process, an additional capital outlay of 300 pounds now functions, so that the continuity of production is not interrupted. The following must now be noted in this connection. Firstly, the working period of the capital of 900 pounds originally advanced is ended after nine weeks, and yet the capital does not return for another three weeks until the beginning of the thirteenth week. A new working period, however, is immediately opened with the additional capital of 300 pounds. This is precisely how the continuity of production is maintained. Secondly, the functions of the original capital of 900 pounds and of the capital of 300 pounds newly advanced at the close of the first nine-week working period, which opens the second working period without interruption on the close of the first, are completely separate in their first turnover period, or can at least be separated, whereas in the course of the second turnover period they cut across one another. We can represent the matter more clearly in the following way. First turnover period of 12 weeks. First nine-week working period, the turnover of the capital advanced in this period is completed by the start of the thirteenth week. During the last three weeks, the additional capital of 300 pounds functions, opening the second nine-week working period. Second turnover period. At the start of the thirteenth week, 900 pounds has returned and is available to begin a new turnover. But the second working period has already opened in the tenth week with the additional 300 pounds. By the beginning of the thirteenth week, a third of this working period has been completed by means of this capital, and 300 pounds has been transformed from productive capital into products. 
Since there are only six weeks more to go till the end of the second working period, only two-thirds of the return capital of 900 pounds, i.e. only 600 pounds, can enter the production process of the second working period. 300 pounds of the original 900 pounds is set free to play the same role that the capital of 300 pounds played in the first working period. At the end of the sixth week of the second turnover period, the second working period is concluded. The capital of 900 pounds laid out on it flows back three weeks later, i.e. at the end of the ninth week of the second 12-week turnover period. During the three weeks of its circulation time, the capital of 300 pounds that was set free enters the scene. This begins the third working period of a capital of 900 pounds, in the seventh week of the second turnover period, or the nineteenth week of the year. Third turnover period. The end of the ninth week of the second turnover period brought a new reflux of 900 pounds, but the third working period had already begun in the seventh week of this turnover period, and six weeks of this have already elapsed by the start of the third turnover. Thus, it has only three more weeks to run. Of the 900 pounds that returned, only 300 pounds, therefore, goes into the production process. The fourth working period comprises the remaining nine weeks of this turnover period, and thus the fourth turnover period until the fifth working period begin together with the 37th week of the year. Second example. In order to simplify the example for purposes of calculation, we should assume a working period of five weeks and a circulation time of five weeks, making a turnover period of ten weeks. 50 weeks to the year, and a capital outlay of £100 per week. Thus the working period requires a fluid capital of £500, and the circulation time with the additional capital of further £500. Working periods and turnover times can now be represented as follows. Working period of 1 lasting from week 1 to 5, producing £500 in commodities and returning at the end of week 10. Working period 2 lasting from weeks 6 to 10, producing £500 in commodities and returning at the end of week 15. Working period 3, lasting from weeks 11 to 15, producing £500 in commodities and returning at the end of week 20. Working period 4, lasting from weeks 16 to 20, producing £500 in commodities and returning at the end of week 25. And working period 5, lasting from weeks 21 to 25, producing £500 in commodities and returning at the end of week 30, etc. If the circulation time was zero, so that the turnover period was the same as the working period, the number of turnovers would simply equal the number of working periods in the year. Hence, with a five-week working period, 50 divided by 5 is equal to 10. The value of the capital turned over would be 500 times 10, equaling 5,000 pounds. In the above table, where a circulation time of five weeks is assumed, a value of 5,000 pounds in commodities is still produced each year, but one-tenth of this, i.e. 500 pounds, is always in the shape of commodity capital and returns only after five weeks' delay. At the end of the year, therefore, the product of the tenth working period weeks 46 to 50, has only completed half of its turnover time, since its circulation time falls into the first five weeks of the ensuing year. We now take a third example, a working period of six weeks, circulation time of three weeks, and a weekly advance for the labor process being 100 pounds. The first working period, weeks 1 to 6. At the end of the sixth week, a commodity capital of 600 pounds, returning at the end of week 9. The second working period, lasting from weeks 7 to 12. 300 pounds additional capital advance during week 7 to 9, a return of 600 pounds at the end of week 9. 300 pounds of this advanced in weeks 10 to 12, so that 300 pounds is free at the end of week 12 and 600 pounds present in commodity capital returning at the end of week 15. Third working period, weeks 13 to 18. Advance of the above 300 pounds in weeks 13 to 15, then a return of 600 pounds of which 300 pounds is advanced for weeks 16 to 18. At the end of week 18, 300 pounds is free in money. 600 pounds is present in commodity capital and returns at the end of week 21. For a more detailed presentation of this case, see heading 2 below. 600 times 9 equals 5,400 pounds worth of commodities, thus produced in 9 working periods, totaling 54 weeks. At the end of the ninth working period, the capitalist has 300 pounds in money and 600 pounds in commodities which have not yet completed their circulation time. When we compare these three examples, we find firstly, that only in the second example do capital 1 of 500 pounds and additional capital 2, also 500 pounds, successively replace one another, so that the two portions of capital perform their movements separately. And this is simply because the assumption is made that the case is the highly exceptional one in which the working period and the circulation time form two equal halves of the turnover period. In all other cases, no matter what the discrepancy between the two sections of the turnover period may be, the movements of these two capitals intersect, as in the first and third examples, right from the second turnover period onwards. 
The capital functioning in the second turnover period is then formed by the additional capital 2 together with a part of capital 1, while the remainder of capital 1 is set free for the original function of capital 2. The capital active during the circulation time of the commodity capital is no longer identical with the capital 2 originally advanced for this purpose, but it is equal to it in value and forms the same aliquot part of the total capital advanced. Secondly, the capital which is functioned during the working period lies idle during the circulation time. In the second example, the capital functions for a working period of five weeks and is idle for a circulation period of five weeks. Thus, the overall time during which capital one is idle amounts to half of every year. However, the additional capital required to maintain the continuity of production during the circulation time is not determined by the total sum of circulation time within the year, but simply by the ratio of circulation time to the turnover period. We assume here, of course, that all the turnovers take place under the same conditions. Hence, it is an additional capital of 500 pounds that is needed in the second example, and not one of 2,500 pounds. This simply follows from the fact that the additional capital enters the turnover just as much as that originally advanced, and so was replaced after a number of turnovers just as the former was. Thirdly, it in no way alters the circumstances considered here if the production time is longer than the working time. The total turnover period is certainly extended by this factor, but this extended turnover does not require any additional capital for the labor process. The additional capital simply has the job of filling up the gaps in the labor process that are due to the circulation time, and so it has to protect production only from disturbances that arise as a result of this circulation time. Disturbances that arise from these specific conditions of production are taken care of in another way, which is not under consideration here. There are, however, businesses where work is done only spasmodically, to order, and in which there can be interruptions between the working periods for this reason. In such cases, the need for additional capital is proportionately reduced. In most types of seasonal work, moreover, there is also a certain limit for this reflux. The same work cannot be repeated the next year with the same capital, if this capital has not meanwhile completed its circulation time. The circulation time may, however, be less than the interval between one production period and the next. In this case, the capital lies idle, unless it is applied in the meantime in another manner. Fourthly, the capital advanced for one working period, for example the 600 pounds in the third example, is laid out partly on raw and ancillary materials, i.e. in a productive stock for the working period, in constant circulating capital, and partly in variable circulating capital, in payment for labor itself. Not all of that part of the capital laid out on constant circulating capital need exist for the same length of time in the form of productive stock. For example, raw material may not be stored for the whole working period, or coal may be procured every two weeks. Nonetheless, if we exclude credit here, this part of the capital, insofar as it is not present in the form of a productive stock, must still remain available in the money form, in order to be transformed into productive stock according to need. This in no way alters the value of the constant circulating capital advanced for six weeks. Wages, on the other hand, quite apart from the money for unforeseen expenses, the specific reserve fund to cope with disturbances are paid at shorter intervals, mostly weekly. So except where the capitalist forces the worker to make particularly long advances of his labor, the capital needed for wages must be present in the money form. When capital returns, therefore, one part must be kept in the form of money for payment of labor, while another part can be transformed into productive stock. The additional capital is divided up just like the original capital, but what distinguishes it from Capital One is that it must already be advanced for the entire duration of the first working period of Capital One, which it is not involved in, in order to be available for its own working period. This is again abstracting from credit relations. During this time, it can be at least partially transformed already into constant circulating capital. The extent to which it assumes this last form, or else persists in the form of additional money capital until the time that this transformation is necessary, will depend partly on the particular production conditions of these specific lines of business involved, partly on local circumstances, and partly on fluctuations in the prices of raw materials, etc. If we consider the total social capital, then a more or less significant part of this additional capital exists for a prolonged time in the state of money capital. As far as the part of capital too advanced for wages is concerned, however, it is only gradually transformed into labor power, inasmuch as the working periods that elapse and are paid for are relatively short. This part of capital too is thus present in the form of money capital for the whole duration of the working period, until it is transformed into labor power and thus embarks on the function of productive capital. This intervention of the additional capital required for the conversion of Capital One's circulation time into production time thus not only increases the size of the capital advanced and the length of time for which the total capital has to be advanced, but it also specifically increases that part of the capital advance that exists as a money reserve, i.e., exists in the state of money capital and possesses the form of potential money capital.
The same thing occurs, as concerns both an advance of capital in the form of productive stock and that in the form of a money reserve, if the division of capital into two parts that is required by the circulation time, capital for the first working period and replacement capital for the circulation time, is brought about not by an increase in the capital laid out, but instead by a reduction in the scale of production. In relation to the scale of production, the capital confined to the money form increases here still further. What is always attained by this division of the capital into original productive capital and additional capital is the uninterrupted succession of working periods, the steady functioning of an equal-sized part of the capital advanced as productive capital. Let us consider the second example. The capital existing in the production process at any one time is 500 pounds. Since the working period is five weeks, this capital operates ten times in every fifty weeks, taken as a year. If we disregard surplus value, the product therefore amounts to 10 times 500 equaling 5,000 pounds. From the standpoint of the capital functioning directly and uninterruptedly in the production process, a capital value of 500 pounds, the circulation time thus appears to have disappeared completely. The turnover period coincides with the working period. The circulation time is assumed to be zero. But if the capital of 500 pounds were to be regularly inhibited in its productive activity by the circulation time of five weeks, so as to be only ready for production once again after completing the entire turnover period of 10 weeks, we should have, in the 50-week year, five 10-week turnovers. These would include five five-week production periods, i.e. a total of 25 weeks production, with a total product of 5 times 500 totaling 2,500 pounds, and five five-week circulation times, i.e. a total circulation time of also 25 weeks. If we say in this case that the capital of 500 pounds is turned over five times in the year, then it is perfectly clear that for half of each turnover period this capital of 500 pounds is not functioned as productive capital at all, and that all things considered, it is functioned only for half the year, and not during the other half. In our example, the replacement capital of 500 pounds enters the scene for the duration of these five circulation times, and in this way, the turnover is raised from 2,500 pounds to 5,000 pounds. But the capital advanced is now 1,000 pounds instead of 500 pounds. 5,000 divided by 1,000 is 5. Thus, instead of 10 turnovers, we have 5. But because it is then said that the capital of 1,000 pounds has turned over 5 times in the year, the memory of the circulation time vanishes from the empty heads of the capitalists, and the confused idea is formed that this capital has functioned constantly in the production process throughout the 5 successive turnovers. However, when we say that the capital of 1,000 pounds has turned over five times, we include in this the circulation time as well as the production time. In fact, if 1,000 pounds really had been continuously active in the production process, then the product would have been 10,000 pounds, on the basis of our assumptions, instead of 5,000 pounds. And in order to have 1,000 pounds continuously in the production process, a capital of 2,000 pounds would have had to be advanced. The economists, who have never produced a clear account of the turnover mechanism, constantly overlook this basic aspect, i.e. the fact that only a part of the industrial capital can actually be engaged in the production process, if production is to proceed without interruption. In other words, one part can function as productive capital only on condition that another part is withdrawn from production proper, in the form of commodity or money capital. Since this is overlooked, so also is the importance and role of money capital in general. What we now have to investigate is the difference in the turnover that arises according to whether the two sections of the turnover period, working period and circulation period, are equal, or whether the working period is longer or shorter than the circulation period. Further, how this affects the tying up of capital in the form of money capital. We assume here that the capital advanced each week is in all cases 100 pounds, and the turnover period 9 weeks, so that the capital that has to be advanced for each turnover period is 900 pounds. Section 1 working period and circulation period equal. This case, though in reality it is only a chance exception, must serve as the starting point for the discussion, since it is here that conditions are present in their simplest and most palpable form. The two capitals, capital 1, which is to be advanced for the first working period, and additional capital 2, which functions during the circulation period of capital 1, relieve one another in their movements without crossing each other's path. With the exception of the first period, therefore, each of the two capitals is advanced only for its own turnover period. If the turnover period is nine weeks, as in the following examples, then the working period and circulation period are accordingly both four and a half weeks. We then have the following schema for a complete year. See Table 1. The aforementioned graphic will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference.
In the 51 weeks that we take here as the year, Capital One has concluded six full working periods, and thus produced commodities to the value of 6 times 450, equaling 2,700 pounds. Capital Two has produced commodities for five full working periods. Five times 450 is equal to 2,250 pounds. Capital Two has also produced a further 150 pounds in the final one and a half weeks of the year, mid-week 50 to the end of week 51, a total product of 5,100 pounds in 51 weeks. As far as the direct production of surplus value is concerned, and this is produced only during the working period itself, the total capital of 900 pounds has turned over five and two-thirds times. Five and two-thirds times 900, equaling 5,100. But if we consider the real turnover, then Capital One has turned over five and two-thirds times, since at the end of week 51, it has only three weeks of its sixth turnover period still to complete. Five and two-thirds times 450, equaling 2,550 pounds. Well, Capital Two has turned over five and one-six times, since it has only completed one and a half weeks of its sixth turnover period, and a further seven and a half weeks of this fall in the coming year. Five and one-six times 450, totaling 2,325 pounds, the real amount turned over being 4,875 pounds. We may treat Capital One and Capital Two as two quite independent capitals. In their movements, they are completely autonomous. These movements are complementary only insofar as their working and circulation periods directly relieve one another. They can be considered as two completely independent capitals, belonging to different capitalists. Capital One has gone through five complete turnover periods in two-thirds of its sixth. It exists at the end of the year in the form of commodity capital, requiring a further three weeks for its normal realization. It functions as commodity capital and circulates. As far as its last turnover goes, it has completed only two-thirds of it. This is expressed by saying that it is turned over only two-thirds of a time. Only two-thirds of its total value is turned over completely. We say that 450 pounds completes its turnover in nine weeks, and therefore 300 pounds does so in six weeks. By expressing it in this way, we leave aside the organic relations between the two specific and different components of the turnover time, since the exact sense of the statement that the capital of 450 pounds advanced has made five and two-thirds turnovers is simply that it has made five turnovers and only completed two-thirds of its sixth. Nevertheless, the expression that the capital turned over is five and two-thirds of the original capital advanced, thus in the above case five and two-thirds times 450 totaling 2,550 pounds, is correct in the sense that if this capital of 450 pounds were not supplemented by another capital of 450 pounds, then one part of it would have to exist in the production process, and another part in the circulation process. If the turnover time is to be expressed in terms of the quantity of the capital turned over, it can only ever be expressed in a quantity of existing value in fact, of finished products. The circumstance that the capital advance does not exist in a state in which it can reopen the production process once again is expressed in the form that only one part of it exists in a state suitable for production, or that, in order to exist in a state of continuous production, the capital must always be divided into one part that is in the production period and another part in the circulation period, according to the ratio between these two periods. This is the same law as that which determines the mass of productive capital functioning at one time by the ratio of circulation time to turnover time. Of capital two, at the end of week 51, which we take here as the close of the year, 150 pounds is advanced in the production of unfinished products. A further part exists in the form of fluid constant capital, raw material, etc., i.e. in a form in which it can function as productive capital in the production process. But a third part exists in the money form, a quantity at least as great as the amount of wages for the remainder of the working period, three weeks, which are paid only at the end of each week. Even though this part of the capital does not exist in the form of productive capital at the beginning of the new year, i.e. of a new turnover cycle, but rather in the form of money capital in which it is incapable of entering the production process, the new turnover nevertheless reopens with fluid variable capital, i.e. living labor power, active in the production process. This phenomenon comes about because although labor power is bought and used at the beginning of the working period, say weekly, it is paid for only at the end of the week. Here, money functions as means of payment. It therefore exists on one hand as money still in the hands of the capitalist, while on the other hand labor power, the commodity into which it is converted and is already active in the production process, and thus the same capital value here appears twofold. If we consider simply the working periods, then Capital One has produced 6 times 450, totaling 2,700 pounds. Capital Two has produced 5 and 1 thirds times 450, totaling 2,400 pounds, i.e. together they have produced 5 and 2 thirds times 900, totaling 5,100 pounds. The money capital of 900 pounds advanced has thus functioned as productive capital five and two-thirds times in the year. As far as the production of surplus value is concerned, 
It is all the same whether 450 pounds in the production process always functions alternately with 450 pounds in the circulation process or whether 900 pounds functions for four and a half weeks in the circulation process. If we consider the turnover periods, on the other hand, then Capital One has turned over 5 and 2 thirds times 450, totaling 2,550 pounds. Capital Two has turned over 5 and 1 sixth times 450, totaling 2,325 pounds, i.e. the total capital turned over is 5 and 5 twelfths times 900, totaling 4,875 pounds. This is because the turnover of the total capital is equal to the amounts of capitals 1 and 2 turned over, divided by the sum of capitals 1 and 2. It should be noted here that capitals 1 and 2, if they really were independent of one another, would still only form different, independent parts of the social capital advanced in the same branch of production. If the social capital in this branch of production consisted only of 1 and 2, the same calculation would hold for the turnover of the social capital in this branch as holds here for the two components 1 and 2 of the same private capital. Any portion of the total social capital in a particular branch of production can be calculated in this way by extension. Finally, the number of turnovers of the total social capital equals the sum of the capital turned over in the various branches of production divided by the sum of the capital advanced in these branches. It should further be noted that, just as here, in the same private business, the two capitals 1 and 2 have, in the strict sense, different turnover years, inasmuch as the turnover cycle of capital 2 begins four and a half weeks later than that of capital 1, and 1's year therefore comes to a close four and a half weeks earlier than that of 2, so, too, the various private capitals in the same branch of production begin business at quite different points in time, and hence complete their annual turnover at different times of the year. The same average calculation that we applied above to 1 and 2 also serves here to reduce the turnover years of the various independent parts of the social capital to a uniform turnover year. Section 2. Working Period, Longer Than Circulation Period in this case, the working and turnover periods of capitals 1 and 2 cut across one another, instead of following on from each other. We also find capital set free, which was not the position in the case considered previously. This is in no way altered by the fact that now, as previously, 1. The number of working periods of the total capital advanced is equal to the value of the annual product of the two years of the capital advanced divided by the total capital advanced, and 2. The number of turnovers of the total capital is equal to the sum of the two amounts turned over, divided by the sum of the two capitals advanced. Here, too, we must consider the two portions of capital as if they perform their turnover movements in complete independence of one another. We assume once again that 100 pounds has to be advanced each week in the labor process. The working period lasts for six weeks, and therefore requires an advance of 600 pounds, capital one. The circulation period is three weeks, and so the turnover period as above is nine weeks. A capital 2 of 300 pounds enters the scene during the three-week circulation period of capital 1. If we consider the two as independent capitals, then the annual turnover presents itself according to the following schema. See Table 2. The aforementioned graphic will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. The production process proceeds uninterruptedly on the same scale throughout the whole year. Here, we have kept the two capitals 1 and 2 completely separate. But in order to present them separately in this way, we have had to cut through their actual intersections and entanglements. According to the above table, for instance, the amounts turned over would be capital 1, 5 and 2 thirds times 600, totaling 3,400 pounds, and capital 2, 5 times 300, totaling 1,500 pounds. For the total capital, 5 and 4 ninths times 900, totaling 4,900 pounds. This is not correct, however, since, as we shall see, the actual production and circulation periods do not entirely coincide with those in the above table, in which the important thing was to exhibit the two capitals 1 and 2 in complete independence from one another. In reality, for instance, capital 2 does not have working and circulation periods separate from those of capital 1. The working period is 6 weeks, the circulation period 3 weeks. Since capital 2 is only 300 pounds, it can serve for only part of a working period. This is in fact the case. At the end of week 6, a product to the value of 600 pounds steps out into circulation, and at the end of week 9, this value returns in money. Capital 2 thus moves into action at the beginning of week 7, and covers the needs of the next working period for week 7 to 9. According to our assumption, however, the working period is only half finished by the end of week 9. The capital 1 of 600 pounds that has just returned therefore moves into action once more, and 300 pounds of it meets the advance needed for weeks 10 to 12. The second working period is thus taken care of. A product to the value of 600 pounds is in circulation and will return at the end of week 15. On top of this, however, 300 pounds, the amount of the original capital 2, 
is set free and can function in the first half of the following working period, i.e. weeks 13 to 15. After this has elapsed, the 600 pounds then returns once again. 300 pounds of it suffices until the close of the working period, while 300 pounds remains free for the following period. The matter now stands as follows. Turnover period 1, weeks 1 to 9. First working period, weeks 1 to 6, capital 1 of 600 pounds functions. First circulation period, weeks 7 to 9. At the end of week 9, 600 pounds returns. Turnover period 2, weeks 7 to 15. Second working period, weeks 7 to 12. First half, weeks 7 to 9, capital 2 of 300 pounds functions. At the end of week 9, 600 pounds returns in money from capital 1. Second half, weeks 10 to 12. 300 pounds of Capital One functions. The other 300 pounds of Capital One remains free. Second circulation period, weeks 13 to 15. At the end of week 15, 600 pounds returns in money, formed half from Capital One, half from Capital Two. Turnover period three, weeks 13 to 21. Third working period, weeks 13 to 18. First half, weeks 13 to 15. The 300 pounds set free begins to function. At the end of week 15, 600 pounds returns in money. Second half, week 16 to 18. Of the 600 pounds that is returned, 300 pounds functions. The other 300 pounds again remains free. Third circulation period, weeks 19 to 21. At its close, 600 pounds again returns in money. In this 600 pounds, capital one and capital two have now merged indistinguishably together. In this way, we have eight full turnover periods of a capital of 600 pounds up till the end of the 51st week. 1, weeks 1 to 9, 2, 7 to 15, 3, 13 to 21, 4, 19 to 27, 5, 25 to 33, 6, 31 to 39, 7, 37 to 45, 8, 43 to 51. But since weeks 49 to 51 fall in the 8th circulation period, the 300 pounds of capital set free must enter production and keep it going during this time. The turnover thus presents itself as follows at the end of the year. 600 pounds has completed its circuit eight times, making 4,800 pounds turned over. On top of this, there is the product of the final three weeks, 49 to 51, but this has accomplished only a third of its nine-week circuit, and thus counts only for a third of its total amount, i.e. 100 pounds in the sum turned over. So if the annual product of 51 weeks is 5,100 pounds, the capital turned over is only 4,800 plus 100, equaling 4,900 pounds. The total capital advanced was 900 pounds, and this has therefore turned over 5 and 4 ninths times, i.e. slightly less than in case 1. In the present example, we assumed a case in which the working time was two-thirds of the turnover period, and the circulation time one-third, i.e. the working time was a simple multiple of the circulation time. The question arises whether the setting free of capital noted above also occurs when this is not the case. Let us take a working period of five weeks and a circulation time of four weeks with a capital advance of 100 pounds per week. Turnover period one, weeks one to nine. First working period, weeks one to five, capital one of 500 pounds functions. First circulation period, weeks six to nine. At the end of week nine, 500 pounds returns in money. Turnover period two, weeks six to 14. Second working period, weeks six to 10. First section, weeks six to nine. Capital 2 of 400 pounds functions. At the end of week 9, capital 1 of 500 pounds returns in money. Second section, week 10. 100 pounds out of the returned 500 pounds functions. The remaining 400 pounds stays free for the following working period. Second circulation period, weeks 11 to 14. At the end of week 14, 500 pounds returns in money. Up till the end of week 14, weeks 11 to 14, the 400 pounds that has been set free functions. 100 pounds of the 500 pounds that is thus returned meets the remaining needs of the third working period, weeks 11 to 15, so that a further 400 pounds is set free for the fourth working period. The same phenomenon is repeated in each working period. At its beginning, there is 400 pounds available, which suffices for the first four weeks. At the end of the fourth week, 500 pounds returns in money and only 100 pounds of this is needed for the final week, the remaining 400 pounds being free until the next working period. Let us now take a working period of seven weeks, with capital one of 700 pounds, at a circulation time of two weeks with capital two of 200 pounds. The first turnover period then lasts from week one to week nine, and out of this period, the first working period comprises weeks one to seven, with an advance of 700 pounds, while the first circulation period comprises weeks eight to nine. At the end of the ninth week, the 700 pounds returns in money. 
The second turnover period, weeks 8 to 16, includes the second working period of weeks 8 to 14. The needs of weeks 8 and 9 are met by Capital 2. At the end of the ninth week, the above 700 pounds returns. 500 pounds of this is used up by the end of the working period, weeks 10 to 14. There remains 200 pounds, which is set free for the next working period. The second circulation period covers weeks 15 to 16. At the end of week 16, a further 700 pounds returns. The same phenomenon is now repeated in each working period. The capital needs of the first two weeks are met by the 200 pounds set free at the close of the previous working period. At the end of the second week, 700 pounds returns, but the working period now only has a further five weeks to run, so that only 500 pounds can be used and there is always 200 pounds set free for the next working period. It emerges, therefore, that in our present example, where the working period is taken as greater than the circulation period, there is always set free at the close of each working period, under all circumstances, a money capital of the same magnitude as the capital 2, which was advanced for the circulation period. In our three examples, capital 2 was £300 in the first, £400 in the second, and £200 in the third, and the capital set free at the close of the working period was accordingly £300, £400, and £200. Section 3. Working Period Shorter Than Circulation Period We again start with a turnover period of nine weeks. The working period is now three weeks, the capital one required for this being £300. The circulation period is six weeks. For these six weeks, an additional capital of £600 is needed, which we can however divide up again into two capitals of £300, each of these catering for one working period. We then have three capitals of £300 each, with £300 always occupied in production, while £600 circulates. See Table 3. The aforementioned graphic will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. Here we have the exact counterpart of Case 1, with the simple distinction that three capitals now relieve one another instead of two. There is no intersection or entanglement between the capitals. Each individual capital can be separately traced right through to the end of the year. Just as little as in case one, therefore, is any capital set free at the close of a working period. Capital one is completely laid out by the end of week three, completely returns at the end of week nine, and begins to function again at the start of week ten. Similarly with capitals two and three. The even and complete replacement of the capitals excludes the setting free of any part of them. The overall turnover is calculated as follows. Turned over by capital 1, 300 pounds times 5 and 2 thirds, 1,700 pounds. Turned over by capital 2, 300 pounds times 5 and 1 third, 1,600 pounds. And turned over by capital 3, 300 pounds times 5, 1,500 pounds. Turned over by the total capital, 900 pounds times 5 and a third, 4,800 pounds. We shall now take an example in which the circulation period is not an exact multiple of the working period i.e. a working period of four weeks, a circulation period of five weeks. The corresponding sums of capital are thus capital 1, 400 pounds, capital 2, 400 pounds, and capital 3, 100 pounds. The following table only gives the first three turnovers. The aforementioned graphic will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. Here, the capitals are intertwined insofar as the working period of capital 3, which does not have an independent working period of its own, since it is sufficient only for one week, coincides with the first working week of capital 1. For this reason, however, a capital of 100 pounds, equal to capital 3, is set free at the close of the working periods of both capitals 1 and 2. If, for instance, capital 3 serves for the first week of the second and all subsequent working periods of capital 1, and at the close of the first week the entire capital one of 400 pounds returns, then the remainder of the working period of capital one amounts to only three weeks, and the corresponding capital outlay is 300 pounds. The 100 pounds set free in this way then suffices for the first week of the directly following working period of capital two. At the close of this week, the entire capital two of 400 pounds returns, but since the working period which is in progress can absorb only 300 pounds, there remains, at its close once again, 100 pounds set free, and so on. Capital is thus set free at the close of the working period whenever the circulation time is not a simple multiple of the working period, and this capital that is set free is moreover equal to the portion of capital which has to fill in for the excess of the circulation period over a working period, or over a number of working periods. It has been assumed in all the cases investigated that both working time and circulation time remain the same throughout the year in the business under consideration, whatever it may be. This assumption was necessary if we wish to establish the influence of the circulation time on the turnover and on the capital advanced. It is beside the point here that this is not unconditionally the case in reality, and often not at all so.
In this whole part, we are considering only the turnovers of circulating capital, and not those of fixed capital. This is for the simple reason that the matter under consideration does not involve the fixed capital. The means of labor, etc., that are applied in the production process only form fixed capital to the extent that the time during which they are in use extends longer than the turnover period of the fluid capital, insofar as the time during which these means of labor endure and serve for constantly repeated labor processes is greater than the turnover period of the fluid capital, i.e. covers a number n of turnover periods of this fluid capital. Whether the overall interval which is formed by these n turnover periods of the fluid capital is longer or shorter, the part of the productive capital that is advanced for this time in the form of fixed capital is not advanced again within the same interval. It goes on functioning in its old use form. The difference is simply that, according to the differing lengths of the individual working period in each turnover period of the fluid capital, the fixed capital surrenders a greater or smaller part of its original value to the product of this working period, and according to the duration of the circulation time in each turnover period, this portion of the value of the fixed capital that is given up to the product returns more quickly or more slowly in the money form. The nature of the object of investigation in this part, the turnover of the circulating part of the productive capital, arises from the nature of this portion of the capital itself. The fluid capital applied in one working period cannot be applied in a new working period before it has completed its turnover, i.e. has been transformed into commodity capital, from the latter into money capital, and then back again into productive capital. In order to follow the first working period directly with the second, therefore, new capital must be advanced, and in sufficient quantity to fill the gaps that arise as a result of the circulating period of the fluid capital that is advanced for the first working period. Hence the influence of the length of the working period of the fluid capital on the scale of the labor process and on the division of the capital advanced, or on the addition of new portions of capital. This, however, is precisely what we are considering in this part. Section 4. Results. The above investigation leads to the following results. A. The various portions in which the capital has to be divided, so that one part of it can always be in its working period while other parts are in their circulation period, relieve each other, like independent private capitals, in two cases. 1. If the working period is equal to the circulation period, and the turnover period is thus divided into two equal sections. 2. If the circulation period is longer than the working period, but is a simple multiple of it, so that one circulation period equals n working periods, where n must be a whole number. In these cases, no part of the capital successively advanced is set free. b. However, in all cases where 1. the circulation period is greater than the working period, without forming a simple multiple of it, or 2. the working period is greater than the circulation period, a part of the overall fluid capital is always periodically set free at the close of each working period. This capital that is set free, moreover, is equal to the portion of the total capital that is advanced for the circulation period if the working period is greater than the circulation period, and equal to the portion of capital which has to stand in for the excess of the circulation period over a working period, or a whole number of working periods, if the circulation period is greater than the working period. c. It follows from this that as far as the total social capital is concerned, considering the fluid part of this, the setting free of capital is the rule while the simple mutual replacement of portions of capital functioning successively in the production process must form the exception. For the equality of working period and circulation period, or the equality of circulation period and a whole number of working periods, in other words, a regular proportion between the two components of the turnover period, has nothing at all to do with the nature of the case, and can therefore occur, by and large, only exceptionally. A very significant portion of the social circulating capital, which is turned over several times in the year, will thus periodically exist in the course of the annual turnover cycle in the form of capital set free. It is also evident that, assuming all other circumstances remain the same, the magnitude of this capital set free will grow with the extent of the labor process or the scale of production, and thus with the development of capitalist production in general. In case B2, simply because the overall capital advanced grows. In B1, for the same reason, and because the length of the circulation period also grows with the development of capitalist production, while the circulation period is not a simple multiple of the working period. In the first case, for example, there was 100 pounds to be laid out each week. This made 600 pounds for a six-week working period, and 300 pounds for a three-week circulation period, making a total of 900 pounds. Here, 300 pounds was always set free. If, however, 300 pounds was laid out each week, then this would make 1,800 pounds for the working period, and 900 pounds for the circulation period, and so 900 pounds would be periodically set free instead of 300 pounds. D. 
The total capital of, for example, 900 pounds must be divided up into two portions. In the above case, 600 pounds for the working period and 300 pounds for the circulation period. The portion that is actually laid out in the labor process will therefore diminish by a third, from 900 pounds to 600 pounds, and hence the scale of production will also be reduced by a third. The 300 pounds, on the other hand, only functions to make the working period continuous, so that in each week of the year, 100 pounds can be laid out in the labor process. Taken abstractly, it is all the same whether 600 pounds operates for 6 times 8, totaling 48 weeks, a product of 4,800 pounds, or whether the entire capital of 900 pounds is laid out for 6 weeks in the labor process and then lies idle for a circulation period of 3 weeks. In the latter case, it would operate for 32 weeks, equaling 5 and a third times 6, out of a total of 48, product being 5 and a third times 900, totaling 4,800 pounds, and lie idle for 16 weeks. But apart from the greater waste of fixed capital during the idle period of 16 weeks and the increased cost of labor, which has to be paid for the whole year even if only a part of this is worked, a regular interruption of this kind in the production process would be incompatible with the running of modern large-scale industry. Continuity is itself a productive force of labor. If we now look more closely at the capital that is set free, or in actual fact suspended, it is clear that a significant part of this must always possess the form of money capital. Let us stick to the example of a working period of six weeks and the circulation period of three weeks, weekly outlay 100 pounds. In the middle of the second working period, at the end of week nine, 600 pounds returns, of which only 300 pounds has to be laid out during the remainder of the working period. At the end of the second working period, therefore, 300 pounds of this is set free. In what state does this 300 pounds now exist? We shall assume that one third of it is laid out on wages and two thirds on raw and ancillary materials. Of the 600 pounds that is returned, 200 pounds thus exists in the money form for wages, and 400 pounds in the form of a productive stock, i.e. as elements of the constant circulating productive capital. But since only half of this productive stock is required for the second half of working period 2, the other half exists for three weeks in the form of a surplus productive stock, i.e. surplus to the needs of one working period. The capitalist, however, knows that, out of the portion of capital that is returned to him, 400 pounds, he needs only one half for the current working period. It will therefore depend on market conditions whether he immediately transforms this 200 pounds completely or partially back into surplus productive stock, or hangs on to it wholly or partly as money capital, in the expectation of more favorable market conditions. It is self-evident, on the other hand, that the part to be laid out on wages, 200 pounds, is kept in the money form. The capitalist cannot dispose of labor power once he has bought it as he can the raw material in his storeroom. He has to incorporate it into the production process and pay for it at the end of the week. Of the capital of 300 pounds that has been set free, therefore, this 100 pounds will in any case possess the form of money capital that has been set free, i.e. is not needed for the working period. The capital set free in the form of money capital must therefore be at least equal to the variable portion of the capital that laid out on wages at the maximum it can include the whole of the capital set free. In reality, it constantly fluctuates between the minimum and the maximum. The money capital that is set free simply by the mechanism of the turnover movement, together with the money capital set free by the successive reflux of the fixed capital, and that needed for variable in every labor process, must play a significant role, as soon as the credit system has developed and must also form one of the foundations for this. Let us assume in our example that the circulation time is cut from three weeks to two. This is not a normal occurrence, but may be an effect of a good period for business, shortened term for payment, etc. The capital of 600 pounds that was laid out during the working period returns one week earlier than needed, and is therefore set free for this week. 300 pounds, part of that 600 pounds, is again set free, as before, in the middle of the working period, but for four weeks now instead of three. Hence, 600 pounds exists on the money market for one week, and 300 pounds for four weeks instead of three. Since this does not just affect one single capitalist, but rather several, and occurs at different periods in different branches of industry, a greater quantity of disposable money capital is thereby brought into the market. If this state of affairs lasts a long time, production will be expanded, where circumstances permit. Capitalists who operate with borrowed capital will exert less demand on the money market, which relieves it as much as does increased supply. Alternatively, the sums that have become superfluous for the turnover mechanism will eventually be definitively thrown out onto the money market. As a result of the contraction of the circulation time from three to two weeks, and hence of the turnover period from nine weeks to eight, one-ninth of the total capital advance becomes superfluous. The six-week working period can now be kept going just as steadily with 800 pounds as it could before with 900. A portion of the commodity capital, 
100 pounds, therefore once it is turned back into money, persists in this state as money capital, and no longer functions as a part of the capital advance for the production process. While production is continued on the same scale, and with conditions such as prices, etc. remaining otherwise the same, the value of the capital advance declines from 900 pounds to 800 pounds. The remaining 100 pounds of the value originally advanced is precipitated out in the form of money capital. As such, it enters the money market and forms an additional part of the capital functioning there. We can see from this how a surfeit of money capital can arise, and not only in the sense that the supply of money capital is greater than the demand for it. The latter is never more than a relative surplus, which is found, for instance, in the depressed period that opens the new business cycle after the crisis is over. It is rather in the sense that a definite part of the capital advanced is superfluous for the overall process of social reproduction, which includes the circulation process, and is therefore precipitated out in the form of money capital. It is thus a surplus which has arisen with the scale of production and prices remaining the same, simply by a contraction in the turnover period. The mass of money in circulation, whether this is larger or smaller, does not have the slightest influence on this. Let us assume inversely that the circulation period is extended, say from three weeks to five. Then, when the next turnover takes place, the reflux of the capital advanced is already two weeks too late. The last part of the production process of this working period cannot be completed simply through the turnover mechanism of the capital originally advanced. If the situation continues for much longer, there will be a contraction of the production process, i.e. a reduction of the scale on which it is conducted, just as in the previous case there was an expansion. In order to continue the process on the same scale, the capital advanced would have to be increased by two-ninths, totaling 200 pounds, for the entire duration, to cope with this prolongation of the circulation period. This additional capital can be obtained only from the money market. If the prolongation of the circulation period affects one or more major lines of business, then it may exert pressure on the money market, if this effect is not cancelled out by a counter-effect from another direction. In this case, too, it is manifestly evident that this pressure, just like the surplus in the previous case, has nothing to do with a change either in the prices of commodities or in the quantity of the available means of circulation. Section 5. Effect of Changes in Price We have so far assumed that prices in the scale of production stay the same, while there is a contraction or expansion in the circulation time. Let us now assume, by way of contrast, a constant turnover period and a constant scale of production but a change in price, i.e. a fall or rise in the price of raw materials, ancillaries, and labor, or of the first two of these elements. Let us say that the price of raw materials and ancillaries falls by a half. In our example, only 50 pounds would then be needed each week instead of 100 pounds, and 450 pounds for the nine-week turnover period instead of 900. 450 pounds of the capital value advanced will at first be precipitated out as money capital, but the production process will be continued on the same scale, with the same turnover period and the same division within this. The annual product will remain the same in volume, but its value will fall by one half. It is neither an accelerated circulation that has led to this nor a change in the quantity of money in circulation, but it is still accompanied by a change in the supply of and demand for money capital. The converse is also true. The initial effect of a fall of a half in the value or price of the elements of productive capital would be that the capital value that has to be advanced for business X, continued on the same scale as before, would be reduced by a half, and so business X would also have to cast only half as much money into the market, since it is in the form of money, i.e. as money capital, that business X originally advances this capital value. The quantity of money cast into circulation would decline, because the price of the elements of production had fallen. This would be the first effect. Secondly, however, half of the capital value of 900 pounds originally advanced, i.e. 450 pounds, whether A, alternately passed through the forms of money capital, productive capital, and commodity capital, or B, existed simultaneously and contiguously partly in the form of money capital, partly as productive capital, and partly as commodity capital, would be precipitated out from the circuit of business X, and would therefore enter the money market as additional money capital, and function there as an additional component. This 450 pounds set free in money functions as money capital not because it is money that has become superfluous for the conduct of business X, but rather because it is a component of the original capital value, hence continues to operate as capital and is not spent as a mere means of circulation. The most direct form in which it can be made to operate as capital is if it is placed on the money market as money capital. Alternatively, the scale of production could be doubled, ignoring the fixed capital. A production process of double the scale could then be conducted with the same capital advance of 900 pounds. 
If the prices of the fluid elements of the productive capital were to rise by a half, on the other hand, so that instead of 100 pounds a week, 150 pounds was necessary, and thus 1,350 pounds instead of 900, then 450 pounds of additional capital would be needed in order to carry on business on the same scale, and this would exert a proportionate pressure on the money market, greater or less according to its condition. If all capital available on it was already taken up, then there would be increased competition for available capital. If a part of it lay idle, then it would be proportionately called into action. But there can also be a third case, when, with a given scale of production, given velocity of turnover, and given prices of the elements of fluid productive capital, the price of the products of business X falls or rises. If the price of the commodities supplied by business X falls, then the price of its commodity capital of 600 pounds, which it is constantly casting into circulation, sinks to 500 pounds, for example. Thus, a sixth of the value of the capital advance does not return from the circulation process. The surplus value concealed in the commodity capital is left out of consideration here. It is lost in it. But since the value or price of the elements of production remains the same, this reflux of 500 pounds is only sufficient to replace five-sixths of the capital of 600 pounds engaged in the production process. 100 pounds of additional money capital must be advanced, therefore, if production is to be continued on the same scale. Conversely, if the price of the products of business X rose, then the price of the commodity capital would rise from 600 pounds to, say, 700 pounds. A seventh of its price, 100 pounds, does not derive from the production process, was not advanced to it, but rather flows in from the circulation process. But still, only 600 pounds is needed to replace the productive elements, and so 100 pounds is set free. The reason why, in the first case, the turnover period is reduced or prolonged, and in the second case, the prices of raw materials and labor, in the third case, the prices of the product supplied, rise or fall, does not belong within the orbit of our investigation so far. What does belong here, however, is this. Case 1. Scale of production remaining the same. Constant prices of elements of production and products change in the period of circulation, and hence in the turnover period. On the assumptions of our example, one-ninth less total capital is needed as a result of the reduction in the circulation period, so that this capital is reduced from 900 pounds to 800 pounds, and 100 pounds in money capital is precipitated out. Business X continues to supply the same six weekly product with the same value of 600 pounds, and since work continues uninterruptedly throughout the year, it turns out in 51 weeks the same quantity of products, with a value of 5,100 pounds. Thus, as far as the quantity and price of the product that the business casts into circulation is concerned, no change takes place, and so neither is there a change in the terms on which it is put into the market. But 100 pounds is precipitated, since by reducing the circulation period, the process can be completed with a capital advance of 800 pounds, instead of 900 as previously. The 100 pounds of capital that has been precipitated exists in the form of money capital, but this is in no way the same part of the capital advance that always had to function in the form of money capital. Let us suppose that, of the fluid capital, one, 600 pounds, that was advanced, four-fifths was always laid out on materials of production, making 480 pounds, and one-fifth, equaling 120 pounds, on wages. Capital two, 300 pounds, must therefore be similarly divided into four-fifths totaling 240 pounds for material elements of production and one-fifth totaling 60 pounds for wages. The capital laid out on wages must always be advanced in the money form. As soon as the commodity product, to the sum of 600 pounds, has been transformed back into the money form, has been sold, 480 pounds of it can be transformed into material elements of production, into a productive stock, but 120 pounds maintains its money form to serve for six weeks' payment of wages. This 120 pounds is the minimum part of the returned capital of 600 pounds, which must always be replaced and renewed in the form of money capital, and hence must always be present as a part of the capital advance which functions in the money form. Now if, of the 300 pounds that is periodically set free for three weeks and is also divisible into a productive stock of 240 pounds and wages of 60 pounds, 100 is precipitated out in the form of money capital as a result of the reduced circulation time, being completely withdrawn from the turnover mechanism, the question arises. Where does the money for this 100 pounds money capital come from? Only a fifth part of it consists of the money capital periodically set free within the turnovers. The remaining four-fifths, 80 pounds, has already been replaced by additional productive stock of the same value. By what means is this additional productive stock transformed into money, and where does the money for this conversion come from? If the reduction in circulation time has already taken place, then only 400 pounds out of the above 600, instead of 480, is transformed back into a production stock. 
The remaining 80 pounds is kept in its money form and composes, together with the above 20 pounds for wages, the 100 pounds of capital precipitated. Even though this 100 pounds is derived from the circulation sphere, by the sale of the 600 pounds commodity capital, and is now withdrawn from this, insofar as it is not laid out again on wages and materials of production, it should not be forgotten that, in the money form, it is once more in the same form as that in which it was originally cast into circulation. At the beginning, 900 pounds in money was laid out on production stock and wages. In order to keep the same production process going, only 800 pounds is now needed. The 100 pounds thus precipitated out in the money form now constitutes a new money capital seeking investment, a new element on the money market. Certainly, it already existed periodically in the form of money capital set free and in the form of superfluous productive capital, but these latent states were themselves conditions for the accomplishment of the process, as preconditions of its continuity. Now they are no longer needed, and therefore form new money capital and a component of the money market, even though they are in no way either a superfluous element of the existing social money stock, since they existed at the start of the business and were cast into circulation by it, or a newly accumulated hoard. This 100 pounds now really is withdrawn from circulation, inasmuch as it is a part of the money capital advance that is no longer applied in the same business. But this withdrawal is only possible because the transformation of commodity capital into money, and of this money into productive capital, C prime to M to C, has been accelerated by a week, so that the circulation of the money engaged in this process is also similarly accelerated. It has been withdrawn from circulation because it is no longer needed for the turnover of capital X. It is assumed here that the capital advance belongs to the person who uses it. It would, however, in no way change things if it were borrowed. With the reduction in circulation time, only 800 pounds of borrowed capital would be needed instead of 900 pounds. If 100 pounds were repaid to its lender, this would once again form additional money capital, only it would be in Y's hands instead of X's. Furthermore, if capitalist X receives his material elements of production to the value of 480 pounds on credit, so that all he has to advance himself in money is 120 pounds for wages, he would now have to obtain on credit an amount of the material elements of production to the value of 80 pounds less, which is therefore so much additional commodity capital for the credit-giving capitalist, while capitalist X has also precipitated out 20 pounds in money. The additional production stock is now reduced by one-third. It was previously 240 pounds, four-fifths of 300 pounds, the additional capital too. It is now only 160 pounds, i.e. an additional stock for two weeks instead of three. It is now replaced every two weeks instead of every three, but this is stock only for two weeks instead of for three. Purchases, on the cotton market, for instance, are repeated more frequently and in smaller quantities. The same amount of cotton is withdrawn from the market since the quantity produced remains the same, but the withdrawal is differently distributed in time and over a longer period. Let us assume, for instance, that there was originally a renewal of the production stock every three months and a subsequent reduction of the renewal time to two months. The annual consumption of cotton is 1,200 bales. In the first case, sales were as follows. On the 1st of January, 300 bales, leaving 900 bales in the warehouse. On the 1st of April, 300 bales, leaving 600 bales in the warehouse. On the 1st of July, 300 more, leaving 300 in the warehouse. And on the 1st of October, 300 bales, leaving none in the warehouse. In the second case, on the other hand, we have, on the 1st of January, 200 bales sold, leaving 1,000 in the warehouse. The 1st of March, 200, leaving 800 in the warehouse. The 1st of May, a further 200, leaving 600 in the warehouse. To the 1st of July, of 200, leaving 400 in the warehouse. And the 1st of September, a further 200, leaving 200 more in the warehouse. And the 1st of November, selling 200 and leaving none in the warehouse. The money invested in cotton, therefore, only completes its return one month later, in November instead of in October. Thus, if as a result of the reduction in the circulation time, and hence in the turnover, one-ninth of the capital advanced, i.e. 100 pounds, is precipitated out in the form of money capital, and this 100 pounds is composed of 20 pounds that was a periodic excess money capital for the payment of wages, and 80 pounds that previously existed as a periodic excess production stock for one week, then corresponding to this 80 pounds reduction in the surplus production stock on the part of the manufacturer, there will be an increased commodity stock in the hands of the cotton broker. The same cotton lies as much longer in the broker's warehouse as a commodity as it exists for a shorter time as a production stock in the stores of the manufacturer. We previously assumed that the reduction in circulation time in X's business depended on X selling his commodities more quickly, or else being paid for it more quickly, i.e. on a reduction in the length of credit. Such a reduction is based on reducing time for the sale of the commodity, i.e. for the transformation of commodity capital into money capital, C' prime to M, the first phase of the circulation process. It could also arise, however, from the second phase, M to C, i.e. from a simultaneous alteration either in the working period or in the circulation time of capitals Y, Z, etc., 
which supply capitalist X with the elements of production of his fluid capital. If cotton, coal, etc., for instance, took three weeks with the old means of transport to travel from their place of production or their depot to the site of capitalist X's place of production, then the minimum productive stock that X had to hold pending the arrival of new stocks had to be sufficient for at least three weeks. As long as cotton and coal are in transit, they cannot serve as means of production. They form instead the object of labor for the transport industry and the capital employed in it, and commodity capital in circulation for the coal producer or the cotton broker. Now let improved means of transport reduce the journey to two weeks. The production stock can then be transformed from a three-week supply into one of two weeks. An additional capital of 80 pounds that was advanced is now set free, and so is 20 pounds for wages, because the capital of 600 pounds completes its turnover and returns one week sooner. If, on the other hand, the working period of the capital that supplies the raw material is reduced, as in the examples given in the previous chapters, then it also becomes possible to replace the raw material in less time. This then permits a reduction in the productive stock, and a shortening in the time between one replacement period and the next. If, inversely, the circulation time and hence the turnover period is prolonged, an advance of additional capital is needed. This comes from the pockets of the capitalist himself if he possesses extra capital. But this will have been invested in some form or other as a part of the money market. In order to make it available, it must be prized out from its old form. For example, shares sold, deposits withdrawn, so that here, too, there is an indirect effect on the money market. Alternatively, the capitalist has to raise the capital. As far as the part of the capital needed for wages is concerned, in normal circumstances this is always advanced as money capital, and to this extent capitalist X exerts his share of direct pressure on the money market. For the part to be invested in raw materials, etc., this is only indispensable if he has to pay cash. If he can get it on credit, then he does not exert a direct influence on the money market, as the additional capital is then advanced directly as a productive stock, and not in the first instance as money capital. Insofar as his creditor directly puts the bill received from X back into the money market, has it discounted, etc., this has an indirect, second-hand effect on the money market. But if he uses this bill to meet a debt that he has later to settle, then this additionally advanced capital has neither a direct nor an indirect effect on the money market. Case 2. Change in the price of materials of production, all other circumstances being unchanged. We have just assumed that, of the total capital of 900 pounds, four-fifths, totaling 720 pounds, is laid out on material elements of production, and one-fifth, totaling 180 pounds, on wages. If the price of raw materials, etc., falls by half, then these require only 240 pounds for the six-week working period, instead of 480 pounds, and only 120 pounds in additional capital two, instead of 240. Capital one is now reduced from 600 pounds to 240 plus 120, totaling 360 pounds and capital two from 300 pounds to 120 plus 60, totaling 180 pounds. The total capital of 900 pounds is reduced to 360 plus 180, totaling 540 pounds. 360 pounds is thus precipitated. This precipitated money capital, which is now unoccupied and is therefore seeking investment on the money market, is simply a fragment of the capital of 900 pounds originally advanced as money capital, which has now become superfluous, owing to the fall in the price of the elements of production into which it is periodically transformed. That is, if the business is not expanded, but rather continued on the old scale. If this fall in price was not due to accidental circumstances, a particularly good harvest, oversupply, etc., but to an increased productivity in the branch of industry that supplies the raw material, then the unoccupied money capital would be an absolute addition to the money market, an absolute addition to the capital available in the form of money capital, because it has ceased to form an integral component of the capital already invested. Case 3 change in the market price of the product itself. In the case of a fall in price, a part of the capital is lost and is therefore to be replaced by a new advance of money capital. This loss for the seller may be recouped by the buyer. Directly, if the market price of the product has been affected only by accidental conjunctures, and the price subsequently rises again to its normal level. Indirectly, if the change in price has been brought about by a change in value reacting on the old product, and if this product again enters another sphere of production as an element of production and sets free a proportionate amount of capital there. In both cases, the capital lost by X, capital which he endeavors to replace by exerting pressure on the money market, can be supplied by his business friends as new additional capital. There is then only a transfer. If the price of the product rises, on the other hand, then a portion of capital that was not advanced is appropriated from the circulation sphere. This is not an organic part of the capital advanced in the production process, and if production is not extended, it forms precipitated money capital. Though it is assumed here that the prices of the elements of the product were given before the latter entered the market as commodity capital, this price increase could still have been caused by a real change in value, to the extent that this had a retroactive effect. 
for example, if raw materials had subsequently risen in value. In this case, capitalist X would have profited both on his product, circulating as commodity capital, and on his existing production stock. This profit would then supply him with the additional capital he now needs to carry on his business as a result of the increased prices of the elements of production. Alternatively, the price rise might only be transitory. What one capitalist then needs as extra capital is precipitated out elsewhere to the extent that his product forms an element of production for other branches of business. What the one lost, the other is gained. Chapter 16. The Turnover of Variable Capital Section 1. The Annual Rate of Surplus Value Let us take a circulating capital of 2,500 pounds, with four-fifths of this, 2,000 pounds, being constant capital, material elements of production, and one-fifth, 500 pounds, being variable capital, capital laid out on wages. Let the turnover period be five weeks, the working period four weeks, and the circulation period one week. Capital 1 is then 2,000 pounds, consisting of 1,600 pounds constant capital and 400 pounds variable capital. Capital 2 is 500 pounds, of which 400 pounds is constant and 100 pounds variable. In each working week, a capital of 500 pounds is laid out. In a year of 50 weeks, an annual product of 50 times 500, totaling 25,000 pounds, is produced. The capital 1 of 2,000 pounds that is applied in each working period thus turns over 12 and one-half times. 12 and one-half times 2,000 is 25,000 pounds. Of this 25,000 pounds, four-fifths, totaling 20,000, is constant capital, laid out on means of production, and one-fifth, 5,000 pounds, is variable, laid out on wages. The total capital of 2,500 pounds, on the other hand, turns over 25,000 over 2,500, totaling 10 times. The variable circulating capital, expended in the course of production, can serve again in the circulation process only to the extent that the product in which its value is reproduced is sold, transformed from commodity capital into money capital, so that it can be laid out anew in payment for labor power. But this is just the same for the constant circulating capital laid out in production, on materials, whose value also reappears as a portion of the value of the product. What these two parts of the circulating capital, the constant and the variable, have in common, and what distinguishes them from fixed capital, is not that the value they have transferred to the product is circulated by commodity capital, i.e. circulates through the circulation of the product as a commodity. A portion of the product's value, and hence of the product itself circulating as a commodity, of the commodity capital, always consists of the wear and tear of the fixed capital, or the part of the fixed capital's value that it has transferred to the product in the course of production. The difference is rather that the fixed capital continues to function in the productive process in its old shape, through a longer or shorter cycle of turnover periods of the circulating capital, that is, the circulating constant plus the circulating variable capital, while any single turnover has as its precondition the replacement of the entire circulating capital that enters the circulation sphere from the production sphere in the shape of commodity capital. The first phase of circulation, C' prime to M' prime, is common to both fluid constant and fluid variable capital. In the second phase, these separate. The money into which the commodity is transformed back is partly converted into a production stock, circulating constant capital. According to the different terms of purchase of the components of this stock, one part of the money may be converted into materials of production earlier, another part later, but eventually it goes into these completely. A further part of the money released by the sale of the commodity remains in the form of a money reserve, to be spent bit by bit in payment for the labor power incorporated into the production process. It forms the circulating variable capital. Nonetheless, the entire replacement of one or the other part derives each time from the turnover of the capital, its transformation into a product, from product into commodity, and from commodity into money. This is the reason why, in the previous chapter, we could treat the turnover of both constant and variable capital together as a separate theme, without regard to the fixed capital. For the question that we have to deal with now, we must go one step further and treat the variable part of the circulating capital as if it alone formed the circulating capital. In other words, we shall disregard here the constant circulating capital that turns over together with the variable capital. £2,500 has been advanced, and the value of the annual product is £25,000. But the variable part of the circulating capital is £500. Hence, the variable capital contained in the £25,000 is £5,000. If we divide the £5,000 by 500, then we get the number of turnovers, 10, just as with the total capital of £2,500. This average calculation, in which the value of the annual product is divided by the value of the capital advanced and not by the value of that part of this capital that is constantly applied in a particular working period, 
i.e., in this case, not by 400, but by 500, not by capital 1, but rather capital 1 plus capital 2, is here, where only the production of surplus value is at issue, absolutely exact. We shall see later on, though, that from another point of view it is inexact, just as this average calculation in general is not quite exact. It is sufficient for the practical purposes of the capitalist, but it does not adequately or precisely express all the real circumstances of the turnover. Up to now, we have completely left out of account one part of the value of the commodity capital, i.e. the surplus value contained in it, which is produced during the production process and has been incorporated into the product. This is what we have now to turn our attention to. Let us assume that the variable capital of 100 pounds laid out each week produces a surplus value of 100%, totaling 100 pounds. Then the variable capital of 500 pounds laid out in the course of the turnover period of five weeks produces a surplus value of 500 pounds i.e., half of the working day consists of surplus labor. But if a variable capital of 500 pounds produces 500 pounds, then 5,000 produces a surplus value of 10 times 500, totaling 5,000 pounds. The variable capital advanced, however, is 500 pounds. The ratio of the total surplus value annually produced to the value of the variable capital advanced we call the annual rate of surplus value. In the present case, this is 5,000 over 500, totaling 1,000%. If we analyze this rate more closely, it is clear that it is equal to the rate of surplus value that the variable capital advance produces during one turnover period multiplied by the number of turnovers of the variable capital, which is the same as the number of turnovers of the total circulating capital. The variable capital advanced in one turnover period is 500 pounds, in the present case, and the surplus value produced in it is also 500 pounds. The rate of surplus value in one turnover period is therefore 500s over 500v, totaling 100%. This 100% multiplied by 10, the number of turnovers in the year, gives 5,000s over 500v, totaling 1,000%. This holds for the annual rate of surplus value. But as far as the mass of the surplus value obtained during a particular turnover period is concerned, this is equal to the value of the variable capital advanced during this period, here 500 pounds, multiplied by the rate of surplus value, here 500 times 100 over 100, equaling 500 times 1, equaling 500 pounds. If the capital advance was 1,500 pounds with the same rate of surplus value, then the mass of surplus value would be 1,500 times 100 over 100, totaling 1,500 pounds. The variable capital of 500 pounds, which turns over 10 times in the year, producing an annual surplus value of 5,000 pounds, its annual rate of surplus value thus being 1,000%, we shall call capital A. Let us now suppose that another variable capital B of 5,000 pounds is advanced for a whole year i.e. here for 50 weeks, and hence turns over only once in the year. We further assume that the product is paid for at the end of the year on the same day that it is finished, so that the money capital into which it is transformed returns the same day. The circulation period is here now zero. The turnover period is the same as the working period, i.e. one year. As in the previous case, a variable capital of 100 pounds is in the labor process each week, hence 5,000 pounds in 50 weeks. The rate of surplus value is also the same, 100%, i.e. with the working day of the same length, half of this consists of surplus labor. If we take five weeks, then the variable capital applied is 500 pounds, the rate of surplus value 100%, and the mass of surplus value created during the five weeks is therefore 500 pounds. The amount of labor power that is exploited, and the degree of its exploitation, are exactly the same here, on the assumptions made, as in capital A. In any one week, the variable capital of 100 pounds that is applied produces a surplus value of 100 pounds. And so in 50 weeks, the capital of 50 times 100, equaling 5,000 pounds, produces a surplus value of 5,000 pounds. The mass of surplus value annually produced is the same as in the previous case, 5,000 pounds, but the annual rate of surplus value is quite different. Here, the surplus value produced during the year, divided by the variable capital advanced, is 5,000 S over 5,000 V, 100%, whereas for capital A, it was 1,000%. In the case of both capital A and capital B, we have the expenditure of 100 pounds variable capital each week. The degree of valorization, or the rate of surplus value, is the same, 100%, and the magnitude of the variable capital is also the same, 100 pounds. The same amount of labor power is exploited, and the degree and scale of exploitation are in both cases the same. The working days are equal and similarly divided into necessary labor and surplus labor. The sum of variable capital applied during the year is equally large, 5,000 pounds, and sets the same amount of labor in motion, while the same mass of surplus value is extracted from the labor power set in motion by the two equal capitals, 5,000 pounds. Yet, there is a difference of 900% in the annual rate of surplus value between A and B. 
This phenomenon makes it appear, moreover, as if the rate of surplus value did not depend only on the amount of variable capital and the rate of exploitation of the labor power set in motion by it, but also on inexplicable influences deriving from the circulation process. And in fact, the phenomenon has been interpreted in this way, if not in this pure form, then at least in its more complicated and concealed form, that of the annual rate of profit. Since the beginning of the 1820s, this phenomenon has led to the complete destruction of the Ricardian school. However, its strangeness immediately disappears if we really do place capitals A and B in exactly the same conditions, and do not just appear to do so. The same conditions obtain only if the variable capital B is wholly spent on payment of labor power in the same interval of time as capital A. The £5,000 of capital B is then paid out in five weeks, £1,000 per week, giving an outlay of £50,000 over the year. The surplus value is now also £50,000 under our assumptions. The capital turned over, £50,000, divided by the capital advanced, £5,000, gives the number of turnovers, 10. The rate of surplus value, 5,000S over 5,000V, equals 100%. Multiplied by the number of turnovers, 10, gives the annual rate of surplus value, 50,000S over 5,000V, 10 over 1 being 1,000%. The annual rates of surplus value for A and B are now the same, i.e. 1,000%, but the mass of surplus value is, for B, 50,000 pounds and for A, 5,000 pounds. The masses of surplus values produced are now in the same ratio as the capital values B and A that were advanced i.e. 5,000 to 500 being 10 to 1. This is the reason why capital B could set 10 times as much labor power in motion in the same time as capital A. It is only the capital actually operating in the labor process which creates surplus value, and to which all the laws given for surplus value apply, including the law that, with a given rate of surplus value, the mass of surplus value is given by the relative magnitude of the variable capital. The labor process itself is measured by time. The length of the working day being given, as it is here where we assume equality between capital A and capital B in all circumstances, in order to present the differences in the annual rate of surplus value in a clear light, the working week consists of a definite number of working days. Alternatively, we can treat each working period, for example here a five-week one, as a single working day of 300 hours, for example if the working day is 10 hours and the week six working days. We must then multiply this figure by the number of workers who are employed alongside one another each day in the same labor process. If this number was 10, for example, then the weekly total would be 60 times 10, totaling 600 hours, and a five-week working period would amount to 600 times 5 being 3,000 hours. Variable capitals at the same side are thus applied if, with the same rate of surplus value and the same length of working day, equal amounts of labor power, one labor power of the given price multiplied by the given number of workers, are set in motion in the same interval of time. Let us now return to our original examples. In both cases, A and B, equal variable capitals, 100 pounds per week, are applied each week of the year. The variable capitals that are applied, and actually function in the labor process, are therefore the same but the variable capitals advanced are quite unequal. With A, 500 pounds is advanced every five weeks, and 100 pounds of this is applied each week. With B, 5,000 pounds has to be advanced for the first five-week period, but out of this only 100 pounds per week, and thus in these five weeks only 500 pounds. One-tenth of the capital advanced is actually applied. In the second five-week period, 4,500 pounds has to be advanced, but only 500 pounds is applied, and so on. The variable capital advanced for a certain period of time is transformed into applied, i.e. really functioning and effective, variable capital only to the degree that it actually does enter those sections of the period of time in question that are filled by the labor process, and really does function in this labor process. In the intervening period in which a part of it is advanced for application only at a later date, this part is as good as non-existent for the labor process, and thus does not have any influence on the formation of either value or surplus value. Take capital A of 500 pounds, for instance. It is advanced for five weeks, but each week only 100 pounds of it successively enters the labor process. In the first week, one-fifth of it is applied. Four-fifths is advanced without being applied, although since it must be on hand for the labor process of the four following weeks, it must certainly be advanced. The circumstances that differentiate the ratio between the advanced and the applied variable capital affect the production of surplus value, at a given rate of profit, only insofar as they differentiate the amount of variable capital which can actually be applied in a definite period of time, for example in one week, five weeks, etc. The variable capital advanced functions as variable capital only to the extent that it is actually applied, and during the time for which it is applied, not during the time in which it remains advanced in reserve without being applied. 
But all circumstances that differentiate the ratio between advanced and applied variable capital can be summed up in the difference in turnover periods, determined by a difference either in working periods or in circulation periods or in both. The law of surplus value production is that, with the same rate of surplus value, equal amounts of functioning variable capital create equal masses of surplus value. So, if equal amounts of variable capital are applied by capitals A and B for the same space of time at the same rate of surplus value, then they must produce equal amounts of surplus value in this time, no matter how different may be the ratio between the variable capital applied in the time in question and the variable capital advanced during the same time, and hence how different also the ratio between the mass of surplus value produced and the total variable capital advanced, rather than that actually applied. The variation of this ratio, instead of contradicting the laws put forward for the production of surplus value, rather confirms these, and is an inescapable consequence of them. Let us consider the first five-week production period of capital B. At the end of week five, 500 pounds has been applied and consumed. The value produced is 1,000 pounds, 500 S over 500 V totaling 100%. It is just the same with capital A. The fact that capital A has realized its surplus value along with the capital advanced while B has not is of no importance to us here, where the issue is simply the production of surplus value and its ratio to the variable capital advance during its production. If, on the other hand, we calculate the ratio of the surplus value in B to the total capital of £5,000 advanced and not to that part of the capital that is applied during its production and hence consumed, then we get 500S over 5,000V totaling one-tenth, totaling 10%. That is, 10% for capital B as against 100%, 10 times as much for capital A. If it be said here that this difference in the rate of surplus value for capitals of equal magnitude, which have set in motion an equal quantity of labor, and moreover labor that is divided into the same portions of paid and unpaid labor, contradicts the laws of surplus value production, the answer is simple, and given by a mere glance at the factual relations. For A, it is the actual rate of surplus value that is expressed here i.e. the ratio of the surplus value produced during five weeks by a variable capital of 500 pounds to this variable capital of 500 pounds. For B, on the other hand, the mode of reckoning is one that has nothing to do with either the production of surplus value or the corresponding determination of the rate of surplus value. The 500 pounds surplus value which has been produced by the variable capital of 500 pounds is in fact not calculated on the basis of the 500 pounds variable capital that is advanced during its production, but rather on a capital of 5,000 pounds, nine-tenths of which, i.e. 4,500 pounds, has nothing at all to do with the production of this surplus value of 500 pounds, but is rather designed to function gradually, over the course of the following 45 weeks, and does not exist at all as far as the production of the first five weeks goes, which is all that we are concerned with here. In this case, therefore, the difference in the rate of surplus value between A and B is no problem at all. Let us now compare the annual rates of surplus value for capitals A and B. For capital B, we have 5,000 S over 5,000 V, totaling 100%. For capital A, 5,000 S over 500 V, totaling 1,000%. The ratio of the surplus value rates, however, is still the same as before. Then we get surplus value rate for capital B over surplus value rate for capital A, totaling 10% over 100%. And now we have the annual rate of surplus value for capital B being 100% over the annual rate of surplus value for capital A being 1,000%. But 10% over 100% is equal to 100% over 1,000%, the same ratio as before. For all that, the problem has now been turned round the other way. The annual rate for capital B, 5,000 S over 5,000 V, being 100%, does not present the slightest divergence, not even the shadow of a divergence from the laws of surplus value production which we already knew, and the rate of surplus value corresponding to these. 5,000 V has already been advanced during the year and productively consumed, having produced 5,000 S. The rate of surplus value is thus the above fraction 5,000 S over 5,000 V, 100%. The annual rate of surplus value agrees with the actual rate. This time, it is not capital B that presents the anomaly to be explained, as it did last time, but rather capital A. Here, we have the rate of surplus value 5,000 S over 500 V, totaling 1,000%. But if in the first case 500, the product of five weeks, was calculated on a capital advance of 5,000 pounds, nine-tenths of which was not applied in its production, now 5,000 S is calculated on the basis of 500 V, i.e. only on one-tenth of the variable capital that was really applied in the production of 5,000 S. For the 5,000 S is the product of a variable capital of 5,000 pounds that is productively consumed over 50 weeks and not of the capital of 500 pounds used during one single five-week period. 
In the first case, the surplus value produced during five weeks was calculated on the capital that was advanced for 50 weeks, i.e. a capital ten times greater than that used during the five weeks. Now, the surplus value produced in 50 weeks is calculated on the capital which was advanced for five weeks, and which is thus ten times smaller than that used during the 50 weeks. Capital A of 500 pounds is not advanced for any longer than five weeks. At the end of this period it returns, and can repeat the same process ten times in the course of the year by turning over ten times. Two things follow from this. Firstly, the capital advanced in case A is only five times greater than the portion of capital applied than any one week's production process. Capital B, on the other hand, which turns over only once in 50 weeks, must therefore also be advanced for 50 weeks, and is 50 times greater than the part of the capital that can ever be applied in one week. The turnover time thus modifies the ratio between the capital advanced for the production process during the year and the capital applied for any given production period, for example the week. And this gives us the first case, in which the surplus value of five weeks is reckoned not on the capital applied during these five weeks, but rather on the ten times greater capital that is applied over fifty weeks. Secondly, the turnover period of capital A, five weeks, comprises only one-tenth of the year. The year, therefore, includes ten such turnover periods, in which capital A of five hundred pounds is each time applied afresh. The capital applied here is equal to the capital advance for five weeks multiplied by the number of turnover periods in the year. The capital applied during the year is 500 times 10, totaling 5,000 pounds. The capital advanced during the year is 5,000 divided by 10, totaling 500 pounds. In point of fact, even though the 500 pounds is always applied afresh, never more than the same 500 pounds is applied every five weeks. In the case of capital B, it is still only 500 pounds that is applied in advance for these five weeks. But since the turnover period is now 50 weeks, the capital applied during the year is the same as the capital advanced not for every 5 weeks but for every 50. The mass of surplus value produced annually, however, is governed, at a given rate of surplus value, by the capital applied during the year, and not by that advanced. Thus it is no greater for this capital of £5,000 that turns over once than it is for the capital of £500 that turns over 10 times. And the only reason why it is the size it is, is that the capital that turns over once in the year is itself ten times greater than that turning over ten times. The variable capital turned over during the year, i.e. the part of the annual product or the annual expenditure equal to this part, is the variable capital actually applied and productively consumed in the course of the year. It follows, therefore, that if the variable capital A turned over annually and the variable capital B turned over annually are the same, and they are applied under the same conditions of valorization, the rate of surplus value must be the same for both. And since the masses of capital applied are the same, so must be the annually reckoned rate of surplus value, as long as it is expressed as the mass of surplus value annually produced over the annual turnover of variable capital. To express it more generally, whatever may be the relative magnitudes of the variable capitals turned over, the rate of surplus value that they produce in the course of a year is determined by the rate of surplus value at which the respective capitals have operated in average periods, for example on a weekly or even daily average. This is the only possible result that follows from the laws of surplus value production and those determining the rate of surplus value. Let us now look once again at what the ratio annual turnover of capital over capital advanced expresses. We are dealing here only with the variable capital, as already stated. The quotient gives the number of turnovers of the capital advanced in one year. For capital A, we have 5,000 pounds capital annually turned over, over 500 pounds capital advanced. For capital B, that is 5,000 pounds annually turned over, over 5,000 pounds advanced. In both ratios, the numerator expresses the capital advanced multiplied by the number of turnovers. For A, 500 times 10, for B, 5,000 times 1. Alternatively, the capital is multiplied by the reciprocal of the turnover time, reckoned in terms of a year. The turnover time for A is one-tenth of a year. The reciprocal of this is 10 over 1, and 500 times 10 over 1 is 5,000. For B, 5,000 times 1 over 1 is equal to 5,000. The denominator expresses the capital turned over multiplied by the reciprocal of the number of turnovers. For A, 5,000 times 1 over 10. For B, 5,000 times 1 over 1. The respective quantities of labor, the sum of the paid and the unpaid labor, that are set in motion are the same here, since the capitals turned over are the same, and so are their rates of valorization. The ratio between the variable capital annually turned over and that advanced indicates, firstly, the ratio in which the capital to be advanced stands to the variable capital applied in a certain working period. If the number of turnovers is 10, as under A, and the year is taken as 50 weeks, then the turnover time is 5 weeks. 
This five weeks is the time for which the variable capital has to be advanced, and the capital advanced for five weeks must be five times larger than the variable capital applied during one week. That is to say, only one-fifth of the capital advanced, here 500 pounds, can be applied in the course of a week. In the case of capital B, on the other hand, where the number of turnovers is 1 over 1, the turnover time is one year, totaling 50 weeks. The ratio of the capital advanced to that applied week by week is therefore 50 to 1. If the situation was the same for B as for A, then B would have to apply 1,000 pounds each week instead of 100. Secondly, it follows that B has applied a capital 10 times as great as A, i.e. 5,000 pounds, in order to set in motion the same amount of variable capital. Thus, with a given rate of surplus value, the same quantity of labor, both paid and unpaid, and thus to produce the same mass of surplus value in the course of the year. The real rate of surplus value expresses nothing more than the ratio of the variable capital applied in a given period of time to the surplus value produced in the same period, or the mass of unpaid labor that the variable capital applied during this time sets in motion. It has absolutely nothing to do with the portion of variable capital that is advanced during the time in which it is not applied, and hence just as little to do with the ratio between the part of it advanced for a definite period of time and that applied during the same period, a ratio which is modified and differentiated by the turnover period. It rather follows from what has already been developed that the annual rate of surplus value coincides with the real rate of surplus value, that which expresses the degree of exploitation of labor only in a single case. Namely, when the capital advance turns over only once in the year, so that the capital advanced is equal to the capital turned over during the year, and the ratio of the mass of surplus value produced during the year to the capital applied during the year for the purpose of this production coincides and is identical with the ratio between the mass of surplus value produced during the year and the capital advanced for the year. In the case of A, the annual rate of surplus value is the mass of surplus value produced during the year over the variable capital advanced. But the mass of surplus value produced during the year equals the real rate of surplus value multiplied by the variable capital applied in its production. The capital applied for the production of the annual mass of surplus value is equal to the capital advanced multiplied by the number of its turnovers, which we shall call n. The formula for A is thus transformed into B. The annual rate of surplus value is the real rate of surplus value times the variable capital advanced times n over the variable capital advanced. For example, for capital B, 100% times 5,000 times 1 over 5,000, or 100%. Only in the case that n equals 1, i.e. if the variable capital advance turns over only once in the year, and is thus equal to the capital applied or turned over in the year, is the annual rate of surplus value equal to the real rate of surplus value. Let us call the annual rate of surplus value S prime, the real rate of surplus value small s prime, and the variable capital advance small v, and the number of turnovers n. Then S prime is equal to small s prime times V times N over V, and also equal to small s prime times N, i.e. S prime is equal to small s prime times N, and is only equal to small s prime if N is equal to 1, when S prime times small s prime times 1 is equal to small s prime. It follows that the annual rate of surplus value is always small s prime times N i.e. the real rate of surplus value produced in a turnover period by the variable capital consumed during this period multiplied by the number of turnovers of this variable capital during the year, or, what is the same thing, multiplied by the reciprocal of its turnover time, reckoned on the basis of a year. If the variable capital turns over ten times in the year, then its turnover time is one-tenth of a year. The reciprocal of this is therefore ten over one, equaling ten. It follows further that s prime is equal to small s prime if n equals one. S prime is greater than small s prime if n is greater than 1, i.e. if the capital advance turns over more than once in the year, so that the capital turned over is greater than that advanced. Finally, S prime is smaller than small s prime if n is less than 1, i.e. if the capital turned over during the year is only one part of the capital advanced, and the turnover period thus lasts for longer than a year. Let us pause for a moment to consider this last case. We keep all the assumptions made in our earlier example, but simply extend the turnover period to 55 weeks. The labor process demands 100 pounds in variable capital each week, and thus 5,500 pounds for the turnover period, and each week it produces 100 S. Small s prime is thus 100%, as before. The number of turnovers is now 50 over 55, equaling 10 over 11, since the turnover time is 1 plus 1 16th years, the year taken as 50 weeks, totaling 11 over 10 years. S prime is equal to 100% times 5,500 times 10 over 11, over 5,500, 
which is also equal to 100 times 10 over 11, which is equal to 1,000 over 11, and finally, equal to 90 and 10 elevenths percent, i.e. less than 100%. In point of fact, if the annual rate of surplus value were 100%, then 5,500 V would have to produce 5,500 S in a year, whereas it actually now takes 11 tenths years for this. The 5,500 V produces only 5,000 S in the course of the year giving an annual rate of surplus value of 5,000 S over 5,500 V, equaling 10 over 11, equaling 90 and 10 elevenths percent. The annual rate of surplus value, or the comparison between the surplus value produced during the year and the total variable capital advanced, as distinct from the variable capital turned over during the year, is therefore not something merely subjective, but a comparison produced by the actual movement of capital itself. For the owner of capital A receives back at the end of the year his variable capital of 500 pounds together with a surplus value of 5,000 pounds. What expresses the size of the capital he has advanced is not the quantity of capital that he has applied during the year, but that which periodically flows back to him. That the capital may exist at the end of the year partly as a production stock and partly as commodity or money capital adds nothing to the question in hand, nor does the ratio in which it is divided between these various portions. The owner of capital B receives back 5,000 pounds, his capital advanced, together with 5,000 pounds surplus value. The owner of capital C, that of 5,500 pounds last introduced, has produced 5,000 pounds surplus value during the year. 5,000 pounds outlay with a rate of surplus value of 100%, but his capital advanced has not yet returned to him, and so neither has the surplus value it has produced. The equation that S prime is equal to small s prime times n expresses the fact that the rate of surplus value on the variable capital applied during a turnover period, this rate being determined by the mass of surplus value produced during a turnover period over the variable capital applied during a turnover period, has to be multiplied by the number of turnover periods or reproduction periods of the variable capital advanced, the number of periods in which it repeats its circuit. We have already seen in Volume 1, Chapter 4, the general formula for capital, and again in Chapter 23, Simple Reproduction, how the capital value is always advanced and not genuinely spent, and that once this value has gone through the various phases of its circuit, it returns again to its starting point, and moreover it does so enriched with surplus value. This is what characterizes it as advanced. The time that elapses between its point of departure and its point of return is the time for which it is advanced. The entire circuit which the capital value undergoes, measured by the time from its advance to its reflux, forms its turnover, and the duration of this turnover is a turnover period. Once this period has elapsed, the circuit is at an end, and the same capital value can begin the same circuit afresh, and thus also valorize itself afresh and again produce surplus value. If the variable capital turns over ten times in a year, as A does, then the mass of surplus value produced in the course of the year will be ten times that corresponding to one turnover period. The nature of the advance must now be investigated from the standpoint of capitalist society as a whole. Capital A, which turns over ten times during the year, is advanced ten times in the course of the year. It is advanced afresh for each new turnover period. But at the same time, all that the owner of A ever advances during the year is the same capital value of 500 pounds, and all that he ever has at his disposal for the production process we are considering is 500 pounds. Once this 500 pounds has completed a circuit, he lets the same circuit begin anew. Capital, by its very nature, only maintains its capital character precisely by functioning as capital in ever-repeated production processes. It is never advanced for longer than five weeks. If the turnover lasts for longer, this capital is not sufficient. If it is reduced, then a part of this capital is superfluous. It is not ten capitals of 500 pounds that are advanced, but one capital of 500 pounds advanced ten times in succession at different intervals of time. Hence, the annual rate of surplus value is not calculated on a capital of 500 pounds advanced 10 times, i.e. on 5,000 pounds, but rather on a capital of 500 pounds advanced once, just as when a shilling circulates 10 times, there is still only one shilling in circulation, even though it performs the functions of 10 shillings. However, no matter in whose hands it exists for the moment, it remains as always the same identical value of one shilling. Capital A shows in just the same way, each time it returns, including its returns at the end of the year, that its owner has always operated simply with the same capital value of 500 pounds. All that he receives back each time is 500 pounds. The capital he advances is therefore never more than 500 pounds. The capital of 500 pounds that is advanced forms the denominator of the fraction that expresses the annual rate of surplus value. We already had for this formula, S prime equals small s prime times V times N over V equals small s prime times N. Since the real rate of surplus value, small s prime equals small s over v, the mass of surplus value divided by the variable capital that produced it, 
we can substitute in small s prime times n the equivalent of a small s prime, i.e., small s over small v, and arrive at the further formula s prime equals small s times n over small v. However, by turning over 10 times, and hence repeating its advance 10 times, the capital of 500 pounds performs the function of a capital 10 times as great, a capital of 5,000 pounds, just as 500 shilling pieces that turn over 10 times in the year perform the same function as 5,000 turning over only once. Section 2. The Turnover of an Individual Variable Capital Quote from Volume 1, Chapter 23 Whatever the social form of the production process, it has to be continuous. It must periodically repeat the same phases. When viewed, therefore, as a connected whole, and in constant flux of its incessant renewal, every social process of production is at the same time a process of reproduction. As a periodic increment to the value of the capital, or a periodic fruit borne by capital and process, surplus value acquires the form of a revenue arising out of capital. End quote. We have 10 five-week turnover periods for capital A. In the first turnover period, 500 pounds variable capital is advanced, i.e. 100 pounds is converted each week into labor power so that at the end of the first turnover period, 500 pounds has been spent on labor power. This 500 pounds, originally part of the total capital advanced, has ceased to be capital. It has been paid out in wages. The workers, for their part, pay it out again in purchasing their means of subsistence and consume means of subsistence to the value of 500 pounds. A mass of commodities amounting altogether to this value is thereby annihilated. What the worker may save his money, etc., is also not capital. This mass of commodities is consumed unproductively, as far as the worker is concerned, except inasmuch as he thereby maintains his labor power, which is an indispensable instrument for the capitalist in working condition. In the second place, however, this 500 pounds is converted, for the capitalist, into labor power of the same value, or price. He consumes the labor power productively in the same labor process. At the end of the five weeks, a value product of 1,000 pounds has been brought into existence. Half of this, 500 pounds, is the reproduced value of the variable capital spent as payment for labor power. The other half, 500 pounds, is newly produced surplus value. But the five weeks labor power, by conversion into which a part of capital has been transformed into variable capital, is also spent or consumed, even if productively. The labor active yesterday is not the same labor as is active today. Its value, together with the surplus value created by it, now exists as the value of a thing distinct from labor power, the product. But because this product is transformed into money, the part of its value equal to the value the variable capital advanced is converted once more into labor power and hence functions afresh as variable capital. The fact that the capital value that is not only reproduced but also transformed back into the money form may engage the same workers, i.e. the same bearers of labor power, is beside the point. It is quite possible for the capitalist to employ new workers in place of the old ones in the second turnover period. In fact, therefore, in the course of the ten five-week turnover periods, a capital of 5,000 pounds is successively spent on wages, and not one of 500 pounds, these wages being spent again by the workers on means of subsistence. The capital of 5,000 pounds advanced in this way is consumed. It no longer exists. On the other hand, it is labor power to the value of 5,000 pounds, and not just 500 pounds, that is successively incorporated into the production process, not only reproducing its own value of 5,000 pounds, but producing, in addition to this, a surplus value of 5,000 pounds. The variable capital of 500 pounds that is advanced in the second turnover period is not the identical capital of 500 pounds advanced in the first turnover period. The latter has been consumed, spent on wages, but it has been replaced by a new variable capital of 500 pounds, which was produced in the first turnover period in the commodity form and was then transformed back into the money form. This new commodity capital of 500 pounds is therefore the money form of the mass of commodities newly produced in the first turnover period. The fact that an identical money sum of 500 pounds exists once more in the hands of the capitalist, i.e. if we disregard the surplus value, the same amount of money capital as he originally advanced, conceals the fact that he is operating with a newly produced capital. As far as the other value components of the commodity capital are concerned, those that replace the constant parts of the capital, their value is not newly produced. It is only the form in which the value exists that has changed. Let us take the third turnover period. Here, it is evident that the variable capital of 500 pounds advanced for the third time is not an old capital, but one newly produced, for it is the money form of the mass of commodities produced in the second turnover period and not in the first turnover period, i.e. the money form of that mass of commodities whose value is equal to the value the variable capital advanced. The part of their value that equals the variable part of the capital advance was converted into the new labor power for the second turnover period, and produced a new mass of commodities. This was again sold, and a part of their value forms the capital of 500 pounds advanced in the third turnover period. 
The same thing happens for all ten turnover periods. Every five weeks, newly produced masses of commodities, whose value insofar as it replaces variable capital is also newly produced and does not simply reappear, as with the constant circulating capital, are thrown onto the market, so that ever new labor power can be incorporated into the production process. What is attained by the tenfold turnover of the variable capital advance, therefore, is not that this capital of 500 pounds can be productively consumed ten times over, or that a variable capital that suffices for five weeks can be applied for 50. In fact, 10 times 500 pounds of variable capital is applied in the 50 weeks. The capital of 500 pounds is only ever sufficient for five weeks, and must be replaced at the end of these five weeks with a newly produced capital of 500 pounds. This occurs just as much for capital A as for capital B. But now comes the difference. At the close of the first section of five weeks, a variable capital of 500 pounds has been advanced and spent both in case B and in case A. For B, just as for A, its value has been converted into labor power and replaced by a part of the value of the product newly produced by its labor power equal in value to the advanced variable capital of 500 pounds. For both B and A, the labor power has not just replaced the value the variable capital expended, 500 pounds, with a new value the same amount, but also added to it a surplus value, one of the same size according to our assumption. In case B, however, the value product which replaces the variable capital advanced and adds to its value a surplus value does not exist in the form in which it can function once again as productive capital, i.e. as variable capital. This is the form in which it does exist for A. For B, however, through to the end of the year, while the variable capital spent in the first five weeks and then successively every five weeks again is replaced by a newly produced value and surplus value, it does not exist in the form in which it can function as productive capital, or in particular variable capital. Its value has certainly been replaced by a new value, and thus renewed, but the form of its value, in this case the absolute value form, its money form, has not been renewed. For the second period of five weeks, and successively for every five weeks during the year, a further 500 pounds must be on hand, just as for the first period. If we ignore credit, then 5,000 pounds must be on hand at the beginning of the year, and exist as latent money capital advanced, even though it is only actually spent and converted into labor power bit by bit in the course of the year. In case A, on the other hand, since the circuit or turnover of the capital advanced has been completed, the replacement value already exists, after five weeks have elapsed, and the form in which it can set in motion new labor power for five weeks, in its original money form. In both cases, A and B, new labor power is consumed in the second five-week period, and a new capital of 500 pounds spent in payment for this labor power. The workers' means of subsistence, which were paid for with the first 500 pounds, have disappeared, or at any rate the value of these has vanished from the hands of the capitalist. The second 500 pounds serves to buy new labor power, to withdraw new means of subsistence from the market. In short, a new capital of 500 pounds is spent, not the old one. But in case A, this new capital is the money form of the newly produced replacement value for the 500 pounds spent previously. In case B, the replacement value exists in a form in which it cannot function as variable capital. It does exist, but not in the form of variable capital. An additional capital of 500 pounds must therefore be available in the money form, which is here unavoidable, to continue the production process for the next five weeks, and it must be advanced as such. Thus the same amount of variable capital is spent in 50 weeks in case B as in case A. The same amount of labor power paid for and used. But in B, this has to be paid for with the capital advance equal to its entire value, 5,000 pounds. In A, however, it is paid for successively by the ever-renewed money form of the replacement value that is produced every five weeks for the capital of 500 pounds advanced for each five weeks. In this case, therefore, the money capital advanced is never greater than that needed for five weeks, i.e. never greater than the capital of 500 pounds advanced for the first five weeks. This 500 pounds is sufficient for the whole year. It is clear, therefore, that with the same degree of exploitation of labor, i.e. the same real rate of surplus value, the annual rates in cases A and B must stand in inverse proportion to the magnitude of the variable money capitals that have had to be advanced in order to set in motion the same quantity of labor power over the year. A, 5,000S over 500V, totaling 1,000%, and B, 5,000S over 5,000V, totaling 100%. But 500V to 5000V is a ratio equal to 1 to 10, which is equal to 100% to 1000%. The distinction arises from the divergence in the turnover periods, i.e. the intervals at which the replacement value the variable capital applied in a certain period of time can function afresh as capital, and therefore as new capital. With both B and A, we find the same replacement value of the variable capital applied during the same period. There is also the same additional surplus value produced during the same period, but with B, even though every five weeks there is a replacement value of 500 pounds, plus 500 pounds surplus value, this replacement value does not yet form any new capital, since it does not exist in the money form. 
In case A, the old capital value is not replaced by a new one but is re-established in its money form and hence replaced as new capital capable of performing its function. The earlier or later transformation of the replacement value into money and hence into the form in which the variable capital is advanced is evidently a circumstance quite immaterial to the production of surplus value. The latter depends on the magnitude of the variable capital applied and on the level of exploitation of labor. But the circumstances mentioned above does not modify the size of the money capital that has to be advanced in order to set in motion a definite amount of labor power in the course of the year, and in this way it does affect the annual rate of surplus value. Section 3. The Turnover of Variable Capital Considered from the Social Point of View Let us consider the matter for a moment from the whole society standpoint. A worker costs, say, one pound per week. The working day is ten hours. Both with capital A and capital B, 100 workers are employed throughout the year. 100 pounds per week for 100 workers, making 500 pounds for five weeks and 5,000 pounds for 50 weeks. And each of these works for 60 hours in a six-day week. 100 workers perform 6,000 hours of labor per week and therefore 300,000 hours of labor in 50 weeks. This labor power is requisitioned by A and B and cannot be spent by the society on anything else. In this respect, the matter is the same from the social standpoint for both A and B. Moreover, in both cases, each 100 workers receives a yearly wage of 5,000 pounds, thus the 200 together receive 10,000 pounds, and withdraw from society means of subsistence to this value. In this respect, too, the matter is equivalent in both cases, from the social standpoint. Since the workers are in both cases paid by the week, they also withdraw the means of subsistence from society each week, and each week they cast into circulation and return their money equivalent. But now comes the difference. Firstly, the money that the workers under capital A cast into circulation is not only, as for the workers under capital B, the money form of the value of their labor power, in actual fact a means of payment for labor already performed. Right from the second turnover period onward, reckoning from the opening of the business, it is the money form of their own value product, equaling the price of labor power plus surplus value, in the first turnover period, which pays for their labor during the second turnover period. With capital B, the position is different. Here, too, the money is certainly a means of payment for labor that the workers have already performed, but this labor is not paid for with their own value product turns into money, the money form of the value they themselves have produced. This can only start to happen from the second year onwards, when the workers under capital B are paid with their own value product of the previous year, converted into money. The shorter the turnover period of the capital, and hence the shorter the intervals at which its reproduction period is repeated in the course of the year, the sooner is the variable part of the capital originally advanced by the capitalist in the money form transformed into the money form of the value product created by the worker as a replacement for this variable capital, this product also including surplus value. The shorter, too, is the time for which the capitalist has to advance money from his own funds, and the smaller the total capital that he advances in relation to the given scale of production. The relatively greater, therefore, is the mass of surplus value that the capitalist extracts in the course of the year, at a given rate of surplus value, since he can buy the workers all the more often, and set their labor in motion with the money form of their own value product. At a given scale of production, the absolute size of the variable money capital advanced, and so of the circulating capital in general, is reduced in proportion to the brevity of the turnover period, and the annual rate of surplus value correspondingly grows. With a given volume of capital advanced, the scale of production grows, and hence, with a given rate of surplus value, the absolute mass of surplus value produced in one turnover period also grows, and there recurs, simultaneously with this, a rise in the annual rate of surplus value caused by the reduction in the reproduction period. The preceding investigation has led us to the result that, according to the varying magnitudes of the turnover period, money capitals of very different scale have to be advanced in order to set in motion the same volume of productive circulating capital and the same amount of labor, given the same level of exploitation of labor. Secondly, and this is related to the first distinction, in both cases, the workers pay for means of subsistence that they buy with the variable capital that is transformed in their hands into means of circulation. They not only withdraw wheat from the market, for example, but also replace it with an equivalent in money. But since the money with which the workers employed by capital B pay for their means of subsistence and withdraw them from the market is not the money form of their own value product cast into the market in the course of the year, as is the case with the workers employed by capital A, it follows that although they supply the seller of their means of subsistence with money, they do not supply any commodity, either means of production or means of subsistence which he could buy with the money provided, which is the position, however, with A. Hence labor power, means of subsistence for this labor power, fixed capital in the form of the means of labor applied under capital B, and production materials are all withdrawn from the market, and an equivalent in money is cast into the market to replace them with. But no product is cast into the market during the year in question to replace the material elements of productive capital withdrawn from it. 
If we were to consider a communist society in place of a capitalist one, then money capital would immediately be done away with, and so too the disguises that transactions acquire through it. The matter would be simply reduced to the fact that the society must reckon in advance how much labor, means of production, and means of subsistence it can spend, without dislocation, on branches of industry which, like the building of railways, for instance, supply neither means of production nor means of subsistence, nor any kind of useful effect for a long period, a year or more, though they certainly do withdraw labor, means of production, and means of subsistence from the total annual product. In capitalist society, on the other hand, where any kind of social rationality asserts itself only post-festum, major disturbances can and must occur constantly. On the one hand, there is pressure on the money market, while conversely the absence of this pressure itself calls into being a mass of such undertakings, and therefore the precise circumstances that later provoke a pressure on the money market. The money market is under pressure because large-scale advances of money capital for long periods of time are always needed here. This is quite apart from the fact that industrialists and merchants throw the money capital they need for the carrying on of their businesses into railway speculations, etc., and replace it with loans from the money market. The other side of the coin is pressure on society's available productive capital. Since elements of productive capital are constantly being withdrawn from the market, and all that is put into the market is an equivalent in money, the effective demand rises, without this in itself providing any element of supply. Hence, prices rise, both for the means of subsistence and for the material elements of production. During this time, too, there are regular business swindles, and a great transfer of capital. A band of speculators, contractors, engineers, lawyers, etc., enrich themselves. These exert a strong consumer demand on the market, and wages rise as well. As far as foodstuffs are concerned, agriculture is given a boost by this process. But since these foodstuffs cannot be suddenly increased within the year, imports grow, as well as the import of exotic foods, coffee, sugar, wine, etc., and objects of luxury. Hence, oversupply and speculation in this part of the import trade. On the other hand, in those branches of industry in which production can be increased more quickly, manufacture proper, mining, etc., the price rise leads to sudden expansion, soon followed by collapse. The same effect occurs on the labor market, drawing great numbers of the latent relative surplus population and even workers already employed into the new lines of business. Undertakings of this kind, such as railways, generally withdraw from the labor market on a large scale a quantity of force, which can derive only from branches such as agriculture, etc., where only strong lads are needed. This still occurs even after the new undertakings have already become an established branch of industry and the migrant working class needed for them has already been formed, for example, when railway construction is temporarily pursued on a scale greater than the average. A part of the reserve army of workers, whose pressure keeps wages down, is absorbed. Wages generally rise, even in the formerly well-employed sections of the labor market. This lasts until, with the inevitable crash, the reserve army of workers is again released and wages are pressed down once more to their minimum and below it. Inasmuch as the greater or lesser length of the turnover period depends on the working period in the strict sense, i.e. the period needed to prepare the product for the market, it depends on the material conditions of production in the various spheres of capital investment, as these are given at the time. In agriculture, these have more the character of natural conditions of production. In manufacture, and for the most part in extractive industries too, they change with the social development of the productive process itself. Inasmuch as the length of the working period depends on the size of deliveries, on the quantitative scale on which the product is generally thrown into the market, this has a conventional character. But the convention itself has as its material basis the scale of production, and is therefore accidental only if considered in isolation. Finally, inasmuch as the length of the turnover period is dependent on the length of the circulation period, this is partly conditioned by the constant change in market conditions, the greater or lesser ease of selling, and the necessity, which arises from this, of casting the product partly on nearer and partly on more distant markets. Apart from the scale of demand in general, the movement of prices plays a major role here. Sales are deliberately restricted when prices are falling, while production goes ahead, and the converse occurs when prices are rising when production and sale keep in step, or selling even takes place in advance. However, the actual distance of the place of production from the market outlet should be considered as a specific material basis. English cotton cloth or yarn, for instance, is sold to India. The export merchant has to pay the English cotton manufacturer. He does this willingly only when the situation on the money market is favorable. As soon as the manufacturer himself replaces his money capital by credit operations, things start to go wrong. The exporter later sells his cotton goods on the Indian market, from where the capital he advanced is remitted. Until this reflux, the situation is just the same as one in which the length of the working period requires a new advance of money capital in order to keep the production process going on the same scale. 
The money capital with which the manufacturer pays his workers and replaces the other elements of his circulating capital is not the money form of the yarn that he produced. This can only be the case after the value of this yarn has returned to England in money or products. It is additional money capital, as before. The distinction is simply that instead of the manufacturer, it is the merchant who advances it, and he may well have obtained it himself by credit operations. Similarly, until this money has been cast into the market, no additional product has been put on the English market that could be bought with this money and enter the sphere of production or individual consumption. If this condition sets in for a long while and on a large scale, then it must lead to the same result as the prolonged working period did previously. It is also possible that the yarn is sold on credit in India itself. With this credit, products are bought in India and sent as return shipment to England, or else drafts are permitted to this amount. If this process is delayed, then pressure builds up on the Indian money market, which may react on England to produce a crisis here. This crisis, in its turn, even if it is combined with the export of precious metals to India, provokes a new crisis in that country, on account of the bankruptcy of the English firms and their Indian branches, who were given credit by Indian banks. Thus, a simultaneous crisis arises both on the market for which the trade balance is unfavorable and on that for which it is favorable. This phenomenon can be still more complicated. England may have sent silver bullion to India, but India's English creditors now press their demands here, and in a short while India will have to send its silver back to England. It can happen that export trade to India and the import trade from India are in approximate balance, even though the size of the latter, with the exception of the special circumstances such as an increase in cotton prices, etc., is determined by the former and stimulated by it. The balance of trade between England and India may appear in equilibrium, or exhibit only weak fluctuations on one side or the other. But once the crisis breaks out in England, it becomes clear that unsold cotton goods are being stored up in India, goods which have therefore not been transformed from commodity capital into money capital, over production on this side, and that on the other hand, there are not only unsold stocks of Indian products in England, but a major part of stocks sold and consumed have not yet been paid for. Thus, what appears as a crisis on the money market, in actual fact, expresses anomalies in the production and reproduction process itself. Thirdly, in relation to the actual circulating capital applied, both variable and constant, the length of the turnover period, insofar as it derives from the length of the working period, leads to the distinction that, with a greater number of turnovers in the course of the year, an element of the variable or constant circulating capital can be supplied by way of its own product, as with the production of coal, of ready-made clothes, etc. In other situations, this is not the case, at least not within the year. Chapter 17. The Circulation of Surplus Value we have already seen how the variation in the turnover period produces a variation in the annual rate of surplus value, even with the mass of surplus value annually produced remaining the same. There is, however, a further necessary variation in the capitalization of surplus value, in accumulation, and in this respect also in the mass of surplus value produced during the year, even with the rate of surplus value remaining the same. We note first of all that capitalist A, in the example of the preceding chapter, has a steady periodic revenue, and so if we accept the turnover period with which he starts business, he meets his own consumption during the year out of his production of surplus value, and does not have to advance anything for this out of his own funds. This is the position, however, with B. Capitalist B produces the same amount of surplus value in the same time as A does, but the surplus value is not realized and can therefore be consumed neither individually nor productively. So far as individual consumption is concerned, surplus value is anticipated. Funds for this must be advanced. A part of the productive capital which is difficult to categorize, i.e., the extra capital needed for repair and maintenance of the fixed capital, now presents itself in a new light. In case A, this part of the capital is either not advanced at the start of production or is only advanced to a small extent. It does not need to be available, let alone actually present. It arises from the business itself, by the direct transformation of surplus value into capital, i.e. its direct application as capital. A part of the surplus value that is not only produced periodically in the course of the year but also realized can cover the expenses necessary for repairs, etc. In this way, a part of the capital needed to conduct the business on its original scale is produced by the business itself, in the course of business, by the capitalization of a part of the surplus value. This is impossible for capitalist B. The portion of capital in question must, in his case, form part of the capital originally advanced. In both cases, this part of the capital figures in the capitalist's books as capital advanced, which indeed it is, since on our assumption it forms a part of the productive capital needed to carry on business on the given scale. But it makes a great difference whose funds it is advanced out of. 
In case B, it is an actual part of the capital that has to be originally advanced or kept available. In case A, on the other hand, it is a portion of the surplus value applied as capital. This latter case shows us how not only the capital accumulated, but also a part of the capital originally advanced, can simply be capitalized surplus value. Once the development of credits intervenes, the relation between the capital originally advanced and the capitalized surplus value becomes still more intricate. For example, A may borrow part of the productive capital with which he begins his business, or carries it on during the year from banker C. At the start, therefore, he lacks sufficient capital of his own to conduct the business. Banker C lends him a sum that simply consists of surplus value deposited with him by industrialists D, E, F, etc. From A's standpoint, it is still not accumulated capital. In point of fact, however, for D, E, F, etc., A is no more than an agent who capitalizes the surplus value that they have appropriated. In Chapter 24 of Volume 1, we saw how the real content of accumulation, the transformation of surplus value into capital, is the reproduction process on an expanded scale. Whether this expansion expresses itself extensively in the form of the addition of new factories to old ones, or intensively in the enlargement of the former scale of operations. The expansion of the scale of production can proceed in relatively small doses, if a part of the surplus value is applied to improvements which either simply raise the productive power of the labor applied, or allow it simultaneously to be more intensively exploited. Alternatively, when the working day is not restricted by law, an additional outlay of circulating capital, in production materials and wages, permits an expansion of the scale of production without any increase in the fixed capital, since the time during which the latter is used is thus simply prolonged, while its turnover period is correspondingly shortened. Alternatively again, the capitalized surplus value, given favorable market conjunctures, may permit speculation in raw materials, operations for which the capital originally advanced would have been insufficient, and so on. It is clear, however, that where a relatively large number of turnover periods brings about a more frequent realization of surplus value in the course of the year, periods do occur in which the working day cannot be extended, nor can individual improvements be brought about, while on the other hand, extension of the whole business on a proportional scale, partly by expanding the entire plant, the buildings, for example, partly by increasing the labor fund, as in agriculture, is possible only within certain limits which may be broader or narrower, and requires a volume of additional capital that can only be supplied by several years' accumulation of surplus value. Besides real accumulation, or the transformation of surplus value into productive capital, and correspondingly reproduction on an expanded scale, there is thus accumulation of money, scraping together a part of the surplus value as latent money capital, which is only to function as additional active capital later on, when it has attained a certain volume. This is how the matter appears from the standpoint of the individual capitalist. With the development of capitalist production, however, there occurs a simultaneous development in the credit system. The money capital that the capitalist cannot yet apply in his own business is employed by others from whom he receives interest. It functions for him as money capital in the specific sense that it is a kind of capital distinct from productive capital. But it is in someone else's hands that it actually operates as capital. It is clear that with the more frequent realization of surplus value and the rising scale on which it is produced, a growth occurs in the proportion in which new money capital, or money as capital, is placed on the money market, and at least a large part of this is absorbed again from the money markets for the expansion of production. The simplest form which this extra latent money capital can assume is that of a hoard. This hoard may be additional gold or silver received directly or indirectly in exchange with the countries producing precious metals. It is only in this way, moreover, that the money hoard within a country grows in absolute terms. It is possible, on the other hand, however, and this is the position in the majority of cases, that this hoard is nothing more than money withdrawn from domestic circulation, which is assumed the form of a hoard in the hands of individual capitalists. It is also possible that this latent money capital consists simply of value tokens. We are still leaving credit money out of account here, or else mere claims, titles of the capitalist on third parties established by legal documents. In all these cases, whatever may be the form of existence of the extra money capital, it represents, inasmuch as it is prospective capital, no more than extra legal titles to the future additional production of the society that the capitalists hold in reserve. Quote, the mass of real accumulated wealth in points of magnitude is so utterly insignificant when compared with the powers of production of the same society in whatever state of civilization, or even compared with the actual consumption for even a few years of that society, that the great attention of legislators and political economists should be directed to productive powers, and their future free development, and not, as hitherto, to a mere accumulated wealth that strikes the eye. 
of what is called accumulated wealth, by far the greater part is only nominal, consisting not of any real things, ships, houses, cottons, improvements on land, but of mere demands on the future annual productive powers of society, engendered and perpetuated by the expedients or institutions of insecurity. The use of such articles, accumulations of physical things or actual wealth, as a mere means of appropriating to their possessors the wealth to be created by the future productive powers of society, being that alone of which the natural laws of distribution would, without force, gradually deprive them, or, if aided by cooperative labor, would in a very few years deprive them. End quote from William Thompson, An Inquiry into the Principles of the Distribution of Wealth, published in London in 1850. This book originally appeared in 1824. Quote, it is little thought, by most persons not at all suspected, how very small a proportion, either in extent or influence, the actual accumulations of society bear to human productive powers, even to the ordinary consumption of a few years of a single generation. The reason is obvious, but the effect is very pernicious. The wealth that is annually consumed, disappearing with its consumption, is seen but for a moment, and makes no impression but during the act of enjoyment or use. But that part of wealth which is of slow consumption, furniture, machinery, buildings, from childhood to old age stand out before the eye, the durable moments of human exertion. By means of the possession of this fixed, permanent, or slowly consumed part of national wealth, of the land and materials to work upon, the tools to work with, the houses to shelter whilst working, the holders of these articles command for their own benefit the yearly productive powers of all the really efficient productive laborers of society, though these articles may bear ever so small the proportion to the recurring products of that labor. The population of Britain and Ireland being twenty millions, the average consumption of each individual, man, woman, and child, is probably about twenty pounds, making four hundred millions of wealth, the product of labor annually consumed. The whole amount of the accumulated capital of these countries, it has been estimated, does not exceed twelve hundred millions, or three times the year's labor of the community, or, if equally divided, sixty pounds capital for every individual. It is with the proportions, rather than with the absolute accurate amount of these estimated sums, we are concerned. The interest of this capital stock would support the whole population in the same comfort in which they now exist for about two months of one year, and the whole accumulated capital itself would maintain them in idleness could purchasers be found for three years, at the end of which time, without houses, clothes, or food, they must starve, or become the slaves of those who supported them in the three years' idleness. As three years is to the life of one healthy generation, say forty years, so is the magnitude and importance of the actual wealth, the accumulated capital of even the wealthiest community, to the productive powers of only one generation. Not of what, under judicious arrangements of equal security, they might produce, particularly with the aid of cooperative labor, but of what, under the defective and depressing expedients of insecurity, they do absolutely produce. As nothing can be accumulated without first supplying necessaries, and as the great current of human inclination is to enjoyment, hence the comparatively trifling amount of the actual wealth of society at any particular moment. It is an eternal round of production and consumption, from the amount of this immense mass of annual consumption and production, the handful of actual accumulation would hardly be missed, and yet it is to this handful, and not to the mass of productive powers, that attention has chiefly been directed. About one-third of the annual products of the labor of these countries is now abstracted from the producers, under the name of public burdens, and unproductively consumed by those who give no equivalent, that is to say, none satisfactory to the producers. With the accumulated masses, particularly when held forth in the hands of a few individuals, the vulgar eye has always been struck. The annually produced and consumed masses, like the eternal and incalculable waves of a mighty river, roll on and are lost in the forgotten ocean of consumption. On this eternal consumption, however, are dependent, not only for almost all gratifications, but even for existence, the whole human race. The quantity and distribution of these yearly products ought to be the paramount objects for consideration. The actual accumulation is altogether of secondary importance, and derives almost the whole of that importance from its influence on the distribution of the yearly productions. Actual accumulations and distributions have always been considered, in reference and subordinate, to the power of producing. In almost all other systems, the power of producing has been considered in reference and subordinate to actual accumulation, and to the perpetuating of the existing modes of distribution. In comparison to the preservation of this actual distribution, the ever-recurring misery or happiness of the whole human race has been considered as unworthy of regard. To perpetuate the results of force, fraud, and chance has been called security, 
and to the support of this spurious security have all the productive powers of the human race been unrelentingly sacrificed. End quote. As far as reproduction is concerned, only two normal cases are possible, leaving aside disturbances which inhibit reproduction even on the existing scale. Either reproduction occurs on a simple scale, or, alternatively, there is capitalization of surplus value, accumulation. Section 1. Simple Reproduction In the case of simple reproduction, the surplus value that is periodically produced and realized, either annually or by several turnovers within the year, is consumed individually, i.e. unproductively, by its owners, the capitalists. The fact that the value of products consists partly of surplus value and partly of the portion of value formed by the variable capital reproduced in it, together with the constant capital consumed, does not change in the least either the volume or the value of the total product which enters circulation at any given time as commodity capital and is similarly withdrawn from it to go into productive or individual consumption, i.e. to serve as means of production or means of consumption. Leaving aside the constant capital, it is only the distribution of the annual product between workers and capitalists that is thereby affected. Even supposing simple reproduction, one part of the surplus value must always exist in money and not in products, because it cannot otherwise be transformed from money into product for the needs of consumption. This transformation of surplus value from its original commodity form into money must now be investigated further. To simplify the matter, we take the problem in its simplest form, i.e. the exclusive circulation of metallic money of money that is a real equivalent. According to the laws developed for simple commodity circulation, see Volume 1, Chapter 3, the mass of metallic money existing in a currency cannot just be enough to circulate the commodities. It must be sufficient to cope with the fluctuations in the circulation of money, which arise partly from fluctuations in the speed of circulation, partly from changes in the price of commodities, and partly from the different and changing proportions in which the money functions as means of payment and as means of circulation proper. The ratio in which the existing mass of money is divided into a hoard and into money in circulation constantly changes, but the mass of money is always equal to the sum of money present as a hoard and as money in circulation. This quantity of money, the quantity of precious metal, is a social hoard accumulated bit by bit. Inasmuch as a part of this hoard is consumed by wear and tear, it must be replaced each year, as with any other product. This happens in reality by the direct or indirect exchange of a part of the annual product of the country in question with the product of the gold and silver producing countries. The international character of this transaction conceals its simple course. In order to reduce the problem to its simplest and most perceptible expression, we must therefore assume that there is production of gold and silver in the country itself, i.e. that gold and silver production form a part of the total social production of any country. Ignoring the gold and silver produced for luxury articles, the minimum annual production of these metals must be equal to the wear and tear of the money metals occasioned by the annual monetary circulation. Moreover, if the value of the mass of commodities annually produced and circulated grows, then the annual production of gold and silver must also grow, insofar as the increased value of the commodities in circulation and the quantity of money required for this circulation and for the corresponding hoard formation is not compensated for by a greater velocity of monetary circulation and by the more comprehensive function of money as means of payment, i.e., by more mutual settlement of sales and purchases without the intervention of actual money. A part of the social labor power and a part of the social means of production must therefore be spent each year in the production of gold and silver. The capitalists who pursue the production of gold and silver, and since we are here assuming simple reproduction they pursue it only within the bounds of the average annual wear and tear and the average annual consumption of gold and silver necessitated by that wear and tear, directly cast their surplus value, which according to our supposition they consume each year without capitalizing any of it, into the circulation sphere in the money form which is for them the natural form of their product, not, as with the other branches of production, its transformed form. Furthermore, as far as wages are concerned, the money form in which the variable capital is advanced, here too they are not replaced by the sale of the product, its transformation into money, but rather by a product whose natural form is money from the very beginning. Finally, this also applies to the part of the total precious metal product that is equal in value to the whole of the constant capital periodically consumed, including both the constant circulating capital and the constant fixed capital consumed during the year. Let us firstly consider the circuit or turnover of the capital invested in the production of precious metals in the form M to C to P to M prime. 
insofar as the C in M to C does not consist only of labor power and means of production, but also of fixed capital, only a part of whose value is used up in P, it is evident that M prime, the product, is a sum of money equal to the variable capital laid out on wages, plus the circulating constant capital laid out on means of production, plus the portion of value of the fixed capital used up, plus the surplus value. If the sum were smaller, with the general value, the gold unchanged, then the mines in question would be unprofitable. Or, if this is generally the case, the value of gold would in future rise, compared with commodities whose value was unchanged, i.e. the prices of commodities would fall, so that the sum of money laid out in M to C would in the future be less. Let us start by considering only the circulating part of the capital advanced in M, the starting point of M to C to P to M prime. In this case, a certain sum of money is advanced and cast into circulation in payment for labor power, and in order to purchase materials of production. The money is not withdrawn again from circulation by the circuit of this capital, and then cast in afresh. The product in its natural form is already money. It does not need to be first transformed into money by exchange, by process of circulation. It moves from the production process into the circulation sphere not in the form of commodity capital that has to be transformed back into money capital, but rather as money capital that has to be transformed back into productive capital, i.e. has to buy new labor power and materials of production. The money form of the circulating capital, that consumed in labor power and means of production, is replaced not by the sale of the product, but rather by the natural form of the product itself i.e. not by withdrawing its value again from circulation in the money form, but rather by adding money newly produced. Let us assume that this circulating capital is 500 pounds, and the turnover period five weeks, a four-week working period, with the circulation period only one week. Right from the start, money has in part to be advanced for five weeks in a production stock, and in part kept on hand to be paid out bit by bit as wages. At the beginning of the sixth week, 400 pounds has returned and 100 pounds been set free. This is continually repeated. Here, as before, 100 pounds always exists in the released form for a certain section of the turnover, but this consists of additional money newly produced, just like the other 400 pounds. Here we have 10 turnovers in the year, and the annual product is 5,000 pounds in gold. The circulation period here does not arise from the time taken to transform commodities into money, but rather that taken to transform money into the elements of production. For any other capital of 500 pounds, turning over under the same conditions, the constantly renewed money form is the changed form of the commodity capital produced, a capital which is cast into circulation every four weeks and always receives this money form afresh by its sale, i.e. by the periodic withdrawal of the sum of money in the shape of which it originally entered the process. Here, on the contrary, in every turnover period, a new additional sum of 500 pounds in money is cast into circulation by the production process, so as to keep withdrawing materials of production and labor power from circulation. The money thus cast into the circulation sphere is not withdrawn from it again by the circuit of this capital, but rather by the increased quantity of new gold that is constantly produced. If we consider the variable part of this circulating capital and take it to be 100 pounds, as above, then this 100 pounds would in ordinary commodity production be sufficient to pay labor power through a tenfold turnover. Here, in money production, the same sum is also sufficient. However, the five weekly reflux of 100 pounds with which the labor power is paid is not the changed form of its product, but rather a part of its ever new product itself. The gold producer pays his workers directly with a part of the gold they have themselves produced. Thus, the 1,000 pounds that is laid out each year on labor power and thrown into circulation by the workers does not return via circulation to its starting point. As far as the fixed capital is concerned, moreover, the initial establishment of the business requires the expenditure of a relatively large money capital, which is thus cast into the circulation sphere. Like all fixed capital, this only returns back bit by bit over a number of years, but it flows back as a direct fragment of the product, the gold, not by the sale of the product and its consequent conversion into monetary form. Thus it does not receive its money form by a withdrawal of money from circulation, but rather by the accumulation of a corresponding part of the product. The money capital thus re-established is not a sum of money gradually withdrawn from circulation to balance the sum of money originally cast into it for fixed capital. It is an additional quantity of money. Finally, as far as the surplus value is concerned, this is also equal to a part of the new gold product that is cast into circulation in each new turnover period, to be spent unproductively according to our assumption and paid out for means of subsistence and luxury articles. According to our assumption, however, this entire annual gold production, through which labor power and materials of production, though not money, are steadily withdrawn from the market and additional money is steadily supplied to it, only replaces the money worn out during the year 
and thus simply keeps intact the social money stock which always exists in the two forms of hoard and money in circulation, though in varying proportions. According to the law of commodity circulation, the total quantity of money must be equal to the quantity of money required for circulation plus a sum of money existing in the hoard form which increases or decreases according to the contraction or expansion of circulation, and serves in particular for the formation of the reserve fund of means of payment that is needed. What has to be paid in money, insofar as there is no direct balancing of accounts, is the value of the commodities. The fact that part of this value consists of surplus value, i.e. has cost the seller of the commodity nothing, does not change this situation in any way. If the producers all possessed their means of production independently, there would then be the circulation between the direct producers themselves. Ignoring the constant part of their capital, we could divide their annual surplus product, by analogy with the situation under capitalism, into two parts. Part A, which simply replaces their necessary means of subsistence, and Part B, which they partly consume as luxury products and partly apply to the expansion of production. Part A then represents the variable capital, Part B the surplus value. But this division would still have no effect on the quantity of money required to circulate their total product. With circumstances otherwise remaining the same, the value of the mass of commodities in circulation would be the same, and so would the quantity of money required by it. They would also have to have the same money reserves as before, given a similar division of the turnover period, i.e. the same part of their capital would always have to be in the money form, on our continued supposition that their production was commodity production. Thus the circumstance that a part of the commodity value consists of surplus value does not alter in the least the quantity of money needed to carry on the business. An opponent of Tuke, who supports the form M to C to M prime, asked him how the capitalist always managed to withdraw more money from circulation than he cast into it. Let us be clear that what is involved here is not the formation of surplus value. This, the only real secret, is taken for granted by the capitalists. The sum of value invested would not be capital if it did not enrich itself with a surplus value. Hence, surplus value is assumed from the outset. Its existence is a matter of course. Thus the question is not, where does surplus value come from, but rather, where does the money come from which it is turned into? In bourgeois economics, the existence of surplus value is taken for granted. Thus not only is it presupposed, but it is also presupposed at the same time that a part of the mass of commodities cast into circulation consists of surplus product, and thus represents a value that the capitalist did not cast into circulation with his capital, that the capitalist therefore casts into circulation an excess over and above his capital, and withdraws this excess from it again. The commodity capital that the capitalist casts into circulation is of greater value than the productive capital he has withdrawn in labor power and means of production from the circulation sphere. Why this should be so is not explained or understood from the capitalist standpoint, but it is a fact for all that. On this assumption, it is therefore clear why not only capitalist A, but also B, C, D, etc. can always withdraw from circulation, by exchanging their commodities, more value than the value of their original capital, which is always advanced anew. A, B, C, D, etc. always cast a greater commodity value into circulation in the form of commodity capital, an operation which has as many sides to it as there are independently functioning capitals, then they withdraw from it in the form of productive capital. Thus they always have a value sum to share among themselves, i.e. each of them can withdraw from circulation a productive capital equal to the value of the productive capitals they have respectively advanced, and can just as regularly share out a value sum which they cast into circulation from just as many sides in the commodity form as a respective surplus of commodity value over the value of their commodities elements of production. But before the commodity capital is transformed back into productive capital, and the surplus value contained in it is spent, it must be turned into money. Where does the money for this come from? This question appears difficult at first glance, and neither Tuke nor anyone else has yet answered it. Assume that the circulating capital of 500 pounds advanced in the form of money capital, whatever may be its turnover period, is the total circulating capital of society, i.e. of the capitalist class. The surplus value is 100 pounds. How then can the entire capitalist class continue extracting 600 pounds from the circulation sphere if it only ever puts 500 pounds into it? Once the money capital of 500 pounds has been transformed into productive capital, this is transformed within the production process into a commodity value of 600 pounds, and there now exists in the circulation sphere not only a commodity value of 500 pounds, equal to the money capital originally advanced, but also a newly produced surplus value of 100 pounds. This extra surplus value of 100 pounds is cast into circulation in the commodity form, there is no doubt about that, but the extra money needed for the circulation of this additional commodity value is not provided by the same operation. The difficulty should not be circumvented by plausible subterfuges. For example, as far as concerns the constant circulating capital, it is clear that not all of it is laid out at the same time. 
While capitalist A is selling his commodities, and thus the capital he has advanced is assuming the money form, the capital of buyer B, which is present in the money form, is assuming the form of B's means of production, and it is A himself who produces these. By the same act through which A gives back its money form to the commodity capital he has produced, B gives his capital back its productive form, transforming it from the money form into means of production and labor power. The same sum of money functions in the two-way process just as in every simple sale C to M. On the other hand, if A transforms his money into means of production again, he buys from C, and this latter thereby pays B, etc. The transaction might thus appear to have been explained. However, none of the laws put forward with respect to the quantity of money circulating for the purpose of commodity circulation, see Volume 1, Chapter 3, are in any way altered by the capitalist character of the production process. Therefore, when it is said that the circulating capital advanced by society in the money form amounts to 500 pounds, it has already been taken into account that this is not the only sum which was advanced at the same time, but that this sum also sets more productive capital than 500 pounds in motion, since it serves alternately as the money fund for different productive capitals. This mode of explanation already presupposes that the money exists, whereas it is precisely its existence that is to be explained. It might further be said that capitalist A produces articles that capitalist B consumes individually and unproductively. B's money thus turns A's commodity capital into money, and so the same sum of money serves to turn into money both B's surplus value and A's circulating constant capital. But here the solution to the question that is to be answered is presupposed even more directly, namely where does B get this money to meet his revenue? How did he himself manage to convert into money this part of his product's surplus value? It might be said, again, that the part of the circulating variable capital that A advances at any one time to his workers constantly flows back to him from the circulation sphere, only a changing part of it is kept back by him for the payment of wages. Between the outlay and the reflux there is, however, a certain interval, in the course of which the money paid out in wages can serve among other things to convert this surplus value into money. However, we know firstly that the greater this interval, the greater must be the quantity of money in reserve which capitalist A must constantly retain in his possession. Secondly, if the workers pay the money out and buy commodities with it, the surplus value contained in these commodities is also proportionately converted into money. Thus the same money that is advanced in the form of variable capital also serves to that extent to convert the surplus value into money. Without going any deeper into the question here, it is at least clear that the consumption of the entire capitalist class, and the unproductive persons dependent on it, keeps even pace with that of the working class. Thus, on top of the money cast into circulation by the workers, money must be cast into circulation by the capitalists if they are to spend their surplus value as revenue, and so money for this must be withdrawn from circulation. The explanation just given would only reduce the quantity needed, and not obviate the need. It might be said, finally, a large amount of money is always cast into circulation on the first investment of the fixed capital, and this is withdrawn from circulation again only gradually, bit by bit, in the course of several years by whoever threw it in. Is this sum not sufficient to convert the surplus value? The answer to this is that the sum of 500 pounds, which also includes hoard formation for the necessary reserve fund, may well already imply the investment of this sum as fixed capital, if not by the person who cast it in, then at least by someone else. Besides, it is already presupposed, in connection with the sum that is spent on the acquisition of products serving as fixed capital, that the surplus value in these commodities is also paid for, and the question precisely arises, where does this money come from? The general answer has already been given. If a mass of commodities of X times 1,000 pounds is to circulate, it in no way affects the quantity of money needed for this circulation whether the value of this commodity mass contains surplus value or not, or whether the mass of commodities is produced under capitalist conditions or not. Thus, the problem itself does not exist. With conditions otherwise given, such as the velocity of circulation of the money, etc., a definite sum of money is required to circulate the commodity value of X times a thousand pounds, quite irrespective of how much or how little of this value accrues to the direct producers of these commodities. Inasmuch as a problem does exist here, it coincides with the general problem. Where does the sum of money needed in a country for the circulation of commodities come from? However, there does exist, from the standpoint of capitalist production, the semblance of a special problem. For here it is the capitalist, the man who casts his money into circulation, who appears as the point of departure. The money that the worker spends in payment for his means of subsistence existed previously as the money form of the variable capital, and was therefore originally cast into circulation by the capitalist as means of purchase or payment for labor power. Moreover, the money that the capitalist casts into circulation originally constituted the money form of his constant fixed or fluid capital. 
He spends it as means of purchase or payment for means of labor and production materials. Beyond this, however, the capitalist no longer appears as the point of departure for the quantity of money that exists in circulation. All that exists now are two starting points, the capitalist and the worker. All third parties must either receive money from these two classes for the performance of services, or, insofar as they receive money without providing services in return, they are co-proprietors of surplus value in the forms of rent, interest, etc. If the surplus value does not all remain in the pockets of the industrial capitalist but has to be shared by him with other persons, this has nothing to do with the question at issue. What was asked is how he converts his surplus value into money, not how the money obtained for it is then divided up. For the present case, therefore, we can still consider the capitalist as the sole owner of surplus value. As far as the workers are concerned, it has already been said that they are only a secondary point of departure, whereas the capitalist is the primary point of departure for the money cast into circulation by the workers. The money that is first advanced as variable capital is already performing its second circulation when the worker spends it in payment for means of subsistence. Thus the capitalist class remains the sole starting point of the money circulation. If it needs 400 pounds for payment for means of production and 100 pounds for payment of labor power, then it casts 500 pounds into circulation. But the surplus value contained in the product, given a rate of surplus value of 100%, makes up a value of 100 pounds. How can the capitalist class continue to extract 600 pounds from circulation if it only ever puts 500 pounds in? Out of nothing, nothing comes. The entire capitalist class cannot extract anything from the circulation sphere that was not put into it already. We disregard here the fact that the sum of 400 pounds in money may be sufficient, given a tenfold turnover, to circulate means of production to a value of 4,000 pounds and labor to a value of 1,000 pounds, while the remaining 100 pounds may suffice for the circulation of 1,000 pounds surplus value. This ratio between the sum of money and the commodity value circulated by it contributes nothing to the matter in hand. The problem remains the same. If the same piece of money did not undergo several circulations, then 5,000 pounds would have to be cast into circulation as capital, and 1,000 pounds would be needed to convert the surplus value into money. The question is where this money comes from, whether it is 1,000 pounds or 100 pounds. In either case, it is additional money capital cast into circulation. In point of fact, paradoxical as it may seem at the first glance, the capitalist class itself casts into circulation the money that serves towards the realization of the surplus value contained in its commodities. But note well, it does not cast this in as money advanced, and therefore not as capital. It spends it as means of purchase for its individual consumption. Thus the money is not advanced by the capitalist class, even though this class is the starting point of its circulation. Let us take a particular capitalist who sets up a business, a farmer for example. During the first year he advances a money capital of 5,000 pounds. Let us say in payment for means of production 4,000 pounds, and for labor power 1,000 pounds. If the rate of surplus value is 100%, then the surplus value he appropriates is 1,000 pounds. The above 5,000 pounds includes all the money that he advances as money capital. But the man must also live, and he does not take in any money until the end of the year. Say that his consumption comes to 1,000 pounds. He must then have this in hand. He admittedly tells us that he has to advance this 1,000 pounds for the first year, but this is an advance only in the subjective sense, and means nothing more than he has to cover his individual consumption for the first year out of his own pocket, instead of using the product produced for nothing by his workers. He does not advance this money as capital. He spends it, i.e. pays it out for an equivalent in means of subsistence which he then consumes. This value is spent by him in money, cast into circulation, and withdrawn from it in commodity values. These commodity values are consumed by him. Thus he has ceased to stand in any relationship to their value. The money with which he pays for it exists as a component of the circulating money stock, but he has withdrawn the value of this money from circulation in products, and the value of these products is destroyed together with the products in which it existed. It is all gone. At the end of the year, then, he throws into circulation a commodity value of £6,000 and sells this. There returns to him as a result, one, the money capital of £5,000 that he advanced, two, his converted surplus value of £1,000. He advanced £5,000 as capital, cast this into circulation, and he withdraws from circulation £6,000. £5,000 as capital and £1,000 for surplus value. The final £1,000 is converted into money with the money that he threw into circulation not as capitalist but as consumer, i.e. did not advance but actually spent. It now returns to him as the money form of the surplus value produced by him. And from now on, this operation is repeated annually. From the second year, however, the £1,000 that he spent is always the changed form, the money form, of the surplus value he produced. He spends this annually, and it returns to him at the same interval. 
If his capital were to turn over several times in the course of the year, this would not change things in any way, even though it would affect the length of time for which he had to cast into circulation, over and above the money capital he advanced, this sum for his individual consumption, and hence also the magnitude of the sum involved. This money is not cast into circulation by the capitalist as capital. However, it certainly pertains to the character of the capitalist that he should be capable of living off the means of subsistence in his possession until the reflux of his surplus value. It was assumed in this case that the sum of money that the capitalist casts into circulation to cover his individual consumption until the first reflux of his capital is exactly equal to the surplus value that he produces and hence has to convert into money. This is obviously an arbitrary assumption in relation to the individual capitalist, but it must be correct for the capitalist class as a whole on the assumption of simple reproduction. It simply expresses the same thing as this assumption implies, namely that the entire surplus value was unproductively consumed, but no more than this, i.e. no fraction of the original capital stock. It was assumed above that the entire production of precious metals, taken as 500 pounds, was just sufficient to replace the wear and tear of the money. The gold-producing capitalists possess their entire product in gold, including the part of it which replaces constant capital, the part which replaces variable capital, and the part which consists of surplus value. One part of the society's surplus value thus consists of gold, and not of products that are turned into money only in the course of circulation. It consists of gold from the start, and is cast into the circulation sphere in order to withdraw products from this. The same applies here to wages, the variable capital, and to the replacement of the constant capital advanced. Thus, if one section of the capitalist class cast into circulation a commodity value greater by the surplus value than the money capital they advanced, another section of the capitalist cast into circulation a greater money value greater by the surplus value than the commodity value they constantly withdraw from circulation for the production of gold. If one group of capitalists constantly pump more money out of the circulation sphere than they put into it, the gold-producing group constantly pump more money in than they withdraw from it in means of production. Now even though a part of the 500 pounds gold product is surplus value for the gold producers, the entire sum is still simply determined by the replacement of the money needed for the circulation of commodities. How much of this converts the surplus value of the commodities into money, and how much the other component parts of their value, is immaterial here. If gold production is transferred from the country in question to other countries, this does not alter the situation in any way. A part of the social labor power and social means of production in country A is transformed into a product, for example linen, to the value of 500 pounds, and this is exported to country B in order to buy gold there. The productive capital thus applied in country A no more throws commodities onto the market in country A as opposed to money than if it had been directly applied in gold production. This product of A is represented by 500 pounds in gold and comes into circulation in country A only as money. The part of the social surplus value that this product contains exists directly in money and as far as country A goes never in any other form. Although for the gold-producing capitalists, only one part of their product is surplus value, while another represents the replacement of capital. The question as to how much of this gold, besides for circulating constant capital, replaces variable capital and how much represents surplus value depends exclusively on the respective ratios of wages and surplus value to the value of the commodities in circulation. The part that forms surplus value is divided between the various members of the capitalist class. Even though it is continuously paid out for their individual consumption and taken in again by the sale of new products, and it is precisely this buying and selling that circulates among them the money needed for the conversion of surplus value, a part of the social surplus value still exists in the form of money in the pockets of the capitalists, even if in changing portions, just as a part of the workers' wages remain in their pockets in the form of money for at least part of the week. And this part is not restricted by the part of the gold product that originally forms the surplus value of the gold-producing capitalists, but rather, as we have already said, by the proportion in which the above product of 500 pounds is divided between capitalists and workers in general, and in which the commodity value consists of surplus value and the other components of value. Still, the part of the surplus value that does not exist in other commodities, but rather alongside these other commodities and money, only consists of a part of the gold annually produced insofar as a part of the annual gold production circulates in order to realize surplus value. The other part of the money, which exists in ever-changing portions in the hands of the capitalist class as the money form or their surplus value, is not an element of the gold annually produced, but rather of the quantity of money previously accumulated in the country. On our supposition, the annual gold production of 500 pounds is just sufficient to replace the money annually worn down. Thus, if we simply bear in mind this 500 pounds and abstract from the part of the mass of commodities annually produced which circulate by means of the money previously accumulated, then the surplus value produced in the form of commodities already finds in circulation money for its conversion, because, at another point, surplus value is annually being produced in the form of gold. 
The same applies to the other parts of the gold product of 500 pounds that replace the money capital advanced. There are two points to be noted here. It follows, firstly, that the surplus value spent by the capitalists in money, as well as the variable and other productive capital which they advance in money, is in fact the product of the workers, in particular of those workers occupied in gold production. These produce afresh both the part of the gold product that is advanced to them as wages and the part of the gold product in which the surplus value of the capitalist gold producers is directly represented. Finally, as far as concerns the part of the gold product that simply replaces the constant capital value advanced for its production, this reappears in the gold form, or in any kind of product, only as a result of the annual labor of the workers. At the start of the business, it was originally given out by the capitalist in money which was not newly produced but formed a part of the social quantity of money in circulation. However, insofar as it is replaced by a new product, additional gold, it is the annual product of the workers. The advance on the part of the capitalist appears here too only as a form deriving from the fact that the worker is neither the proprietor of his own means of production, nor does he have at his disposal during the course of production the means of subsistence produced by other workers. Secondly, however, as far as concerns the quantity of money that exists independently of this annual replacement of 500 pounds, partly in the form of a hoard, partly in the form of a quantity of money in circulation, the same must apply to it, i.e. the same must have originally applied as still applies to this annual 500 pounds. We shall return to this point at the conclusion of this section. In the meantime, some other points must be noted. In considering the turnover, we have already seen that with circumstances otherwise remaining the same, changes in the length of the turnover periods make different amounts of capital necessary in order to continue production on the same scale. The monetary circulation must thus be elastic enough to adapt to this alternate expansion and contraction. If we further assume that other circumstances remain the same, and therefore that there is no change in the size, intensity, or productivity of the working day, but that there is an altered division of the value product between wages and surplus value, so that either the former rises and the latter falls, or vice versa, then the quantity of money in circulation is not affected. This change can come about without any kind of expansion or contraction in the quantity of money in circulation. If we consider, for instance, the case of a general rise in wages, and on the conditions here assumed, a consequent general fall in the rate of surplus value, there would not be, again on the assumptions made here, any change in the value of the mass of commodities in circulation. In this case, moreover, the money capital that has to be advanced as variable capital would grow, and so would the quantity of money that serves for this function. But this being the case, surplus value would decline by the same amount as the increase in the quantity of money required for the function of variable capital and thus so would the quantity of money needed for its realization. The quantity of money needed to realize the commodity value is therefore no more affected than is this commodity value itself. The cost price of the commodities rises for the individual capitalist, but their social price of production remains unaltered. What is changed is the ratio in which, leaving aside the constant portion of the value, the production price of the commodities is divided between wages and profit. It will be said, however, that a greater outlay of variable money capital means a correspondingly greater quantity of monetary means in the hands of the workers. The value of the money is of course assumed to be constant here. This gives rise to a greater demand for commodities on the part of the workers. A further consequence is a rise in the price of commodities. Alternatively, it is said that if wages rise, the capitalists will increase the prices of their commodities. In both cases, the general rise in wages leads to a rise in the price of commodities. Thus, a greater quantity of money must be needed to circulate the commodities, whether the price rises explained in one way or the other. The reply to the first of these conceptions is that as a result of rising wages, the demand of the workers for necessary means of subsistence will grow. Their demand for luxury articles will increase to a smaller degree, or else a demand will arise for articles that previously did not enter the area of their consumption. The sudden and large-scale rise in demand for necessary means of subsistence will certainly cause a temporary rise in their prices. The result of this is that a greater part of the social capital will be applied to the production of necessary means of subsistence and a smaller part to the production of luxury goods, since the latter will have fallen in price on account of the decline of surplus value and the resulting diminished demand for them from the capitalists. To the extent that the workers themselves buy luxury goods, however, the rise in their wages does not lead to a rise in the prices of necessary means of subsistence, but simply displaces the buyers of luxury goods. More luxury goods than before are consumed by the workers, and relatively fewer are consumed by the capitalists. That is all. After a few oscillations, the mass of commodities in circulation is the same in value as before. As for these temporary oscillations, moreover, they can have no other result than to cast into domestic circulation, as unoccupied money capital, capital which formerly sought employment in speculative undertakings on the stock exchange or abroad. The reply to the second conception is this. If it were within the capacity of the capitalist producers to increase the prices of their commodities at will, then they could and would do so even without any rise in wages. 
nor would wages rise with a fall in commodity prices. The capitalist class would never oppose trade unions, since they would always and in all circumstances be able to do what they now do exceptionally under certain particular and, so to speak, local conditions, i.e. use any increase in wages to raise commodity prices to a far higher degree and thus tuck away a greater profit. The contention that the capitalists can raise the prices of luxury articles because the demand for these declines, as a result of the reduced demand of the capitalists whose means of purchasing them have diminished, would be an extremely original application of the law of supply and demand. Inasmuch as there is not just a shift in the buyers, workers replacing capitalists, and to the extent that this displacement occurs, the workers' demand does not operate to raise the price of the necessary means of subsistence, since the part of their additional wages that the workers spend on articles of luxury cannot be spent by them on necessary means of subsistence. The prices of luxury goods fall as a consequence of the reduced demand. As a result, capital is withdrawn from their production, until their supply is reduced to the extent that corresponds with their changed role in the social production process. With this reduction in production, they rise again to their normal prices, given that their values are unchanged. While this contraction or balancing process is taking place, the same amount of additional capital will be supplied for the production of means of subsistence, whose prices are rising, as is withdrawn from the other branch of production until demand is satisfied. There is then once again an equilibrium, and the conclusion of the whole process is that the social capital, and hence also the money capital, is divided between the production of necessary means of subsistence and that of luxury goods in changed proportions. The entire objection is a red herring brought in by the capitalists and their economic sycophants. The facts that provide the pretext for this diversion are of three kinds. 1. It is a general law of monetary circulation that if the sum of the prices of goods in circulation rises, whether this increase is for the same volume of commodities or for an increased volume, with other circumstances remaining the same, the quantity of money in circulation grows. The effect is then taken for the cause. However, wages rise, even if seldom and proportionately only in exceptional cases, with the increased price of the necessary means of subsistence. Their rise is the result of the rise in commodity prices and not the cause of this. 2. Given a partial or local rise in wages, i.e. a rise in just a few branches of production, it is possible that a local rise in prices for the products of this branch may result. But even this depends on many circumstances. For example, that wages were not abnormally depressed here and hence the rate of profit abnormally high, that the market for these commodities was not constricted by a rise in price, and thus that a rise in their prices does not depend on a preceding contraction in their supply, etc. 3. With the general rise in wages, the price of goods produced in branches of industry in which variable capital is predominant rises, whereas prices fall in those branches in which constant or fixed capital predominates. In the case of simple commodity circulation, see Volume 1, Chapter 3, Section 2, we showed that even if the money form is only transient in the circulation of a particular quantity of commodities, the money transiently in the hands of one person in the commodity metamorphosis still necessarily finds its way into the hands of someone else, and so not only are commodities exchanged on all sides, replacing each other, but this replacement is also mediated and accompanied by a precipitation of money on all sides. Quote from Volume 1. When one commodity replaces another, the money commodity always sticks to the hands of some third person. Circulation sweats money from every pore. End quote. The very same fact is expressed on the basis of capitalist commodity production by the constant retention of a part of capital in the form of money capital, and the constant presence of a part of the surplus value similarly in the money form in the hands of its proprietor. Apart from this, the circuit of money, i.e. the return of the money to its starting point, inasmuch as this forms a moment of the turnover of capital, is a phenomenon completely different from and even opposed to the circulation of money which expresses its constant removal from its starting point through a series of hands. See Volume 1, page 210. However, an accelerated turnover involves by its very nature an accelerated circulation. To take the case of variable capital first, if, for example, a money capital of 500 pounds turns over 10 times a year in the form of variable capital, it is clear that this aliquot part of the quantity of money in circulation circulates 10 times its sum of values. It circulates 10 times in the year between capitalist and worker. The worker is paid, and himself pays, ten times in the year with the same aliquot part of the quantity of money in circulation. If this variable capital were to turn over once in the year with the same scale of production, then there would only be one circulation of five thousand pounds. Furthermore, the constant part of the circulating capital is one thousand pounds. If the capital turns over ten times, then the capitalist sells his commodity ten times in the year, and thus also the constant circulating part of its value with it. The same aliquot part of the money quantity in circulation, 1,000 pounds, passes ten times in the year from the hands of its owner to those of the capitalist. There are ten changes of place from one hand to another. 
Secondly, the capitalist buys the means of production ten times in the year. These are again ten circulations of money from one hand to another. With money to the total of £1,000, commodities for £10,000 are sold by the industrial capitalist, and other commodities of £10,000 are bought. By a twenty-fold circulation of £1,000 of money, a commodity stock of £20,000 is circulated. Finally, accelerated turnover also leads to a quicker circulation of the portion of money that realizes surplus value. Conversely, however, a more rapid monetary circulation does not necessarily involve a more rapid turnover of capital, and hence also of money, i.e. there is not necessarily a shortening and more rapid renewal of the reproduction process. More rapid monetary circulation takes place whenever a greater volume of transactions is completed with the same quantity of money. This can also be the case without a change in the reproduction period of the capital, as a result of change technical arrangements for monetary circulation. Further, the volume of transactions in which money circulates can increase without this expressing a real replacement of commodities, speculation in futures on the stock exchange, etc. On the other hand, certain monetary circulations can completely disappear. Where the agriculturalist is his own landlord, for example, there is no monetary circulation between farmer and landlord. Where the industrial capitalist is himself the owner of his capital, there is no circulation between him and a creditor. As for the question of the original formation of a money hoard in a country, as well as the appropriation of it by a few people, it is not necessary to go into this in detail here. The capitalist mode of production, since its basis is wage labor, and therefore also the payment of the worker in money and the general transformation of services in kind into money payments, can develop on a large scale and penetrate deeply only when there is a quantity of money in the country in question sufficient for circulation and for the hoard formation reserve fund, etc., conditioned by this circulation. This is a historical precondition, even if the situation should not be conceived in such a way that a sufficient hoard has first to be formed before capitalist production can begin. The latter rather develops simultaneously with the development of its preconditions, and one of these preconditions is a sufficient supply of precious metals. Hence the increased supply of precious metals from the 16th century onwards was a decisive moment in the historical development of capitalist production. Insofar as we are dealing with the further supply of money material needed on the basis of the capitalist mode of production, we can say that on the one hand, surplus value is cast into circulation in the product without the money for its conversion, while on the other hand, surplus value in gold is cast into circulation without its previous transformation from product into money. The additional commodities that have to be transformed into money find the sums of money needed available because on the other hand, additional gold and silver is cast into circulation by production itself, not by exchange, and has to be transformed into commodities. Section 2. Accumulation and Expanded Reproduction The case in which accumulation takes place in the form of reproduction on an expanded scale clearly does not offer any new problems with respect to money circulation. As far as the additional money capital is concerned, that required for the function of the increased productive capital, this is supplied by the portion of the realized surplus value that is cast into circulation by the capitalist as money capital, instead of as the money form of revenue. The money is already in the hands of the capitalists. It is simply its application that differs. Now, however, as a result of the addition to the productive capital, an additional mass of commodities is cast into circulation as its product. Together with this extra mass of commodities, a part of the extra money needed for their realization is also cast in, to the extent that the value of this mass of commodities contains the value the productive capital consumed in their production. This additional quantity of money is advanced precisely as additional money capital, and hence returns to the capitalist with the turnover of his capital. Here, the same question comes up again as before. Where does the extra money come from to realize the extra surplus value that now exists in the commodity form? The general reply is again the same. The total price of the mass of commodities in circulation has increased, not because the price of a given mass of commodities has risen, but rather because the mass of commodities now in circulation is greater than that of the commodities circulating earlier, without this having been balanced by any fall in prices. The additional money required for the circulation of this increased commodity mass of a greater value must be created either by a more economic use of the quantity of money in circulation, whether by directly balancing payments, etc., or by means that accelerate the circulation of the same pieces of money or alternatively by the transformation of money from the hoard form into the circulating form. This does not just imply that idle money capital begins to function as a means of purchase or payment, or that money capital already functioning as a reserve fund, while continuing to perform the function of a reserve fund for its owners, circulates actively for the society, as with deposits and banks which are constantly lent out, and thus performs a double function. It also means that stagnant reserves of coin are used more economically, Quote from A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy by Karl Marx.
So that money as coin may flow continuously, coin must continuously congeal into money. The continual movement of coin implies its perpetual stagnation in larger or smaller amounts in reserve funds of coin which arise everywhere within the framework of circulation and which are at the same time a condition of circulation. The formation, distribution, dissolution, and reformation of these funds constantly changes. Existing funds disappear continuously and their disappearance is a continuous fact. This unceasing transformation of coin into money and of money into coin was expressed by Adam Smith when he said that, in addition to the particular commodity that he sells, every commodity owner must always keep in stock a certain amount of the general commodity with which he buys. We have seen that M to C, the second member of the circuit C to M to C, splits up into a series of purchases, which are not affected all at once, but successively over a period of time, so that one part of M circulates as coin, while the other part remains at rest as money. In this case, money is in fact only suspended coin, and the various components of the coinage and circulation appear, constantly changing, now in one form, now in another. The first transformation of the medium of circulation into money constitutes, therefore, merely a technical aspect of the circulation of money. End quote. Coin, as opposed to money, is used here to denote money in its function as means of circulation, as opposed to its other functions. To the extent that all these means together were not enough, there must be additional production of gold, or when it comes to the same thing, a part of the additional product must be exchanged either directly or indirectly for gold, the product of those countries that produce precious metals. The sum of labor power and social means of production that is spent in the annual production of gold and silver as instruments of circulation forms a heavy item of faux flay for the capitalist mode of production, or more generally, for a mode of production based on commodity circulation. It withdraws from social use a corresponding sum of possible additional means of production and consumption, i.e. of real wealth. To the extent that the costs of this expensive machinery of circulation are reduced, with the scale of production remaining the same, i.e. at a given level of its extension, the productive forces of social labor are correspondingly heightened. Thus, inasmuch as the auxiliary means that develop with credit have this effect, they directly increase capitalist wealth, whether this is because a greater part of the social production and labor process is thereby accomplished without the intervention of real money, or because the capacity of the actually functioning quantity of money to fulfill its function is thereby increased. This also disposes of the pointless question of whether capitalist production on its present scale would be possible without credit, even considered from this standpoint alone, i.e. with a merely metallic circulation. It would clearly not be possible. It would come up against the limited scale of precious metal production. On the other hand, we should not get any mystical ideas about the productive power of the credit system just because this makes money capital available or fluid. But the further development of this point does not belong here. We must now consider the case where there is not actual accumulation, i.e. direct expansion of the scale of production, but where a part of the surplus value realized is stored up over a longer or shorter time as a monetary reserve fund, so as later to be transformed into productive capital. Insofar as the money thus accumulated is extra money, the situation is very clear. This money can only be a part of the additional gold supplied by the gold-producing countries. It should be noted in this connection that the domestic products in return for which this gold is imported no longer exist in the country in question. They have been dispensed abroad in exchange for gold. If we assume, on the other hand, that there is the same quantity of money in the country as before, then the money that has been stored away or is being stored away has flowed in from circulation. It is simply its function that has changed. It has been transformed from circulating money into a gradually formed latent money capital. The money that is stored up here is the money form of commodities that have been sold, and moreover of that portion of their value that represents surplus value for their owner. The credit system is assumed here to be non-existent. The capitalist who stores up money has to that extent sold without buying. If we look upon this process simply as a partial phenomenon, there is nothing in it that needs explaining. One group of capitalists keep back part of the money they obtain from the sale of their products instead of using it to withdraw products from the market. Another group, on the other hand, transform their money into products, with the exception of the constantly recurring money capital needed to carry on production. A part of the product thrown onto the market as a bearer of surplus value consists of means of production, or of the real elements of variable capital, the necessary means of subsistence. It can therefore immediately serve to expand production, for it is in no way assumed that one group of capitalists accumulates money capital while the other group completely consume their surplus value, but simply that one group carry out the accumulation in the money form and build up latent money capital while the others really do accumulate, i.e. expand the scale of production, actually expand their productive capital. The quantity of money present remains sufficient for the needs of circulation, even if it is alternately one group of capitalists who store up money while the other group expand their scale of production, and vice versa. 
The storing up of money on the one side can proceed even without cash, simply through the piling up of credit notes. But difficulties start to arise when we assume not partial accumulation of money capital, but general accumulation within the capitalist class. Outside this class, on our assumption, that of the universal and exclusive domination of capitalist production, there is no other class except the working class. The total purchases of the working class are equal to the sum of their wages, i.e. the sum of the variable capital advanced by the entire capitalist class as a whole. This money flows back to the latter through the sale of their product to the working class. Their variable capital thereby receives its money form. If the sum of variable capital is x times 100 pounds, this is not the total variable capital advanced in the year, but only that applied. Whether this variable capital value is advanced with more money or less during the year, according to the speed of the turnover, does not affect the question at present under discussion. With this capital of x times 100 pounds, the capitalist class buys a certain quantity of labor power, or pays wages to a certain number of workers. First transaction. The workers use this sum to buy a certain value of commodities from the capitalists, and in this way the sum of x times 100 pounds returns to the hands of the capitalists. Second transaction. This process is constantly repeated. The sum of x times 100 pounds can therefore never enable the working class to buy the part of the product which contains the constant capital, let alone the surplus value which belongs to the capitalists. The workers can buy with x times 100 pounds only a portion of the value of the social product equal to the portion of value which represents the value of the variable capital advanced. Apart from the case in which this all-round monetary accumulation simply expresses the division, in whatever proportions, between the various individual capitalists of the additional precious metal which has been brought in, how else is the entire capitalist class to accumulate money? They would all have to have sold a part of their product without buying again. It is nothing mysterious that they all possess a certain money fund which they cast into the circulation sphere as means of circulation for their consumption, and of which each receives a certain part back again from the circulation sphere. But this monetary fund is then precisely a circulation fund, acquired by the conversion into money of surplus value and does not consist at all of latent money capital. If we consider the way things happen in real life, we can say that the latent money capital that is stored up for later use consists of 1. Bank deposits, and the money that the banks really dispose of is a relatively small sum. Here it is only nominally stored up as money capital. What is really stored up are monetary claims which are only convertible, to the extent that they are ever converted, because there is a balance between money drawn out and the money put in. The money that exists in the hands of the bank is relatively only a small sum. 2. Government papers. These are not capital at all, but simply outstanding claims on the nation's annual product. 3. Shares. Leaving aside the fraudulent ones, these are titles of ownership to a real capital belonging to a corporate body, and drafts on the surplus value that flow in from this each year. In all these cases, there is no storage of money, and what appears on the one hand as storage of money capital appears on the other hand as the continuous real expenditure of money. Whether the money is spent by the person it belongs to or by other people, by people in debt to him, does not affect the situation. On the basis of capitalist production, the formation of a hoard as such is never a purpose but rather a result, a result either of a stagnation in circulation, and that greater quantities of money than usual assume the hoard form, or of the storage required by the turnover. The hoard can also, finally, be simply a formation of money capital, in the latent form for the time being, but destined to function as productive capital. If, on the one hand, therefore, a part of the surplus value realized in money is withdrawn from circulation and stored up as a hoard, at the same time, a further part of the surplus value is always transformed into productive capital. With the exception of the division of additional precious metal among the capital's class, storage in the money form never occurs simultaneously at all points. The same applies to that part of the annual product which represents surplus value in the commodity form, as applies to the rest of the annual product. A certain sum of money is required for its circulation. This sum of money belongs just as much to the capitalist class as does the annually produced mass of commodities that represents surplus value. It was originally cast into circulation by the capitalist class itself. It is continuously divided among them afresh by circulation. Just as with the circulation of coin in general, a part of this monetary surplus value is held up at ever-changing points while the further part is always circulating. Whether some of this storage is deliberate in order to form money capital does not affect the situation in any way. Here we have disregarded the vicissitudes of circulation, in which one capitalist seizes for himself a piece of another's surplus value, and even of his capital, and there is therefore a one-sided accumulation and centralization of both money capital and productive capital. A part of the extorted surplus value that A stores up as money capital may thus be a fragment of B's surplus value that has failed to return to him. End of part two.